do clear the aisles. Those of you outside, I would request you to please come in, be seated. I do hope you're going to make us trend our hashtag India Today Conclave 24. Requesting all of you to please come in, do clear the aisle. Appreciate it. Do come in, grab yourself a seat, put your phones on silent and we are ready to begin on day one of the India Today Conclave. Our theme this year, Brand Bharat, an assertive nation in an uncertain world. Along with what you witness uh, on this stage, we're going to have a couple of breakaway sessions as well. You can trust me to keep you up to speed with all of that as and when they happen. We have two of them today as well, and we're going to let you know. There's a photo booth outside. If you want to take a memory right outside Shah Jahan Hall, do step out, get a picture taken. Once again, I welcome you all to the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave, our theme this year, Brand Bharat, an assertive nation in an uncertain world. With the world's largest democracy headed for a defining electoral battle this summer, the India Today Conclave 21st edition is all set to explore ideas of how in the coming decades Bharat, India, with its political, economic stability and unique social vibrancy, Ladies and gentlemen, may I please call upon stage Mr. Arun Puri, Chairman, Editor-in-Chief, India Today Group, to come up on stage and deliver the welcome address. Good morning. Welcome to the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. Honorable guests, honorable finance minister, welcome. The theme of the conclave last year was the India moment. Well, I can confidently say the India moment has only got bigger, much bigger. Let me be ambitious and call it the India movement. This way, we remind ourselves of the work that needs to be done so that we keep asking ourselves the big questions. What's next? What can we do today to ensure that the India moment lasts as long as possible and convert it into a movement so that it transforms India like no other in the past? To me, the best way to build a future is to have a clear vision of that future and then work towards turning that vision into reality. Today, I want to submit to you five images of India's future that I think are within our grasp. Firstly, forget about the poverty line, which is so often discussed in India, and let's convert into what I would call the dignity line. Less than a month ago, the government released data that suggested that extreme poverty in India has almost eliminated. It is now indeed restricted to less than 2% of India's population. But I must tell you that extreme poverty is a very low bar to clear. According to the World Bank, poverty is defined as a consumption expenditure of dollars 2.15 PPV dollars a day. That's purchasing power parity means a dollar is about half the value of the US dollar. This means roughly 1,200 to 1,500 rupees a month, or just 40 to 80 rupees a day. In the last 10 years, the present government has done a remarkable job of lifting more than 200 people, 200 million people above the extreme poverty line. Now let's set the bar to dignity line. It's a line that measures the means to lead a life of basic dignity. 
that includes food, of course, but it also includes access to basic housing, electricity, clean water, education, and health care. And of course, a job that gives a basic income. I think Prime Minister Modi has grasped this idea of delivering a life of dignity for the bottom, for the people at the bottom of the pyramid from the time he took office 10 years ago. That is why his emphasis on schemes like Swachh Bharat and delivering tap water and electricity to every household. Also, Niti Aayog does not measure poverty by poverty line anymore, but by what they call multi-dimensional poverty. This is a most welcome step. The current estimates suggest 11.3% of Indians are below the multi-dimensional poverty line. Five years from now, we should target either zero or no more than 2% of Indians below this line. That's when every Indian will have a fair opportunity at, to making what life offers to all of us. Second is education. No country has become a developed one without a good education system. In education, we have solved the enrollment problem. But what happens or doesn't happen between enrollment and graduation remains unaddressed. This shows up in the large teaching and learning gaps on the one hand and historically high youth employment, unemployment on the other. A recent survey showed 25% of 14 to 18 year olds could not read a simple class two level text in their regional language. Less than 50% of them could not solve grade two level maths. This is a very sad state of affairs that does not bode well for the future of this country. Quality of education from curriculum to pedagogy to delivery hasn't kept pace with enrollments. This is true at all levels of education, primary, secondary, and college. At college level, education must be linked to employability. Most recent data show that youth unemployment to be at 16.5%. In five years from now, we must aim to reduce our youth unemployment to no more than 5%. This has to change dramatically and quickly. If we use it seriously, AI can help us there. In a matter of months, not years, our children could have access to the highest quality education customized to their level of understanding, delivered to them right at their home in their native language for almost free of cost. This is distinct, do, distinctly doable because India has one of the finest public infrastructure, digital infrastructure in the world. I hope the government, NGOs, and tech companies in India join to bring such solutions to every student. These are all AI images, by the way. So I see AI as a source of free intellectual energy. Let's open it up for our young minds. Thirdly, how we deliver the best health care to the remotest Indian village in that is the next big challenge. India has been late in understanding the direct correlation between human capability and human capital. Healthcare, along with education, is the essential ingredient for converting our biggest capability into our best capital. For the next five years, we should aim to achieve the following two. Bringing our infant mortality to five per thousand live births from 25 right now. We've done a remarkable job in bringing our life expectancy down from 32 years at the time of independence to over 70 years right now. But now we have to focus on healthy life expect expectancy, not just life expectancy. India is the capital of just too many diseases. Like for education, for healthcare too, I think AI may be a godsend for India. It allows an inexpensive and fast way to combine the practice of medicine with the science of medicine, which is what we need to deliver best quality primary care to the remotest places in India. Fourth, make, make in India, we should, we should move to make better than the best in India. By this I mean we should be setting world standards. And there are examples. 
For example, we have in India one of the world's biggest and most efficient oil refineries. Some of our seaports and the most, are the most modern, and so are our airports, are world class. At the turn of this century, how many of you would have imagined India would be exporting automobiles and being home to building the highest quality smartphones? Thanks to developments like China Plus One and policies like Make in India, we have the tide in our favor that can take us from Make in India to make better than the best in India. We have what I would call the last mover advantage. We can start with the latest technology, especially now that we are getting into semiconductor manufacturing. I think we're at the cusp of a golden era in Indian manufacturing. Today, India accounts for little over 3% of global manufacturing, and China has little over 28%. In five years, we should aim 8% of global share. Remember, in 1995, China had only 3%. Lastly, we are on the way to become the third largest economy in the world in terms of GDP. But becoming an economic giant is not an end in itself. We have to become a great nation. We cannot rise economically and descend in our conduct and our character. Can we be a great nation without knowing which side of the road to drive on? Every year, nearly 10,000 Indians lose their lives in accidents caused by people driving on the wrong side of the road. Can we be a great nation with ever rising mountain of garbage surrounding our urban centers? Can we be a great nation if most of our cities and towns are choking with pollution? Can we be a great nation when lynching or beating a person to death becomes commonplace? Can we be great, a great nation when we are regarded as a rape capital of the world? Also, violence against women is treated as a routine affair. Can we be a great nation if our election funding is open to question? Can we be a great nation by confusing disagreement with dissent, dissent with disloyalty, and disloyalty with treason? Can we be a great nation if we live in fear of our government? There are many more hard questions like these that I'm sure you ask yourself every day. I think most of you know the answer. We need to, we need to measure what I call gross domestic behavior. GDP, if you like, just as we measure GDP. So that a nation building goes hand in hand with character building. So that we become an economic giant, we also become a social and moral giant. 20 years ago, 2003 to be precise, President Clinton had told India Today Conclave something that has remained in my mind. He said, I have no doubt India will be a giant, but what kind of giant? You must become a global giant and of the right kind. So here's to becoming the right kind of giant. Like always, we have a wide range of subjects and speakers for you to listen to in the next two days. I invite you to enjoy our festival of ideas. All of India Today Group is here to host you and make the best of the two days you have spared for us. Honored guests, I thank you for your time and attention. Have a good time. Thank you, Mr. Puri. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, begin the Festival of Ideas with our first session this morning. Uh, a seven trillion economy by 2030, the promise and the pitfalls. I'd like to invite on stage our session's moderators, Rahul Kaval, News Director, TV Today Network, Managing Editor, Special Online Projects, Executive Director, Business Today, Anjana Om Kashyap, Managing Editor, Special Projects, Ajtak, and Siddhat Zarabi, Managing Editor business today.
Hello everyone and welcome to the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to have all of you with us. Can we have a round of applause as you welcome our Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. The theme of this year's conclave is India's rapidly changing position in the emerging global order. And central to that is the strength of the Indian economy. The International Monetary Fund has projected, and I have a slide that's coming up behind your screen, that India could be a $6.9 trillion economy by 2028. What's the unfinished reform agenda? What more do we need to do to move with the maximum speed and purpose possible? And what are the pitfalls that can derail us along the way? To talk about this, we are kicking off the first session at this year's conclave with our finance minister, who now is one of India's most experienced finance ministers. And at this moment, the odds-on favorite to present a seventh budget in July, potentially. So, Nirmala Sitaramanji, welcome to the conclave, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you. I also want to welcome my colleagues and co-moderators for this session, Anjana Kashyap, Patshtak star anchor and editor, and also Siddharth Zarabi, the managing editor of Business Today Television. So, welcome. Let's get started. Ma'am, can you begin by outlining the unfinished reform agenda? To achieve that kind of growth from where we are right now, if your government gets another chance, what more do you believe needs to be done beyond the reform measures that you've already put in place for India to unlock its true potential and rise and grow at the maximum speed possible? Thank you, India Today, for having me over. And uh, I thought uh, Rahul's uh, comment about most experience was a bit tongue-in-cheek. He, he comes out as somebody who doesn't believe in it himself. But never mind, I'll allow that. Um, in no order of priority, the right, uh, kind of reforms which we need to undertake now, I would think, in whichever sector you would want to take it, will have to have greater coordination between the center, the states, and the urban local bodies, panchayats, and so on. In the last 10 years, my experience, at least limited to my experience, I can tell you, you may do wonderful um, futuristic reforms at the central government level. And most states understand that it benefits them as well. And they do also, uh, in synchrony, do things which are going to help both center and states. And it is only when you touch that layer, the third layer, you find many of them are almost getting blocked in the sense it's not an intentional block. It's more a question of they understanding what it can do for them and also trying to make sure that they can uh, easily slip into that process so that up from the central government down to the panchayat. Because after all, when industry in the ground, in the, at the panchayat level. So if all those great reforms are happening elsewhere, at the level, it's not So there has to be a lot of work done from top level in the sense of center, state, and, uh, you know. So that is one thing I think across the sectors, when you undertake reforms, it has to have that effect of cascading down to the uh, lowest level. I felt maybe that that comment was an absolute statement of fact. And she is indeed one of India's most uh, experienced finance ministers now and in very august company. And truly, without tongue being in cheek and just stating the fact for is the odds on favorite to be back in July, both of those are Thank absolute you. statements of fact. She's just being humble and modest. The way she is. The tricky aspects of reform. So the government tried to deal with uh, land reform. The government tried to deal with agriculture. Both occasions, the government and the Prime Minister ended up burning their hands and backtracked. Reform again has been an area where put, uh, progress hasn't been made beyond where we've reached. Do you think those are areas that you have a philosophy or a framework to be able to navigate, or will they remain just political hot potatoes? Due respects to those who protested on those, I would like to say. Those bills, when passed in the parliament, 
you can have a thousand commentary on it saying could the debate in the Rajya Sabha be held for one extra hour, it would have brought in more speakers. You can nitpick on those things. But they were the very reforms that when in power, those governments, those ministers who held power at that time, were all watching for. They wanted the agriculture reform. They wanted the land reform, labor codes. These are things when people wanted it, they spoke very much about it. Records in the parliament show it. But when you politically conveniently sitting in the opposition protest against every one of this, your hypocrisy is what, get, what is getting exposed. And as much as this election, 2024 Lok Sabha, people see a delivering government, a visionary prime minister, and many other things which this government has done, I think they are also seeing how hypocritical in protesting against every good measure this government took was the current opposition. People are seeing that as well. So if the environment is building up for Prime Minister to come back, it's, become, it's, coming, it's getting built up on the one hand, two thirds on what the government has done and the vision with which this government is functioning, and at least a third goes to those hypocrites who wasted the parliament's time. And people are realizing, we've not sent them there for it. Hypocrites who spoke in favor of some policies who are speaking against it now. So it is a blend of a hypocritical opposition which has got exposed and the fantastic work which Prime Minister has done during most difficult time with transparency. Ten years, every journalist, I'm sure, searched for at least one little straw of corruption. You couldn't find one. Anjana. Huh. Vitta Mantri ji, when the Pradhan Mantri ne sabse pehli baar tisre term ki baat ki, to wo aise hi hall mein baithe the, jahan baut bade bade business tycoons baithe hoye the. और उसका सारा का सारा बोझ आपके कंधों पर डाल दिया क्योंकि उन्होंने कहा कि तीसरी सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्था हम अपने देश को बनाएंगे 370 का टारगेट भी दे दिया है तो तीन बहुत ज्यादा हैं जो आपको मैनेज करने हैं लेकिन सवाल आता है कि क्या आप ये चुनौती देखती हैं आरबीआई से लेकर प्रधानमंत्री सब ने रेवड़ियों पर बहुत कंसर्न जताया यहां तक आरबीआई ने कहा कि परिस्थितियां कई राज्यों में राजस्थान पश्चिम बंगाल बहुत खराब है इसको रोकना जरूरी है लेकिन जो एक पार्टी के लिए रेवड़ी है वो आपकी पार्टी तक आते आते सोशल वेलफेयर स्कीम कल्याणकारी स्कीम बन जाती है क्या ये मापदंड सही है और इसी प्रश्न का दूसरा हिस्सा है कि क्या अर्थव्यवस्था को तीसरी सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्था बनाने में बतौर वित्त मंत्री आपको ये सबसे बड़ी चुनौती नहीं लगती है जो चुनावी वक्त में भी सारे एक के बाद एक इतने पैसे देंगे इतने फ्री बस राइड्स देंगे जो फ्री बीज जैसे हम कहते हैं सभी पार्टियाँ ऐलान कर रही हैं Anjana ji, you're as usual trying, and I'm going to do it in English. I'll try to speak in Hindi, but I'll lose my um, thought flow because, you know, I'll be searching for words in Hindi. You're as usual, and as is typical with media, and I don't blame you for it. You do this balancing act. What is ravedy for you is not ravedy for them. Come on! You do not have a budgetary support for some fantastic idea that you throw about. And then once you get the vote, you don't have money to fund that. And then you go about blaming the central government, which has not sought vote with you for the same rave day. But you want the central government to fund you because you had these fancy baskets of lollipops given for the people. Look at the example, and I'm sitting here to talk politics. Look at the example of Karnataka. A state one year ago was doing very well. Global Investor Summit drew the best of people to come and invest in that state because it's a fantastic state, draws excellent talent from all over the country, beautifully endowed, and has the right environment of blend of culture, industry, enterprise, and everything else. Now what is the state of affairs in Karnataka? And who is to blame? And it, it, actually hurts me so much to say, even Bengaluru city doesn't have drinking water. All within a year, you, you've seen what a ravedi can do. And now you want center to fund your ravedi? And you blame saying center is discriminating? And there is also another state which has taken us to the court, and I'm quite happy to go to the court and put all the facts before the court. For the mismanagement that states do, 
I would want the media to ask more meaningful questions of those states as well. Stop this debate of balancing. What is revenue for you is not revenue. Come on, tell me. Ask them to show the budgetary statements to say, I have made provision for this particular thing, so I don't need newer taxes on my own people. I've made budgetary provision for this. I will not blame the government if it doesn't give me one paisa extra than what the Finance Commission has asked me for. Ask such questions, Anjana. Then you'll know what is revenue and what is not. Uh, <laughs> Finance Minister, I want to follow this question up uh, with a broader point about the north-south divide. Uh, fastest growing economy in the G20 nations, faster than any of our uh, rivals. Fourth largest stock market, which is turbocharged right now. But do you think the north-south divide is a crucial uh, concern that will escalate during the election uh, campaigning? Yeah, obviously, because they'll want to ex escalate it because it can keep the narrative going in the direction in which they want uh, the narrative to go. But matter of fact, this has been one of those pet themes of state-level parties which think it's good to hit at the center and nobody from the center can come and defend themselves in that state, for instance. So when you have this debate going, I grew up in a Tamil Nadu, which I've heard, even with the Congress party in power in the center, and subsequently, every time there was an alliance with the uh, state party, Congress party was an alliance. Even then, I've heard comments like, Vadakku varudu terku meaning North prospers and South is um, teyidu is ragad ragad karke kuch hota hai. You become thinner and uh, paler and everything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this kind of a narrative I've heard even Tamil Nadu, even when center was ruled by Congress party. It's a typical um, political narrative, which particularly the Dravidian parties, particularly the DMK, has always used to give an impression that center is not doing its due to the state. And none of the ministers in the center, even one or two of them who are from Tamil Nadu themselves, would take it upon themselves to go and defend the center. I would want to believe the center did not discriminate the states even then and even now. But ministers who are part of the central government even at that time, alliance partners of the party DMK, wouldn't go to Tamil Nadu and take the pains to say no center doesn't discriminate. So that narrative happily found traction. But today, no, sorry, each one of us go there to say what we are doing and therefore there are friction points in the narrative. So that is a typical Dravidian political narrative which believes in showing this country as being different in the south and the north being ruled by mostly or largely by non-Tamil or non-South Indian language speaking people in power, so it sells as an argument but that's not fair at all. Madam Finance Minister, as we look back at the 10 years of the Modi Sarkar, on the economic report card, there are areas of strength and achievements, and then there are some concerns. I want to draw your attention to two visualizations compiled by the India Today Data Intelligence Unit and get you to comment on your strategy to deal with these. These are economic realities, I want to understand how you're dealing with them. I'll take uh, shrinking consumer spending first. So on your screen coming up is a visualization that maps uh, consumer spending going back two decades. So if you see, uh, consumer spending over the last couple of years has actually come down uh, to levels below where we were a couple of decades ago. Do you see this as being normal? There's a lot of concern in some economic circles that consumer spending is going down and why and whether beyond the big headline economic growth numbers, there is underlying stress. So that's one. The second is to do with household savings. So if you call up the visualization on household savings, here as well, uh, there is some concern in terms of whether household saving, which has really been one of the strengths of the Indian economy, because Indians, unlike more profligate consumers in the West, tend to save more, whether that is changing and whether that again, at some level, uh, is representative of economic stress. So if you look at those, I'm sure you've had an opportunity to absorb 
what the trend lines are suggesting. So, Madam Finance Minister, your sense on the concern that behind the growth numbers is an underlying stress reflected and captured in these charts? I'll first take on the household savings. Yes, the number which is shown is based on savings, small savings. And there are very many schemes through which we are trying to capture with better interest rates, like the one which we gave in honor of women. We said, you, uh, you take up a fixed deposit before the uh, 31st of March 2024, you get a higher rate of interest. And many women have started uh, investing money into the fixed deposit because the rate of interest was much higher than what otherwise the banks would give. Um, so. By doing this, uh, where the interest rate was remaining low for a long time and people didn't think it was worth putting money into the small savings schemes or the banks, we had to prop that up with specified targets with higher interest rate, which means we are subsidizing. But what is also equally happening and which doesn't get captured in this is people today, when I say people, retail, small people, are also going to the stock markets. Not just going through mutual funds, but also going through DMAT accounts which they open on their own. So the, actually since after 2020, you find that money is going to the stock market in the name of retail investments have gone substantially high. In fact, India stands out as one of those countries where retail investors are directly going to stock market. And that should also get ca captured and not seen as speculation. It's certainly investing their savings into stock market rather than putting into savings schemes. That's about savings. Uh, if you talk about consumption, there, there can be a disparity and that will be a matter of my worry so that I can um, see how best I can help out in consumption expenditure. But consumption expenditure also depends on the items which go into the basket. And when you talk to the fast moving uh, goods which are reaching out the rural areas, there are dips and rises, but people are spending on goods which are consumer durables as much as they used to do when days were not affected by COVID earlier. So I, I think what is important for us to is to see how in the medium term it pans out rather than get carried away by month on month expenditure analysis. It is important to know because you'll get to seeing how it's moving. But I would be uh, looking at both with a larger screen before me. मेरा सवाल भी घरेलू बचत और लोगों की खर्च करने की क्षमता से ही जुड़ा हुआ है लोगों की जेब की बात करते हैं जब पांच राज्यों के चुनाव थे तब सिलेंडर की कीमत एलपीजी सिलेंडर की 200 रुपए घटा दी गई और अब 100 रुपए घटा दी गई है और बीती शाम ही 2 रुपए पेट्रोल डीजल की कीमत अब विपक्ष कह रहा है कि यह चुनावी चाल है आप लोग जब इलेक्शन का टाइम आता है तभी कीमतें घटाते हैं वो सही बात नहीं है क्योंकि नवंबर 21 में और उसके बाद जून 22 में फ्यूल का एक्साइज ड्यूटी कटाया गया और सिलेंडर का इससे पहले अभी 100 रुपया के बाद आप कर रहे हैं इससे पहले 200 का कटौती हुई 200 प्लस 100 पुट टुगेदर आज उज्ज्वला कंस्यूमर्स के लिए जो लोअर एंड का कंस्यूमर्स है उनके लिए 300 तो हो रही है सो चुनाव के बहाना हो उसके बाद हो उसके पहले हो आम जनता के लिए जो हम करना है हम करते जा रहे हैं लगातार आप चुनाव के मध्य नजर रखते हुए आप प्रश्न पूछ रहे हैं मैं पूछ रही हूँ बहुत सारे स्टेट्स हैं जब हम रिड्यूस किए उन्होंने रिड्यूस नहीं किए और उनके इलेक्शन मैनिफेस्टो में प्रॉमिस था हम कट करेंगे प्रॉमिस को भी माना नहीं है चुनाव को भी माना नहीं है कभी खाटा भी नहीं है सो so, प्रश्न हमसे उठाना है या उनसे उठाना है हम कुछ ना कुछ बहाना दिखे दिखाते हुए चाहे वो इलेक्शन भी क्यों ना हो हम खट तो कर रहे हैं मैं पूछ रही हूँ उन लोगों से जो मैनिफेस्टो में लिखे हैं और अब उस समय भी नहीं किया अभी भी नहीं कर रहे हैं उनसे पूछ लो आम जनता के ध्यान वोट के समय आप प्रॉमिस कर रहे हो और फिर भी जीतने के बाद काम तो नहीं कर रहे 
Finance Minister, you mentioned the stock markets and the uh, and the growing uh, stock market uh, equity investing cult. But my question is, do you see any excesses building up uh, in the economy? Are certain areas of our economy getting overheated? The regulators seem to be a little concerned. They have expressed public warnings, froth in the market, valuation bubbles, unsecured lending. As the Finance Minister of India, what is your view on this? I'll allow the markets to play on their own. Because as much as all of us can observe that our stocks are overvalued or our stocks don't represent the real value, whatever be it, I think the markets will play it out. And uh, we should leave it to the wisdom of the market because all of us have seen that despite huge fluctuations globally, Indian market has maintained a certain level of sanity. It hasn't really gone too uh, violent this way or that way. So I'll place a lot of trust on the market. Madam Finance Minister, you know, I want to talk to you about two things. If you look at the overall numbers for foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment, the numbers show that we're at historic levels or we're doing much better than in the past. However, many economists would argue that that's not the full picture, that the right way of looking at this, and again, I want to call two visualizations on the screen. The right way of looking at this is to look at foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment relative to our GDP. So if we were to do that conversion and have these on our screen right now, so just so that everyone's on the same page, the light cream represents foreign direct investments where in 2001, if foreign direct investment was what 0.9% of the size of the GDP as a percentage, it's now 0.7. So it went up in 2010 and has been a flatline curve tending downwards uh, till the last numbers are available for Q3 of uh, the last year. So that's foreign direct investment. Foreign portfolio investments which come into the markets, again, is a zigzag flatline curve, not really tending upwards as a percentage of the GDP. They're saying, naturally, if the size of the economy keeps increasing, you look at the overall numbers, that looks very impressive, but convert it back into a percentage of the GDP, and then the numbers tell their own picture. So here, we've gone up from 0 0.6 to 1.3, but whether that is enough, optimal, and what more can be done? So how do you look at these numbers? the foreign attraction to India relative to the size of the current GDP. Madam Finance Minister. Um, they are very important indicators, no doubt. We'll also have to place them in the context. That is, whether the Indian market, Indian economy, the macro economy are all attractive enough for foreign direct investment to come. And whether for the FPIs, which are a lot more mercurial in their functioning, whether there's enough for them to earn. But that is looking at the one side of the coin, that is the Indian macroeconomic situation. But you'll also have to look at the global situation, whether the fund is ready to come here, or are they attractive markets outside? Despite that, if they have to come, what are the kind of things we need to do? So when the question is asked, as to what the government has to do to keep FDI consistently coming to India, you'll have to every time pitch that picture against what is developing globally. So if the global um, situation is strong, you will have to do a lot more to attract them. And if the volatility is much more there, then you know that you will naturally project your macroeconomic situation being stable and attract them. I'm telling you the larger principle. But off late, India's macroeconomic consistency has been strong, and that is why you find FDIs coming in. Discussions with fund managers, discussion with sovereign funds, all of whom come to India to ask as to what is it that they can get in into, which are the kinds of areas, and so on. So yes, the map is important, but I would think the interest in investments coming into India is at its one of the peak, peak moments, I would think, because off late, at least in the last five to six months, we've had quite a few funds coming to India to say, we are very impressed, we want to continue to be here, or we want to expand. So I would look at that as a very strong indicator that this picture will only improve and keep growing. 
विदेशी निवेश की आपने चर्चा की लेकिन देश के अंदर जो चर्चा होती है वो सबसे ज़्यादा नौकरियों को लेकर है और चुनावी वर्ष है मोदी सरकार बनने के बाद 2014 से लगभग 2021-22 तक सात लाख के आसपास सरकारी नौकरियां दी गई थी और उसके बाद से पिछले 18 महीनों में चूँकि फोकस बहुत नौकरियों पर आया आठ लाख से ज़्यादा सरकारी नौकरियाँ दी गई आपकी सरकार दावा करती है कि मुद्रा लोन बहुत दे रहे हैं उससे हम रोज़गार के साधन लोगों को प्रोवाइड कर रहे हैं फिर वो इंटर्न आगे लोगों को देंगे लेकिन विपक्ष इस बात पर घिरता है लगभग जो सरकारी आंकड़ा है कहता है साढ़े नौ से दस लाख सरकारी नौकरियां अभी भी रिक्त हैं राहुल गांधी कहते हैं कि तीस लाख सरकारी नौकरियां रिक्त हैं हम सरकार में आते ही वो देंगे वो राइट टू अप्रेंटिसशिप लॉ भी लाना चाह रहे हैं जिसमें वो एक लाख युवाओं को देंगे और लगभग साढ़े आठ हज़ार महीने ऐसे में ये कितना बड़ा चैलेंज है आपके लिए क्योंकि बेरोजगारी एक मुद्दा है जिस पर विपक्ष आपको बार बार घेरता है विपक्ष जो बार बार कह रहे हैं उनके लिए मैं एक प्रश्न उठाना चाहती हूँ जब वो राजस्थान में सरकार में थे मध्य प्रदेश में थे छत्तीसगढ़ में थे अभी कर्नाटका में भी हैं हिमाचल में भी हैं एक पायलट तो दिखाना चाहिए जैसे हिंदी में आप बोलते हैं झलक दिखाओ भाई फिर लोकसभा में हम वोट देंगे आपको कहीं कुछ नहीं करते हैं घूमते रहते हैं भारत को ये जोड़ो भारत को न्याय दिलाओ भारत को अरे भैया प्लीज इतना भी स्कैटर्ड मन के साथ ना घूमो भाई एक जगह बैठो प्लान करो व्हाट डू यू थिंक मैडम ऑफ द राइट टू अप्रेंटिसशिप एक्ट दिस इज वन ऑफ कांग्रेस इज बिग प्रोमिस दे से लाइक वी ब्रॉट मनरेगा लाइक वी ब्रॉट द फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट we now intend to bring the right to apprenticeship act given that unemployment uh, is one of the big challenges any government faces is this a workable solution what do you think of it as finance i want to ask of you rahul only when you think you have to have a right to so and so in the parliament passed is the world going to change right to food act right to the sack right no one is against rights please to ask but are you even empowered to ask for your rights so would you want to place emphasis on empowering people give them the basic facilities across the board for everybody once you bring this right and once you don't implement it which is what they did they brought all the right and kept crowing about it tell me how ineffectively they used manrega atrocious accounts came out of their time manrega being implemented and now when it is being properly implemented particularly because of the context being covid for instance they mock at you saying ha ah, there you go we brought the act and you don't even give us credit but you are using it re extreme once in a hundred year kind of a situation you use that it becomes a, you know blue book every time you want to quote when you give them enough support to empower them and they are in a position to do their own and i was very glad to hear mr puri talk about dignity and not talk about poverty what does that mean yes talk about poverty deliver on removing people from poverty but do it with dignity intact i was so glad to hear that and that's what empowering is all about and that is exactly what prime minister modi has done give houses for everybody who is in that you know below poverty line make sure they don't have to run helter skelter use technology to say wherever they are they can get their food quota and so on so right to skilling isn't that what government is doing today skilling is happening all over the country not just for you know those usual skills लेत मशीन चलाओ सुइंग मशीन चलाओ पापड़ बनाओ नो इवन ऑन ए आई इवन टू यूज टेक्नोलॉजी इमेजिन द रूरल एनवायरमेंट टूडे एंड ऑल ऑफ एस टॉक अबाउट वीमेन वीमेन्स राइट सॉरी राहुल आई लैव टू टेक अ मिनट ऑन दिस हु इज बींग ट्रेन टू यूज ड्रोन इन द विलेजेस एंड फॉर ऑल ऑफ एस हु स्पीक अबाउट जेंडर जस्टिस and for all of us who want more women's participation in labor force what is prime minister modi doing to the women in the villages they are the ones who are going to operate the drones and what drones which are going to uh, spray um, fertilizer 
which are going to measure the extent of uh, the land cultivating a certain particular crop, which is also going to look at aerially what is the health of the crop. In rural India, for women to hold those instruments and go about doing this job, does it have a big impact on the mindset itself? So you're doing things making sure that you will ensure people are trained for skills. What is this Vishwakarma Yojana? Where people who are doing their jobs with bare hands or with minimum tools, you're giving them better market access, better training them, better modern equipments, and making sure that they will get a toolkit worth 15,000 rupees, 500 rupees during the skilling, no rights act business, 500 rupees per day during the training uh, session. So you, you are able to see what impact this Vishwakarma is happening, uh, is having on the ground, and then now say, no, no, I'm bringing a right for it. No right in the parliament, no passing of any law, it's happening in the ground. Let's talk about delivering things. We put everything in the right bracket and never delivered. And we can always speak about, I've given the right, but you've not delivered. Before she became finance minister, Nirmala Sitaraman, I'm sure most of you remember, used to be a highly pugnacious spokesperson of the Bharati Janta Party. As finance minister, she puts on a more sophisticated uh, financial avatar. It's at moments like these <laughs> that uh, the political, the political boxes, the gloves come on and then she's throwing some political punches. So, thank you for that. Uh, Madam Finance Minister. I was ensuring by saying a thank you that I don't come up with one more on him. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Finance Minister, recently we got to know the identity of the donors in the electoral bonds. And as I was scrutinizing the list, there are a couple of questions that I'm sure are in the minds of everyone here. A, the fact that the BJP gets the large majority of the funding, which can be partly explained by the fact that you're the party in power and everybody wants to be with whoever they think can win. But there are two other questions. One, that the country's major corporate groups, and I don't want to name any one or two, but the big funders who you'd imagine are the ones who are spending their money because it's now through white channels, are not on that list. They're not amongst the major donors, and I'm wondering, okay, if those guys are funding, how is that money coming, and how are they funding, and why is it not through white channels? The second question, Madam Finance Minister, is this, that out of the 30 top funders, 14 corporates had some kind of investigative agency chasing them for some case, which would lead everyone sitting here to wonder whether this is some kind of a buy yourself some protection. If these agencies are chasing you, fund through the electoral bond route in the hope that you can buy yourself some protection. Now, the Modi government's promise was, we will not let this happen. No way, no crony capitalism. And yet, the data seems to be telling a story which leads to many questions, Madam Finance Minister. I think you've based yourself on huge assumptions. That the money is given after the ED raid happened. For all you know, the money was given earlier. And in spite of that, we went knocking at their doors. Am I making sense? No? <laughs> what if the companies gave the money and after that we still went and knocked at their doors through ED? Is that a probability or not? That's an assumption which Rahul has made that ED went and knocked at their doors. They wanted to save themselves and therefore they came up with the funds. One. Second assumption in that itself is are you sure that they've given it to BJP? They probably gave it to the regional parties. What makes you assume so many things and build a narrative? The government has given and the state bank has done its job as per the orders given by the state, uh, Supreme Court. Now you do any hair splitting on it, but do it without assumptions of this nature. ED, and therefore they gave you but the rest of them didn't, uh, the rest of them have given God knows to who. Which ED sent, was sent to them? And they have also given it. I think, you know, smart, hard-working research will do good rather than lazy journalism. Uh, <laughs> Finance Minister, uh, a, a, a quick follow-up on this. Uh, one, do you think uh, 
loss making firms and shell companies should be barred from political funding and the second question that is related to this is that why is there so much doubt about corporate funding don't companies and businesses if you have a right to vote we also should be having a sort of right to finance elections of our choice एक लीडिंग सवाल इससे हिंदी में भी मैं पूछ लेती हूँ आप एक साथ जवाब दे दीजिएगा कि पूरा कॉन्सेप्ट इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का ये शक पैदा करता है कि राजनीतिक उगाही यानी पॉलिटिकल एक्सटोशन का एक सिस्टम हो सकता है आ, किसी भी पार्टी के लिए आई एम नॉट रूलिंग आउट रीजनल पार्टीज और कांग्रेस और बीजेपी एनी किसी के लिए भी पूरा इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का जो कॉन्सेप्ट ही है वो पोलिटिकल उगाही के लिए मौका देता है क्या ये सही नहीं है अंजना जी मैं सिर्फ एक बार विस्तार से ये विषय बोलना चाह रही हूँ एंड ऑल्सो एड्रेसिंग योर सिद्धार्थ योर क्वेश्चन इससे पहले क्या था मैं फुली कॉन्शियस हूँ कि ये मामला कोर्ट में अभी भी चालू है चल रही है वर्डिक्ट इज कम एस बी आई इज गॉट बी सबमिटिंग इट इज सबमिटेड मगर विषय इसमें एक प्रश्न मेरे मन में आता है क्या इससे पहले जो सिस्टम था वो हंड्रेड परसेंट परफेक्ट था क्या नहीं एंड लेट एस लेट एस जस्ट रिकॉल व्हाट माय प्रेडिसेसर व्हेन ही ब्रॉट दिस इलेक्ट्रल बॉन्ड्स अरुण जेटली जी सेड इज इट उससे बेहतर है भाई कम से कम पैसा जो पार्टियों को चलता है वो अकाउंट के द्वारा चलने दो That is why electoral bonds monies are going into the accounts from account to parties account. So, कम से कम जो party तक पहुंचता है पैसा कोई भी party क्यों ना हो वो white पहुंचता है It's not a perfect system, but you moved from almost a wild uh, law into oneself kind of a situation. where everybody did what they wanted so we moved from that to the system this is certainly not perfect but one bit better now that's not it fine in the wisdom of supreme court they thought this is not the way to go about it sorry all right is se better system aane tak abhi kya hum wapas usi zamane par chale gaye hain ki jo marzi kar sakte hain कैश में दो चेक में दो कुछ में दो कुछ और में दो वगैरह आई एम नॉट क्रिटिसाइजिंग द सुप्रीम कोर्ट्स जजमेंट बट इट इज एन एनालिसिस विच रन इन माई माइंड एंड आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ अस थिंकिंग अबाउट इट सो अ सिस्टम विच वॉज नॉट परफेक्ट फ्रॉम अ सिस्टम विच वॉज कंप्लीटली इम परफेक्ट वॉज ब्रॉट इन कॉन्शियसली ब्रॉट इन सेम एट लीस्ट वन एस्पेक्ट ऑफ इट विल बी क्लीनर well it's not approved by the supreme court all right so therefore abhi hamara prayatn ye hona chahiye kam se kam isse bahut sare sikna like hai ki abhi jo kanoon jab bhi hoga hoga ki nahi hoga i am not commenting on it it's not a headline for rahul to say finance minister said the new government there will be new. i'm not saying anything i am only saying if at all whenever something comes we have to introduce elements of lessons that we've taken from this to make sure there is a transparency that transparency will have to be progressively better than each earlier system madam finance minister we are coming to the and yeah sorry yes siddharth you are right why not if corporates can fund they can fund but of course under which scheme of things which law all that will have to be worked out nobody is saying no parties cannot be funded but, but loss making and uh, shell ha, companies yes there are issues on those sort of things which of course will have to be looked into you can't afford to have shell companies or you know loss making companies that's a very valid point madam finance minister we are coming to the close of the first session of the india today conclave and before we end i have one final question you know when we spoken to you at the peak of the crypto hype you said you don't believe in the crypto asset that this is pure speculation i just want to call this visualization which goes back a few years looks at the crash which is when a lot of people sitting here would have imagined that the crypto story is over this was speculation this is like tulips this was never real and then wala 
the cockroach bounces back. Now, when you look at this chart now, more and more serious traders and firms are looking at crypto as an asset, saying if it survived so many falls, there is some underlying resilience, which even if doesn't make sense simplistically, but obviously is there, which is why it's kind of bounced back. And now, given the fact that crypto supply is also coming down, in the context of how market fundamentals are moving at this moment, is that leading the government also potentially to reassess its position on cryptos? Reassess its position. Its position has always been this, that assets created in the name of crypto can be assets for trading, assets for speculation, assets for money making, assets for many other things. We hadn't regulated them then, we haven't regulated them even now. But they cannot be currencies is what I've always held and that's the government of India position also. Currencies are to be issued with the fiat of the government or the central bank of the day. So that is a different story. So if they're coming back, there's resurgence, that is the asset which is being created for speculation or for trading or for whatever purpose. And it is still unregulated in India. And that is why we thought it fit to raise it in the G20 forum, because as it is so technology driven, and it will have a bearing on cross-border payments and so on. If one country regulates and others don't, it will be an easy way of moving money uh, round tripping or funding drugs or even terrorism and so on. So we wanted to create a kind of a framework by taking it to the level of G20. It has been very well received and I'm sure there will be some framework emerging. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of the first session of the India Today Conclave. One of the critiques, frankly, of the state of India's democratic play at this moment is the allegation that ministers in the government don't take tough questions and that journalists don't ask tough questions. I think the first session of the conclave should whip your appetite and give you the sense that Madam Finance Minister didn't have anything about what to ask, what not to ask, questions that could potentially be asked, were asked, and she answered them, throwing a few punches as bravely as was possible. Thank you very much. We appreciate the candor Thank and we appreciate much. your presence. Madam Finance Minister, can we have a round of applause for Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman for setting the tone and the stage for this, the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. Thank you, Nirmala Ji. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we raise a warm applause for the Honourable Minister, ma'am, would you stay up on stage for just a minute? Ma'am, ma'am, just one minute if you could stay up on stage and accept a small token of our appreciation. I'd like to call upon uh, Executive Editor-in-Chief, Vice Chairperson, the India Today Group, Ms. Kali Puri, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to the Honourable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause for Union Minister Finance Corporate Affairs Nirmala Sitaraman. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for coming up on stage, taking our questions. Appreciated. Thirty seconds to turn around the stage and we are ready to power into our second session this morning, day two of the India Today Conclave, our 21st edition, ladies and gentlemen. Our theme this year, Brand Bharat, an assertive nation in an uncertain world. We are tweeting on social media under the hashtag India Today Conclave 24. 
At lunch, you can step out, take a little picture at our photo booth outside Shah Jahan Hall. We will have two breakaway sessions this afternoon starting 12.30 p.m. And our second session, 4.30 p.m. In case you're interested, 12.30 p.m., Threats and Opportunities, India and the Indo-Pacific. That would be in Mumtaz Mehel. For those of you a little intrigued on who exactly is Indrani Mukherjee, after watching the India Today production, Buried Truth, the Indrani Mukherjee story, you can join us and actually see her in person and maybe ask a few questions for 30 p.m. at Mumtaz Mehel. Mumtaz Hall. Let's take you now to our second session of the day, India's Resilience Amidst Global Turmoil, Truth versus Reality. This session is sponsored by the RP Sanjeev Goenka Group. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please settle down, get yourself a seat. We're ready to go into our second session. You don't want to quite miss it. Would urge all of you who are making their way out, believe me, it's a session you'd like to watch. Do come in, find yourself a seat, settle down, ready to power in to our next session this morning. Inviting on stage Rahul Kaval, News Director, TV Today Network, Managing Editor, Special Online Projects and Executive Director, Business Today. Could I request everyone to just settle down and then we can start because if everyone's kind of moving, it's disrespectful to the next set of speakers. So if you stop speaking to each other and just settle down, if you really need to speak, if you step out, it just kind of makes things more settled. Thank you. The government of India strongly claims that uh, the Indian economy at this moment is marching confidently towards becoming the third largest economy in the next few years. It could happen in 28, 29, 30, but that this is India's moment and that because of the policy moves over the past 10 years, India has been set on a very firm path of growth. Now, how much of that is the new reality? And how much of that is hype where we need to be wary of the big numbers and look below the bonnet as it were. To talk about this, we are joined by two distinguished economists. Can I have a very warm round of applause as I welcome Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, special in many ways also because he's come down specially from the United States for this. So we really appreciate that. And we've got Dr. Shamika Ravi joining us as well. So can we have a very, very warm round of applause uh, for them and for their presence at the conclave. I want to start by getting Dr. Subramaniam to explain what is it that makes you wary at this moment. You know, we heard from the finance minister, we heard from the prime minister, they're painting a very bullish picture. And a lot of Indians, frankly, think that the Indian economy is moving in the right direction. When, as a well-wisher, you look at the India economic story, Dr. Subramaniam, what makes you most wary, anxious and concerned? Well, uh, thanks, Rahul. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here and uh, to be with uh, Shamika on this uh, panel. Um, f first of all, uh, let me begin with a prefatory remark, uh, Rahul, that, you know, I in some ways, we're only having this, you know, is it hype or reality? Because there is a reality, a substantive number of achievements that the government has made, which we're well aware of. Uh, you know, the, 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 the old saying is, the best lie is one which is closest to the truth. Uh, so we're only having the reality hype thing because there is a lot of reality. And, and in fact, I do want to speak about some of the lesser known, you know, early signs of success, if I may, can I, can I, yeah? So, so I think on the plus side, you know, we've all seen, uh, uh, you know, the build up of the physical infrastructure, you know, the digital revolution in India, uh, you know, the, the prime minister's new welfareism, providing goods to uh, people, uh, you know, and, and the banking system has become more robust, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I see one or two, early signs 
of things that have never happened before, which kind of give me a little bit of, uh, you know, extra optimism, as it were. Uh, the first thing, uh, of course, is that we see now, especially in some of the southern states, uh, you're seeing a revival of manufacturing in a way that we never saw before. And I think what is particularly interesting about uh, these developments is that you're seeing factories coming up at scale, employing 5, 10, 15, 20,000 workers, which we never saw before. And I think that's very encouraging, uh, the kind of scale. Uh, the second very uh, encouraging sign, of course, is if we can put up that chart on the, uh, you know, uh, the services exports, how India is actually actually gaining global market share. And it's, it's a very different kind. India has in some ways diversified and gone upscale from the first, you know, the IT revolution, you know, Dr. Nairamurti's year, uh, and you will see we had a first wave uh, in the early 2000s, India's global export market share rose, and now we're seeing, uh, no, I think this is the wrong, <laughs> Oh, yeah, the high skills one. And you can see now a second wave, you know, the global capability centers and so on. So I think there are some new things that are happening, early signs, which I think give. Having said that, let me turn to your question. Uh, what do I, I kind of find uh, uh, somewhat challenging and difficult to understand and worrying also? First of all, I, I want to be honest with you that the latest GDP numbers, uh, I, I just simply cannot understand them. I say that with genuine, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, respect uh, and things. They, they're absolutely mystifying. They don't add up. Uh, I, I don't know what they mean. Uh, so uh, because of that, I look at some of the other indicators. Uh, at what's happening. In the Why economy. aren't you believing the government's growth numbers? If you want me to launch into some of the details, I'm ha happy to. Uh, but essentially, you know, the numbers don't add up. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, you know, the implied inflation in these numbers is one to one and a half percent. Actual inflation in the economy is somewhere between three and five percent. The economy is growing at seven and a half percent, even though private consumption is at three percent. And in the latest data, the errors and omissions, the uh, you know, what is not accounted for, actually, it's about 4.3 percentage points out of the 7.6. So it's a lot of stuff about the numbers which, you know, I don't understand. I'm not saying these are wrong or these are right. That's for others to judge. I just don't understand them. That's why I want to look at some of the other indicators. And to me, the two or three big indicators are, you know, we keep hearing that the economy has become a very good place to invest in. You showed earlier the chart on foreign direct investment, right? Uh, which, by the way, in the last uh, few uh, quarters and last few years, can we sh uh, put up the number again? It's actually declined very sharply. Then on top of that, if you look at the overall private, see, if you look at this, uh, the white line here, you can see the foreign direct investment actually collapsed quite a bit. So the question is that if this China plus one opportunity has been created, why isn't more coming in? And by the way, just to uh, uh, elaborate on that, it's not just that India's FDI is coming down as a share of GDP. India's share of global FDI going to emerging markets has has also come down. So the question is, if India has become such an attractive place, why isn't there more foreign direct investment? And even more important, if you can put up the chart on private investment, corporate investment, that's well, uh, I hope we can put it up, that's well below levels in 2016 and way below levels when we had our boom in the early 2000s. So the puzzling question is, why isn't investment, you know, routinely we hear captains of industry coming and praising the economy. It's as if they're saying one thing in public, but actually you don't see the numbers in the data at all. So you've set the stage for this debate and I want to get Dr. Shamika Ravi, who works closely with the government of the day to respond to some of this. One, the assertion that a lot of uh, economists seem to have, or some economists seem to have, that the, that the government is pay, painting a rosier picture than the reality, and that uh, India Inc., for various reasons, may say certain things in public, but look at their private investment numbers. Those numbers tell their own story. So don't go by what they're saying, see by what their balance sheets are saying in terms of how much they're investing. Dr. Ravi. So first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's always wonderful to be back at this forum. Um, now, the way Arvind and I look at the world and the economy are very different. 
he is a macroeconomist, he looks at uh, macro indicators. I really go to the economy with a lens, and I'm a micro, I'm an applied microeconomist. If you look at the FDI numbers that were put up, they were as a percentage of the GDP. Now GDP, your GDP is, you are the major, fastest major economy, and you have remained so for some time now. So there are two variables that are in that. It's the FDI and then there is the GDP, right? And you're really looking at the share of that. What has been done right now, it is like an accounting exercise, and I think that's valuable in itself, but I think an economic insight would be to really go a little deeper into that to figure out, are we becoming more efficient at using the FDI, perhaps? Because it's been now many years, many decades of, uh, uh, you know, these flows. So I think you need a little more nuanced sort of a look into some of this to understand what is happening to the FDI and the efficiency of the FDI that is coming into the economy. That's number one. As far as the, the private investments are concerned, you see, I think it's very important to be honest amongst each other that, you know, in some ways, the state of India, by which I mean the government, the judiciary, etc., etc., because it takes all, everyone has to play ball for this growth story and, uh, you know, this, this to unfold. Since 2012, you have had such tremendous shocks in the form of whether it was the retrospective tax, whether it was institutions basically annulling allocations which were legit as well as illegal, but even legit ones after 20 years of growth, these, I don't know if one recognizes that these are body blows to private confidence. And it has taken us about a decade. You are beginning to see a growth in the last few quarters in private investment. But that's, that is the long-term impact of some of these absolutely uh, disastrous policies that we witnessed uh, under the UPA2 regime, unfortunately. Which is why, you know, we look at measures which are irrefutable, Rahul. Just me, I'm not going to argue base year kya hai, deflator me we are going to quibble. I'm going to therefore measure and look at, which is what I have been publishing, look at satellite data, daytime satellite data. Okay, so let's do that. So we worked with Dr. Ravi's office and there are two visualizations we'll show you. One is the uh, annualized growth rate of built up surfaces across parliamentary constituencies. So you see what happened from 2010 to 2015 and then you will see what happened from 15 to 20. So what this argues is wherever the, uh, wherever the color is darker, the darker suggests that the growth of built up surface areas is higher. The lighter no, color... No, no, Rahul, you have, uh, you have the luxury of me being here. Let me explain my research. You see, this is, this is daytime satellite image at a resolution of 10 meter into 10 meter. Can you imagine how accurate it is? It's not Indian data. It's not government of India's data. This is the European Commission having spent billions of dollars. This data is now put up. And you have this at the parliamentary constituency because that is what we focused on. But you have it also at a sub-district level. What you're seeing is, and this is built up area, built up area is an incredibly useful proxy or an indicator to look at what is the economic activity at a ground level. And built up surface is not just infrastructure, by the way, which is the government side of the story. This is residential, this is non-residential, this is all kinds of construction and building that is happening, all kinds of building. What you notice, and these are every five years, is you have an 18% increase in this measure or economic activity since 15, right? In fact, if you compare this with UPA 1, because you can go back, these are five yearly epochs, you're seeing that that difference is almost 30%. But beyond just looking at the average, because all India statistics that macroeconomists look at, it's a national GDP, national FDI, I'm telling you where is the growth happening? So this kind of an approach to economy and so I'm very I'm curious now to get Dr. Subramanian to respond to it because the argument that's playing out here, one is a micro lens at what's happening on the ground, the other is a more macro 30,000 uh, feet view. Now, she spoke of efficiency, that whatever money is coming in internationally is used more efficiently with lesser uh, corruption and whatever the government is also spending is more efficiently and therefore the multiplier effect is higher. The second is that look at, for example, and she's just given one data point about, say, built up areas, which was on the ground, there is economic activity at a speed higher than at any time in the past, Dr. Simone. Uh, yeah, uh, f firstly, you know, I don't want to turn it into a no. kind of a dry uh, kind of academic debate that may not be very interesting for the audience. Uh, I, I mean, just to look at 
all this in terms of parliamentary constituencies is a bit odd for me because, you know, uh, change takes place as a result of actions by the central government, by the state government, and so on. So it, it, to make the parliamentary constituency, it's as if saying that all the relevant policy actions are being taken at the constituency level, when in fact that's you know, kind of not the case, you know, these things. Second, I think, is that even if I'm reading your number right for the, uh, the second, uh, for the growth rate for, for 2015 to 2020, it's something like three, three and a half percent per year. That's not what was being claimed, seven, eight percent. And the third thing I, I would really urge all of us is that, you know, I, I don't want to get into this, you know, UPA did this, NDA did this, because as I wrote in a piece recently, that whatever the achievements and the failures we've had over the last 10, 15 years, are cumulative and bipartisan. You know, uh, anything that we've done, you know, take for example, uh, the jam trinity, for which this government deserves a lot of credit. I mean, the seeds were sowed earlier in the previous government. Uh, and I can go on and on. I think it's not very interesting to say, you know, this happened in this point and that happened and therefore we get into political bickering uh, rather than saying, what does the government need? You know, are we on the right path? What are the deficiencies and so on? So let's spend a moment on that because the one other big debate at this moment is around manufacturing and whether India is indeed becoming a manufacturing, I wouldn't say powerhouse, but a manufacturing center. Are we benefiting adequately from the China plus one pivot in global supply chains? And whether we are doing whatever is possible or is the opportunity really being captured by countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico and the others? So I want you, Dr. Subramanian, to first begin by highlighting what you think are the problems with government schemes like production link incentives, the Make in India, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, all of which sound like the right thing to do. And they are. Are they working in your view? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Rahul. So let me, uh, can we put up the chart on manufacturing, please, our uh, global uh, export market share? So I think we're doing very well in services and the Global Capability Center. And it's true that we have uh, launched all these schemes. But if you look at manufacturing, for example, our, our global uh, uh, share in low-skill manufacturing exports, which is apparel, etc. Um, a, look at the levels. It's like 2.7%. China's for this would be something like 40% of, of the, uh, the global share of exports. And as someone said, global uh, thing. Uh, and, uh, and again, remember, this is not a failure of this government alone. This is a cumulative failure. And as you can see, uh, while it's come down from the peaks of the uh, mid 2000s, uh, our level has been uniformly low. So this is a, a, an endemic problem in India, but it's not that we're making significant progress on that. Our, if anything, our global market share has come down. So the question to ask ourselves is, you know, uh, what do we need to do? Because make no mistake. No, but that's one way of looking at it. The other is a lot of manufacturing that's now beginning to happen in India is happening also because of the size of the Indian domestic market and is coming in largely because they think they can, this, India is a big enough market to manufacture for India, apart from what may get So, so I, I think, uh, Rahul, th this is something that we really need to disabuse ourselves of, that we are a big market we are not a very big market. So uh, let me give you some numbers. Uh, let's say India's GDP is something like two and a half, three trillion dollars, okay? Uh, uh, and if you look at what is the middle class market share of that, uh, I would say it's about, uh, about 750 billion to, you know, about 40 to 45% of that. That's the middle class consumption market. You compare that with the global economy, it's 20, 30 trillion. So it's, I think we are making the mistake now of thinking that we can grow based on the domestic market, which I think is a fatal uh, error of judgment. Because no country in the post-war period, and let me re no successful country in the post-war period, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, 
ever achieved uh, 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 you know seven eight percent growth without fifteen percent growth uh, in manufacturing exports, and you cannot get that from the domestic market. Doctor, we do you want to weigh in on this this argument that yes, there is some manufacturing activity, but the base is very low. And when I spoke to Doctor Agarwal Rajan at Davos, he made the same argument that your base is so low to show some growth on a very low basis, just aiming for too little. We must aim for much higher because that's the appetite the government claims it has, and therefore we are getting carried away and excited by very small wins. We are not playing the big game. If you look at the big global picture, it's Mexico, it's Vietnam, it's countries like that. Those are the true beneficiaries of the China plus one pivot. But that's again Rahul, uh, and I agree with Arvind when he says there's a continuum. It's not like the country became totally different in 2014. You know, when I moved to Delhi in 2013, it was accepted wisdom in Delhi circuits of public policy that India has missed the manufacturing bus. And I bet most of you who have been reading anything on government policy in manufacturing, you must have come across this phrase. India has missed the manufacturing bus. Now, do you? And some people continue to say that it is so naive because you are assuming that we are going to do exactly what China did, or that is the growth model. You know, the whole world is growing. It's not just the OECD. Your Latin America is growing. Africa is growing. The rest of Asia is growing. And as these parts of the world grow. the demand for simple manufacturing shirts shoes books pens bottles everything around you these are not high tech that whole demand will continue to grow there are buses and buses coming the point is now we are on to a bus finally so we have had to reorient the thinking not just at the central but i must say across the states to say that manufacturing is a very important now we are also in a very different world today than we were 10 years back Do you know how much China spends on industrial policy? 1.7 percent of its GDP. Do you know that is more than what they spend on their defence? Do you realise the strategic importance of government and industrial policy and what is happening in the world today? You have to respond to that. So to think that we are going to make a switch from agriculture, unskilled, semi-skilled, whatever, to services, and that is going to be oh no, I'm sorry, that is just not going to happen in an economy where you have 600 million. Workforce, right? So, so I think that's that's an important way to look at it. By you want to make a quick interjection? No, uh, 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 I, I think uh, Shamika makes a, a really important point, which is why, you know, uh, I think it's uh, uh, worth. Uh, but I, I kind of got a bit confused. But remember that the the services boom that we are witnessing today, that can produce dynamism. it cannot produce inclusive growth because by definition global capability center services provide good employment for 1 2 3% <laughs> of the workforce so if you need inclusive growth and i think that's what shamika was saying that we need to do you know the the shoes the textiles the apparel etc etc where i think shamika is also absolutely right is that but this window is not open forever because of stuff like you know artificial intelligence robots etc just to give you one example no but can i just challenge you to say that that's much easier said than done look at what she's saying that we weren't even we were just standing at the bus stop the buses were going past now we got into some kind of a bus okay the bus isn't moving with as much speed as sure but these were on a bus earlier we weren't even on the manufacturing bus what no, do you think Rahul, the, the bus is moving doing, dr subramaniam yeah. which they are Like what is it that you say? Okay, they really ought to be doing this, which they aren't. Uh, so uh, uh, l- l- let me give you a couple of uh, uh, responses on that. I-, I think that what uh, the government needs to do. Take the PLI for example, right? Uh, the PLI, as you, if you look at the numbers, it's very tilted towards uh, you know uh, skill-intensive, capital-intensive sectors. Uh, we should, I mean, building on what Shamika said, we should be building on that to really promote you know uh, the the leather, the footwear, the textiles, the clothing, etc., etc. And uh, in Tamil Nadu, for example, and and Karnataka, that's happening to some extent. But we should be wooing global investors. in those sectors that are going to produce a lot why don't we do that yeah why is it more towards semiconductors chips oh it's telecom. across the board rahul it's across the board in fact uh, the point is was it limited to parliamentary constituents you know that's the shape file that you had so we put it out that analysis is at a district level where an administration runs is at a sub district level where your taluk or your blocks are run and when you look at that analysis you are seeing that the biggest growth and construction by the way is a very important part of the economy the real estate etc 
you have had the biggest growth since 15 in the smallest or the least developed parts of your country. So when, when we are talking about inclusive growth, it means regional, uh, you know, okay. sort of so variation. So this is such a fascinating yes, yes. In response to your question, I think the question that all of us should confront about government policy, it's done a lot of good things. Uh, I would make a distinction between hardware, where the government has done very well, versus the software. And, you know, subsidies, good, you're trying it, etc. You still don't see any outcomes. I think the, the heart, uh, you know, we should examine ourselves. Is there something about government policy that is creating a level playing field for all investors or not? Or is it the case that some, uh, uh, so some, let me come to some that are favored over other no, so let me come to arbitrary that. action, uh, uh, you know, th the sense that you are safe, that there won't be arbitrary action, that some, uh, you know, uh, houses will not be favored or others. Otherwise, I cannot understand why, despite the hardware being done, despite the banking system being cleaned up, despite the China plus one opportunity, our private investment is stuck. So you think it's because they're fearful of vindictive action? I, I, that's a question I'd like to pose. So let Shamika Ravi respond to this, because we're also at the end of this debate, and this is such a fascinating economic conversation. I could go on all night with this. But this assertion that the reason that private investment isn't coming in, given where we are in uh, the utilization cycle, is because you know, they won't tell you on the face, and they won't say this at the India Day conclave, but privately they are fearful that some corporate groups are benefiting, that you say you've ended crony capitalism, but that is not really correct because if it wasn't and if India Inc. wasn't fearful, at this stage of our utilization cycle, there would be more investment in all kinds of activity. So first of all, the PLIs are working in sectors that they are working and cell phone is an example. So let's not sweepingly say PLIs are not working. An important thing to remember is that in the current global environment with every country, major countries now doing a make in X great again or make in the US or make in Germany, etc. You have to have a policy where manufacturing in India, make in India, etc. is a priority. That's number one. So you have to do it. It's of strategic importance. The second is, are they fearful? Well, that's another uh, myth. And I'm actually surprised you call it truth versus uh, reality, as if the reality is uh, untrue. I mean, the point is, you know, in the recent, if you look at the last few quarters, you've had an uptick. And that's what I'm trying to tell you, that the death blows that came in the form of retrospective or the coal allocations, etc. It takes a while to build confidence. And you know, unlike most countries, where major capex by the government crowds out private investment, Rahul, India is one country that has never followed that average path. If you look at the data of the last 50 years, in India, growing capital expenditure by the government always crowds in private investment. So it's a matter of when you're seeing the economy grow, the way I have shown you, at least in terms of things that are irrefutable, private investment follows with a certain lag, right? And it is happening. Okay. Is it happening everywhere is the question. But PLI, also we have to have a scientific approach to it. It's not working everywhere, but it's working in sectors. That there's a trial and error about policy as well. So we're not going to randomly scale up in sectors where because we do not have 1.7% of GDP of the size of China to throw at industry, and that's the real competition that you're up against. So, so, uh, around one We're last, out of time. Okay, uh, very briefly. See, the, the other thing that worries me, and it, it kind of uh, something that uh, Arun mentioned at the beginning and something that you said as well, is that I, I think one is, uh, one worries about government action. You know, is it being consistent? Is it being fair? Is it being arbitrary? Is that the reason? The other uh, thing that worries me is that, fine, we're giving subsidies. I think that we have turned inward once again in terms of our tariff policy, in terms of restrictions, uh, 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 and so on. So the question, bigger question for Indian policymakers is, I mean, we say, and I agree with that, that we want to conquer the world because that's where the jobs are, the manufacturing is, but our orientation is once again come inward. Are these two consistent is something that I would like to pose for the audience. So we're out of time on this session and this is truly a fascinating conversation because answering some of these questions is central to where we end up 
in 2030. And Dr. Subramaniam is here, and hopefully some of you who've come in for the conclave can have conversations with him on the sidelines. I want to thank Shamika Ravi and Dr. Subramaniam for joining us. We're like radiologists doing an X-ray. You can see what the X-ray is telling you now, whether it is because there is fear or because there was the pandemic and retrospective tax, you know, trying to clear that up, so the lung is being cleared. now. What's the reason? Everyone has their own theory, but this has been a very fascinating conversation. And Rahul, I'm I do think you should spend a moment, because you didn't, is that you know what the government has accomplished in the last 10 years in terms of targeting the bottom two quintiles, which is the saturation, basic amenities, you didn't put up those graphs, but you know 50% of the bottom 20% had electricity. Today that number is above 90, right? Same for toilets, drinking water. You should view what is happening in India today as something that happened in the US in the 1940s post the war. You are expanding basic amenities to all citizens everywhere in the country because this is the foundation for long-term sustainable economic growth. So it's not just, let's try make an India today, let's try services, no. You have to have a 100-year vision of what exactly will it take to unleash eventually human capital, people make nations, people build countries, and that is the effort. Sure. Can we have a warm round of applause for Dr. Shamika Ravi and Dr. Arvind Subramanyam? You know, it's very nice to have these genteel but sophisticated, high-quality economic debates. I'm very thankful for your time. Thank you for making Ladies the effort. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for put your hands us. together, request both, uh, both uh, Ms. Ravi and uh, Mr. Subramanian to stay on stage. So, so do stay on stage as I do, as I call upon Joyanil Mukherjee, Executive uh, Director, RP Sanjeev Goenka Group, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to our esteemed panelists. Once again, do raise a warm applause for Arvind Subramaniam and Shamika Ravi. Thank you, Ms. Ravi. Thank you, Mr. Subramaniam. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, allow us about 20 seconds turnaround time and we are ready to power into our next session this afternoon. And it's a session you don't quite want to miss if you were completely enthralled with the Ram Mandir inauguration. Because we'll have with us next the man who sculpted the Murti that has practically all of India in ruptures. To take it from here and uh, to introduce you to our guest, take you through our next session, Sculpting Faith, Bringing Stone to Life. This session has been sponsored by Gujarat Tourism. Calling on stage, Gaurav Savant, Managing Editor, Strategic Affairs and Defense, India Today TV, to take it from here. विद्रुम से अरुण अधर बोलत मुख मधुर मधुर सुभग नासिका में चारू लटकत लटकनिया ठुमक चलत रामचंद्र बाजत पैजनिया गोस्वामी तुलसीदास पेंटेड अ वर्ड पिक्चर about Baal Shri Ram and that's been etched in our collective conscience in our memories for generations for centuries but to carve that in stone for the next not just generations or centuries but for millennia that miracle that marvel i have arun yogi raj ji here with us and he did that tapasya and those eyes that you see those eyes look into your soul arun ji ye kaise kiya aapne how did you do this chamatkar that those eyes have just come so alive. Uh, first of all, I would like to give credit to my, our ancestors. 
this is all the beauty and the strength of our Shilpa Shastra. Uh, again, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm born in a family where uh, we are doing sculpting from past five generations. That knowledge transfer really helped me to bring this divinity in the eyes. There is a process called Netro Milan. It was written by our ancestors earlier, centuries ago. There, we will be carving not only this idol, every idol which will get Pranapadishtha and will be carved in a silver hammer and golden chisel. The same thing, no, I followed the same thing here. And uh, so many people are asking me about the, that glitterness in the eyes. After completing uh, Netro Milan, we have a Dhyana Sloka and Bijakshara, uh, we'll write a Bijakshara on the eyes. After that, we felt that there is a small uh, uh, hurt happened to eyes, to heal that. I just, not, it's not my idea, it's our ancestral given uh, uh, written things and uh, we applied a ghee and honey so that that day uh, the whole nation you know, connected through eyes because of that our ancestral given uh, solution, you know, uh, given procedures of eyes. And when this was being done, we were, we were told that there was a Shubh Muhurt that was taken out uh, precisely of 20 minutes, that the eyes had to be made in 20 minutes and there was a tapasya that you did, there was a ritual that you followed hmm. before you used that um, go golden, golden chisel and silver hammer hmm. to make these divine eyes, sir. Sir, Amko Ganesh uh, uh, Sapati, Ganesh Acharya Ji ne kaha tha. So, Arun, the 20 minutes enough for you to sculpt the eyes. And I told him, ah, ah Guruji, this is enough for me to carve. And he told me some rituals uh, to follow. One, uh, he told me to take bath in the Saryu Nadi in the early morning. And he told, take the blessings of Hanuman. And also, do puja in Kanak Bhavan. Later, you do the eye opening part. And he, appoint, he given me murtam and uh, exactly 20 minutes. That is one of the uh, most te no, tense and very, uh, I can say, both both tension tha, kyunki I might know, I know so many types of eyes. Wo das se zyada mein tarika se aag bana sakte hai. Magar selecting one in the ten, both uh, difficult tha and, uh, and again I always believe that uh, Bhagwan will help me and he will get it through me. So then uh, I did a small prayer, you know, puja to my Kula Devata and, uh, and I took the blessings of our Kula Devata and I sculpted this uh, ice in 20 minutes. Just 20 minutes. <laughs> One. By the way, Bhagwan Shiv ki ye, ye vigraha ban ke tayar hoga aur aapke saamne, in front of you, he'll sculpt those eyes right here as we continue talking mm. and uh, there, there is a specific way that mm. you do this uh, to, to make the eyes, that, that hammer, the chisel, the mm. prayer mm. and I believe you used to talk to uh, Lord Ram uh, for inspiration. Sir, uh, what, what is our thought process? Our, what is our reflection of our soul is our art. What we want is that it मैं वही चाहता था हम पूरा देश से आने वाला आ, मा, माता पिता गांव से आने वाला माता पिता हमारा एज का एवरीवन शुड एटलीस्ट फील द दर्शन ऑफ राम लल्ला दिस इज व्हाट माय थॉट प्रोसेस व्हेन आई स्टार्टेड स्कल्पटिंग फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट डे एंड दैट टाइम इट्स अ इट्स अ ह्यूज ह्यूज रिस्पांसिबिलिटी बिकॉज़ वी नो दैट द होल नेशन इज वेटिंग फॉर दिस and and as a you know as a normal human being i'm not able to take this pressure so uh, to reduce my pressure i always believe that it is not my work he will get it through me so maine aise hi baat karna shuru kiya because i spend most of the time with a stone bar ki duniya se bahut kam rehta hu kyunki patthar se bahut zyada bitata hu aur kabhi kabhi aapko bore ho jata hai so i fight i show my anger and my love and my expression, everything is for me stone from past 25 years. So this is what I did. I was talking to Lala, 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 I was 
so this type of interaction i keep always having with with whatever the work i'm doing aur ramlala ne aapki lekin pariksha bhi bahut li kyunki bahut kam log ye jante hain ki jab aapne banana shuru kiya vigrah ko and i think you already worked 3 uh, months uh, on yes, it yes and there was a flaw in that stone and that idol that stone was rejected yes what happened then sir uh, i started sculpting in the month of june and uh, at the time of august i almost completed 70% of the work aur mishra ji ne phone kiya arun delhi aa jao i thought uh, main to bahut acha kaam kar raha hu wo shayad aur badi kaam dega mere ko <laughs> so uh, i arrived delhi and uh, uh, mishra ji told arun out of eight test there is one report coming out negative हम इस पत्थर से आगे हम नहीं जा सकते एंड ई टोल्ड वी आर आंसरेबल फॉर द नेशन एंड यू आर अ यंग बॉय यू हैव टू मंथ्स मोर टाइम आई थिंक यू कैन डू द न्यू वन विद इन अ मिनट नॉट इवन अ मिनट लेस देन अ मिनट आई अग्रीड एंड आई स्टार्टेड द न्यू स्कल्पचर मूर्ति का निर्माण मैंने सेप्टेम्बर में शुरू किया सो इवन आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो हेल्प विथ दैट अभी एक नेगेटिव रिपोर्ट आ गया सो इवन आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू वर्क ऑन दैट अगेन सो परीक्षा तो बहुत लिया है लेकिन टेंशन भी बहुत हुआ क्योंकि उस दिन मैंने सुना है कि आप बहुत बहुत दुखी थे कि अब कैसे होगा कंपटीशन भी था yes. तीन तीन विग्रह बन रहे थे तीन अलग अलग मूर्तियां बन रही थी yes. और ऐसा भी चांस था कि ये कृष्ण शिला डार्क स्टोन विच वॉज फाइनली सेलेक्टेड दैट में भी रिजेक्टेड एंड मार्बल में भी चोजन सो ये बहुत डिफिकल्ट टाइम एट दैट डे बिकॉज हम मैं तो हाँ कह दिया एक मिनट के अंदर बाद में एक एक टेंशन शुरू हो गया कि हम आई एम वेरी क्लोज लाइक आई एम वन एम ऑन थ्री दिस इज द बिगेस्ट अपॉर्चुनिटी ऑफ माई लाइफ एंड मेरे साथ ऐसा क्यों हो गया सो बहुत डिप्रेशन में था आई आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक चंपत राय जी एट दैट टाइम ई रियलाइज दैट ये लड़का डिप्रेशन में जाएगा सो ई लेफ्ट एवरी थिंग एंड ई केम बैक एंड ही हैग मी फॉर एटलीस्ट टेन मिनट्स ई स्टार्ट टाइपिंग ऑन माई शोल्डर हिम्मत मत आ रो भगवान परी चलेगा so that word again i just regrouped all my energy and you know main hazar photo save kiya tha to take the references usme mera kaam pichle kya kiya tha do 10 photos add kiya kyunki i would like to get my confidence back aur mera photos bhi dekhne shuru kiya ha main pehle kaam kiya hai kyunki us waqt maine bhul raha tha main kuch kiya hai it was so you no know, heartbroken thing happened at that time I have to get my confidence back. इसलिए मेरा काम पिछले क्या किया था वो भी फोटोज देखना शुरू किया मैंने एंड ऑल्सो अगेन वनवास हमारा राम को नहीं छोड़ा हमको सामान्य मनुष्य है ये ये कभी हिम्मत नहीं हारनी चाहिए और ये भी था कि हो है वही जो राम रच राखा तो वट एवर हैपन्स विल 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 बी गुड विल बी पॉजिटिव इज वॉट योर थिंकिंग वॉज लेकिन एक एक परीक्षा आपकी और हुई थी तो मैंने आ, आपकी पत्नी विजेता जी का भी इंटरव्यू किया था मैं लगातार एक महीने से अयोध्या में था उस समय और उन्होंने मुझे बताया एंड आई थिंक शी टीयर्स इन राइज व्हेन शी सेड अपेरेंटली यू हैड अ मेजर आई इंजरी व्हेन यू वाज स्कल्प्टिंग दिस पीपल नो दिस यस स्टोन स्कल्प्टिंग इट्स ऑलवेज ए लाइफ रिस्क वर्क बिकॉज बिकॉज दिस डेज बहुत पत्थर तो बहुत हार्ड था वील टेक द हेल्प ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी लाइक कटिंग एंड ग्राइंडिंग मशीन वेयर कटिंग मशीन रैन ट्वेंटी एट थाउजेंड टाइम्स अ पर मिनट ट्वेंटी एट थाउजेंड रोटेशन पर मिनट सो वाइल डूइंग वाइल चिपिंग आउट सो समाइम डेफिनेटली मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम आई वेयर द स्पेक्स बट समाइम वी नीड टू हैव अ लुक वेरी क्लोज अ लुक मैं थोड़ा निकाल के काम कर रहा था जस्ट यू नो लग गई मेरा राइट हाई पे थोड़ा थोड़ा नॉट वेरी सीरियस बट डेफिनेटली बहुत पेन हो रहा था एट दैट टाइम आई आई वेंट टू एन आई आई हॉस्पिटल एट अयोध्या डॉक्टर ट्रीटेड मी एंड आई रिमूव इट एंड ई टोल मी टेक रेस्ट फॉर एटलीस्ट थ्री फोर डेज डोंट गेट डस्ट के थोड़ा बाहर दूर डस्ट से थोड़ा दूर रहिए वो नहीं हो सकता क्योंकि मेरा जिंदगी पूरा डस्ट के साथ ही है so i wear a specs and uh, immediately I, i told my assistant to do this at least for two days to hum log baatein karte rehte hain 
भगवान शिव की आंखें आप किस तरह बना रहे हैं जो औजार है वैसे तो चांदी का हैमर होता है हथौड़ा चांदी का और सोने की अभी नहीं है, अभी भी लेकिन है, इसमें अलग है यस yes, अभी हमें हम लोग स्टील में कर रहे हैं प्लीज एंड फॉर दैट आई एम यूजिंग फ्लैट चीजल आई पॉइंटेड चीजल विच वॉज इन्वेंटेड बाई अवर एंसेस्टर थाउजेंड ईयर्स एगो आपको मैंने दूसरे से माइक लगा दिया यस जस्ट अभी आप देख सकते हैं इसमें आँख और लिप्स नहीं है जस्ट आई विल ट्राई टू मेक दैट आई सेंड द लिप्स फॉर यू और जब आप ये करते हैं लगातार तो आप गोद में रख के इन योर लैप यू कीप दिस एंड 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 यू कीप काविंग एट ऑल टाइम्स एंड यू कीप टॉकिंग यू आर ऑलवेज इन टच विद योर यंग डॉटर सानवी शी कैप बूस्टिंग योर मोरल आई बिलीव नो वाइल वर्किंग आई नीड ए जीनियन फीडबैक and uh, at that time so so many were giving me the feedback that acha aa raha hai acha aa raha hai still i'm not happy with the feedback i'm receiving so isliye main mera aur photo kisi ko nahi dikhana tha us waqt so isliye mera daughter ko maine pucha phone karke photo dikha ke uh, sanvi whether it is looking like a old boy or a child unhone bataya bachche jaise dikh rahe that day i got a confident so और एक चीज हो रहा था सो वाइल वर्किंग वी आर नॉट सपोज टू सी वॉट अदर आर्टिशन आर डूइंग सो एंड वी आर वेरी क्यूरियस वो लोग क्या कर रहे हैं सो वी हैव अ स्टाफ देर अराउंड फाइव टू सिक्स स्टाफ एज अराउंड ट्वेंटी लेस देन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स they are taking care of our food and uh, taking care of us from past 7 months so me puta tha so because they have uh, access to visit all three studios so me puta tha unko kaun si murti achi aa rahe zyada nahi puta tha always good to know competition kya kar rahe hai yes yes so uh, they are giving me uh, they are telling that ab teenon murti ka bahut acha ban raha hai bahut acha ban raha hai हाँ और ये बताओ कौन सी अच्छा है आपको सो दे टोल्ड आप तीनों मूर्ति अच्छा बन रहे हैं मगर आपके मूर्ति में जान है लाइफनेस है दैट इज दिनिटी नहीं वो लास्ट में आग बन गए बट उस वक्त उस वक्त उनका उनका फीडबैक सुनते ही मेरे को अच्छा लगा तो समाइम यू नो वी नीड कॉन्फिडेंट यू नो वी आर इवन दो वी आर डूइंग ये हमारा बच्चा है सो दैट टाइम ये हम लोग हमारा बच्चा हर वक्त अच्छा दिखते हैं हमारा बच्चा सो आई नीड अ प्रॉपर फीडबैक फ्रॉम नो हमारा डिवोटिस वी कैन से बट अगर उस वक्त हमको एक बहुत कंडीशन था हम बाहर कहीं दिखाना नहीं है और बहुत कम लोग आते थे अंदर सो ऑल दिस थिंग सो हम क्या क्या मिलते थे उसी वक्त हमने एक फीडबैक लेते थे अच्छा मैंने ये भी सुना कि कुछ uh, डर ये था कि संगमरमर वाली मूर्ति uh, अगर चूज uh, की सबने mm-hmm. और यूनानिमस डिसीजन था क्योंकि आपको जो डायरेक्टिव मिला था मेरे को ये बताया गया मैं उस उस समिति के लोगों से मैंने बात की तो उन्होंने कहा उसमें बालत्व होना चाहिए yes, yes, देवत्व yes, होना yes, चाहिए डिविनिटी हैज टू बी देयर दैट चाइल्ड लाइक फीचर्स ऑफ लॉर्ड राम एंड ऑफ कोर्स द रॉयल्टी ऑफ अ किंग वॉट वॉज इट दैट वॉज हाउ डू यू कन्वे दैट इन स्टोन sir uh, as we to uh, no while sculpting i don't want only the child face i need a ram in the child face in the divinity for that what i did is um, one is the shilpa shastra a geometrical measurement given by our ancestors first i make a what do you call a, a geometrical measure, measurement we can we call it as a blocking पहला मैंने ब्लॉकिंग ठीक से हमारा शास्त्र के अनुसार मैंने किया बाद में आई स्टार्टेड स्टडिंग अबाउट अबाउट द फीचर्स ऑफ द बॉय एज फाइव एंड ऑल्सो मैंने उधर uh, दो तीन uh, बाहर का लोग आते थे आई रिक्वेस्टेड आई रिक्वेस्टेड दैम टू ब्रिंग देयर चिल्ड्रन इफ दे आर एज अराउंड फोर टू फाइव सैटरडे संडे वेन दे आर आव न स्कूल चिट्ठी थे उस वक्त थोड़ा लेके आइए so i i used to call some children there and i spent time with them unka pair chuta tha haath chuta tha because of touch mai feel karke karna wo bahut important hai so uh, because 
हमको ये आई वॉन्ट टू हम एक चीज में नहीं छोड़ना चाहता था क्योंकि आई वॉन्ट टू कैप्चर द शिल्प शास्त्र द मेजरमेंट द डिवाइनिटी एंड द क्यूटनेस हर चीज इवन द साइंस एंड ऑल्सो अकॉर्डिंग टू अवर शिल्प शास्त्र एंड ऑल्सो हमारा शिल्प निर्माण सेवन हंड्रेड टू थाउजेंड ईयर्स एको कैसा होता था सो आई वॉन्ट टू टच एवरी पार्ट आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू लिव एनी थिंग बिकॉज दिस इज दिस दट टाइप ऑफ सिचुएशन आई मीन एंड ऑल्सो बिकॉज ऑफ माई यू नो फाइव जनरेशन का एक काम करके आ रहा है नॉलेज ट्रांसफर हैपन्ड माई ग्रैंड फादर टू फादर फादर टू मी दैट दैट रियली हेल्प मी हेयर and the feedback that you got because um, whether it's north or south east or west mm-hmm. um, everyone sees lord ram or there's been a change in which people used to see lord ram and now uh, that that vigraha that idol mm-hmm. that murti has united our entire country south to north most of the time uh, i am from south india uh, very you uh, know it's it's sometime we get disconnected uh, uh maybe sometime uh, by seeing some marble idols because we so much uh, in the south india you will see so much of black idols mm. uh even in north india uh they they keep seeing the white idols more mm. so that is the biggest challenge again but this time the uh, blessings of ram even in south india they are so much connected they are seeing sometime i got the feedback that no ये हमारा वेंकटेश्वर भगवान जैसा दिख रहा है और समवन तेलेंगे अयप्पा जैसा दिख दिख रहा है और सुब्रमण्य स्वामी सो अकॉर्डिंग टू देयर विच इज गिविंग द दर्शन दैट इज द ब्यूटी एंड ऑल्सो आई आई ट्रैवल्ड लखनऊ एंड आफ्टर इट इट कॉट इनाग्रेटेड सो इवन देयर ऑल्सो एवरी वन इज हैप्पी विथ नो दे आर नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट एनी कलर बट दे आर हैप्पी विथ Uh, whatever uh, no i am able to create because of uh, bhagwan ke aashirwad se aap ye sochiye ki 500 varsho ki pratiksha thi aur 500 varsho ki pratiksha ke baad um, ek divya bhavya navya uh, ramlala ka vigrah pure desh ne uh, dekha pure uh, pure vishva ne dekha lekin uh, jis tarah se goswami tulsidas ne ye kaha tha ki tulsidas ati anand dekh ke mukhar vind रघुवर छवि के समान रघुवर छवि बसिया बनिया तो आपको क्या वही उस तरह की फीलिंग आई दैट दिस इज अनपैरल्ड नथिंग लाइक दिस बिफोर और आफ्टर सर वाइल मैं मेरा अब उधर स्टूडियो दिया गया था एक कार्यकार उधर काम करते तो उस वक्त ऐसा लग रहा था ये बच्चे जैसा दिख रहे हैं बट आफ्टर ई एंटरिंग आफ्टर ई एंटर द गर्भगृहम एंड दर हमारा वो प्रतिष्ठापन का विधि विधान होने के बाद इवन uh, ऐसा लगा ये मेरा काम नहीं है दैट आई एक्सप्लेन दैट डे इट सेल्फ सो समाइम वी एस ए ह्यूमन बींग वी आर नॉट एबल टू क्रिएट गॉड ही ही विल गाइड वॉट यू वॉन्ट थ्रू माई हैंड्स यू विल गेट इट डन आई नेवर फेल्ट दैट आई क्रिएटेड राम राम एज चूज मी टू क्रिएट दिस दैट्स इट सो आई वुड लाइक टू कीप इट सिंपल true sir true before that uh, you've uh, also made a very divine uh, uh, murti of jagadguru adi shankaracharya which is at kedarnath dham uh, and uh, also netaji subhash chandra bose and we'll also show those here what next for you what next sir next uh, mera previous kaam bahut bach gaya hai so i have to do all my previous work <laughs> or else uh, uh, because i requested my clients that you know main is kaam ke liye ja raha hu and uh, they are very supportive they cancelled their programs they allowed me to come and do ramlala idol yes remember that time they have given some advance to me from that i might have food and my whole family lived on that money i don't want to disappoint them pehla unka kaam karke baad mein hum dusra kaam dekhte ya yeah, ab uh, matlab mathura mein krishna janmabhoomi mein bhagwan krishna ki uh, murti bhi banane ka plan hai <laughs> ye sunte hi bahut khushi ho raha hai pata <laughs> मिल गया तो डेफिनेटली आई विल डू माई ना जस्टिस करने का पूरा कोशिश करता हूँ प्रश्न बहुत है अच्छा बहुत लग रहा है लेकिन समय इतना ही था आपसे yes. बात करने के लिए लेकिन चलते चलते मैं आपसे ये निवेदन करूंगा रिक्वेस्ट यू यू नो फॉर फॉर द व्यूअर्स हियर फॉर आर फ्रेंड्स हियर सिंबल भगवान शिव देखिए ना राम जी की बात हुई कृष्ण जी की बात हुई और अब 
आदि योगी शिव के दर्शन भी यहां पर होंगे अब उसी की प्रतीक्षा है जस्ट हो गया सर जस्ट सो जस्ट आई शो नहीं अब हाँ लाइटिंग दे सकते हैं Ladies and gentlemen please raise a warm warm applause Arun Yogi Raj the man behind Ram Lalla's murti Thank you Arun ji aap hamare sath jude bahut bahut dhanyawad many thanks for joining us um, at the India Today conclave and wish you all the best all the best aapne पूरे विश्व को राम जी का एक रूप दिखाया जो विच इज विच इज नाउ एच इन आर कलेक्टिव कॉन्शियंस फॉर जेनरेशन एंड सेंचुरीज टू कम थैंक यू वेरी मच सर वंस अगेन प्लीज वेज अम अपलॉज एज आई कॉल अपॉन अमर सिन्हा सी ओ ओ रेडिकल खेतान टू कम अप ऑन स्टेज एंड प्रेजेंट अ स्मॉल टोकन ऑफ आवर अप्रीसिएशन टू मिस्टर अरुण योगी राज Thank you, Mr. Yogi Raj. Thank you, Gaurav. Give us about 20 seconds turnaround time, and we'll be ready to go into our next session. Mr. Yogi Raj is going to be here. You can, uh, after our next session, maybe if you want to speak with him, you can. Also, ladies and gentlemen, we are tweeting under the hashtag India Today Conclave 2024. Do keep the tweets going. Also, a reminder for those of you interested, we do have a breakaway session at 12:15 at the Mumtaz Hall, India, and the Indo-Pacific Threat and Opportunities. It's about to begin in the Mumtaz Hall. Those interested can head there. For those of you who want to stay here for our next session, let me take you through that modern love, the fascinating journey of the Infosys couple, sponsored by Motwani Jadeja Foundation. To take it from here, inviting on stage Rajdeep Sardesai, consulting editor, India Today Group, to introduce our esteemed panel and our speakers. Sudhaji, your mic is next to you there. Hello and welcome. Sorry. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the India Today Conclave once again, where we are very privileged to be joined by a couple who I am going to describe today as, in many ways, Jody Number One. He is an iconic figure for India's startup industry and the infotech. ecosystem that has exploded over the last couple of decades she is an award winning best selling author and philanthropist who's now just become a nominated rajya sabha mp uh and their power doesn't just extend to this country but if you want to enter 10 downing street they might well tell you how to get there So in many ways they proven the world is flat that you can move from Bengaluru to 10 Downing Street without a problem but what makes them truly ladies and gentlemen jodi number 1 is their love for each other 
an uncommon love that has sustained for 50 years and counting and to my mind therefore they represent some of the best values of India. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Narayan Murthy and Sudha Murthy join us here at the India Today Conclave. Thank you both very much. I want to start though, I'm going to ask my producer to just slay, play a little video because you've just a couple of days ago, ma'am, been sworn in as a, a member of the Rajya Sabha. There you are, getting sworn in and I think that is another feather in your cap. <laughs> Sudha Murthy ji, what was it like to now in your latest innings that you've decided to play as a Rajya Sabha MP, ma'am? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, this is a new chapter to me at the age of 73, I suppose. It's a new lesson, but for learning age no bar. So let me... So age no bar. Age Mr. no bar. Mr. Murthy, are you happy to now remain in the shadows of your wife? <laughs> well, absolutely, but uh, because right from day one, uh, it was very clear that she was so much superior to me because, you know, as an engineer, I used data. I never got the first rank, never. But she always got the first rank in <laughs> 10 semesters of her engineering. <laughs> and at Institute of Science Bangalore, she had got a scholarship to the best technology university in the world to do her PhD. Uh, she was the first woman to go to telco, all of that. So therefore, I had no doubt in my mind that she was truly the better half. <laughs> you're, you're acknowledging that today after all these years because the truth is Mr. Murthy, when you had the opportunity, you did not make her part of the Infosys startup team. Do you regret that today that you didn't take your wife as part of the startup team? Even though, as you say, she was eminently qualified to be part of it. Well, uh, life is all about learning and improving. <laughs> Those days, I was uh, an incorrigible idealist. Those days, the standard was family-run organizations, husband and wife, father and son, father and daughter, etc. So therefore, I said, having returned from France, I said, I want to do something different in India. And therefore, I thought one way of doing it is not to make it a husband and wife company, even though she was much more qualified than all the founders, let there be no doubt about it. So it was a, an act of idealism. It was an act of idealism. Have you forgiven him for it, Sudhaji, after all these years that he didn't make you part? Because in your book, which has come out, you do mention somewhere that you felt a little hurt. Yeah, uh, of course, because uh, I allowed engineering and a couple of years it had hurt me, maybe two to three years. I felt it, I wish I could have been. But when I look back in life now, good, I did not become part because I would have retired as a director of, technical director of Infosys probably. But I, I, I touched many lives in real life through Infosys Foundation and I value it much more than any other position. So I feel <laughs> helping others being compassionate to others is more important than any position. Probably God closed one window for me, but he opened many doors, I consider that way. And I'm going to play some photographs. And we're going to start with the early 70s, when over books, the two of you fell in love with each other, and that's your marriage day. That's... Our marriage, and within 800 rupees we got married. In 800 rupees. 400 and, each. And you thought that he would look like Rajesh Khanna? No. That was very clear. I knew him. Okay. I thought so when I, before meeting him. After meeting him, I said, no. Rajesh Khanna is Rajesh <laughs> Because when you first, it, it was love over books, Mr. Murthy. You, you wooed your wife with your, uh, with the fact that she was a bibliophile and that is what seemed to attract you. But you have any memories of this special day? 
Well, I think she walked into the, my room. I was sharing a room with a family in uh, Pune, Deccan uh, Jamkana. She walked in, she was full of enthusiasm, she was very talkative, a lot of confidence, all of that. And uh, I knew that the only hope I had of uh, uh, impressing her was my impressive array of books. <laughs> and uh, I had some very unusual authors, George Mikesh, who is a Hungarian English comedian, you know, uh, humor writer. And George Mikesh. George, yeah, Mikesh. And she was uh, very much impressed by George Mikesh, not so much by me. <laughs> And that was good enough for me. So the way to a woman's heart is sometimes through books, to the point where Mr. Murthy, you once took, of course, once love blossom, 11-hour train journey, traveling ticketless, because by then you were missing your wife. Yeah. Uh, so no, you were not yet my wife. She was not yet your <laughs> wife. That's right. So it's okay to fall in love, spend time wooing a, a woman, and not necessarily have a 70-hour work day right <laughs> work week right <laughs> nothing wrong because a lot of younger India today believes the moment you said you must mandatorily have 70 hour work lives they said what is Narayan Murthy talking about what about work life balance well you know coming back to those wonderful days I had just returned from France I was somewhat bohemian and uh, I had no worries in the world I had joined a think tank, NGO. I took half the salary they offered. Uh, and uh, the day I met her, I wanted to meet her more often. We would go to a restaurant, uh, not restaurant, a fruit juice shop called uh, Dakshin. No, da what is that? Darsh Darshan. Darshan, Darshan. Darshan. In Pune. And I would go, she would order a queen-size orange juice and I would order a king-size banana juice, banana milkshake, and we'd be sitting. And of course, uh, once in a while I would say, Abhina Javo and all of that, you know, <laughs> Chodo Kar, <laughs> Dil Abhi Baranai, and all of that. And one day, one of the bandhus, I mean, the servers, the waiters were called bandhus, he came and said, you know, I know you say a lot of true things, but this one is not true. You have been sitting here for four hours. <laughs> Would you please vacate it now? You know, so it so, was. So, it so, was so did you all grow up, Sudha Murthy? I, I mean, in these years of uh, falling in love with each other, did you, uh, a more innocent age, the 1970s, holding hands in a cinema theater was seen as the maximum in public display of affection? Was that how... It was a more innocent age, wasn't it? Yeah, because uh, we never had uh, Infosys. We never thought of any, uh, anything more than being happy, going around in a nice city like Pune. But my life drastically changed when Murthy started Infosys. It was no longer that happy days in Pune. It was a responsibility, uh, commitment, to, you know, uh, and uh, building a company is not a joke. It requires a lot of sacrifices from the family, support from the family, and a lot of uh, give and then take. So the whole life changed once it uh, came to Infosys. You know, but love blossoms and this entrepreneurial journey grows almost simultaneously. And there is this wonderful, incredible story, Mrs. Murthy, uh, that you talk about or we all now know about how you gave 10,000 rupees from your account. That's all you had in your savings account and you gave it to your husband to start off his entrepreneurial journey. It is perhaps the most valuable 10,000 that anyone has given their husband. I mean, what prompted you? You had faith in this man, this bohemian man that you had fallen in love with? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are two things. Number one, when I got married, my mother told me, you know, we are both come from a middle class family. We are not from rich family. We are all come from a salaried families. So my mother told me without spend money with great care and save some money without husband's knowledge. 
and this money should not be used for jewels or the sarees only in emergency you should use it so i saved every month some money and it was in a box i did not even calculate count <coughs> when murthy said i want to start a software company in 1981 uh, i told we have good, good jobs both of us had very good jobs we had our own daughter akshata by that time and i said why do you want to start murthy knew that i am very fond of history so he wants to prove that historically then i will agree he said when there was the industrial revolution uh, we were the colonies of uh, other country and british country uh, britain and we could not prosper because industrialization took place there we only became the raw material suppliers now the second revolution has come now that is software revolution so if we miss this boat we will never become legally ethically rich and this is the only way indians middle class people with good educational background can do something so he said if you help me out i will start a company i said i don't have too much money because uh, uh, you are salaried people with a lot of responsibility he said if you don't agree then i cannot start i want you should wholeheartedly accept this then only i would like to jump into this i thought over it it was a wednesday evening thursday morning i counted it was 10250 i'm not good in economics you know i'm good in engineering but not in economics the only investment i have made in life is 10000 rupees that's all mm -hmm. well it's the best investment you ever made uh, I told Murthy, look here is ten thousand two fifty again. I kept inside because you, I never know this man will be successful or not. Because he had his, before that he had his own company, Softronics. He was not successful, so I took a little bit of risk and I said, take this money. I assumed I will write off. He may not be or he may be. If he is well and good, if he is not, it is also well and good. Then he told me, okay, be ready for the bumpy ride for the next three years. Okay, I will. I myself will be very busy. and you this money i will start that's how i gave 10000 rupees it's as i said one of the most valuable 10000 rupees that anyone any wife has given her husband <laughs> i'm going to ask my producer to put up another couple of pictures because uh, family life begins and i don't know about the holidays that you all spend where is this mr murthy did you take your wife on uh, this is the first foreign holiday that you all ever did you all went overseas Where was this? Yes, I think. Uh, no, you know, Murthy, 1990, 1979. 79. Went to America first time yeah. on work. This is in Greece in the yeah. year 1996. Yeah. We we took Akshata. A whole of us went. I was very keen. I'm a, I'm very fond of history. So I told we should go to Greece. It's in Greece. Because you have a reputation that you are uh, you don't. like you'd like to travel e there were all these rumors about how you prefer to even travel economy not business class yeah. is that true well uh, till we reached a uh, billion dollars of revenue and about 280 million dollars of net income that is after uh, tax profit uh, we had said we are going to travel economy international domestic doesn't matter however at that time some of the younger people came to me and said look we have made so much of sacrifice all of this why don't you be a little bit more relaxed and that's why we shifted to business class but till then the independent directors were given first class So independent directors oh, travel first class absolutely. while you travel the economy absolutely absolutely anyway <laughs> so that's when we shifted to business class we used to stay in very cd hotels in uh, new york in new york even in <laughs> delhi here near the old uh, railway station uh, there is to be a hotel called natraj when <laughs> when i came to get the license and all i mean we, we we were quite happy i think at the end of the day what is more important than is, is your mental happiness rather than a physical comfort you know that is uh, because you all uh, 
for a while stayed in a small one BHK. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when you first got married yeah. with a common toilet. Of course. That's where it all started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then, of course, Infosys takes over your lives. And uh, there is a poignant moment in your Uncommon Love book where you uh, miss your son's birthday, Rohan's birthday, and he asks you, who do you love more, Infosys or me and Akshata? Well, when I told them that I did love the, my daughter and son, they didn't believe me. It was very clear. <laughs> they just smiled and went away. I, I, I'll play what uh, uh, Rohan said. We've got something that Rohan has to say to you all. And, and listen in to what your son uh, had to say, uh, who's now at the moment in London. Okay, I'm going to ask them to uh, increase the volume. Okay, we'll try and get that audio of, uh, of, of Rohan Murthy in a moment. Uh, but is that the sacrifice that you've had to make in a way that your children missed out because you were on your entrepreneurial journey? You know, I'll tell you, my, when I returned from France, I must be one of the very few people who left a Western country and came back to India. I had a very aspirational uh, uh, target. I said, I want to conduct the first experiment in India on democratization of wealth. I want to create a company of the professional, for the professional and by the professional as Abe Lincoln defined US democracy. I want to demonstrate in India that even people who have no connections to the government can succeed. I want to create a company that will compete itself with the best in the world. So these were all very aspirational, noble, uh, you know, objectives. When you have such a thing, uh, there is no sacrifice because you are all the time focused on that target. So we never felt anything. You never felt. Let's hear what Rohan had to say. I was there, why should I worry? Feel. I'm proud of in terms of my identity. I, in, I, it's come from trying to emulate him. And this is far before there's any success in his life. I mean, a very important role model. I, I don't want to make it sound like my father is the best and so on, but in my limited sort of life, uh, um, all things that I consider very important part of my identity come from my father um, and my mother, of course. Uh, but I think I'm more influenced by my father. You know, uh, but Sudha Murthy ji, it's not just Rohan now. Now you've got Akshata. We have some lovely family photographs of holidays that you all took together. Uh, and now she's out there uh, as the wife of the British Prime Minister. Is it true that you told the immigration authorities uh, when, you had to, uh, when they asked you in London when you arrived, where are you going to go and stay? And you really told them 10 Downing Street? Yeah, because that is the official address and... Uh, my son also stays in uh, London. I won't remember these codes, you know, N5, H7, O, uh, uh, the British code. I won't remember that. So I was wondering, with my, my sister was with me, which, which address we should write, whether it is the Rohan's address or her address. So when we were debating, so I said, okay, 10 Downing Street or something. Like that. <laughs> and you put 10 Downing Street? Yeah, no, at the end I... And what did the immigration officer no, say? No, at the better is to put my son's address. You know, because then a lot more questions will not be asked, you know. <laughs> so they felt very funny, actually. Amy and my sister are arguing which address we should put it. 10 Downing Street or 11 Downing Street or what is that? They felt but you know, these are lovely pictures. I want to ask you, what is your message to young couples? Both, are, you know, the couples may be fierce professionals, but also want to, you know, have a strong, conducive family life. How do you do that? How do you achieve the love, work-life balance? Okay. When you are married, you are bound to fight, number one, accept that. If they say we have never fought, then you are not husband and wife. Okay. Number two, when you fight, one person is upset, second should be cool, second should not open their mouth. When Murthy is angry, I will never talk. I said, let him pour out what he wants to, okay. I'll keep quiet. When I am angry, he keeps quiet. But in real life, I keep quiet most of the time. Okay. You should never get upset together because that is the 
recipe for further fights. Third thing is, it's a life is give and take, you know. It is no, there is no perfect life, there is no perfect uh, couple. Some plus, some minus. He comes along with that plus and minus, I come with my own plus and minus. Please understand. Number four, I want all men of this generation should help their wife in the kitchen. It's very important. <laughs> Only wife should help. She should be a software engineer, come back, cook. She should attend PTA meeting. No. You have to share the burden of your wife. Then only the family can... Because you stay in a city and you are young, both of you have aspirations, but you have to share your difficulties. And all men normally talk, oh, my mother was a great cook. Because she was not working. <laughs> then she will cook whole day. So your wife is working, then you expect she should be like your mother. It is not possible. So please understand, your wife is always dear to you. Can, okay? I, can I ask both of you in conclusion, what's the biggest regret and what's the one proud moment you most cherish? You start first, Mr. Murthy. What's your biggest regret after all these years of marriage and love and setting up Infosys? Your biggest regret and your proudest moment? Well, I, I don't know if I have any regrets because right from day one, we operated Infosys as an enlightened democracy. There were certain highly daring things that we didn't do. We could have done them if we were not a, we didn't operate like a true democracy. So, to some extent, maybe our growth was somewhat less than what we could have achieved. It's not a regret, but that's one. And your uh, proudest moment? Proudest is really when I sat in front of those scorching uh, lights on, the, on a high stool in, in NASDAQ uh, when we became the first Indian company to be listed on NASDAQ. I think that was... In, in some sense, we were doing something that had not been done, you know, in many senses, we had, that had not been done at all from by an Indian company. That was. Sudha Murthy, your one big regret and your proudest moment. Regret is I never learned swimming. I feel bad about it. Because I come from an area where drinking water was so difficult to get, forget swimming. I always feel, when I look at swimming pool, I say, oh, so much water is there, we can use it. <laughs> it never comes to me that I can jump into that. It never comes to me. And your proudest moment? Um, when I helped Devdasis, 3,000 of them who were sex workers, converted them and rehabilitated them to normal life, that was the proudest. <laughs> I, that day, that day my wish list became empty. That day I said, okay, now I can converse with God saying that I served your children very well. I don't have any desire in my life. No okay. desires. I, I know that you all love books and we are going to have a book signing with them for those who would like to have mm -hmm. the Uncommon Love sign. But you are also a movie buff. You used to watch what? Lots of movies. 20 what? movies a month. So no. should we end with a nice duet from the 1970s? We are all, I mean I like to see myself as a child of the 70s when music was quite brilliant. Is there a favorite song that you want to tell us? A love song that typifies love? Oh, there are many are there. 50s. Oh, which, and anything that, if today you had to sing to... Kora ka agastha man mera, Dilip Kumar, sorry, Rajesh Khanna and Rajay, yeah, say you can, no I can't sing. Kora ka agastha ye man mera, likh gaya naam, isme tera. That's a beautiful song. See, she sings it, then you have to respond. No, I'm Murthy. Huh? I thought I already. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. You know, Abhina Jao Chodkar. Dil. That, you know. Abhina Jao Chodkar ki dil abhi. Bara nahi. Aray, wow. You know, that, that in a way typifies their relationship. Because it is what, how many years and counting now? I know me Murthy 50 years. We are married for 46 years. Okay. So you're about to you're about to reach a half century, but you knew each other 50 years ago for the first time. You're celebrating your half century, and it's been a remarkable journey from uh, those days when you had your banana milkshake and your orange juice yeah. to today uh, being on Nasdaq and being a Rajya Sabha MP. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Sudha Murthy and Narayan Murthy, truly inspirational and truly people who represent the best values of India today. Thank you. Rajdeep, 
your father your father was a well known cricketer yes. so it's a good partnership in cricket i suppose half a century at least you have scored yeah. when, when, you. When, when you have a cricket partnership you are supposed to score a full century so <laughs> okay. may you score a full <laughs> ladies okay, and gentlemen <laughs> please thank you very much together for the murtis and may i please request them to honor us and launch the india today coffee table book i'd like to invite on stage mr sudhakar rao director icfia to join the murtis for the launch of india today's coffee table book it's the best of india a collection a celebration of the very many things our country has got right in its independent existence and the many famous indians who've made our lives happier healthier more prosperous and just plain better along the way from our culture to agriculture dance to bollywood blockbusters victories on the battlefield to the olympic podium and much more the best of india ladies and gentlemen please raise a warm applause right after this book launch the murtis will be launching their own book and signing their own book right outside an uncommon love there are copies that are available for sale in the pre function area you can meet them there may i please call upon stage rushali malpekar motwani jadeja foundation to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation right after this quick photo opportunity ma'am just 10 seconds Once again ladies and gentlemen the murtis put your hands together may i please call upon rushali malpekar motwani jadeja foundation to come up and present a small token of our appreciation this session was sponsored by motwani jadeja foundation and right outside at the pre function area an uncommon love their love story all encapsulated in a book right outside copies are available for sale in the pre function area thank you sir thank you ma'am ladies and gentlemen once again do raise a warm applause thank you ma'am Well, they've also left us with a good tip. The Murtis have handed me one of the two books that was given to them because they said paper should not be wasted. They have one. It's a good lesson, good takeaway. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, quickly move on to our next session this evening. Why the Congress still matters in 2024. Taking it from here, session's moderator Rajdeep Sardesai, consulting editor, India Today Group on stage. Ladies and gentlemen just uh, requesting you to settle down as our next guest joins us in a minute uh, Mr Chidambaram please come Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the India Today Conclave. This conclave is being held on the eve of uh, the big general elections. In fact, we've just learned that general elections will be formally announced tomorrow at 3 p.m. So we will have uh, the model code of conduct starting tomorrow, and the big story, of course, will be who will win the elections. Now, most pundits are predicting that 
it is the BJP and Prime Minister Modi who will complete a, a hat trick of victories. So where does that leave the principal opposition party, the Indian National Congress? To answer that question, I'm joined by a very special guest. Please welcome the former Union Finance and Home Minister, Member of Parliament and the head of the Congress's Manifesto Committee, Mr. P. Chidambaram. <laughs> Mr. Chidambaram, our session is titled, Does the Congress Still Matter? Or Does the Congress Matter? Because many believe that 2024 is a done deal. How do you respond to those in this audience and indeed across the country who believe that 2024 is a done deal, the Congress really doesn't have a chance, Prime Minister Modi will complete a hat-trick? Well, if it's a done deal, you should recommend no elections then. <laughs> People have to vote. I can't speak for the whole country. But I think there are places where the Congress will win. Whether it will be enough to form a government, I cannot say. But let's assume that Mr. Modi's party, the BJP, gets the majority. They will form the government and we will be in the opposition. Uh, but opposition also matters in a democracy, isn't it? The opposition does matter, but I'll tell you, and I'm going to put up a graphic to tell you why there is skepticism about whether the opposition can mount a challenge. I'm just putting, and, and to my mind, of all the various numbers, this is the most significant number that represents how Indian politics has changed in the last decade. It will reflect how things have changed in terms of votes between 2009 and 19. Take a look at Lok Sabha numbers between the two major political parties the BJP and the Congress. If these number, as these numbers show Mr. Chidambaram, the BJP's votes in 2009 were 7.8 crores, that's not rupees, that's voters guys. Uh, it's gone up to 22.9. 22.9 crore people voted for the BJP from 7.8 crores in 2009. Congress votes have gone from 2009 11.9 crores when you won that election with 200 odd seats and you're still stuck at 11.94 crores. So the feeling is the BJP has grown exponentially. The Congress is where it is even though the number of people voting in this country has also gone up. So your response. That's where my skepticism comes from. In the lighter vein, these numbers could be right for rupees also. I think, <laughs> anyway, yes, the BJP has been able to attract more votes, which is why it wins. Well, that's a no-brainer. Question is, can the Congress recover and win more votes? As I said, the position is different in different states. I think we can win more than last time in Telangana, in Karnataka, in Haryana. We can win. But in the North Indian states, the Hindi-speaking North Indian states, I cannot pre make any prediction. But they all seem to be uh, swayed by the uh, Ram temple and the fervor about uh, Lord Ram. And coming from Tamil Nadu, I'm not able to think on that wavelength. But I can speak for the South, and in particular, I can speak for Tamil Nadu. No, you seem to suggest there's a North-South divide. Uh, uh, that, did I say that? No, effectively, you're saying speaking from Tamil Nadu, I'm not able to understand I how the Hindi I, heartland votes. Yes. I, I, I cannot understand. That's my... Uh, fault or my failure, maybe you understand it better. We had Nirmala Sitaraman uh, on the, on the, at the conclave sitting where you were and she said two-thirds is because of what Mr. Modi has done and one-third is because the opposition has no narrative apart from anti-Modism. You've not been able to provide the country a compelling narrative 
as to why they should move away from the BJP and vote for the Congress? Because the Honorable Finance Minister turns a blind eye to facts. The facts are, the Oxfam January 2024 report says, 50% of the population holds 3% of the national assets and shares 13% of the national income. According to the government, only 5% of India are poor. I'm, 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 I'm surprised, why did they not claim 0% are poor? The point is, if you turn your blind eye to the fact that there is massive poverty at the bottom of the pyramid, that among graduates, the unemployment rate is 42%, that among children, the number of stunted children and wasted children is about 30%. In education, eight standard child cannot read a second standard text. That's the average for the whole India. If you turn a blind eye to all these facts, you will of course say, um, God is in his heaven and all is well with the world. No, the politicians may turn a blind eye. We don't in the media or some of us don't in the media. And I'll give you but the, where your problem is. Our India Today Mood of the Nation poll said 71% of Indians feel that unemployment is either a serious issue or somewhat serious. Yet when those same people were asked, who will you vote for? They said, we'll vote for Prime Minister Modi That's and the BJP. Awful. So the point, sir, that is proves my you point. were in power for most of the last seven decades. People are saying, okay, there may be problems, but we seem to trust Prime Minister Modi and the BJP more than the Congress which was tried and tested. Is that your problem? No, that's your interpretation. I'm saying when there's massive unemployment, significant poverty, and huge gaps in education and health care, if the people are not voting against an incumbent government, it must be for some other reason. The some other reason, I think, is the Hindutva wave that seems to be sweeping Hindi-speaking northern states. I don't blame anyone. I don't criticize anyone. I'm stating a fact as I see it. If that is a fact, and if the Hindutva wave is sweeping across Hindi-speaking northern India, and people are swayed by that, well, uh, they will vote accordingly and uh, the, gov the country will have a government, but you will have these problems unattended, unaddressed, and people will suffer. So you're saying it's a Hindutva wave that you think could be the reason for the BJP's rise. There will be those who will say, Lok Sabha elections in particular in this country have become quasi-presidential. Voters want to know who is my leader. And then when they make the election, Modi versus Rahul, or Namdar versus Kamdar, or Kamdar versus Namdar, that's where you lose out. Again, Nirmala Sitaraman says, Rahul Gandhi is scurrying around the country, one day Bharat Jodo Yatra, one day Bharat Nyaya Yatra, what does it mean in tangible terms? And then they compare it with Mr. Modi, and it becomes a no contest is what she suggests. That's the problem, not just Hindutva. The opposition has an opportunity. You need better leadership, more credible leadership, before people trust you. Now, you're moving away to another subject now. No, I'm not. We are asking, why are people voting in a particular manner? Yes. Why do you think people are expected to vote in a particular manner, despite unemployment and poverty? And I gave you my answer. I think despite massive unemployment and significant poverty, if people are voting, it must be because they are motivated by some other factor. And that factor, in my view, is Hindutva factor. So it you don't think it's about factor. leadership? You don't think it's about it's, leadership? We'll come to that. It is about leadership. But the leader is seen as the principal protagonist of Hindutva. Mm -hmm. If you, you can't de-link the leader from the wave that seems to be sweeping across the country. The leader is identified 
as the principal protagonist of Hindutva. So if people are voting for Hindutva, they will naturally vote for Mr. Modi. Mr. Chidambaram, uh, on the other hand, people want to know what your party now stands for. We are, you mentioned the unemployment crisis. You mentioned that poverty at the bottom of the pyramid is much deeper than many people imagine. What is your solution to it? For example, I see these Nyai promises you've made. The right to apprenticeship. One lakh stipend will be provided to every diploma or undergraduate holder below the age of 25. You talk about one lakh to a woman in every poor family will be given. Have numbers been calculated? Are you in any position to provide this? According to, again, dare I say, the government, the government says none of this is actually empowering people. <laughs> The, all these rights are in abstract. They don't actually empower people. The BJP, according to them, is empowering people by putting cash in hand and actually providing people tangible benefits. If they put cash in the hands, it is cash in the hand. If we promise an apprentice one lakh a year, that's not cash in the hand. Don't apply these uh, uh, different standards. Let's take one by one. They say they are empowering people How? by uh, through the Vishwakarma scheme, for example, providing people the the body blocks for them to actually reach up to an aspirational India. You are talking of a povertyian India. They talk of an aspirational India. Listen, you can dress it up with words, and you are a wordsmith. That's not the issue. The issue is, if one lakh young people are put through a one-year apprenticeship program, is that not empowerment? Is that not putting hands in the, uh, money in the hands of an unemployed graduate? 42% is the unemployment rate among graduates. You saw that police constable examination. Police constable examination, 60 lakh people applied. 48 lakh wrote the examination. Every railway station, every bus stand was crowded. They had to run special buses, special trains. And two days after the examination, they cancelled the examination. So, but one of the highest poverty, uh, one of the highest unemployment rates in recent times has been in Congress ruled Rajasthan. The point is, you've got to put up a model state. If you say the BJP is doing A, B, C wrong, You've got to either create a model state where you're ruling or show what you will do to ensure that, that next time a constable saying. exam is held, you won't have lakhs of people applying. That is what we are saying. Wait for our manifesto. You picked out two points of the manifesto. I will defend those two points. Those two points are perfectly valid. The apprenticeship is a good idea. There's an apprenticeship act. It's an anemic act, a toothless act. We're going to strengthen that. 50, 45,000 companies have joined the apprenticeship program today. There are 10 lakh companies which can afford to have an apprentice, obliged to have an apprentice. From 45,000 to 10 lakh, if 10 lakh companies, one tenth of them, one lakh companies take one apprenticeship each, one apprentice each, that is one lakh graduates will be through that apprenticeship program. What's wrong with that? What's your criticism of that program? The question no, therefore... No. What is your criticism of that program? Sir, my, my question, it is not for me to criticize the people of you this did, country. You did no, just no, people now. Of, sir, people of this country are judging you by your agenda. You recall 2019, before the election, the Congress came up and said they would bring up minimum income scheme. Yes. Right? The, uh, the that time's NIAI program. You ended up with 52 seats. Now you're talking about the five nyais that you're going to give the people. Again, we don't know where it'll end up. But the question is, is it then a problem of communication if you believe these schemes are so good? Why is it that the people of this country are not endorsing your party? Is it's there a disjunction between what you say it's and what the voter behavior is? You are applying wrong measures to assess a program. I'm here to defend the worth of the program. If people do not vote for us, it's not because they are for or against that program. There are hundred thoughts that race through a voter's mind when he, he or she enters a voting booth. 
what finally impels a voter to vote for one party or against another party does not depend upon one promise or one uh, manifesto point. There are hundred other things. Therefore, you are asking me the validity of a promise and I'm ready to defend the validity of that promise. But why a voter does not vote for the Congress is dependent upon a number of other factors. Is it that Mr. Modi has captured the zeitgeist, if I may use the word, of new India? That the Congress is seen to represent the old India, an India of Parivarvad, an India which is seen to, in some way you are still pigeonholed as a party tainted with corruption and scams. And Mr. Modi on the other hand claims, I'm cleaning up the system, na khane dunga, na khaunga, na khane dunga. And the younger voters in this new India finds his rhetoric, if I may use the word rhetoric, far more attractive than that of the Congress's older India. I think you are listening to too many Modi speeches. You are speaking the language of Mr. Modi. Now let's take Parivarwad. Who are his allies in the last election and this election? Every one of his allies, to use his words, not my words, is a dynast, Akali Dal, JJP, INLD, RLD in Uttar Pradesh, Mr. Jain Chowdhury, now his new ally, TDP, Mr. Naveen Patnaik in Orissa, everybody's a dynast. Why don't you ask him? If you are against Parivar Vard, why are every one of your allies a dynast? You won't get an opportunity to ask him because he won't sit in this chair. You will not be allowed anywhere 10 feet of the Prime Minister. But please ask him this question. Therefore, don't listen to too many of Mr. Modi's speeches. Listen to some other speeches also. What is the other thing you said? Zeit guest or something. Zeit guest, the, the sort of energies the German, of Germany. Yeah, German, German words. Z e i. I'm 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 not surprised that they look to Germany, Russia, China, Turkey, Iran as examples. No, no. All these countries, all these countries, have turned their constitution upside down, and I. Please read my column on Sunday. I'm afraid a third term for the BJP with a two-third majority will lead to major amendments on the Constitution, which you will regret and I will regret. You're and this audience will regret. You're saying that we are turning to a... We are, if Mr. Modi wins again, India is moving towards an electoral autocracy. It's is that what you're saying? It, it is already some shades of an electoral autocracy. That's how the VDEM Institute describes India's democracy. But if Mr. Modi wins a third term, you can be assured and you can note the date and the day and the time, major amendments to the constitution will be made. Let the prime minister say, I will not make any amendments to the constitution which interferes with the federal structure of this country. Let the BJP say that. They will not say that because they have planned to amend the constitution. And the forerunner of that is this one nation, one election. Well, how is this democratic? Tamil Nadu will go into a state election in 20... 26. 26. And the assembly elected under 20, on in 2026 will have only a three-year term under Mr. Covin's report, former President Covin's report. So we will elect terms, uh, we'll elect assemblies with two-year term, three-year term, one and a half-year term. What is this democracy? Give, you know, since you're raising questions over democracy, one of the big stories at the moment is electoral bonds. Yes. Uh, 14 of the top 30 companies who've given donations through electoral bonds are companies that at some stage or the other in recent times have been raided or investigated by the enforcement agencies. 
uh, when we asked this question to Nirmala Sitaraman, she said, these are your assumptions that there is a protection being offered and, and that's how uh, any connection is being built between raids and, and donations given. What's your view? Since you are, many believe, the architect of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Mr. Chidambaram uh, initiates it, the BJP the implements it. The point is, India today, a famous channel and the most celebrated anchor doesn't read the facts. No, there PM, are, no, I, I'll tell you answer. Yes, PMLA is a 2002 act. Yes. 2002, who was finance minister? Implemented by you, Just notified in 2005. Yeah, yeah. Allow me to complete. Yes, sir. I'm asking you one question. You don't have an answer. I'll ask you two more. Who was the, who was the finance minister and who was the prime minister and which was the law or who was the government in 2002? One. Second, when did the act receive the assent of the president? In 2003. FATF asked the government, the act has been passed, president has assented, why are you not implementing that? If you don't implement that, we will have to ask you to withdraw from FATF. We came into office in 2004. The tremendous pressure from FATF, you have passed a law, you have to implement it, otherwise you'll have to withdraw from FATF. So, in 2005, I made two significant amendments to the Act and implemented it. But nobody thought, not you, not I, not any lawyer, that you can weaponize a law. You weaponize a law, use it to tame or destroy political opponents, and, in, and the interpretation, of course, is another issue. We have a review petition, a Supreme Court bench has agreed to review the matter. Therefore, the interpretation made it worse. But can law, I ask? Law was passed by the BJP. The law was assented to in the BJP's time. We had no choice but to implement it. I made two significant amendments and implemented it. And the law has been weaponized. As long as we were in power, did we weaponize the law? Sir, that, that is a contentious issue whether you did, whether you, you misused, started it. Whether you, you misused or didn't misuse agencies, we can debate that you separately. You started PMLA. Sir, sir may, I, may I just very quickly though ask you, just a minute. Number one, electoral bonds, according to you, therefore, and their links with enforcement agencies is the weaponization of those agencies. You are very clear Elec about that. I, I described electoral... So give me a better just system. A moment, just give a me a better system just for campaign financing. The day the electoral bonds was introduced, I said it's legalized bribery. It's legalizing bribery. You still maintain that? I still maintain that. What's the better system? Better system is a multi-pronged system. One system is to allow more open campaigning. The election commission's restrictions have driven election campaigning underground. Cash has gone underground. Because they, they place too many restrictions. See, elections are a festival of democracy. It must have a lot of uh, uh, rhetoric, song, dance, speeches. Uh, they have restricted everything. Last time in Tamil Nadu, we were not allowed to take a road show. We were not allowed to fly flags. We were not allowed to paste posters in towns and municipalities. Therefore, the election has been driven underground bring back election over the ground. That's one. Second, allow a larger limit of expenditure for candidates. This is ridiculously low numbers. Nobody, nobody can uh, win an election or fight an election by spending these ridiculously low, low amounts. To hire a car for a day to hire a car for a day in 1984, when I contested election, cost three, 300 rupees to 400 rupees. Today, to hire a car for a day will cost you 4,000 to 5,000 rupees. Third, state funding. There's a simple way to state fund. You take the 2024 election, take the 2019 vote share. Per vote, I give you one rupee. I'm giving an example. One rupee for every vote you got in 2019. 
the BJP will get more. It's entitled to get more because it won the election. So state funding on a purely neutral formula, every political party has to accept it, so state funding. And then revert to open, transparent donations to political parties where the donor will reflect it in his books of account or the company's books of account and the political party has to reflect it in its annual financial statement. Okay. There's a multi-prong approach. You know, I, I'm sorry. Of that, I'm instead sorry of that, sound, instead I'm, of that, you had an electoral bond which was devised in order to legalize bribery and the ruling party will be the biggest beneficiary. And I'm sorry to sound cynical, but much of this could have been implemented in the many years that y'all were in power, especially state funding. But that's another debate for another day. I'm going to ask you, therefore, to wear your cephologist hat every now and then when we do a program, Mr. Chidambaram, particularly when we are dealing with numbers on television, has his own numbers and analysis. You tell These me are, my numbers are wrong. He, he's an amateur cephologist, so I'm <laughs> going to ask you, Mr. Chidambaram. 2014, Congress got 44 seats. 2019, you got 52 seats, including eight from Tamil Nadu in alliance with the DMK. How much do you expect to get in 2024? I can only speak about Tamil Nadu. I cannot speak about other states because I have not toured the other states. I'm not familiar with the situation of the ground. I can speak about Tamil Nadu. And last time we won Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, out of 40 seats, we won 39. We, I'm confident we will repeat that uh, result. Okay. Therefore, I ask you again, are you accepting the where we started off, the inevitability of a Modi hat-trick? Are you accepting the inevitability of a Modi hat-trick, Mr. Chidambaram? Or Not do you believe that picture abhi baki hai? Nothing is inevitable. Where was your channel? in 2004 when the India shining campaign was raging all over India. Mr. Vajpayee was a good man, a moderate man, not given to extremes. He led the campaign, yet the Congress pipped him to the winning post by eight seats. Okay. So nothing is inevitable in... Uh, did you think that uh, Trump-Biden rematch is inevitable? <laughs> but we are having a, a Trump-Biden rematch as an inevitable uh, contest. Okay. Nothing is inevitable, but I concede, I concede from the numbers you put out, I concede if the Hindi-speaking states vote in a particular manner, vote in a manner that they voted last time, we have a battle on our hand okay and how the india alliance will cope with that battle is for the india alliance leaders to determine but i can speak for tamil nadu we will repeat the same result as in 2019 let me leave it there mr chidambaram whether this is a modi shining moment we will wait and see or whether the congress can actually uh, prove that reports of its death are grossly exaggerated we will know in a few months from now. For now, for joining us, and as always being combative, thank you very much. Mr. P. Chidamram. Thank you. Good thank luck you. to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause, Mr. P. Chidambaram, as I call upon Alpana Kirloskar, promoter, Kirloskar Group, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to Mr. Chidambaram. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause, former Union Minister, Finance and Home Affairs, Mr. P. Chudambaram. Lunch will be served here as well as the Shah Jahan Hall, so you can make your way to Shah Jahan Hall as well. There's a full spread for you, but we are going to go into our debate and it's a working lunch sorts for us. You can just sit back and enjoy. Once again, letting you all know, lunch will be served here as well as Shah Jahan Hall. And we're going to quickly prepare for our lunch debate, the big conclave debate, nights out. The motion for the debate, secularism is dying in India. 
both for and against the motion. We'll also have a jury. All of that right here through lunch. Lunch is being served here as well as Shah Jahan Hall. A full spread for you there. You can make your way there as well. And I hope you're tweeting. We are tweeting under the hashtag India Today Conclave 2024. What we have next lined up for you is a unique concept in our 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. We are introducing that to you. And we are going to dig right in through lunch in that debate while you dig into a sumptuous spread. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, just to get you up to speed, lunch is also being served at the Shah Jahan Hall right next door. And uh, we're serving you lunch here as well. It's a new one for us, but in our 21st edition, we did think to do something new and uh, to get you to imbibe the maximum out of the time that you've given to us. We respect that. And uh, we're going to have a lunch conclave debate. The conclave debate, knives out, the motion secularism is dying in India. So do settle down. It's a working lunch for us, but you can sit back and dig in. So sit back, enjoy your meal, and we will go directly into our debate. We hope you're tweeting hashtag India Today Conclave 2024. We also have screens up at the Shah Jahan Hall. If you just want to go there and indulge in the spread, you can even catch the debate through lunch at the Shah Jahan Hall. All of you can hear me at the Shah Jahan Hall itself. So sit back, enjoy your meal, and let's get into a juicy debate where the secularism is dying in India. Knives out, a big conclave debate. All right, to take it from here, inviting on stage sessions moderator Rahul Kaval, news director, TV Today Network, managing editor, special online projects, executive editor, Business Today. So much before we start, I just want to give everyone a heads up. Just get your food in order, sit down, settle down. We'll start in a few minutes. We'll call the debaters. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're doing this for the first time. But we just want to ensure that everybody has food because this is your lunch. So you have to earn your lunch. I'm sure you have since the morning. Uh, and um, once we start debating, 
then it'll be nice if people aren't talking to each other and there's some because you know it's nice because you're eating and they're talking that's not very nice so just get your lunch sit down settle down we'll start in a few minutes from now
take it from here inviting on stage our moderator rahul kaval news director tvtn managing editor special online project executive director business today most of you have qr codes right in front like you have a sheet of paper do you all have a sheet of paper somewhere in front which has a qr code on it can you just tell me whether you do yeah like everybody is like really busy eating and no one saying anything you guys have a qr code right yeah because you have to judge the debate so that's it no no as long okay i can show it once yeah so basically once we start and you've eaten nicely you have to go to the qr code and vote after the debate gets over so everybody has a role to play i'll explain but uh, yeah so that's part of the format if everybody also settles down it's just very nice So hello and welcome to Knives Out. This is the big India Today conclave debate. Ten years after the Modi government came to power, one of the biggest questions in our country is whether secularism is dying on the watch of the Modi Sarkar. That's the motion we will debate today. Allow me to introduce you to our speakers and explain the rules of the contest. Each of our speakers will have. Three minutes. There is a buzzer that will go off at the end of the three minutes. There's a countdown clock in front, so they have exactly three minutes to speak. So it's not like a TV debate where they can go on and on and on, and then they're not out of the control of the anchor and the moderator. After three minutes, the buzzer just goes off. So they have exactly three minutes to speak. And also, the debaters will be judged not just for the content that they put out, but for the style of performance, the theater, the drama, the delivery. it's not just the content we have a very distinguished jury the jury will be sitting here and uh, these are great debaters themselves however the jury will not tell us what they think we don't want to know what their views are at this moment they have to pick on the arguments of each of the debaters what they liked what they didn't like logical fallacies in what the speaker said and play a role in shaping the debate So you have opening comments for three minutes. You have one rounds of interjection. Then the jury speaks, and then we have one minute of concluding comments. And then all of you have a very important role because you have to vote who won. So there is this QR code that's in front of you. It will also be on the screen. Basically, this is a URL that you go to, and you decide who vote who won. Right. So there's a question secularism is dead in india not basis your own opinion ideally but basis what you've heard from these two teams you determine and decide who you thought won so just play a role in helping decide who won this contest so with all that said allow me to introduce you to our debaters we'll do this one by one can we begin by welcoming on stage the pugnacious young spokesperson of the ruling bharatiya janata party can we have a round of applause for shehzad punawala please the first debater at the knives out conclave debate come shehzad speaking for the motion and representing the opposition congress party can be welcome its national spokesperson shama mohammad can we have a round of applause for shama our next speaker in shehzad's team my college sparring partner hindol sen gupta can we have a round of applause for hindol please he's an author analyst used to be a fierce debater let's see if he still got it come hindol now coming down all the way from kolkata from the trinamool congress is its spokesperson riju datta he's big on the kolkata debating scene let's see what talent he's brought to delhi can we have a round of applause for riju datta please 
our next speaker and remember we wanted to make this interesting and not just very predictable is someone who used to be a fierce trenchant critic of the modi sarkar and has now found and seen new light can we have a round of applause for shahil arshi please human rights activist from kashmir very strong one time critic of the modi government now is talking a different tune come shaila our last speaker who almost didn't make it but almost in the end just did can we have a round of applause for our former colleague journalist and author and analyst ashutosh he was a bit of a scare but made it in the end ashutosh welcome so that's a three versus three unlike a college or university debate where you know the people you are debating with here we've taken three different people put them together made them into a team now they need to either sink or swim together so best of luck to all of you now i want to introduce you to a very imminent jury i want to introduce first aryamar sundaram aryamar sundaram is one of the country's senior most lawyers one of the sharpest legal eagles and a very fine debater himself he's never missed court on a friday afternoon so he, and therefore he's made a great effort to come here and we're very thankful for that aryam ashundram welcome a very sharp debater himself this time without his political robe but only as a thinker and analyst can we have a round of applause for former member of parliament of the rajya sabha bjp spokesperson author and analyst swapan das gupta swapan das can we have a round of applause please our last member of the jury just so that it gives a feel of being a serious debate which it is actually uh, is deepak varma he is the president of the debating society of india and a very fine debater himself so can we have a round of applause for deepak varma please deepak welcome so i said earlier that we won't tell you who speaks first okay there are two teams the teams need to decide who speaks first so i hope they've made up their minds let's call the first speaker who will speak for the motion that secularism is dying in india are you ready are pehle decide karke aana chahiye tha itni der wa kya kar rahe the okay okay see this this is i'm saying this is where teamsmanship comes out uh, and whether they've got a plan not got a plan here what here 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 riju they have only 3 minutes they can't go on any more than that so here it is one two trinamool spokesperson riju datta speaking for the motion to explain why he thinks secularism is dying on the watch of the modi government riju go thank you good afternoon to all let me start off by quoting one of the tallest leaders of bjp this country has ever seen bharat ratna shri atal bihari bajpai ji and he said सरकारें आएंगी सरकारें जाएंगी पार्टियां बनेंगी पार्टियां बिगड़ेंगी पर ये देश रहना चाहिए और इस देश का संविधान रहना चाहिए एंड सेकुलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन दिस कंट्री एंड रिमेंबर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इज एट द स्टेक सेकुलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन इंडिया हाउ डू यू नो दैट यू नो सेकुलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन इंडिया वेन द प्राइम मिनिस्टर पार्टिसिपेट्स इन कॉन्सेंट्रेटिंग अ न्यू टेम्पल एंड ममता बैनर्जी हैज टू टेक आउट अ मल्टी फेथ रैली टू री एफर्म आर फेथ इन द secularity of this country you know secularism is dying in this country when the ruling party does not have a single muslim member of parliament you know secularism is dying in this country when the ruling party does not care about article 14 15 and 21 of the constitution in in the desperate bid to push a ethno religious nationalist ideology of hindutva you know secularism is dying in this country जब आपके मुंह में है राम पर आपके दिल में है नथू राम यू नो सेक्युलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन दिस कंट्री व्हेन जय श्री राम फ्रॉम अ वॉर्म ग्रीटिंग बिकम्स अ लिंचिंग वॉर क्राई यू नो सेक्युलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन इंडिया व्हेन अ जस्टिस ऑफ कैलकाटा हाई कोर्ट कैन नॉट डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन द अपोसल ऑफ हिंदू मुस्लिम यूनिटी महात्मा गांधी एंड अ कोल्ड ब्लडेड मदर नथू राम गॉड से यू नो सेक्युलरिज्म सेक्युलरिज्म इज डाइंग इन दिस कंट्री वेन अ तबली की गैदरिंग is termed as terrorist spreading corona during lockdown whereas the kumbh mela gets a go ahead you know secularism is dying in this country when a law which is unconstitutional and undemocratic like caa is implemented on the country where religion chooses or religion decides whether you are a citizen of this country or a refugee how can religion be a fundamental definition of identity in this country you know secularism is dying when the ruling government practices theocracy and not secularism you know secularism is dying in this country 
when BJP, because of their brute majority, practices majoritarianism. What I mean by that is one temple, one God, one food, one religion, one nation, one election, one language, one party, and one leader. And when majoritarianism triumphs, secularism dies, and with that dies the ethos of India. It, this moments like this, I remind the, it, it remembers me, I remember the last two lines of Rahul Tindori Sahib. Sabhi ka khun hai shamil yaha ki mitti mein, Hindustan kisi ke baap ki thodi hai. And I'll just finish off by saying, there is one politician in this country, Mamta Banerjee, who's the definition of secularism. She celebrates Durga Puja, she celebrates Eid, she celebrates Buddha Purnima, she celebrates Guru Nanak Jayanti. And I hope, and I hope and pray for the sake of our future generations that what Bengal thinks today, India will think tomorrow. Thank you, thank you very much. It's good to debate and it's good also to score some political brownie points with your boss. So Riju Dutta, well done for that. Thank you very much. Our first debater who argues that secularism is dying because religion determines whether or not you can be a citizen of this country. I want to call upon now our first speaker speaking against this motion to talk about why secularism is not dying and the team speaking against the motion has chosen interestingly Shaila Rashid to come and tell us why secularism is not dying. Shahzad says this is Nari Shakti. I see some strategic mind games at play as well. So it gets interesting. Shaila Rashid who once epitomized what was wrong with this government and spoke out very longly, very strongly. Please explain why you think secularism is not dying in India. Your time, Shaila, starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Secularism in India has never meant dharm nirpeksta. Our constitution, for example, provides that minority institutions can receive state grants. We are not secular in the sense that the West is, or God forbid, China is. Indian secularism was always about Sarvadharm Sambhav. And when the new parliament building was inaugurated, ceremonial prayers of all faiths were held there, including Islam. So I ask, if the Prime Minister of my country, why should he have to be ashamed of being a Hindu? If I am proud to be a Muslim, why can't Prime Minister Modi be a proud Hindu? I ask you. Secularism means treating everyone on merit. A Muslim cricketer recently got the Arjun Award. A Muslim educationist got the Padma Shri. A Muslim lady is in charge of space programs such as Aditya and Chandrayaan. That is secularism. Secularism means that the state does not discriminate against anyone. Nobody is turned away from a common service center on account of their faith. Secularism means that we need to think beyond our communities and I as a Muslim, you as a Hindu, you need to think about what will take our nation forward. That is secularism. When we uplift ourselves, we uplift our communities and we uplift our nation. Many people accuse past governments of appeasement. Now, I would like to disagree with this view because at the peak of the so-called golden era of secularism, we had the Sachar Committee report saying that Muslims are doing worse than SC and ST communities. This is now being rectified through schemes such as PM Avas Yojana, PM Mudra Yojana, PM Kisan, Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana, which are benefiting Muslims largely. At the height of the so-called golden age of secularism, if some of you remember, we used to have terror blasts. We used to have incarceration of Muslim youth. We used to have POTA, TADA, UAPA. Now look at the last 10 years. There is peace in Kashmir. There is peace outside Kashmir. Terrorist incidents have, res uh, has, have reduced. There is, fear, there is fear of law. There is rule of law. And who does that benefit? That definitely benefits the minorities. In Kashmir, in the last uh, four or five years, lives are being saved. Who are these people whose lives are being saved? They are Muslim. So are the, is the government not saving lives of Muslims by taking a strong stance against terror, by ensuring that there is fear of law, by ensuring that there is rule of law? Yes, it is. So I ask you, when we say that the secularism is dying, let's take a moment to recall the, what the golden age of the secularism looked like. Thank you very much. Okay, can we have a round of applause for Shaila Rashid for arguing why she thinks secularism is not dying in India? Very nice. Good to see camaraderie, teamsmanship. Now for our next speaker, 
have you decided who speaks first because you seem to be deciding on the fly but that's fine too pehle aap pehle aap going on can we hear can we have a round of applause for shama mahamad to come and speak about why she thinks secularism is dying in india and this is a very quiet audience please feel free to show your love affection brick bats do whatever just don't throw anything at us you got some food on your table okay don't throw anything <laughs> apart from that you can make as much noise as you want when you hear something you like or hear something you don't like shama mohammed tell us why is secularism dying in india your time starts now in 1961 jawaharlal nehru said we talk about a secular state in india in hindi perhaps we cannot find a word for secular some people think it means something opposed to religion that is obviously not correct what it means is that a state which honors all religions equally and gives them equal opportunities nehru secularism never mixed religion with politics or elections he sought to prevent indian politicians from exploiting religion for political gains and sanction those who promoted religious polarization Although it has been unevenly enforced section 123 of the Representation of Peoples Act 1951 the law that guides the conduct of elections in India forbids politicians from campaigning on religious themes fast forward to today what do we see the present prime minister mr narendra modi invokes religion at every possible opportunity not an election speech goes by where he is not talking about mandir or talking about gods The most dangerous thing is the ecosystem created by the present dispensation. Now what do I mean by the ecosystem? Let me give you an example. In 2019, Pragya Thakur inside the parliament said, "God se desh bhakta hai hai aur rahega." He is a terrorist, God say for us. And what did the prime minister do? He said, "Main kabhi maaf nahi karunga." But then what did he do? Nothing. She continued as a member of parliament. What do the people of India think? This is a norm. It doesn't matter. that is the ecosystem when bilkis banu's rapists were released ck rolji a bjp mla who was part of the state government and panel that recommends the remission to all the 11 men found guilty said some of the convicts in the gujarat 2002 riots are brahmins with secular sanskar and values they may be fixed due to their past family activities did the prime minister of india condemn it no he did not so what happens to the ecosystem what happens to the janta they think this is the norm bjp leaders like kapil mishra says goli maro salo ko who is the salo the muslim minority did the prime minister of india condemn it say something about it no then what happens to the janta they think ye to norm hai sahi bola hoga hate speech is not fringe anymore it is the norm in 2023 india documented 668 hate speech that targeted muslims in the 2002 22 report on international religious freedom highlighted continued targeted attacks on religious minorities including christians muslims sikhs dalits and indigenous communities narendra modi says sabka saath sabka vikas but he also says those indulging in arson can be recognized by their clothes hame use kapde se pehchante hain uska matlab kya hai uska matlab kya hai 86 of people 86 people percent of the sorry, people shama uh, i know you got lots okay, of people you know but there's, there's no time you. you can't speak anymore it's just finished. one last thing sorry, i just want actually, to say that's why your time is india is not at the today you could end up getting negative marks for your team shama there is no time left the 2024 lok sabha elections will determine whether india remains problem, a secular democracy or the problem a democratic is, one party this is not a television show so you can't browbeat or bully the anchor unfortunately fortunately for me actually uh, but your time's up shama thank you very much that was shama mohammed speaking and trying to explain why secularism is dying she had so many pages written out i got a little concerned that oh my god what's going to happen to the rest but then the buzzer goes off so that's the amount of time that you have so thank you shama for that uh, calling upon next uh, speaker to speak about why uh shahzad punawal has been very charitable and chivalrous pehle aap pehle aap oh you've decided ah teamsmanship spirit here okay shahzad's taking charge and showing teamsmanship okay hindol sen gupta comes up next to explain why secularism is not dying in india hindol are you set your time starts now Ladies and gentlemen good afternoon if truly secularism was dead in India would we be having a debate in a five star hotel about secularism 
Do note, ladies and gentlemen, that if secularism was truly dead, if secularism was truly dead, would I be the only Hindu member of a team with two other Muslim members defending the fact that secularism is not dead? I put to you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I put to you that my colleagues, debaters, are so fascinated at scoring points about their or for and against their political masters that they've forgotten that the real topic of today's debate is, is secularism dead in India? What India are we talking about, ladies and gentlemen? Is it the same India that one of my debaters mentioned that his party head had to take a rally out when the Ram Temple was built. Well, I would argue that that she could take a rally out against the Ram Temple in India proves that secularism is not dead, ladies and gentlemen. It is exactly the reverse. It is exactly the reverse I put to you. I want to say to my colleague, you come from the same city which organizes one of the biggest Christmas festivals in, in the world in Park Street where I spent my childhood and you still argue secularism is dead? That's not fair, ladies and gentlemen. I put to you that when you look at a, de a debating topic like this, you must think as an Indian, not as a party person. And what is this India? It is the same India where only six years ago, ladies and gentlemen, Asia's biggest church was built in the same India in Nagaland. It is the same India where for the first time a woman parliamentarian from India who is not Muslim can go to Medina and have many Muslim commentators around the world including Hassan Surur say that this is an epochal moment in the history of Islam. It's the same India. Secularism is not dead. Quite on the contrary, India is showing what secularism truly is. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people spoke about Ayodhya. It's interesting, is it not, about the Ram Temple, that one of the main Muslim litigants uh, on the Ram Temple issue finally accepted that double the amount of land was actually given to the Muslim side to build a mosque compared to what was given to the Hindus to build a temple. And therefore, therefore, Iqbal Ansari showered rose petals on the Prime Minister when a roadshow was happened and the Ram Temple was consecrated. Secularism, ladies and gentlemen, is alive and well in India. Secularism is alive in many, many ways. It is alive because, do you know who's the biggest landowner in India after the government of India? It is an organization called the Catholic Church of India. Okay. Thank ladies you, Hindon. Thank you very much is alive. Thank for that, thank you. So we've had two speakers speak both for and against the motion. This is where I go across for the first time to our jury to get them to give us some sense of how it's going. Aryamar Sundram, do you think your wards are doing a good job? What would you tell them? Well, I think it's uh, very determined, whatever each one is saying. They feel they're right. As far as I'm concerned, I'd like to hear what they really think secularism ought to be in India. Ah, he wants to hear, go, go deeper. Shwapanda, going well, not going well? Uh, what are you liking, not it's, liking? It's, it's quite fascinating. It's quite rhetorical, quite interesting. I have a few questions which I would like to ask. Maybe I'll ask it later, but just for one moment. When did India become secular? Was it India always secular? Or did it become secular only in 1950 or maybe in 1970, uh, which was? 76. 76, 42nd Amendment. Second question, I'm a bit intrigued when he said, I think it was Riju who pointed out one nation, one, one uh, language. He also mentioned one food. What is this one food we are talking about? <laughs> As long as you guys have some food in your plate, right? That's all that matters. Deepak, how's it going? I think it's going fine. It would have been a little more uh, appropriate if people had gone into the fact that secularism is always going to be a difficult concept in a diff deeply religious country like India. And therefore, how do you handle it? So I think a little more background would have been advisable. Interesting. So thank you for your first uh, comments. I just want to tell everyone as you're busy eating, remember you have to vote after this. We have this QR code. If you don't have it, just look around. 
find somebody who will give it to you you need to log in not right now there'll be a counter it will go for 1 minute 20 seconds that's when you vote and decide who carried the day now for our last uh, set of speakers uh, speaking for the motion secularism is dying in india there's only one person left so can we hear it fashtosh please ashutosh TV anchors are good when they're on TV. Can they be good debaters? Ashutosh, your time starts now. I have never been a good debater, but I know how to speak. Uh, to start with, a High Court judge retires, joins BJP next day, and says he can't choose between Gandhi and Godse. Need time to think, and still we believe that secularism in India is is not dying. Then one has to be delusional or ideologically blind. Secularism as an idea was a defining principle of the modern India, in which every religion has to respect other, whatever faith one one has. Secularism cannot discriminate. If a state starts discriminating between the different faith and the religion, there is something wrong with it. In India today, the state is discriminatory. It discriminates between between different faiths and different religion. That has to be understood. In fact. today the media is unabashedly has become communal and i'm saying this with all my responsibility that was the last bastion when we started our journalism the secularism come what may has to be reflected in our reports and analysis not anymore and unfortunately unfortunately today when a tomar manoj kumar tomar when he when he hit somebody doing namaz in front of a mosque then he is hailed as a as a hero he is not the only one there is one chetan sharma who killed three muslims in a, in a, in a train and he was hailed as a as a hero and then there was one uh, ragar he burnt he killed and when he was to be produced in udaipur udaipur court he for two hours police could not do it because the thousands of supporters had gathered out that area and they hoisted a flag at the top of the court that can be nothing can be more bad than this but what is worrying is the worrying is that this has a sanction of the state it is not secularism is no longer a guarantee by the constitution secularism is no longer a guarantee by the government secularism is not modi's guarantee today that's unfortunate part of it the fact of the matter is and i still remember what sardar patel has written to mr ms golwar on 11 september 1948 and he said and he said ki you hindu rss is good but the fact is when he attacks muslims full of venom and i still remember what the golwalkar has, has written in his book and he said the muslims has to live like a second class citizens that's a, that's the unfortunate part of it but those today who are in the government they inspire from that ideology so i don't blame i don't blame tomar i don't blame chetan i don't blame uh, gangopadhyay i blame the the, the 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 ideological system it is here today and i dread to say this but if this continues okay. unhindered india is heading Ash for a historical accident it's better okay. we revive secularism thank otherwise you. we are dead thank you very much can we hear it fashtosh please our last speaker now spe and remember after this we'll have one round of interjections the jury will speak one at a time and then all of you votes so i hope you're ready for that national spokesperson of the bharatiya janata party can speak no more than 3 minutes your time starts now secularism is not dying in india explain why members of the jury this august gathering the opposition argues that secularism is dying in india i want to give you a sad piece of news nehruvian version of secularism is dead and i have one black cloth so that i can reiterate that the paul bearers of nehruvian secularism ought to know that it's never coming back that secularism which says that women and men can't have equal rights in the name of personal laws from shabanu to triple talaq is dead that secularism which says that the uniform civil code should not be applied and a 9 year old girl should get married to a 60 year old 
girl who has three wives is dead and it's never coming back. That secularism which says that Tazia should come out on the streets but Durga Puja Visarjan Yatra should not till the time the High Court has to intervene is dead, Riju Datta. And that secularism which says that the partition was secular but the CA law which was committed by Mahatma Gandhi to get the refugees back from Pakistan and Bangladesh is communal, is dead. Today I ask only one question, it's Ramzan. Ya Allah, mujhe is Neruvian secularism se kya mila? Mila to keval lynching or riots mila. Hashimpura, Bhagalpur, Meerut, Nalyana, Bhagalpur, all of these riots, Ahmedabad, Jalgaon, Nelly, Delhi, all of them happened under Nehruvian secularism's watch. 10,000 Muslims were chopped, it was almost 3,500 Sikhs who were butchered and one Prime Minister got up and said, Bada ped girta hai to dharti hilti hai and Sajjan Kumar and Jagdish Taitler were defended in the name of Nehruvian secularism. I ask, what did I get in Nehruvian secularism? Zero taps, zero toilets, zero houses, zero bank accounts and today when 25 crore people are out of poverty, when 13 crore people get toilets, 13 crore people get nal se jal, Shaila gets it, Sagarika gets it. Uh, Mohit gets it, Mohammed gets it, at that time secularism is in danger. I want to ask that what is this logic that when the UPA government bats for, secular, for CA law, when it implements it for two years, when it makes a parliamentary report that the Pakistani minorities, the Bangladeshi minority should get it, when Manmohan Singh stands up and says in Rajya Sabha that we ought to have this law and when Mahatma Gandhi advocated for it, it is secular then but when the BJP walks the talk, it becomes communal. I want to also ask the question that today abusing Sanatan, you said kicking a namazi Ashitosh, abusing Sanatan and saying Sanatan should be eliminated. Udhainidhi Stalin said it, High Court, Supreme Court came down heavily on it. That is secularism. But kicking a namazi is communism. Nobody justifies that. But I ask you today, when Ram Mandir is abused, when Ram Charitamanas is abused, and if I say, Sir, Tan se juda mat bolo, then I am communal. But Udhainidhi Stalin saying that Sanatan should be eradicated is becoming secular. This is the double standard. Your hypocrisy should be dead, actually. When I go to a iftar party wearing a topi, I'm neither a rosadar nor a Muslim, and I go to a state-sponsored iftar party, that is secular but if a practicing Hindu does the Anushtan and goes to the Ram Mandir Prat Pratishtha, that becomes communal and to answer Swapandas Gupta, India or Bharat was not secular because of the addition of a word in the preamble, Bharat was not secular because of some Nehruvian concept of secularism, Bharat has always been secular because Bharat has a majority of Hindus and the Hindus of this country are secular and as long as the Hindus will be secular, Bharat will be secular, nobody can take that away from us, long live secularism. Okay, good. It's good to see some camaraderie between the opposing sides. Here's what we'll do next. One of our members of the jury gets to observe, weigh in and say something which will be responded to by either of the teams. So you can decide who wants to go first. Very brief observation. Drawing from what you've heard, not from the biases that you brought or the views that you brought, drawing from what you heard, a very quick one minute interjection uh, comment from any of the members of the jury. I think Aryama Sundram has his mic up. I actually found one person who touched on the point as to first understand what is secularism in the Indian context and then debate the issue whether it's dying or not. Otherwise, you don't know what you're killing or what you're keeping alive. And I feel that is one thing I find that apart from probably one speaker, nobody has gone near as to what is the secularism in the Indian context. Okay. May I ask Ashutosh a question? He pointed out that the media has become deeply communal of late. I mean, that was one of his observations. Now, I remember a time when I started off in journalism and we used to have lines such as, last Friday afternoon, a crowd of people of belonging to a particular community came out on the streets shouting, din, din. That was the sort of, is that supposed to be secularism? Where you obfuscate, don't talk about the realities. Yes, of course, here, you can, you can stay there. I get you the mic. But no, you can sit if you want. You have only one minute to answer, okay? So there's only one minute to answer. A, Just bring the count. That, that's a very typical of the right-wingers. You take one anecdote from the history and you say this is the general theory. The fact of the matter is everybody knows that how the riots were reported. Never Hindus and Muslims have ever mentioned by name. Today the chief minister mentions that. Is that secularism? Is, is media the way during the pandemic the minority communities were demonized in this country? Was that secularism in, in media? 
I think this is the time where we should introspect, we should find out why so much demonization. If somebody from the Kashmiri speaks a word, he's treated like an enemy on the, on the TV channels. If somebody who's a Muslim with a dadi, he's treated like an enemy of the, of the state. I think we have to understand, we have to introspect. And I said it, and I believe in, into this, that unless we, unless as a nation we realize, the country is heading for a historical accident. Where will it lead? I do not know. The history is a witness for that matter. And uh, Sopan, the fact is, you also know, and I also know, what is secularism. Secularism is a constitutional guarantee by the constitution. It is not a Modi's guarantee, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you, Ashutosh. Uh, no, you can't add to that because that's just one by one and now Deepak Kaur. Question to Shahzad. You can sit, Shahzad. Sit, sit, sit. Free country. You ended by saying that the Hindus are secular. How do you establish that? May I start? You have one minute, go for it, time's clicking. Much before the preamble had the word secularism inserted in it at the time when half of the opposition was in jail at the peak of emergency, thousands of years before that the Parsis, a community that I am very close to, landed up on the coast of Gujarat and they asked if they could have refuge here facing persecution from the planet they came from and the Indians Hindus gave them refuge. In the entire world, the Jews were persecuted, especially in Western educated Europe, but the only land, the only Bhumi where the Jews were not persecuted in any point of their history was the land of Bharat, and this was thousands of years ago, and therefore, India is secular because yahan ka swabhav, yahan ka jan mana secular hai. This is our existence. It is not a creation even of one word in the constitution. It is not the creation of some anglicized model of secularism that was imposed Post upon us, it is exactly how you are, and therefore, even if though I'm a Muslim, I start my day saying, Ram Ram Ji, kaise ho aap? Thank you, Ashutosh. Now we'll have one round of interjections. Uh, this is for one minute, and ideally made by someone who hasn't had an opportunity to pipe in so far. So, uh, and this is not based on what you would like to say ideally because you came with a long speech and this much is left. No, not that. From what you've heard from the others some argument that you wish to tear apart. Uh, don't look at me, you guys are a team. Both Riju and Shama have a hand up. Look at each other and decide because your time's about to start. Let's go for it. So Shahzad said something that what is it against the Hindus? I want to make it clear. I'm, I'm a Muslim brought up by my father saying that Hinduism is the most tolerant religion. It's not against the Hindus. That is what, it's, what we have to be clear about. It is what has happened after 2014, especially when you see in parliament, you hear Jai Shri Ram. Vande Mataram is at the start of the session and at the end of the session. We hear it all the time. We hear Bharat Mata Ki Jai continuously. I remember when Meenakshi Lekhi came to Kerala and told them, say Bharat Mata Ki Jai, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Why do you force this on us is the question today. We want to live together. That is the most important. Mr. Savant in, in uh, the Chief Minister of Goa says, I'm sorry, you ca I, I can't get you beef for five days. It's not available. But in Haryana, Nasar and Junaid are burned alive on suspicion of transporting cow. So what's happening in this country? What we see is secularism means all religions are equal and e all of them should be given equal opportunity. Nobody is against the ecosystem started in 2014 because there okay. is no Your condemnation from the top. So thank you for that Shama. I just also want to tell our debaters and everyone sitting here that you can use the interjection to actually put somebody on the mat by asking them a question which he needs to respond to which is based on something that he said but you didn't do that which is fine as well. We now have somebody from the against team uh, making an interjection. Hindal has the mic out. Go for it. Since I'm the only one interested in history, professionally at least, let's make a historical point. A lot of people mention Nathuram Godse. Perhaps they don't know that Rathuram Godse in court gave a statement saying he stood for a secular version of India and he never said, he said he never wanted any mixing of religion with politics in India. This is recorded statement of Nathuram Godse. He said he objected to Gandhi because of what happened with Pakistan and India and the division of the country, but he personally always stood for a division between politics and religion. And the other thing, the other point I really wanted to make was Prakya Thakur was mentioned. Well, 
actually Pragya Thakur's case is a wonderful example of how secularism is alive. She said something, lo behold, she doesn't have a ticket today. So, you know, in my mind, this is a perfect example of secularism. You do something, well, you don't have a ticket. Uh, what better could be? What, what better? Okay. Know, a, Thank you, Hindal, a, for that. You know, lots of uh, people who are sitting here are messaging and some who are watching on digital and social are messaging. So I'll use my uh, perch as the session chair to ask Shaila Rashid this question. Many people are messaging me and saying, Shaila ko kya hua? Given what she was and who she was earlier as a trenchant critic of the Modi government, they're saying, is this discovery of secularism or is this pressure? Shaila Rashid, one minute, go for it. Uh, so it's uh, quite clear that the last 10 years have not been an easy have not been, uh, you know, an easy conversation between the government and the Muslims. But what we need to realize is that what has ended, the era that is over that we are talking about, is an era of tokenism. What has ended is lip service to the Muslim cause. Now, let me give you a small example. The scheduled caste reservation, for example, does not include Muslims. And this was the golden age of secularism under Congress. But now we see the EWS reservation. Does it discriminate against Muslims? Does it leave out Muslims? It does not. So for example, the PM Vishwakarma scheme, if you look at it, it has 18 crafts listed under which youth are given training and they are given some per diem and they are given some livelihood. Now these crafts are primarily practiced by Pasmanda Muslims, but the scheme doesn't say that. So actions speak louder than words. That is what has changed. Earlier we used to have only words, now we have actions. Without paying lip service, without saying Muslim, 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 the government is teaching us, it is enabling us to stand on our own feet. That is what has changed. Okay, so thank you Shaila for that. We're coming now to the business end of this debate. I just want to tell our debaters that you have one minute each for final comments. One person from both teams, whoever has not spoken ideally that. Before that, from the jury, your final comments and then the voting. So whoever wants to speak first. Uh, just one minute each. Comments, one minute I think each. all of them are quite passionate in whatever they have said. I just want to ask a question. How does saying Bharat Mata Ki Jai or Vande Mataram undermine Muslims? Okay. Since everybody has a minute to answer, I want to ask you all a question. Do you think the question of secularism being under attack or not being attack, under attack is because India seems to have made a departure from what is the philosophy of secularism? The philosophy of secularism is the state is not disassociates itself from religion. It is actually a passive role the state plays. Whereas the Indian constitution appears to lead, as was said by a nine judge bench in the Supreme Court, to a positive concept in India, whereby the state participates with one rule. The state does not have ethical morality. It does not have religious morality. It has constitutional morality. And constitutional morality means that political parties cannot bring religion into their political agenda because that is according, I'm quoting the Supreme Court, constitutionally impermissible and therefore constitutionally immoral. I would like it if anybody can comment okay. as to whether this so is you the have cause to do this. of Remember, In the concluding comments that one of you makes, you have to respond to the jury and what you've heard. It's not what you're itching to say because everybody's already got his hand up and they're itching to say something. It's not necessarily what you're itching to say. It's in response to what you have because we have a very smart audience and the sharpest minds sitting out in the audience, they'll be judging you. So respond to what you're hearing from the jury. Ask, ask uh, Aryaman, has faith got to be vetted by the Supreme Court? You know, I have a plan. We set up a separate debate on the sidelines and do an adda. Swapandas Gupta versus Aryama Sundaram. Who's joining me for that later? That'll be fun as well. On, on a lighter great. vein, if you gave the Supreme Court a chance to decide it, they would. <laughs> oh, we can have the nine judge uh, constitution bench of the Supreme Court weighing in on this and we can have Swapan and Aryama argue on both sides. That'll be a lot of fun. Our Law Today team would be very excited about that. Deepak Varma, final comments. Uh, any particular direction you wish to take this debate in and then final words. Mike. I would have been sort of, I would have expected that people talk about the difficulty of having a Western concept like secularism incorporated into India. And 
the original debates in the in the constituent assembly about that so that that is something we did not come out at all during the conversations deepak is not very impressed with the whole debate he like i'm not here okay we'll we'll hopefully uh, the debaters will in the last chance they have rise to the moment it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who hasn't spoken it could be anybody in the team whoever wants to have a go uh, to speak first or against the motion no so because we started with speaking for so this time we'll start with against so speaking against the motion that secularism is dying and then you can because we started with you we'll end with you so here's your chance you have only 1 minute shahzad punawala the last speaker the last comment after which is audience voting shahzad punawala explain based on what you heard from the jury why you think secularism is not dying your time starts now uh because we veered around the gandhi godse debate and let me tell you what was the gandhian concept of secularism the gandhian concept of secularism was he himself said ram rajya hona chahiye his final words were hey ram he wanted that the cow slaughter should be prohibited but the nehruvian form of secularism even dumped gandhi and by the way the only person who's built a godse mandir babulal chorasia is in the congress party and he continues to be there so that much about their godse love but having said that this is the true idea of secularism that the congress party departed from and which we are returning to today and only one last point exposing the hypocrisy these people call themselves secular they have allied with uddhav sena which destroyed the babri masjid according to them they are allied with the muslim league in kerala from where she comes from and they are allied with isf furfura sharif who said he wanted hindus blood in west bengal this is their secularism and our secularism is very simple that the concept of our vedas the secularism is imbibed in that that is the secularism ram and krishna are on the pages of the constitution but they say ram ji ke bare mein baat karna is communal this is where congress is at okay thank you so our last speaker the last one minute of this debate and then we do the voting you can come here riju he got this uh, debate off to a flying start let's see how he wraps this all up your time starts now final comments speaking for the motion that secularism is dying in india on a topic when secularism is dying in india my dear friend from the bjp spoke about how many toilets were built and how many taps were built well shahzad if you are in power for two consecutive terms and the majority of 150 crore people are voting for you pardon my french but that's your bloody job to do secondly hinduism does not need protection we have survived we have survived the mughals we have survived the british and we will survive the bjp as well it's a religion of compassion generosity and we are all in it together but that does not mean we will under mind somebody else to make us look superior i have learned my i am a practicing hindu i have learned my religion from my parents and from my grandparents the custodian the self declared custodians of hinduism do not understand that hinduism traverses them all and it will stay even after them even after me even after this country hinduism will stay here forever but what hinduism does not teach us is to undermine others to make us look superior and if you want Ladies to know that, with that where we come to an end of this debate thank you very much for joining us Bengal. for the first knives out conclave debate can we have a very big round of applause for our debaters you know and i just want to say before we begin the voting that it doesn't really matter who won or lost just the fact that they came they made the arguments that they did for us they're all winners but of course there must be a winner and somebody somebody gets a pen and somebody gets something much fancier than that right so let's do that now so this qr code that i spoke of is now going to come on your screen so if you can zoom in and download the qr code from the screen fantastic remember once this starts you have only 120 seconds to conclude so i hope that everyone's got that tech game spot on right and you also have this uh, qr code on the table in front of you so just pick out your phone go to the qr code and then start to vote so um, i hope you're all ready we're just kind of building it up because you actually have just that limited amount of time once this gets kick started to conclude your voting if you aren't able to conclude that we can't really help you because that's just the way it is and because this screen may be too far away from some of you therefore this sheet of paper is also somewhere near you or you could just reach out and get one from someone who's nearby but hopefully our tech team's done a great job and you're being able to download straight from that QR code the question is secularism is dying in india that's the motion that we've been debating you've heard from say so you, you guys can't vote i hope you're not shahzad bhai 
you're not voting right oh i thought he's like okay i have a 5 pm on his channel i'm giving the time for that the, the biggest concern is i hope elections aren't rigged and i hope the debaters aren't voting for themselves right that's not allowed so don't do that uh yeah i don't know i hope our evm is good i hope our evm is good we have confidence in the india today group digital tech team they've done a good job and hopefully it's working out really fine okay so we have 116 seconds left okay 116 seconds left it's on your screen right now and this is live voting so as you keep pumping in your answers this keeps changing you get to vote only once you can't change your mind at this moment uh 20% 21% of the respondents are saying secularism is dying in india 75% are saying no secularism is not dying 4% seem confused because they can't say i mean how can you not say you said it's a great debate you cannot possibly say you can't say who are these 3% not lot maybe they didn't get any food and they're upset ki india wale ne khana nahi khilaya so don't do that i hope you're voting now 22% secularism is dying it's going up just with i think the nose really just went out and voted straight up the other team is getting their votes out very slowly we've got 68 seconds to go i don't know what shahzad is doing he's looking very dangerous he's like you know mai apni army ko lagaya tha because this qr code if you try online i don't know if you can do it from home i hope you don't have the full bjp army doing that download the qr code from social and digital and then what he's already passed whatever message he had to their toolkit is already activated if required or it could just be all of you it could all also just be all of the evm hack karne ki zarurat nahi hai janta hi hacked hai okay fine we've got 43 seconds to go before we wrap up this debate if you haven't voted still please do this is your last chance and i hope it's only people who are here who are voting because that's the whole idea you can't i mean you can i suppose if you're elsewhere and you were really quick like a quick gun murugan you pulled it out looked at the qr code you could do it from outside as well 26 seconds to go is secularism dying in india you know this is where is, is rajdeep here because rajdeep gets really excited he says i can call the election that's when everyone else at the back end gets really worried saying don't call the election because it can change but rajdeep says agar 11 second mein nahi hua to ab change nahi hoga and i think that's quite correct so on the motion of whether secularism is dying in india the india today knives out debate the results are in front of us 76% of the respondents who are present over here hopefully with no fixing no hacking no toolkits they've come to the conclusion that secularism in fact is not dying in india so they've carried this motion can we have a very warm round of applause please very warm round of applause it's good to see some camaraderie between uh, our debaters i now want to call our team with the awards and the prizes and can we get the members of the jury to give away the awards to the winning team so if you can just come here arema sundaram shwapan das gupta deepak varma can we have a round of applause for them as well please and can we call our winning team first shehzad punawala hindol sen gupta shaila rashid uh, and those fancy gifts for our winners for making so much of an effort and just just give it to the gift So you can come, uh, Sh Shaila. Please come, Shopanda. There's a lot of pehle aap, pehle aap happening. Huh? There's a kind of formed good camaraderie and teamsmanship. Sir, unko de do please. Ek ek karke de do. Yes, thank you. Yes. So thank you very much. So group photograph. That's the winning team. Can we have a round of applause for our winners, please? they argued against the motion that secularism is dying and they carried the debate at knives out thank you thank you very much thank you please come back can we have the team that fought hard but didn't carry this motion couldn't win the audience uh, can we have riju datta here please shama mohammad ashutosh please come No, just give it to the give it to the jury, and they'll give it to the guests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So please come back. If the jury can just stay with us, can we have the last three? Uh, can we have a token of appreciation for our jury, please? Uh, can I invite Kali Puri? Uh, Uh, Kali Puri to come our managing director executive editor in chief it was her idea that we do this uh, knives out conclave debate so can we have a round of applause please and can you bring the last three gifts for our jury starting with Shopan Das Gupta
Aryama. Aryama said, I've never missed court on a Friday afternoon. This is a very expensive debate. So thank you for that, Aryama. And Deepak Orma, thank you very much. Can we have everyone coming here for one photograph? Five minutes. She, she came uh, with a let's full... Let's put it together for Rahul Aray, for moderating this. Put it together for Rahul for moderating this. Ho gaya bhai, ho gaya. Ho gaya, Shahzad bhai, ho gaya. Jeet gaya aap. Okay, can you all stand and can we get a photograph? And thank you, thank you very much. I hope you guys had great fun. Thank you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, raise a warm applause for the jury and our panelists this afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank the panelists. Give us about five-minute clearance time. We hope you've had a sumptuous uh, lunch and enjoyed a sumptuous debate as well. We're going to just clear your tables and the stage and we'll be back in exactly five minutes. Give us about five minutes, we're going to clear the tables. We hope you enjoyed lunch, we hope you enjoyed the debate and we are ready to go into our next session, just about a couple of minutes and we are back on. We'll start two tales of conviction, courage and cricket. This session sponsored by NIA.
once again introducing to you our next session sensational start two tales of conviction courage and cricket session sponsored by nia to take it from here inviting on stage our session's moderator nikhil naz consulting editor sports in there today Good afternoon everyone, if you can just settle down and then I'll call upon the two guests, they are waiting there in the aisle. I'll just allow the waiters to just clear the tables. If, if I could request everyone to just take their seats, please. Because the two guests are waiting, if you could just take your seats, thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I know that this is probably the toughest session to moderate, simply because this is the first session after your working lunch. And uh, you know, I know after a sumptuous meal that you've just had, and sleep knocking on the doors, it's going to be tough. I understand that. But guess what? We've got the perfect antidote to your sleep uh, in the two guests that are going to be coming up. What has actually made matters worse, and I just realized it while coming today, is that today also happens to be the World Sleep Day for some reason. But uh, I'd just like you to celebrate your World Sleep Day maybe in another 10 hours or so. As I mentioned, the two guests that are going to be coming on stage are the perfect antidote. I say that because they're full of beans. If they show even half the energy that they showed on the cricket field, boy, are you in for a fine session this afternoon. Before I call them on stage, I'm going to give you a bit of a context. So for those of you who haven't been following cricket, you'd understand who I'm talking about. Uh, and for that, I'm going to rewind a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, the English team came to India with the famous hyped approach called Basball. And to make matters worse for the Indian team at that time, two of their stalwarts in Ajinkya Rahane and Cheteshwar Pujara had been dropped. And then to add to India's misery, you had the superstar of Indian cricket, Virat Kohli, take a break from that India versus England series. And then there was, there was more trouble around the corner. And then. The two players that were going to replace the two stalwarts in KL Rahul and Shreya Sayyar, they were battling injuries too. So India had their backs against the wall. If I was to say that, that would be an understatement. So what did the Indian team do at that time? They called upon two youngsters to come and step up into the shoes of a few legends that were supposed to play. And the rest, as they say, is history. Those two youngsters, one of them, got a 15 both the innings of his first debut test match to help India win that Rajkot test. And then this next youngster in his second ever test match for India scores a 90 and a match winning 39 to get the man of the match and to help India win the next test and with that win the series. So with a huge round of applause, we are delighted to be joined by two future superstars of Indian cricket in Sharfraz Khan and Dhruv Jurel. Please welcome them.
थैंक यू सो मच आप दोनों का आने के लिए हमारे प्लेटफॉर्म पे बात करने के लिए एंड माई फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन ऑब्वियसली इज वेन यू आर प्लेइंग जब सीरीज चल रही थी तब कई बार आदमी को पता नहीं चलता क्या हो रहा है यू डोंट रियलाइज वॉट यू गाइज हैव अचीव नाउ यू हैड अ बिट ऑफ टाइम थोड़ा डाउन टाइम मिला है हैज इट संक इन रियलाइज हो रहा है uh, कि क्या किया ध्रुव आपके साथ शुरुआत करूँगा नहीं सर इट वॉज ऑलवेज बिन ए ड्रीम टू प्ले टेस्ट क्रिकेट क्योंकि which i believe that test is a purest form of cricket mm. i always dreamed that i want to play test cricket and i was very sure that i'll play test cricket some day so sir acha lag raha hai ki test cricket khela and i am glad that i contributed contributed for my team in a uh, win so sir always been a dream and dream come true moment for me sir first instagram followers badh gaye suddenly aapne realize kiya जी बिल्कुल कुछ टाइम तीन चार साल से मेरे 600 700 के के पास ही थे सडनली इंडिया खेलने के बाद 1.5 मिलियन हो गए तो ठीक है बढ़िया है द पावर द पावर ऑफ इंडियन क्रिकेट ही वाज आउटस्टैंडिंग मैं मैं ये जानना चाहता था कहीं आपको ऐसा तो नहीं लग रहा दोनों को इतने साल से ड्रीम था फिर आप टेस्ट क्रिकेट खेलते हो इतने अच्छी परफॉर्मेंस जो मैंने मैंशन की कहीं ऐसा तो नहीं लगा लोग टेस्ट क्रिकेट टेस्ट क्रिकेट बोलते हैं वट्स द फर्स्ट ऑल अबाउट ऐसा तो नहीं लगा नहीं मेरे लिए तो ऐसा नहीं है क्योंकि बचपन से सुनते हुए आ रहा था और रियल क्रिकेट टेस्ट क्रिक, टेस्ट क्रिकेट को ही माना जाता है तो मतलब मेरे अबू यही बोलते थे कि टेस्ट क्रिकेट खेलना है जब हम लोगों ने खेले और ऐसा नहीं था कि प्रेशर नहीं था ऑब्वियसली उस समय था तब वहाँ पर खेल के पता चला कि हाँ भाई रियल टेस्ट क्रिकेट यही होता है क्योंकि शरफराज मुंबई से है मेरा अगला सवाल थोड़ी मुंबई भाषा का इस्तेमाल करूँगा ध्रुव लेकिन आपसे सवाल है बैस बॉल बैस बॉल हम सुनते रहे इंग्लैंड की टीम बैस बॉल ले रही है बैस बॉल की तो वाट लगा दी आपने सर वो उनका तरीका है क्रिकेट खेलने का इंडियंस का अलग तरीका है मेरे को लगता है कि फाइव डेज हैं तो उनका यूटिलाइज़ क्यों नहीं करते क्योंकि इफ़ यू प्ले टी ट्वेंटी और ओ आपको एक दिन में रिजल्ट मिल जाता है बट इन टेस्ट क्रिकेट यू हैव टू विन सेशंस और कभी सेशन डाउन हो फिर जीतना अगला तो हर एक मैंने गेम में रहते हो आप दोनों टीम तो मेरे को लगता है कि इफ़ यू वॉन्ट टू प्ले टेस्ट क्रिकेट यू हैव टू विन सेशन बाई सेशन क्योंकि मैं बैस बॉल क्या है आप लोगों को पता होगा बैस बॉल का मतलब है टू प्ले अग्रेसिव क्रिकेट and i think if you were to compare the two teams there was only one winner there only one team played aggressive cricket that was india i wish main wo footage chala pata but main sharfraz ka ek ek session tha ek play tha markwood versus sharfraz markwood dalta hai 150 km ph pe he hits him for a four no look shot niche dekh ke straight down the line the bowler gets angry bowls a bouncer at him he hits him for a four again piche ki taraf फिर वो और गुस्सा होता है एक और शॉर्ट बॉल आती है देन ही हिट्स हिम फॉर अ सिक्स देर उसके बाद उसका गुस्सा पूरा उतर गया ही जस्ट गोज बैक टू द पवेलियन वो अभी हाइलाइट्स देखते हो गूस बम्स आते हैं जब वो मोमेंट चल रहा था जी बिल्कुल अभी तक तो वैसे शॉट सिर्फ रोहित भाई को मारते हुए देखता था टी वी तो जब मैंने भी वैसे शॉट्स मारा ऑब्वियसली इतने टाइम से उस चीज़ों की प्रैक्टिस चल रही थी तो उस उस समय इतना नहीं पता चला लेकिन जब रील्स हम देखते हैं तब तो ऐसा हाँ भाई मैं ही हूँ वेल डन करके अच्छा एक चीज़ आप दोनों ने कही एंड ये थोड़ी क्रिटिसिज्म भी होती है इंडियन क्रिकेटर्स की कि अब आई आ गया टी ट्वेंटी आ गया है और आप दोनों ने आई खेला भी है तो टेस्ट क्रिकेट की अब वो इम्पोर्टेंस नहीं रही है uh, आपने कैसे इस जनरेशन के होने के बावजूद आप दोनों ने टेस्ट क्रिकेट को कैसे उतना इम्पोर्टेंस अभी भी दी है क्या है माइंड सेट आप में सर माइंड सेट तो मैंने आपको बताया था टोल आई ऑलवेज वॉन्टेड टू प्ले टेस्ट क्रिकेट आई स्टिल रिमेम्बर इन माई अंडर नाइनटीन डेज दे आज मी वन क्वेश्चन वट आर योर गोल्स सो आई वॉज अ सिम्पली टेलिंग दैम दैट आई वॉन्ट टू प्ले टू हंड्रेड टेस्ट मैचेज फॉर इंडिया एंड आफ्टर दैट आई रिलाइज दैट्स अ लॉट बट आई वॉज वेरी श्योर अबाउट टेस्ट क्रिकेट नहीं कभी ऐसा नहीं लगा इन अगेंस्ट द ग्लैमर ऑफ आई पी एल टी ट्वेंटी अभी आपने बोला भी कि माई बैट इज इचिंग टू गो टू प्ले आई पी एल थोड़े चक्के मारने उसके ग्लैमर में कम तो नहीं हुआ आपकी नज़रों में कभी टेस्ट क्रिकेट नहीं सर जब आ, आपको पता चलता है कि यू गोना डेब्यू तो आपको जो बैगी कैप मिलती है आपका उसमें कैप नंबर लिखा होता है और वो बैगी कैप आपको कोई सीनियर प्ले देता है सर उसकी फीलिंग बहुत अलग है हम हमेशा से बोलते आए हैं कि वाइट बॉल रेड बॉल लेकिन मेरे को लगता नहीं इन दोनों का कोई कॉन्टेस्ट भी है टेस्ट क्रिकेट इज़ वेरी वेरी सरफ्राज नहीं सर देखिए ऐसा है कि क्रिकेट में ऐसी चीज़ है कि आपको बस हर चीज़ में मेहनत करनी है अगर वाइट बॉल क्रिकेट आ रहा है तो आपको उसके लिए अलग से प्रैक्टिस लगती है ऑब्वियसली टेस्ट क्रिकेट डिफ़िकल्ट है क्योंकि पाँच दिन तक चलेगा वो लंबी लंबे रेस का घोड़ा बनना पड़ता है उसमें तो डिपेंड करता है कि आप प्रैक्टिस कैसे करते हो अगर आप दोनों चीज़ को साथ में लेके चल सकते हो तो वो बहुत ही अच्छा होता है 
तो अच्छी प्रैक्टिस की ज़रूरत होती है अगर टी आ रहा है तो उससे पहले हम वाइट बॉल से अच्छा प्रैक्टिस करें प्रिपरेशन करें और डेज मैच के टाइम पे ज़्यादातर विकेट पे रुकने की कोशिश करें वो माइंडसेट दिमाग में लेके चल तो डिपेंड करता है अच्छा हाल ही में बी ने भी अच्छे स्टेप्स लिए हैं टूवर्ड्स टेस्ट क्रिकेट सडनली द मैच फी हैज़ इंक्रीज सो टेस्ट क्रिकेट को वो इंपॉर्टेंस दी जा रही है वट यू टू मेक ऑफ दिस स्टेप्स द बी सी सी आई टेकन ध्रुव आप शुरू कर सकते हैं सरफराज नहीं सर एक बहुत अच्छा इनिशिएटिव है बट मैं और सरफराज तो फिगर आउट कर रहा है कि वो क्या इनिशिएटिव है अभी ढंग से समझ में आया कि वो उन्होंने कुछ वो निकाला है लेकिन है इनिशिएटिव क्योंकि जैसा सर आए थे उन्होंने बताया दैट वी टुक इनिशिएटिव दैट वी आर गोइंग टू इंक्रीज योर सैलरी तो वो मेरे को समझ में नहीं आया लेकिन ये है कि हाँ खाम का वो एक एक टेस्ट क्रिकेट के लिए बहुत अच्छी चीज़ है आई टेल यू वाई इज ई सेंग समझ में नहीं आया बिकॉज इट्स अ वेरी कॉन्वुलेटेड फॉर्मूला सो यू हैव टू बी अ मैथ जीनियस टू अंडरस्टैंड सो आई फिगर इट आउट आफ्टर द सेशन आप दोनों के साथ एक छोटी सी मैथ क्लास होगी आई एल एक्सप्लेन बट या वट यू मेक ऑफ जो ये स्टेप है बी सी सी आई ने लिया नहीं हमने भी समझने की कोशिश किया लेकिन समझ नहीं पाए जैसे कि आपने बताया जब आप समझ जाओगे तो हमको बाद में आप भी समझा दें <laughs> okay maybe this question is best asked after the session after i have uh, you know that session with you in the private one thing that is common in both your stories and it's an incredible story from where these two come uh, you know humble backgrounds to have made it this far uh, is the role of their parents uh, you can understand how much uh, their parents played an important role in their life i'll just mention two things Uh, Sarfraz here wears a jersey which is 97, which is his birth year, but it's also 97. It is dedicated to his father, who worked throughout his life to have him as a Test cricketer. Because nine and seven in Hindi will be no or sat, so Noshad is his father's name. So that's why he picked the 97 jersey. Just tells you the role that his father played. <laughs> Dhruv, Dhruv, on the other hand. the day he made his debut you know sometime people put their own pictures that i'm getting this debut this is my cap his instagram had the picture of his father and his mother and i'll read the caption that he had mentioned he had written aap dono se zamana hai abhi aur bhi naam kamana hai this is what he had paid a tribute to his parents when he got picked for the indian team dono se aap main janna chahta hu just ek koi story bachpan ki जो आपको ग्राउंडेड रखती है जब आप मैदान पे खेल रहे हो जितना भी फेमडम मिला जितने भी बड़े आप स्टार बने आप हमेशा वो स्टोरी को याद कर लेते हो बचपन की अपने पेरेंट्स की और आप ग्राउंडेड रहते हो सरफराज आप स्टार्ट करेंगे सर मैं तो आ, आ, कई बार ऐसा होता था कि दिन भर ग्राउंड पे रहता था छोटा था और दो दो महीने मैंने जब समर वेकेशन का टाइम होता था दिन भर हम ग्राउंड पे रहते थे तो मैं प्लॉट पे भी सोया हूँ ताकि घर पे जाने पे मुझे आठ नौ बज जाते थे लेट हो जाता था मैं फिर सुबह पाँच बजे उठ के आऊँ फिर सुबह प्रैक्टिस दिन भर मैच और शाम में प्रैक्टिस तो यही सब चीज़ें मतलब कि मैं बहुत ग्राउंड पर रहा हूँ विकेट भी बनाई है माली लोगों के साथ रहा हूँ और एक टाइम ऐसा भी था कि जब इनिशियल आगे बढ़ रहा था मैं क्रिकेट जस्ट चालू किया था तब डैडी का मेरे ट्रैक पैंट का धंधा भी था मैंने ये सब चीज़ें कहीं किसी को बताई नहीं लाइफ में तो वो पूरी जम्बो थैली पीछे बाइक पे आगे रख के और अब वो आगे ड्राइव कर रहे हैं ऐसे पकड़ के बारिश में भीगते हुए जाना वो सब लेके तो बस इतनी मुश्किल से आगे आया हूँ मैं उनके साथ मेहनत करके कई सारी चीज़ें देखी लाइफ में तो ये सब सोच के इंसान ज़्यादा उठता नहीं है नीचे ही रहता है लवली इस फादर कुडन बी हेयर ध्रुव आपकी कोई बचपन की कहानी सर हमेशा से सो माई फादर वॉज इन आर्मी सो आई ऑलवेज वॉन्टेड टू जॉइन आर्मी एज ए मिलिट्री लाइक स्पेशल फोर्स तो ये था बचपन से सो आई वॉज जस्ट प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर एन डी ए तो ज़्यादा मन नहीं लगता था टू बी ऑनेस्ट बताऊँ बस पापा को इतना देखता था माई फादर वॉज वेरी डिसिप्लिन इन टर्म्स ऑफ डाइट ट्रेनिंग एंड ऑल तो मैंने उनसे उनसे बहुत कुछ सीखा क्योंकि सुबह वो जाते थे पाँच बजे शाम को आते थे तो डिसिप्लिन बचपन से ही था तो मैंने पापा पापा वॉज नॉट इन ए फेवर टू कि मैं जाऊं और क्रिकेट खेलूं बिकॉज मिडिल क्लास फैमिली की होता है कि जस्ट गो एंड डू गवर्नमेंट जॉब कि इससे दोनों की फैमिली सिक्योर हो जाएगी तो मैंने पापा को बिना बताया मैं क्रिकेट स्टार्ट करी थोड़ा खेलने लगा फिर पापा को पता चला कि ये वो पापा ने मेरे को कन्विंस करने की कोशिश करी कि जस्ट डू नॉट प्ले क्रिकेट जस्ट फोकस ऑन योर स्टडी तो मैं नहीं माना तो अब सॉफ्ट कॉर्नर तो था कि पापा तो मान नहीं रहे मम्मी मानेंगी तो मैं मम्मी को भी पूछा मम्मी थोड़ा कन्विंस हुई फिर पापा से बात करी फिर दोनों एक पेज पे तो मैं करूँ तो करूँ क्या अब तो आ, मैं मैच खेलने लगा तो पापा को बोला कि पापा मेरे को बैट चाहिए तो पापा ने समाओ करके वो स्लॉगर बैट था एक कश्मीर विलो का वो कैसे करना कैसे दिलाया फिर मेरे को किट चाहिए थी 
तो वो किट आती थी शायद पाँच छः हज़ार की आती होगी तो पापा को बोला पापा ने बोले इतने सारे रुपए मेरे पास नहीं है तो क्रिकेट छोड़ दे तो मैंने बाथरूम में नहाता नहाता बोला अगर तुमने क्रिकेट किट नहीं दिलाई तो मैं मैं घर छोड़ के चले जाऊँगा तो मम्मी ने सुन लिया सारी मम्मियाँ ऐसी होती हैं तो बोले कोई बात नहीं मेरे पे एक गोल्ड चैन रखी है वो बेच दो और इसके लिए किट ला दो तो जब टू बी ऑनर सर जब इतना रियलाइज़ नहीं हुआ मेरे को कि मम्मी ने इतना बड़ा सेक्रीफाइस किया थोड़ा मैं क्रिकेट खेला ये वो तो मेरे को रियलाइज़ हुआ कि बहुत बड़ा सेक्रीफाइस किया है तो मैं सिक्सटीन नाइनटीन शायद खेला ही खेला था तो मैंने मम्मी को प्रॉमिस किया था कि जब भी मेरी कोई अच्छी अर्निंग आएगी तो मैं आपको गोल्ड के सामान दिलाऊँगा तो वो लास्ट ईयर मैंने मम्मी के लिए किया Uh, how much he loves his parents uh, was also visible on the cricket field uh, when he got his first half century he kind of dedicated it to his father uh, if we have that image i'll show it to you for those of you who saw that match you would know what uh, dhruv did but he saluted his father when he got to his first half century you know luckily enough uh, that's it that was his salute to his father who's a Cargill war veteran uh even though i'm running short of time but you know what his father is here so i'm going to take that liberty sir main ek cheez puchna chahta hu aapse uh inhone to salute kar diya aapke liye lekin fauj mein ek tradition hota hai na jab koi salute karta hai to salute wapas karna hota hai to main chahta hu ki is salute ka aapko reply dena padega aur apne bete ko salute karna padega aap kar sakte hain hamare liye agar khade ho jaye aap to मैं भी इंडियन आर्मी में था और ये भी इंडिया के लिए खेल रहा है तो सलूट वाली बात है तो मार सकता हूँ सलूट वो भी भारत के लिए खेल रहा है बिल्कुल तो दे दीजिए लवली सर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच अच्छा सरफराज आपने ये जो कहानियाँ सुनाई ना इसमें आपका ये पता चलता है कितनी मेहनत आपने की कितनी मेहनत आपके फैमिली ने की यूजली uh, जर्नलिस्ट को तो हमेशा क्रिटिसिजम ही मिलती है हमें कि हम लोग अपना काम ठीक से नहीं करते बट मैं आपको बताना चाहता हूँ कुछ कुछ कंट्रीब्यूशन मतलब पॉइंट ज़ीरो ज़ीरो वन परसेंट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन आपके डेब्यू करने में इंडिया टुडे का भी था अब आप पूछेंगे ये कैसे था तो मैं आपको एक इंटरव्यू दिखाता हूँ जो आपके सिलेक्शन से कुछ चंद महीने पहले हमने किया था हमारे एक्सपर्ट हैं सुनील गावस्कर Uh, unhone kya kaha tha main aapko sunana chahunga if you have that video up please what do you make of sharfraz uh, you know his non selection in test matches do you think his time is going to come his time his time is definitely i mean with the scores that he is getting he has to he has to be uh, pretty much in the frame because you know at the moment sometimes you know you start to feel frustrated what do i need to do he scoring runs he scored triple hundreds double hundreds as i mean you reckon it's his fitness that probably goes against him so i think at the end of the day if you are unfit you are not going to score hundreds so the cricket fitness is most important if you're looking for only slim and trim guys then might as well go to a fashion show and pick some of the models and ask give a bat and ball in their hands and then include them but that's not the way cricket goes okay so this particular line that mr gavaskar said that if you're looking for slim and trim guy go to a fashion show uh, and don't see cricket that became headline across all the media and sure enough few months later if mr gavaskar says something that carries a lot of weight sure enough few months later sharfraz made his debut to so, kuch 0.1% contribution humne kiya aapko pata chala tha iske bare mein नहीं मैंने सोशल मीडिया पे एक दो बार ऐसी वीडियो देखी थी मैं गावस्कर सर को भी थैंक यू बोलना चाहता हूँ साथ ही साथ इंडिया टुडे को भी जिन जिन्होंने मेरे लिए हेल्प की है जिन्होंने भी मुझे सपोर्ट किया है उनके लिए बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया अच्छा जब जब थैंक यू बट जब जब आपके टफ टाइम चलते थे जब ये क्योंकि मिस्टर गावस्कर यहाँ पर कह रहे हैं ना आपने सुना कि आदमी फ्रस्ट्रेट हो जाता है यू आर मेकिंग अ लॉड ऑफ रन इन डोमेस्टिक क्रिकेट हंड्रेड आफ्टर हंड्रेड एवरी सीजन द टॉप रन गेटर बट यू आर नॉट गेटिंग पिक सो so, आपके फादर तो शेर व शायरी करते हैं वो मोटिवेटेड रहते हैं कुछ शेर सुनाया था आपको जो आप हमेशा याद रखते थे इन दैट टफ टाइम नहीं मैं पूछता था उनसे कि अबू मैं कब इंडिया खेलूँगा ऐसा वैसा तो वो सिर्फ बोलते थे कि मैंने बोला अबू हमको कौन सा पेट सपोर्ट कर रहा है कि नहीं कर रहा है तो बोले कि मैं तुझे सिर्फ एक ही चीज़ बोलना चाहता हूँ वो भी शायरी में बोलते थे कभी गिरते तो कभी गिर के संभलते रहते बैठे रहने से अच्छा था कि चलते रहते और चल के हम गैर के कदमों से कहीं के ना रहे खुद के पैरों से चलते तो चलते रहते तो बस उन्होंने यही बोला कि 
तू इंडिया के लिए खेलेगा तभी भी तुझे रन बनाना है और तू नेक्स्ट मैच अपना डोमेस्टिक का खेलने जा रहा है ये सोच के जाके तू इंडिया के लिए खेल रहा है वहाँ भी तुझे रन बनाना है तो मेरा बस एक ही काम था कि जिधर भी मैं खेल रहा हूँ मुझे बस रन बनाना है lovely great great attitude to have maybe a lot of us can learn from that dhruv uh, kyunki humne gavaskar sahab ki baat ki unke liye to tareef ki unhone ek aur cheez keh di hai abhi which is and this is coming from the legend sunil gavaskar that this man sitting next to me mr gavaskar thinks is the next ms dhoni he said it on record uh, that he's going to be the next ms dhoni that's how well he's done in that limited space no pressure pressure to nahi hai नहीं नहीं थैंक यू सो मच गावस्कर सर यू इतना बड़ा ही धोनी सर का नाम बट मैं पर्सनली uh, बोलता हूँ कि धोनी सर ने जो किया है वो कर नहीं सकता है एक ही धोनी था है और रहेगा मेरे को बस ध्रुव बनना है जो भी कर लगूँ एज ए ध्रुव करूँ जो भी मैं कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकूँ इंडिया के लिए एज ए ध्रुव करूँ लेकिन धोनी सर इज ए लेजेंड वो धोनी सर धोनी सर ही रहेंगे अच्छा मैंने सुना आपके व्हाट्सएप में उनकी इमेज होती थी जो आपकी डी अभी भी है दिखाएँ जल्दी से his dp on whatsapp i had heard was of ms dhoni i'm just going to quickly test it that if it's still there khol ke mat dekho it is it is it is i i'll put the photograph up a little later it is still of ms dhoni acha i'll tell you very interesting why is it that you must be wondering that mr gavaskar compared him to next ms dhoni i'll i'll illustrate it with a picture okay so this happens in dharamshala test and ms dhoni is just not known to be a good wicket keeper batter ms dhoni is ms dhoni because he's a sharp thinker behind the stump he tells the bowler what to do and that's a bit of genius that he dhruv displayed in the dharamshala test match i'll show you with an illustration of a couple of pictures that we have uh, the first picture is from the first innings of the dharamshala test and this is dhruv jurel i nahi meri awaaz hai wo acha so this is dhruv jurel uh, uh, saying to uh, was that you sarfraz or badega aage badega aage uh, that is your awaaz <laughs> like, uh, and and not his nahi meri awaaz isse puchho kiski awaaz hai wo sach bata kiski awaaz thi badega aage बढ़ेगा आगे बढ़ेगा आगे किसने बोला शॉर्ट लेग पे कहूँ भाई लेग स्लिप पीछे वाले पे हूँ मैं इधर वहाँ से तो आवाज आ ही नहीं सकती आपकी वहाँ अरे मैं ही मैं हूँ ध्रुव बोल रहा है उसकी आवाज़ है अरे नहीं मेरी आवाज़ है मैं आपको सुनाऊंगा रील पे ध्रुव किसकी आवाज है बढ़ेगा आगे तूने बोला था तो तू बता दे मैं हार मान जाऊंगा शॉर्ट लेग पे कहो तुम दिखाओ तुम्हें अरे मैं थोड़ा ही पीछे हूँ यहाँ से इसे आगे बढ़ाओ ध्रुव चलिए अभी के लिए मान लेते हैं कि ठीक है ठीक है ना क्योंकि आप दिख ही नहीं रहे यहाँ पे क्या आपको कैसे आइडिया लगा कि आगे बढ़ेगा एंड गेस वॉट हैपन्स आफ्टर दैट लेट मी शो यू द नेक्स्ट इमेज सो यू एन आइडिया दिस इज द बॉल बिफोर वो आगे बढ़ता है एंड ध्रुव जुरेल स्टम्प्स हिम और उधर उधर देखो कौन खड़ा है पीछे वो फोटो गलत दिखाई अच्छा यू तक नहीं आपको कैसे लगा आगे बढ़ेगा मुझे क्योंकि उससे पहले वाली बॉल पे मैं शॉर्ट लेग पे खड़ा था सामने की तरफ ठीक हाँ. है और उसके सेकंड बॉल जिस पे वो आउट हुआ मैं लेग स्लिप पे है तो मुझे पता था कि लन से पहले तीन बॉल बची है और वो बचने के लिए सिंगल लेके उस तरफ जाने की कोशिश करेगा और मुझे पता था कि कुलदीप भाई के पास अच्छी गुगली है इसीलिए पहले उनको मैंने बोला बढ़ेगा आगे बढ़ेगा आगे उन्होंने गुगली फेंक दिया आउट हो गया लवली प्रूफ आपका वर्जन नहीं सर मेरा तो काम है एज ए विकेट कीपर ना तो मेरा काम है बोलो को बोलते रहना ऐसा कोई प्रडिक्शन था नहीं मेरा मेरे को सिर्फ बोलते रहना मैंने बहुत बहुत सारे डिसमिसल्स में बोला है जो हुआ भी है नहीं भी हुआ जैक क्रोली वाले में बोला है मैंने तो सर मेरा ये काम है अगर मैं बोलने को नहीं बोलूँगा तो कौन बोलेगा कि मैं बीच में खड़ा रहता हूँ अच्छा ही डिड दैट एंड एंड कंटिन्यूसली थ्रू आउट द मैच दिस वन अदर थिंग ध्रुव जो आपको बहुत प्रेशर होता है एक तो ये दूसरा होता है डी देखो मैंने बोला भी नहीं ही सेट डी सो टेल मी विच इज टफ डी आर एस की कॉल सही लेनी में आप पे ज़्यादा प्रेशर होता है या प्रेशर वेन यू आर कीपिंग टू स्पिनर्स लाइक कुलदीप यादव रविचंद्रन अश्विन रविंद्र जडेजा इनको कीप करना भी बहुत टफ है और डी आर एस में रोहित भैया खड़े हैं वो भी बहुत टफ है टफर क्या है सर तीन रिव्यूज़ मिलते हैं बट वही है कि सा, साथ में जैसे सरफराज हो गया और कौन करता शॉर्ट जो नज़दीक वाले रोहित भाई हो गया उनसे ज़्यादा पूछा जाता है 
तो सर आपको पता है तो आपको आइडिया है कि हाँ एज लगा है इम्पैक्ट बाहर है लेकिन आप बोल नहीं सकते मतलब बोला आप में हाँ भी लग रहा है लेकिन दो तीन सीनियर आए नहीं नहीं तो लग रहा है अब मैं क्या बोलूँ तीन सीनियर बोल रहे हैं ये और मैं बोल रहा हूँ ये तो सर अभी डेब्यू सीरीज थी तो इस चीज़ से थोड़ा सीखा है कि हाँ थोड़ा बोलना पड़ेगा फिर वो गलत हो जाता है उनका नहीं देखा जाता कि उन्होंने क्या बोला कि ध्रुव ने क्या बोला ध्रुव ने क्या देखा very tough i i don't envy you this is the toughest job that there is on the planet but i can now you know now that i'm thinking i can believe jo sharfraz was saying he was the one who must have said that i'll tell you why i'll quote another example that happened in that uh, particular series there is a player called shoaib bashir from england pakistani origin he comes out to play and he's batting and first thing that you can catch sharfraz saying on the stump mic isko hindi nahi aati isko hindi nahi aati isko bolo सो बश बशीर से नहीं नहीं मुझे थोड़ी थोड़ी हिंदी आती है सो दैट वॉज जस्ट अ टेस्ट नाउ इज फिगर आउट दैट बशीर नोज हिंदी नेक्स्ट बॉल आफ्टर दैट ही इज टेलिंग बशीर चल जल्दी से शॉर्ट खेल आउट तो ऊपर जाएंगे स्नो के माउंटेन घूम के आएंगे इन धर्मशाला यू सेट दैट राइट मैम देखो मेरा तो काम था उसे जल्दी जल्दी आउट करवाना ठीक है मैंने उसको बैट की भी लालच दी कि तुझे बैट भी दूंगा कहता मेरी बैट खराब है मैंने बोला ध्रुव के ले लेना लेकिन आउट हो जा बस ज अ मास्टर स्लेजर दैट्स वाई आपको जावेद मियादाद के साथ कंपेयर किया जाता है आपको अच्छा लगता है वो कंपेरिजन बोलते हैं अरविंदा डिसिल्वा जावेद मियादाद नहीं काफ़ी लोग बोलते हैं कि मैं मतलब जब मैं सिंगल लेता हूँ तो उनकी तरह लेता हूँ मतलब काफ़ी सारे मतलब कवर्स के पास से ले लिए कभी स्क्वायर लेग के पास से ले लिए सेम बॉल को तो बस ये सब अबू ने सिखाया अबू की देन है मार मारा भी बहुत है उन्होंने सुन रहे होंगे तो सुन लें ओके फाइनल क्वेश्चन द टाइम इज अब आई टेक वन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द टू ऑफ देम वन थिंग ध्रूव आई स्टार्ट विद यू आईपीएल है आईपीएल के बाद टी ट्वेंटी वर्ल्ड कप है ठीक है टी ट्वेंटी वर्ल्ड कप टीम के लिए वी डोंट नो हुज गोइंग टू बी द विकेट कीपर कैप्टन एवरी वन लुक विकेट कीपर बैटर एवरी वन लुकिंग एट यू एज द धोनी Uh, वो एस्पिरेशन है कि कैन यू बी पार्ट ऑफ द टी ट्वेंटी वर्ल्ड कप टीम आई यू गोइंग टू बी प्लेइंग द आई पी एल विद दैट इन माइंड सर टू बी ऑनेस कि मेरे को इतना सोचना नहीं है जो चीज़ मेरे को यहाँ तक लाई है वन डे एट ए टाइम जस्ट कंट्रोल द कंट्रोलेबल्स रेस्ट विल फॉल इन प्लेस तो मेरा यही है कि अननेसरी प्रेशर नहीं देना एक्सपेक्टेशन नहीं देनी खुद को जो होगा वो होगा ही अपना जो कर सकते हो हम वो ही करेंगे सर फ्रास्ट यू फाइनली यू डू नॉट हैव एन आई पी एल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट राइट नाउ टेस्ट सीरीज के बाद कुछ फ़ोन आए कोई फ्रेंचाइज के कि आ जाइए नहीं देखिए अभी ऐसा आई पी एल में बड़ा सीज़न होता है कभी कोई प्लेयर इंजर्ड होता है तो उसमें बुला लेते हैं कभी कभी बट मेरे हाथ में है कि मेहनत करते रहना ऑब्वियसली मैं नहीं हूँ फिर भी कभी मुझे कॉल आ गया तो उसके लिए डैडी ने प्रिपरेशन करके रखी है घर पर जाते साथ ही प्रैक्टिस करना है और साथ ही साथ रेड बॉल को भी साथ में लेके चलना है All right that's all the time that we have but uh, another huge round of applause to the future superstars of Indian cricket in Sharfraz Khan and Dhruv Jurel thank you so much your great audience Ladies and gentlemen please raise a warm applause for Dhruv Jurel Sharfraz Khan as I call upon Satya Manjula Deputy General Manager New India Assurance Company Limited to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to both the gentlemen This session sponsored by NIA. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hand together for this young dynamic duo. Thank you. Appreciate it. To more glory in the next coming days. and with that we are ready to go into our next session this evening ladies and gentlemen just 10 seconds turn around time on the dials and we are ready to power into our next session hope you are tweeting do tweet under the hashtag india today conclave 2024 and let's immediately dive in to our next session indian equity outlook 20 at the rate 2047 wixit market for a wixit bharat inviting session moderator on stage siddharth zarabi managing editor business today tv and shailendra bhatnagar chief analyst and editor markets business today
Ladies and gentlemen, could you please put your hands together for our guest, a uh, globally well-known commodity guru, Jim Rogers. Jim, welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon once again. Um, Jim, I must uh, tell you that Indians uh, are absolutely in love with cricket and the session before this was with two young upcoming cricketers. But after cricket, if there's one love that Indians have perhaps equally is gold. And ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rogers is known as the gold guru all over the world and not just gold, silver also fascinates him. So it's great to have you here at the India Today Conclave and we are talking about India and as you have described it at a very sweet spot in history. So I want to begin by getting you to tell us your latest views on India. You've been an India watcher for several decades. How is India looking to you at this point of time? Wow, that's a complicated question. First, I want to say to everybody here, because I tell many people in the world, that if you can only visit one country in your life, the country to visit is India. <laughs> well, this is a very serious because there is, I've been to many countries, there's no country like India, with man-made and natural sites, food, languages, religions, everything. It is an absolutely astonishing country. For those of you who have not seen the whole world, I will tell you, I tell every peop everybody in the world, if there's only one country, it should be India. So you are at the right place at the right time, and I have often been skeptical of the government in India, but for the first time in my life, I'm beginning to think maybe, maybe they're getting it right now, and maybe their things are going to change so that India is going to be even better in the future than it is now. So if Mr. Modi does what he says he's going to do, wow, wow. India, India is going to be even more astonishing than it is now. Now, as far as you want to ask me about India? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, well, uh, that's, a, that's a good start to the conversation, but uh, let's uh, get to ask you, uh, are you currently invested in, in India? Uh, if you are, why? And if not, explain the reasons. Well, I am not, I'm embarrassed to say. And the reason I'm not is the Indian stock market is now making all-time highs. Somebody's doing something right in India. But more important is many markets around the world, Japan, America, many markets are making all-time highs. And in my experience, when you have a lot of countries doing well at the same time, it usually means it's getting late. It's getting late in the day, and so I am watching. Now, it does not mean you should not buy because the market is making an all-time high, and I have certainly missed many markets because they make all-time highs, but at the moment I am not investing in India because everything is going right. You're doing a good job. Uh, Jim, you've been uh, uh, investing across the globe and across asset classes and chiefly in commodities, mainly in gold. Gold is also at a record high. Where do you think it is headed from now on and are you buying it these days? Well, gold is at an all-time high. If I were, and I own gold, I own a fair amount of gold and I have for many years. Everybody should own some gold no matter what. But I also own silver. Silver is down 50% from 
from its all-time high, and gold is at an all-time high. I own both, and if I were buying today, I would buy silver. Do you have okay. something on you? See? Are you gifting that to no, us? No, no, no. This is just... Okay, no. The, just for it's demonstration. It's the Indian magic trick. It's gone. <laughs> can you see it? Yes, it well, just, I can show you. This is a, this is a panda and a, a cub and a silver coin of 30 ounce, uh, Jim. This is just for demonstration. <laughs> no, we'll keep it till the show. <laughs> we were no. thinking this but was... But what about gold? Where is gold? the gold? I have, well, never mind. I have gold in my pocket. I have silver in my pocket for demonstration. I own both. If I were buying one today, I would buy silver. You no, know, I, I have learned a lot from India about gold and silver. You've been buying gold and silver for centuries, centuries. A lot of rich Indian women own a lot of gold and silver, as I have learned. So I own both and I hope to buy more silver soon. Okay. Jim, when you look at, um, you've yourself said you, are an India, you were an India skeptic and you visited the country earlier as well. What do you think has changed between then and now? Between then and now? When the first time I came to India? Oh my, oh my gosh, this is a different country. Some of you may remember India a few decades ago. <sighs> Nothing worked. People, the people in Delhi were not very excited if people made money. They did not want people to make money. They thought it was bad for people to make money. But now, for whatever reason, India has changed. If you go, in those days, a lot of Indians left India because they thought there were more opportunities outside of India and everywhere in the world. There were rich Indians, rich and successful Indians. But now, these, you have these great universities in India, and some of them are turning out extraordinary engineers. So a main difference now is there's a lot of entrepreneurship in India. There's a lot of, well, entrepreneurship and capitalism in India, and even more successful Indians now than in the past. Jim, uh, we have a chart right behind us and this is gold price, uh, 10 grams and silver price per kilo. Indian prices between 2019 and 2024, we can see the increase in prices both for silver and gold. And Indians continue to have this appetite for gold which despite the introduction of paper gold in India, uh, the government wants to increase that, uh, still remains so high. But we also have something called Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is at all-time highs. Between gold and Bitcoin, uh, what would you buy? I have never bought Bitcoin. I have no, never sold short Bitcoin. I do have a lot of gold and silver, as you can see. Uh, in my view, cryptocurrencies apparently are good trading vehicles. I have never bought nor sold either. I expect them all to disappear someday. Many of them have already disappeared. If you're a good trader, do it. Do it. Get rich. But I have no confidence in the future. Okay. Jim, everybody here would like to make uh, uh, a quick buck as far as markets are concerned. All of us want to get wealthy. You are wealthier than most of us here. I just wanted to understand over the next five years, what should people do sitting in India to create supernormal wealth? Well, your, mar your stock market is making all-time highs right now. You said for five years, I would not suggest that you own stocks for five years because nothing has ever lasted very long. If I were in India now looking for something for, I guess, agriculture, I guess farmland, I guess agriculture in India would be a fantastic investment for the next five years. So if any of you know how to drive a tractor, go and become a farmer. Okay. Well, uh, become a farmer, that's, that's, that's a pretty radical suggestion. Can you drive a tractor? Uh, I haven't tried my hand at it. See? 
he can, nobody can drive a tractor. Go and become a farmer. Okay, that, that's good advice. Uh, Shell, he's moving us away from the stock markets. Perhaps uh, you're concerned with the froth or overvaluations because like you said, the stock markets are at an all-time high. Gold is at an all-time high. Property is uh, doing very well in India, rising constantly. Bitcoin is high. But the larger macro question is, are the markets, are asset classes across the board overvalued uh, in India and the world and does it concern you uh, that uh, a big crash could be coming soon? Well, you just said it. Nearly everything you mentioned is at an all-time high. That's fabulous for everybody who's in the markets. But if everybody is making a lot of money, that usually is the time to get worried. I've been investing a long time all over the world. And when everybody is happy and singing and making money, you should start thinking about something else. And you should start thinking about something else. Uh, Jim, you always look at buying depressed assets uh, across the world. I think uh, the only depressed asset uh, in India at the moment are the opposition parties. Sadly, they're not listed, so we can't offer them to you. Uh, look at it from another point of view. Why not buy high and sell higher? Fabulous. Yes, you have just had good instructions if you know what you're doing and if you can do it. And there are people, and I have known people, who are extremely good at buying high and selling higher. And if you're one of those people, hooray, hooray, I will buy you a beer later. But most people who buy high do not make money, I want to even in India. I want to turn uh, the debate towards India and its position in the uh, global order. Uh, fifth largest economy on its way uh, to grow at near 8%, three years of consecutive 7% growth, no other country, large economy in the world has had that kind of growth. Uh, but very clearly, if we have to go ahead, we have China and the world's investment, especially in manufacturing in China. In your reckoning, where does China and China, the Chinese economy stand at this point of time? And what can India do to sort of benefit from the strategy where people all across the world are de-risking their supply chains? Well, you're correct. China is depressed right now. China had the virus and China had a property bubble. China had one of the biggest property bubbles in world history. They tried to stop it, but they were not successful. Then the market stopped it. And the Chinese property market is a huge disaster right now. One of the biggest disasters ever. So China is in the, has the problem of two things, the virus, the COVID virus, and the property disaster, it is hitting bottom. It's going to take a while. After any country has a huge bubble like China had, it takes a while. You bump along the bottom for a while, some, several years sometimes. So I see that China is doing better or stop doing worse, but I anyway would not be rushing to buy a lot of Chinese shares right now because they had a huge, huge bubble. Uh, what we'll show you, ladies and gentlemen, is a graph of how our markets, the US markets, and in particular, the Chinese market has performed over the last uh, uh, three years, and uh, they uh, actually are absolutely in sync with what uh, Jim has been talking about. You'll just see the graphic coming in uh, in front of you. The returns on the Nifty have been fantastic, uh, followed by the US markets, and uh, sadly, uh, the Chinese markets are depressed, as uh, uh, Jim says. Uh, but Jim, for us, uh, paint a picture. Uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, if the FDI flows come in, if what Mr. Modi promises in terms of changes in the macroeconomy, in the laws, happen to take place, where do you see India from now, 10 years later? Well, I will repeat, if, you, if, Mr. if Delhi does what it says, what it says what it's doing, and it opens, makes the currency convertible, and it makes the markets 
investable by everybody. Wow, India is going to be spectacular. Much of the market, the world maybe have a bear market in that time, but if India continues to open up, and if Delhi does what it says it's doing, it's going to help and encourage manufacturing, why not? You have the largest population in the world. You have a lot of very smart people. Those universities in India turn out a lot of smart people. So if, if Delhi is supportive and really supportive now, India will be great. But see, I have a history I remember. I remember, some of you might remember in 1990, the world was opening up. So Delhi said, we're going to open too. We're going to privatize, like everybody else in the world was doing. The communists were privatizing everybody. Delhi privatized one company, and it was a bakery. I mean, I said to myself, what is wrong with them? What's wrong with them? Why don't they privatize the whole economy like everybody else? Now, that has changed. This is not 1990 anymore. And as I said to you before, and I will say again, if Delhi really does what it says it's doing, wow, India is going to be a phenomenal country again. I want to turn the attention back to the global situation. It's said that when the United States uh, economy sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. What's your reading of the United States economy, particularly from the point of view that it's heading into elections, November will be the big uh, US presidential election and uh, markets all over the world are concerned at the outcome. Would it mean continuous printing of more money, for example? Well, I will tell you, I'm, you said people all over the world are concerned. I'm concerned. You should be concerned because, you know, <clears throat> one of the people who's running for president is over 80 years old. He's not very smart. The other person is nearly 80 years old. He's not very smart either. So I don't see I don't see that the next administration in the United States is going to be good for the world, nor good for the markets. I would suspect that the American stock market in the next two or three years is going to have problems, whichever one of them is elected. America is now the largest debtor nation, the largest debtor nation in the history of the world and the debt keeps going higher and higher every year. So, I mean, add it up. If you look out the window and you see staggering debt going up every day in a country that's run by people who are not very smart, I, I worry, I am worried. Uh, is that why you moved to Singapore, uh, Jim? No, no, no. I moved to Singapore because I wanted my children to speak Chinese and we could not do it in New York. It's purely because I see the rise of China as being important in their lifetime. Okay. Why just Mandarin? Why not uh, Indian language? We have hundreds apart from English. When I moved, when my children were born 20 years ago, India did not have the prospects then that it does now, if you ask me. Uh, I have, will say to you what I've said again. India now may be on the verge of having an amazing sweet spot. If Delhi does what it says it's going to do, India is going to change for the better very, very dramatically. So, uh, Siddharth and to everybody in the audience, uh, Mr. Rogers was always known as a Chinese bull. And uh, it's now only a matter of time that he'll turn into an Indian bull as well. Well, maybe if I have more children, which is very unlikely, I will teach them Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are actually looking at the world's youngest trader. <laughs> well, I will say the Indian women are the most beautiful in the world, so maybe I should have more children.
<laughs> okay, I, I want to ask you about uh, what you can tell our audience about your uh, best investment decision ever in your uh, lifetime and the worst mistake that you have made as a professional investor. You asked me about my best investments? Well, I will tell all of you that for many years, I thought children were a horrible waste of time and money and energy. I felt sorry for people who had children. Oh my gosh, how could you be so foolish as to have children? I want you to know I was wrong. I was completely 100% wrong about children. I have two children now. Everybody here should go home and have children. <laughs> go home for lunch, you know. And if you have children, you should have girl children. Girls are better than boys. I, I know that in India you think boys are better, but they're not. <laughs> Girls are better. So I hope everybody, everybody in this room will go home after this and have children. It will be good for India, good for you, and good for the world. What about your best investment decision? Well, that was my best investment. Uh, my worst investment, oh my gosh. Whew. I can tell you I have made many mistakes in my life. I have made, you want to hear about my first wife? Oh my gosh, what a horrible mistake that was. I guess my first wife was my worst mistake and my children are my best success. If you meet my first wife, do not marry her. A final question, Jim, to you. Uh, since uh, you troll the bottom when it comes to buying uh, quality assets at depressed prices, anything in the world at this moment that looks depressed to you? Anything in the world of assets that looks depressed to you? As a good opportunity to buy, uh, anything in the world that is currently according to your investment philosophy at depressed prices and something that's ripe for the picking? I guess probably the best opportunities now are farmland somewhere. Probably now, one of the great opportunities is farmland in Ukraine or in Russia. I am not buying farmland in Russia or Ukraine. I'm an American. But I have learned in history that if you buy a, something during a war, after the war ends, you're probably going to make a lot of money. And both of those countries have some of the best agricultural farmland in the world. So probably right now, farmland in Ukraine or Russia, I cannot do it, I am not doing it, but that's probably the best. If you know about it, but you don't know how to drive a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Not for you, not for you, <laughs> but for those of you who are smart and can drive a tractor, buy a farm in Ukraine. Well, you get me the land and I'll learn a tractor too. <laughs> Jim Rogers, thank you very much for your time with us. A round of applause for one of the world's best investors of all time. Thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, raise a warm applause as I call upon stage Shantanu Dhar, CHRO, Hindustan Powers, to come on stage and present a small token of our appreciation. Once again, please raise a warm applause for Jim Rogers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shailindras. Thank you, Sadat. Ten seconds and we are ready to go into our next session. There's a lot happening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow, by about this time, we know what the election dates are for 2024. So this next session that we have planned out for you, some of the top psychologists of the country coming together on one stage I'm giving you an idea on what is their idea as a look forward to 2024 general elections.
Once again, like I pointed out, by this time tomorrow, we know the election dates. It'd be an interesting session up ahead. The, some of India's top sophologists on one stage giving you an idea on what is their idea as a look forward to 2024 general elections. Inviting on stage to take it from here are two sessions moderators, Rahul Kaval, News Director, TV Today Network, Managing Editor, Special Online Projects, Executive Director of Business Today, and Rajdeep Sardesai, Consulting Editor, India Today. Your mics are next to you. Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's election time. The 18th Lok Sabha elections are upon us. It's the world's largest democratic exercise. And a critical question is, who will get how many numbers? At the end of the day, this is the numbers game. Across this country, people want to know not just who will win, but often by what margin. That's what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes. Dive deep into those numbers, try and understand cephalogically and politically which way is the country heading. So Raul and I are joined today by a very special panel of people who are going to stake their reputation by telling us who's going to win come the third week of May. Not just who's going to win Rahul, but by what margins. Who gets how many seats. And all of it is being recorded, gentlemen. So you will be tested on the day the actual results come out. So you've seen them dance on television. This is where their numbers will dance for us. We did this in 2019, just before the general election. And this was one of the most widely tracked sessions. It was buzzing on social media and digital television for very long. So we're very excited about doing an encore. Most of our cast and crew is the same. Some faces have changed, new talent has emerged. So allow me to introduce to you our guests, Pradeep Gupta, 
known largely for his dancing, sometimes for his numbers. Uh, Access My India, thank you very much, Pradeep. Yashwan Deshmukh, thank you very much for coming down all the way from Dubai. We've got Amita Aptiwari, used to be a sharp numbers wizard on the banking side, is now applying the same skill, the same uh, assessment and analysis to election data. I said, I'm a Bihari, I mean, politics is my blood, banking was something I was just doing for a living. So thank you. And GVL Narsimha Rao, I thought he'd come all suited, booted, because this is the conclave, he's come in his Neta Aftar. So he's clearly telling us, I'm Neta first, numbers later. I want to start by showing you the image as it stands. This is the picture from the last Lok Sabha. It gives you a sense of the starting point in this election. And then uh, we'll talk to each of the experts about where we may end up sometime in May. So, basis the last Lok Sabha elections, I'll just walk across and try and show this to you here. This is where things stand. So, in the states marked out in grey, the BJP maxed it. So, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, they've done as well as they could. The areas demarcated in this yellowish tone are the states where there is some room to grow. So they had an 85% strike rate in Maharashtra, 38% uh, in Odisha, 43 in West Bengal, 64 in Assam, 80% in UP, uh, Andhra Pradesh, they had nothing. So that's where you can grow. So that's the headroom that is available uh, for the Bharatiya Janata Party and for the National Democratic Alliance to grow in the 2024 Lok Sabha election. So the alliance needs to increase its strike rate from 40% to 57% in 16 states to achieve this target. Elsewhere, they've already peaked out in the Hindi heartland. So that's the starting point. To ensure that Rajdeep and I had to do the minimum amount of work and the experts did the maximum amount of work so we could juice them for uh, them having come here, we got them to send us some visualizations and some assessments on what they believe is critical. What do they think will determine this election? The Prime Minister says 370 power for BJP and 400 power for NDA. Will that happen? So I'll start by getting Pradeep Gupta to explain what he thinks can change. And since this is about cephalogy, it's about numbers, we'll get them to explain some visualizations for you. So the first visualization, this is done by Pradeep and his team at Access My India. It will give you a sense of what can change? So, Gupta ji, mic uthao, there's no music, so you only need to let the numbers dance. Uh, here it is, on your screen right now, his assessment on what can change and then you can explain it. So, at Access My India, we have divided these states into three major groups. The group number one, where you can see there are 257-250 odd seats, where NDA won 238, meaning 90% plus strike rate they scored. The first and foremost for NDA to cross 400 marks, they have to maintain their strike rate in these states and particularly if you can see in this group, Maharashtra is very critical and important state to be seen. So this is the group number one. And of course the Karnataka where BJP has done very good in last Lok Sabha election, but recently concluded assembly election, BJP lost very badly to Congress. So that is, these are the three states, Maharashtra, Bihar and Karnataka in this group to be seen closely. And of course, Delhi where Aam Admi Party and Congress has formed the alliance. So this will be interesting to see. Last time, all three fought separately. Now the group, Two is where... So can I just call that visualization? So what we've done is we've divided this into two parts. One is called happy hunting ground, where the BJP has the chance of doing better than it did in the last elections. And then we're classifying tough seats, tough seats where they haven't done well in the last elections and therefore uh, how have things changed. So Pradeep, there it is yeah. behind us. So group two is where BJP has done fairly good. They secured 60% of seats out of total 180 odd seats. So here is some scope or elbow room to improve their tally from 60% to maybe to 80%, which means about 30 to 40 odd seats, there is a scope in this group. And most important here is Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. In Uttar Pradesh, last time, BSP and SP fought together and secured 15 seats among them and Congress won one seat. 
so this will be interesting to see so there is a elbow room of about 16 seats in uttar pradesh bengal bjp won 18 seats out of 42 seats and 24 seats won by tmc and one seat by two seats by congress so here is another some scope one can say but it can go other way round as well particularly in bengal considering last assembly election they decimated the bjp in that sense and the third group which is very important and critical and everybody should focus particularly in nda side where there are about 100 odd seats the nda could won only five meaning five percent strike rate 95 percent strike rate in favor of opposition last time also last time aidmk had the alliance with nd and uh, bjp or nda meaning they have won one seat out of 40 seats in tamil nadu tamil nadu and pondicherry of course then the punjab this time also all four parties seems to be contesting separately last time akali dal and bjp had the alliance as nda and both of them won two seats each so this is the battleground for nda particularly try and improve their tally as much as possible to come close to 400 seats. So, so but essentially, but essentially, Pradeep, your, where I want to challenge you on this is that you are basically going by the premise that 2024 is a done deal. That it's all about whether the BJP gets 300 to 325 on its own and with allies goes to 350, 360 or the BJP itself goes to 330 to 350 and with allies goes to 400. Am I correct? Then essentially you are telling me despite the fact that there is possible losses in Maharashtra, double digit, Maharashtra, Bihar, to some extent the potential in Karnataka for the opposition. This election is basically about whether the BJP peaks at 320, 325 or whether it goes above 350. That's what the game is, right? Uh, uh, Rajdeep, I didn't say the done deal. All I am saying is this is the number game may play out in the forthcoming election. So that's the reason why, you know, in Karnataka, where BJP won like 26 seats out of 28 seats, only won by JDS and this time mm -hmm. JDS is coming in the fold of NDA, which is the BJP fold. Last time they were with the Congress Alliance. Maharashtra also categorically I mentioned. So these are the three, four states in the group one needs to be watched very carefully if BJP is able to maintain their strike rate. So, so basically what you are saying, BJP has to maintain its strike rate yeah. across what some would call the northwest monsoon. Because if you look from Goa all the way to Jharkhand and I am including Jharkhand for a moment in the north, the BJP won 85% of the seats in this entire belt. Essentially 230 to 240 of their total number of seats, 303 came from here. Yeah. You are saying A, they have to either retain that and then add in South India whether which has been their traditional weak point or the lotus has to bloom in the east where between a bengal possibly odisha and the northeast the bjp could make up for any potential losses it suffers in either north or west india am i broadly correct yes you are absolutely right chalo good thank you no, so if you look at what's at the back, in Andhra Pradesh, which is where GVL comes from, there's now an alliance with uh, Janasena and Chandrababu Naidu's TDP. Remember last time the NDA had zero. There are 25 seats up for grabs, uh, GVL. Uh, if you look, for example, at uh, Odisha, there is supposed to be an alliance between the BJP and the BJD. They had only eight seats last time, 21. Now, the point here, GVL, is you're stitching alliances which just on the surface don't make sense. Typically the number one party and number two party don't ally. I mean, have you ever seen the number one party and their prime opponent come together? I mean, that simply doesn't make electoral sense, usually. How are you making these things happen? You know, this is quite like in Punjab, the AAP and the Congress couldn't really come together because they were one and two. What is this magic wand that you have which can make the winner and his prime opponent come together in an alliance? Rahul, this hasn't happened yet, so it's uh, it's premature for me to comment on this. But this is an election in the, after four decades. I have been a close watcher of elections. I haven't seen an election like this for 40 years. 
you have never seen a Lok Sabha election where you could pick a winner well before election. This has not happened even in 2014. This has not happened even in 2019. Every time you expected it to be a hung parliament or no single party majority government. Here we are talking about a BJP tally at 325 or 350. So one fundamental difference is opposition is decimated well before the elections have been even announced. Okay, so... No, decimated I, I, in, in the conclave. Not no, 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 no. Because see, there's a sense that this is... No, just a minute. To push you, this is, there is a sense that this is the BJP's ploy to physically intimidate the uh, opposition or politically intimidate like the West Indies would do on a cricket field. You went on a cricket field, there were four fast bowlers, there was Clive Lloyd, the opposition was decimated. Similarly, there's Narendra Modi ji as Clive Lloyd, there are his four fast bowlers, Amit Shah, you can add another three. The opposition already feels, yeah, India today conclave mein bol diya, 400 seat, to 350 to kam se kam aayega. That this is psychological. When you look at the numbers, why you then plucking around, looking for allies. There's, why are you taking congressmen from other parties, giving tickets to former congressmen who've switched over? Are you as certain about these numbers as perhaps you're telling us here? Clive Lloyd a or Vivian Richards? That, that's a different debate. No, we don't Captain get into was that. Uh, Clive Lloyd, but go ahead. No, absolutely, Rajdeep. The question of uh, either the victory or the magnitude of victory is not in question. But this is the time that anybody who wants a political future for himself wants to align with the BJP. States like, for example, Andhra Pradesh, which you talked about, the parties are very keen to align with the BJP. No, but poor Jagan Reddy will feel so cheated. He helped you on so many occasions in the Rajya Sabha. I, I don't know. Last what, moment you leave him. No, I, I think it's not for you to comment for any individual. I have not seen any party making a comment like this. It is our right to align with any party to further our prospects. The bigger mandate is not 20, 2024 election. The real real target is 2047 because it Bharat is our agenda. We are not fighting just for a majority in this election to realize the dream. It's an aspirational election. You see, normally in an election like this, voters will feel unenthusiastic about the election because the outcome is already known. No. Prime Minister Modi ji, the way he's, he's creating that aspirational India, people will turn out so in larger numbers no, than so what you see. So then why tie up with the Chandra Babu Naidu who called the same Prime Minister a hardened terrorist before the 2019 election? You see, my point is, if you're so confident of your numbers, why do you even need these alliances? Is that a recognition? that there are limitations, especially south of the Vindhyas or in a state like Odisha. And therefore, because this time has to be about 400 or about 350 plus, Sam Dam Danda Bhed, election, kuch bhi karna hai, forget what's happened in the past, be flexible and tie up open door policy. Anyone wants to come into our party, please come, this is the time. No, Rajdeep, there is, I, I think it's a, the larger mandate, as I mentioned to you, is Vikset Bharat. You need to get as many political parties on board. You need to get as many state governments to partner with you in this larger mission. Because we already have a two-thirds majority. Parliamentary uh, uh, passage of bills is not really our concern. But for, for realizing your dream of Vikset Bharat, you certainly need to get okay. everyone on board. Okay. okay. So, that was Pradeep Gupta's analysis. I want to come now to Yashwan Deshmukh. Because we asked Yashwan the question, will the BJP cross the 370 mark? So, there's a visualization that's coming up on your screen. Take a look at it very carefully. And then Yashwan can explain, because you've broken this up into three categories. Seats which are tough fights for the BJP. That's the first category, there are 100 such seats. The second category is where it's BJP versus Congress in a direct fight. The third is where it's BJP versus a regional party. Yashwant, 370 par honge ki Just, uh, uh, I want all of you to basically deconstruct everything into very, very simple three figures. 543 is the total Lok Sabha strength. Remember three numbers, 100, 200 and 243. Easy? What we have simply done is the 100 seats where the BJP is completely absent. Forget about number one, forget about number two. BJP is not even number three or four, maybe. 100 seats, BJP is just absent. Look at the 2014 and 19 vote shares over here. BJP polled 7.3% in these 100 seats 
and 5.8 percent in these 100 seats in 2019. BJP might be very happy to double, triple its vote share even it then it reaches about 15 percent vote share. Will that convert into any seat? No. Nah. Big no. Maybe one or two here and there, that's fine. I mean, you know, you may have an odd in Trivandrum, one Kanyakumari, one Coimbatu, those kind of things, that aberration is fine. But zilch. Second is 200 seats. This is where the meat is. BJP versus the Congress, direct fight. Look at the gap of the BJP and the Congress vote share, almost about 20% plus in 14, 20%, 25, almost touching 25% in 2019. And there the BJP strike rate, look at that, 171 out of 200 in 14 and 185 out of 200 in 2019. And as per our MOTN, which will come in right now, which we did in January, by the way, BJP was almost touching 190 out of these 200. So what does it tell you? That between the BJP and the Congress, these 200 seats where the, the direct fight is, the BJP is leading over the Congress by more than 20% votes. There are number of states where BJP is voting more, voting more than 50%, number of states where the BJP is polling more than 60% votes. So no matter how much Nyayatra works out, this figure is not going to change just the way the first block is not going to change. BJP, no matter how much tries, nothing is going to change in the first block. No matter how much Congress is going to try, nothing is going to change in the second block. Third block is the most critical. That is 243 where it is BJP versus the regional parties. That is where the meat is. Now out of here, 2014, BJP was about 27%. Look at the BJP vote share going up to 35% plus in 2019. Can it go even further? They got 108 in 14, 118 in 2019. Can they take it from here? Can they go further north from here? That's the big question. So question about 370 Rahul and 400 plus, it's not about the zone one and zone two. It's the zone three where it is going to come down. But therefore, basically since we are also entering IPL season, when I look at your numbers, if I was a captain of any of the, if I was Mumbai Indians captain, I want the Congress bowlers at me. Basically what you are saying, the perfect matchup for the BJP is the Congress. Where there is Congress, the BJP is in a comfortable position. Where it is a regional party, it's a tough situation. And there are certain traditional areas, like Kerala for example, where the BJP is still a single digit party in terms of vote share. Broadly therefore, I want the Congress to oppose me in as many seats as possible. It's the Congress which is the Kamzor Kadi. As Absolutely. we go into this election. Absolutely. For the opposition alliance, their weakest link is the Congress. For the NDA, their weakest link, by the way, are actually their alliance partners in many states. For example, in Bihar, those who are contesting on BJP ticket have much better chance to win than the alliance partner JDU's ticket. Similarly, in Maharashtra, those who are contesting on a BJP ticket are likely to win much better than those who are contesting on Eknath Shinde or Ajit Pawar ticket. It's that easy. However, one interesting thing which Radhi has happened after our MOTN poll came out, GVL's party all of a sudden realized that, you know, putting up a manufacturing unit in certain area from the ground zero in a greenfield investment is a long shot. Acquisition is better. No, so let GVL so, respond to this. This is very so, important because each time the mood of the nation is put out by the no. India Today team, the BJP takes that very seriously. Last time we had the mood of the nation, which showed that the, um, the NDA alliance wasn't doing well in Maharashtra. You broke uh, Sharad Pawar's party. You took Eknath Shinde away from Udav Takre. Then the next time we put out a poll which said that they weren't doing well in Bihar, they took Nitish Kumar back and took him. So, you know, it's very difficult to do data when the factors that make up the data keep changing. They basically, they become an... No, no, basically, BJP should put in the brackets. MA and MA is not Mukesh Ambani, it's mergers and acquisition. <laughs> you know, you're, you're very good at it. You're very good at merger and acquisition. That, that, to be very honest, our leadership, uh, our politics is not media driven. We are not going to change our Sir, politics. Sir, mood of the nation ke baad hi hota hai. Nahin, nahin, aisa nahi hai. Because I'm telling you, I don't want to name our leaders, but they, we certainly look at media with respect. But our decisions are never 
never ever driven by media so therefore don't uh, so, so why no, did no, you Rashid, 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 my home state Rashid. why did you break these two parties if you were so confident you see what as as, as uh, yashwant has pointed out bjp very strong when it comes the, to the congress when it comes to the regional parties you are in more no, difficult what so why break a regional party or why acquire a regional no, party I, i think it's very unfair to ask me why they split up you should ask those parties what did they find so uncomfortable within them possibly they say they the say they found the ed uncomfortable nahi 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 you see darwaze pe ed no then then congress should have split several times should congress not be splitting how many congress leaders have been raided should should every other party should dmk not be splitting should they should have come back and joined the nda so should the brs not be splitting so don't be unfair okay so parties which have split they have split because of their internal turmoil because there are their inability to accept their own leadership because they are corrupt parties because they are family driven parties there is no scope for leadership to gain and emerge otherwise if what you said is right every party should be splitting daily But they are corrupt only while they are the opposition they are once they come to you they are a washing machine Okay, you true. see these. You see, the, it is you in the media who keep targeting us like this. We have never, see, we have never given a clean chit to anybody because he has joined either the NDA or BJP. So that's not fair. If there are any such cases, please approach the courts. What prevents the opposition from going to the court? It's so, only these are only political the allegations. Only of two things can be true, because it's an equation ultimately. No? either the bjp sees the mood of the nation and makes changes in states where they aren't doing well which is possible which is my theory or the bjp already knows what the reality is and the mood of the nation captures the reality and therefore you have to act based on that reality which means that we do a great job with mood of the no, nation no, 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 either way, either way, both of us no no we give we give ourselves too much of credit the bjp yeah, the bjp is on our side but usi side pe kya matlab hai here here i must here i must be on the side Rajdeep, of modi shah if you don't want to take credit don't Rajdeep, take it Rajdeep, be very Rajdeep, careful about what you are saying rajdeep is saying i'm on the side of modi shah i don't know where this is going next no no only to the extent it's a supreme election machine you and i do one poll the bjp today has resources yes. to do half a dozen polls per week tracking it on a day to day basis it requires lots of money and they have no shortage of it and, and they are getting they are get, i'll give you an example of a seat in maharashtra i know they've changed their candidate specifically after they did four rounds of polls in that constituency now you and i and priyashwant or anyone even pradeep pradeep may be doing it for them uh, which is another matter but the fact is you're getting therefore data of a kind that no, we've but, never but seen but i disagree with rajdeep i think all party is are doing polling they do very extensive polling in fact the pollster of the congress in 2009 was so horribly wrong that he convinced the congress top leadership that they were winning i'm not making this up no, rajdeep no, is this not no, true no, 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 no. is this not true so it's not as if they aren't polling they are polling as extensively as rigorously it's just that they have terrible Rahul, pollsters I've never said no one second no no i have i have also done polls for my own party aapke sahi hote hain galat hote hain but let me tell you as a pollster no one second were your polls good or bad they have they have no their nose to the ground. round they will know if you come and tell them i am telling you if i do a poll and go and tell them tamil nadu we are sweeping they will say tum kahan kar rahe ho tum kya kar rahe ho no but our leadership no no but rajdeep once again let me let me ask rajdeep rajdeep is this not true that in 2019 the internal polling of the congress party had convinced the top leadership of the congress party that they were actually winning that when the result came out it came as a shock to them because their internal polling they were spending money on it it's not as if money wasn't being spent was telling them that they are winning a, because question, congress doesn't live a, at a, the this ground question, level a this question should be posed to the congress leadership b the fact is if i have 10 rupees in my pocket there's only so much i can do if i have 100 or 1000 rupees in my pocket i have far more options the bjp as i said is a sophisticated resource rich election machine but having said that no but if you have 10 rupees how much of that gets spent on polling and how much gets kept away and that's also a fact <laughs> well they could let's, save let's, all let's, the money rajdeep they let's, could let's, save all the money and simply read india today <laughs> that's fine with them ah. because i remember the four states boss asked me to you know red flag that was in 15th august issue last year uh, i was talking to ap and you know bell came i was rather i i i'll end up learning every time something and he asked me what is the red flagging that of the bjp i said four states that is karnataka bihar maharashtra and bengal and look at the bjp has moved around that first thing the lowest hanging fruit jds in karnataka 10% vote share they got them in i don't know why congress did not do it god knows 
second thing bihar the unthinkable as they can of course maharashtra is a kind of a, they are doing in installments whatever they are trying to do ho nahi raha theek se aaj jo bhi ho raha hai wo hota hai to bahut kare ho nahi raha hai and bengal is going to be the mother of all election let me tell you one thing which pradeep would agree with me and even amitabh would agree with me this election all the other states 30 as you may call it quasi states and states everything is this way or that way there is only one state where actually there is going to be a fight for each and every bloody seat that is going to be west bengal okay let's get amitabh tiwari then to give so us a final i just want to tell everyone since we want to make the conclave experience as immersive and as experiential as possible we want you all to vote so we did some jugad in the way that india can do jugad and india today can do jugad and hopefully it will work out well i will throw up that same qr code remember from the debate which you guys were eating and watching and i was working uh, from that debate we'll put out that qr code which will have four options of where you think the results of the poll will be and before anybody trolls us yes we understand statistics and this is not a representative sample it's highly skewed it's very urban it's very suit boot it's not really the real voter but we're just having some fun right so we will have that up and you tell us so get your phones get your qr codes and then we'll do this in just a while Amitabh Tiwari. So we'll have your visualization on the question of whether they'll get to 370 or whether they'll even cross 272, as Rajdeep is asking. What's your sense? See, essentially, uh, we've heard a lot about A, B, C category of seats in in newspapers. So what we have tried to do is we have divided the 543 seats into A, B, C category. A is strong and relatively strong so two out of three or three out of three wins in the last three election is a category strong relate category b which is relatively weak and if the party has not won any time in the last three elections it's a category c or a weak seat this is the breakup of seats of bjp so bjp it is very simple for bjp to attain a single simple majority because the a category seats of bjp are 262 the first column which it has won two out of three or three out of three times in the last three elections so if it's able to maintain then it will be very near the simple majority out of that if you see 147 seats which is more than half of the seats are from the northern region which means that the party has maxed out in the northern region and that's why it has to look for other regions to expand now if you see there are 82 seats in the b category which it has won only one out of three times here most of the seats are in eastern region where the focus of the bjp is odisha where it wanted to have an alliance or tried to have an alliance with the bjd then bengal where sir is saying that is the mother of all battles half of the seats are there and then you look at the weak seats of bjp is 199 almost 200 some of these seats the allies would have contested now in this if you see half of the seats are in south of india 98 and the balance or other 61 seats are in eastern region so the 80% of weak seats of bjp are in south and east that's why bjp has a look south and a look east policy because here the focus so is of the bjp because the prime minister and he is going to be here at the india today conclave and we're all looking forward to that the prime minister is spending a lot of time energy and effort in the south do you think that has some impact in this election or are they playing a much longer game work hard now benefit later or work hard now in the hope of benefiting right away no of course bjp is looking for some gains in the short term and longer gains in the long term like the alliance with tdp is part of its long term strategy in the southern state because chandrababu naidu is already 73 years of age and the party may want to co-opt the party after it ret- retires in what does co-opt mean co-opt means like what has happened with shiv sena like what has happened with ncp like what is likely to happen with parties regional parties who do not have stronger succession plan like jdu or a bjd you know in a sense therefore raul when you said you know the modi shah election machine what stands out for me they are actually focusing and they've done it before we put out these graphics on 161 seats which they did not win last time or came second and third now think about it normally in life 
we first strengthen ourselves where we are strong and then think about our weak areas here you've got a party which has spent the last two years focusing on their weak areas you're seeing the prime minister now in south india traveling a lot there you're seeing him focusing on east india but they've actually planned this out there have been a minister assigned to every three lok sabha constituencies and most of them have been assigned to constituencies which the bjp did not win in 2019 and 14 so that's where i say the election machine you see this is a this is very systematic use of your political acumen along with resources and i keep maintaining all of this needs resources and your power machine i know gvl will disagree on the ed point you use it but the fact is at the end of the day you have to give them credit for the way they are thinking south india rahul is about vote share it's about 2029 20, in bengal if you look at their numbers 10 years ago they were nowhere in the race they were almost a single digit party today they are competing for power so it's been a 15 20 year race that's a 20 year race in kerala it's a possibly a 15 year race in tamil nadu so i can see where the bjp is going the real question in all your graphics rahul you put is kya bjp 370 or bjp 400 the question i ask Where's the opposition? Where can the Congress cross 54? That's the question, Rahul. Not where BJP can cross. If the Congress can reach 100, actually, our, I was hoping one of our four guests would tell me how can the Congress, if I was playing game theory, how can the Congress cross 100? Because if the Congress can cross 100, then the BJP can be brought below 300. And that should be the game if the opposition really was focusing on the 2024 election seriously. Unfortunately, it appears all of us are taken away and believing char so par. So no, we're not thinking so par. There were some uh, opposition leaning cephologists who we'd invited for this conversation. They didn't even want to come. Now, at least you can come and argue and make your point. I mean, they ultimately didn't even want to come. So I don't want to say anything, but that tells its own story. So now we're out of time on this debate. As I said, pick up your phones and there's a QR code that's coming up on the screen. This is by no means a representative sample. It's not stratified. It's none of that. It's just, we're just having some fun. We're seeing what the pulse of the, what the mood of the conclave audience is. That's all that there is. Don't and be prepared to be trolled. Who will get trolled? The, the audience. Why will the audience get trolled? Because you will, you know, look, Rahul and I are not voting. We are only the judges here. We are the neutral umpires. This is Sorry? the mood of the... Yeah, it is. Anonymous. Yeah, it's anonymous, but you're being treated as a collective. The great and good yeah, of yeah. India. But also, you know, I know it's post lunch and stuff, but some people haven't picked up their phones. That's not nice. Please pick up your phones. And there's a QR code in front of you. So get involved in this. Let's otherwise. And you know, don't worry, there are no. You know, and that's the problem the EC also has. That voter participation has to be high. Otherwise, what's the point? And don't worry, there are no central agencies at the moment here. <laughs> So when you're voting and your and your electoral bond bond won't become public and the electoral bonds are also unconstitutional. So all, all that said, please, uh, there it is, and it's on your screen. So if you can just scan that QR code, go to the question. Uh, I still see some people are very excited and doing should, it. Should we get our four guests they to first give their numbers? No, we'll do that after this. At the end, huh. while that's going on. So now. I hope everyone's doing it. A lot of people so are doing it. So while they're going on, we'll get their numbers. Okay. So okay, now, GBL, you no, start. Let's what? finish this other little get part. No, we finish then get the... Oh, oh, there it started. Okay. So there it is. So there are four, four options here. Okay. So very quickly, I mean, it's very simple. Will the BJP get less than 272 is this category. You can click it if that's where you think they'll end up. 272 to 325 is this category. Three... 26 to 370 is the third category and 370 plus is the fourth category. So you got 90 seconds on the screen. This group of people are not very nice. Can they should vote. Oh, you voted. Oh, subse By the nice. way, well can, done. By the way, can all the 11 percent stand up? Who? No, no. The 11 percent. That's like making the electoral bond public. The, 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 the 11 percent who are saying less than 272 stand but you up. You cannot make them stand Mr. up. Mr. Modi is coming tomorrow. He wants you to be identified. <laughs> no, no, that's not fair. Ra we said it's. Ra we said it's very, private. Very yeah. unfair. It's very unfair. unfair. I agree. It's very unfair. Well, okay, now. Voting is Have you all voted, not voted? This table, or the front tables oh, look like they're very all sophisticated to do this. Ballot. You can't be so sophisticated to do You've done this. Okay, they've all voted. You guys have voted. So now 53 seconds to go. 
जीवीएल आपके सपोर्टर्स थोड़े कम है यार वो तीन सेवेंटी पाँच इंक्रीजिंग नाउ आई होप यू डोंट हैव सम पीपल आउटसाइड वोटिंग फॉर यू यू न्यू दिस वाज हैपनिंग यू डोंट नो वाज हैपनिंग आई इफ आई हैड मैनेज टू गेट समबडी देन यू वुड हैव नाइंटी परसेंट प्लस इन द लास्ट इन द बॉटम ऑफ फिक्सिंग की होती तो अच्छे से कर बिकॉज इन दिस ऑडियंस वी डोंट गेट द सेम लेवल ऑफ सपोर्ट प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड आई प्रिज्यूम दिस इज बीजेपी नॉट एनडीए नो दिस इज बीजेपी ओनली बीजेपी दिस इज ओनली बीजेपी ओके ट्वेंटी सिक्स सेकेंड्स टू गो Will the BJP get 272 and less? Is 10%, 17%, 272, 322. 18 seconds still. Is there anyone who hasn't voted? Say this is a waste of my time. I'm not doing it. I'm too classy and sophisticated for this. Oh, I hope you guys joined in, right? Okay, good. So now 10 seconds to go. I think it's kind of stabilizing. Rajdeep likes to say, as I said, can we call this election now, Rajdeep? Still, uh, three, two, one. Okay, we can call it. <laughs> 10% have said BJP less than 272. If you want to identify yourself, one last chance. Two seventy-two to three twenty-five is sixteen percent. Three twenty-six to three seventy is thirty-four percent. Three seventy plus is forty percent. Now, Rajdeep, I have a a small. See, yes. those who have said less than two two seventy-two, it is my firm conviction. Yes. They believe BJP will get more than two seventy-two, but they want it to get less than two seventy-two. Please talk to them, and you will get this answer. Yeah. Unko well, bhi pata hai. Unko bhi pata hai. Modi ji. Yeah, but but you know those who've given three seventy plus are also going to find it extremely difficult to tell me where that three seventy number is coming. But that for another day. I will give the panel ten yeah. seconds each. What are your numbers? Your final numbers. This will be repeated on counting day. Yashwan Deshmukh, you start. If you are polling, how much does the BJP get? How much does the Congress get? Come general election day. Very quickly, twenty seconds. Very quickly, each. BJP is. Now, ज़्यादा लंबा नहीं बोलना. Number बताओ बस. Number. Just the number. Forty-one percent vote for the BJP. Forty-six percent plus votes for the NDA. No seats. 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 No. <laughs> No, no, हमारी ड्यूटीज बटी हुई है no, 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 you, देखे you, ऐसा है आपने अभी जो नंबर्स देखे बहुत क्लियरली बोल रहे हैं बहुत साम सिंपल सी चीज दस सेकंड में दस सेकंड दिए ना आपने हाँ जितना तीन सौ पैंतीस हमने एमओटीएन में दिया है उसके ऊपर जो कुछ भी आना है मर्जन एंड एक्विजिशन से आना है ओके ओके प्रदीप गुप्ता योर नंबर नो प्रदीप विल कम लास्ट वन सेकेंड अमिताभ तिवारी योर नंबर ओके फोर हंड्रेड लुक्स अटेनेबल प्रभु राम इज हेल्पिंग बीजेपी एंड इट इज इट इज इट इज प्लीज 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 इट इज रीगेन Lost seats in 2019. Attain, add new seats and maintain. Maintain the 303 seats. Regain, attain, maintain. Now, what's your number? 400 is attainable. Okay, GBL Narasimha Rao. This is an election. This is a vote for Modi, Prime Minister Modi, and for number, Mbou number, Diyai. number, number. Morality. Number, number. Mor I'm giving you number. Morality, optimism, development, and innovation. So how many of you will live four, by these acronyms? How four many? zero four. Okay, you know the thing is the BJP has been so hard. Okay, four so four. Three so three, four so four. So less than Rajiv Gandhi in twenty eighty four. That's another debate. But go ahead, Pradeep. No, I don't have number. Give me a sure. number. No, no. I mean, still the alliance. Give me a range. Has, no, no. Rajiv, alliance has to be formed in its proper Odisha. shape. Odisha, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu. Hey, it's a number. Tell me number. Tell me number. Boss, number I cannot say because of my some agreement. I am bound with those agreements. I am not supposed to reveal any kind of number, any platform. We do reveal number only once. We have once. to pay that a lot of money if you want to know numbers. That is on the exit poll day. Only once we reveal the number. Okay. Reveal the number. So we, are, we are out of time. Rajdeep, we are out of time. This was a lot of fun. If you want Pradeep Gupta to give you a number, pay him like serious amounts of money. Otherwise, he doesn't give you. Just just getting a cogly of ticket doesn't cut it. Uh, but Yashwan Deshmukh and Amitabh Tiwari were a lot of fun. Jeevan Narasimha Rao for coming here to the conclave. Thank you very much. Ram is the concept that you put on. Everybody is kind of getting onto these abbreviations. We're very but, thankful for your time and uh, delighted that you could join us. But Rao, let me say this because otherwise no one will watch television over the next couple of days if you think the election is a done deal. In India, picture abhi baki hai. Whether the BJP crosses 400 or actually maybe the opposition does a bit better than what we think. we'll know sometime in the third to fourth week of may but for all of you for joining us thank you very much and uh, great to have all of you here all right ladies and gentlemen raise a warm applause for our panelists while i call upon stage sudhir upadhyay executive vice president radhiko khetan to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to our panelists some of the top sophologists of the country This session was sponsored by Radhiko Khetha.
once again, do raise a warm applause for our panelists. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Give us about 10 seconds. We're going to turn around our stage. Uh, actually, we're going to let go of everything on the stage because our next session is not so much of a session but a performance. She's the current internet sensation, a social media star, packed with talent. In 2021, won the Super Dancer, a category which usually sees uh, anyone from 20 to 35 participate and she did that when she was all of seven so she was seven then when she won the super dancer she's 10 right now and she's taken social media by storm. She comes from Assam. She's cute as a button, but she's power packed with talent. And if you don't believe me, ladies and gentlemen, do put your hands together for little 10 year old Chota Packet Bada Dhamaka, where Florina Gogoi, winner, super dancer. Thank you that you are here. Like I said, she's cute as a button, but she's packed with so much talent. Why don't you call her cute? No, you call her. Call her, right? Okay. So she's very cute, but she was seven years old. Were you seven years old when you won Super Dancer? Yes, 
Six years. Six years kid Abhi aap kitne saal ke ho? Ten, ten. Ten years ke ho? Abhi to mein bai ho gai ho na? Pure ten years ke ho gai ho. Acha aap yeh batao, jab aap ne super dancer enter kiya, tab aap six years ke thay. Aap ke saare baaki jo contestants thay, wo kitne saal ke thay? Wo loog mujh se baat bade thay. So then, eleven, twelve years. 11-12, वो आपसे बहुत बड़े थे पर तभी भी आप फर्स्ट आए हाँ शायद से क्योंकि आप सब लोगों ने मुझे ढेर सारा प्यार दिया इसलिए आप मुझे बताओ ये जो डांस फॉर्म है आपका क्या डांस फॉर्म है किसने सिखाया ये मुझे संतुष सर ने सिखाया एक्चुअली मैं आपको मेरा मेरा जर्नी बताऊंगी ठीक है हाँ वी स फोर इयर्स ओल्ड तब मैं डांस किया था वह जस डांस मींस मुझे कुछ भी नहीं पता था सो जब भी मैं गाना सुनती थी एनी म्यूजिक तो मैं आई जस मूविंग माय हैंड्स एंड बॉडीज और और उसके बाद मेरे पेरेंट्स ने नोटिस की सो वो लोग ने सोचा कि पढ़ाई के साथ साथ कुछ एक्स्ट्रा करना चाहिए इसलिए मुझे डांस मतलब डांस क्लास में मुझे एडमिशन दे दी तो मेरा स्टाइल था कथक उसके बाद मैंने एक साल तक डांस किया और उसके बाद मेरे पापा का कुछ ऐसा आने जाने का प्रॉब्लम हुआ इसलिए हम कंटिन्यू नहीं कर पाए तो मुझे मम्मी ने फिर से एक डांस क्लास में एडमिशन दे दिया वो है डांस एकेडमी ओ सॉरी क्या था सॉरी सॉरी मैं मैं बताऊं क्या था बताऊं चलो आप बताओ हाँ अम्म एक सेकंड मुन्नवक डांस एकेडमी दा सो मुझे सिखाया और मेरा स्टाइल था हिप हॉप स्टाइल जो मैं अभी डांस कर रही हूँ सो उसके बाद मुझे अंडरग्राउंड बैटल्स भी भी करने लगी उसके बाद एक्चुअली सुपर डांस चैप्टर फोर ऑडिशन स्टार्ट हो गया था जो मेरे सर थे उन लोगों ने मतलब मेरा वीडियो ऑडिशन देके सुपर डांसर में मैं सिलेक्ट हो गई होने के बाद लाइव ऑडिशन था वो भी मैं सिलेक्ट हो गई उसके बाद हमें कोलकाता बुलाया कोलकाता में भी सिलेक्ट हो गई फिर आप सुपर डांसर बन गए नहीं नहीं अच्छा उसके बाद हमें मुंबई जाना था सो मैं डर रही थी क्योंकि कोरोना वायरस आया था तब इसलिए मतलब बर बर जा रहा था बड़े बड़े होके सो इसलिए मैं डर रही थी तो मेरे पापा ने बोला इस साल नहीं जाएंगे हम अगले साल जाएंगे पर मेरी मम्मी ने स्ट्रॉंग डिसीजन लेके बोला कि नहीं डोंट वरी I am with you. So, I thought that my mom is the same. So, I went to Mumbai. After that, I wanted to be a super guru. And that's what I got. So, I'm a super guru. 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 I मैं आगे हो मतलब गुड ह्यूमन बीइंग्स बनना चाहती हूँ सबसे पहले एंड सेकंड इज गुड डांसर और आप सब मुझे आशीर्वाद और प्यार दोगे तो मैं और बढ़ती जाऊँगी है ना फ्लोरिना गुड ह्यूमन बीइंग गुड डांसर गुड डांसर तो आप हो होपफुली आप गुड ह्यूमन बीइंग भी बनोगे और एक चीज बताओ बॉलीवुड एंटर करना चाहोगे बॉलीवुड हाँ मैं करना चाहोगे करना चाहोगे तो फिर अगला सॉन्ग प्ले कर दे यस दो मुझे और मैं आप सब के लिए मैं ये गाने में डांस कर रही हूँ और आप सब भी बहुत एंजॉय करना ठीक है चलो दो और डांस करो थैंक यू
Gogoi, as I call upon stage, Sashwat Goenka, RPS, RPSG Vice Chairperson, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to this small but massive talent, Florina Gogoi. Special request aya hai. Kya aap ek song pe aur dance kar loge? Ha? Bacha. Main itna ready to hu ne us gaane me. To main thoda sa pani kha lo. Theek hai? Get some water. Ha, main aapko pani deti hu aur fir aap jo wo third number pe dance kar loge. Acha Sheet Singh aap question nahi puchhoge. Ab आप चलो आपसे क्वेश्चन पूछते हैं आप आगे आप बॉलीवुड जाओगे या आप असम में ही रहोगे मैं चाहती हूँ कि कि इंडिया मतलब मैं कैसे मतलब भारत को क्योंकि मैं इंडिया गर्ल हूँ भारत की बेटी हूँ मैं इसलिए कैसे इंडिया को ज़्यादा नाम कर सके हाँ थैंक यू तो आप कहीं पर भी जाओ पर आप ऐसे ही डांस करो क्योंकि आप इतना अच्छा डांस करते हो कि सबको लगता है कि वो भी थोड़ा डांस कर ले आपके साथ आप पानी पियो और फिर जो आपका थर्ड सॉन्ग है जो हमने सुना था उस पर करोगे हाँ अभी हाँ रेडी यस आपसे शोर करना थोड़ा सा इसलिए तो मुझे स्ट्रॉन्ग मिलेगा ना यो 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 ऐसे ठीक है थोड़ा और पानी खाना है Ready? Chalo, let's go. अच्छा डांस कर लेते हो मुझे भी सिखा देना 
बैकस्टेज ठीक है पर बहुत मुश्किल है इस ड्रेस में क्योंकि मैं पापा का टी शर्ट पहन रही हूँ ना ढीला धूला आप सबको तो पता ही है कि पापा का टी शर्ट मुझे कितना एनर्जेटिक देता है है ना हाँ जब आप डांस नहीं करते आप क्या करते हो तो मतलब अगर डांस नहीं करते हो प्रैक्टिस नहीं करते हो तो फेवरेट चीज़ क्या है ओके तो वो है क्राफ्ट ड्राॅइंग एंड प्लेइंग बैडमिंटन चलो वेल डन थैंक यू कि आप इतनी दूर से हमारे लिए आए थैंक यू सो मच वी विश यू सो मच लव एंड लव थैंक यू थैंक यू आप सब मुझे हर दिन प्यार और आशीर्वाद देते रहना थैंक यू थैंक यू फ्लोरिना लेडीज एंड जेंटमैन प्लीज रेज अ वार्म अप्लॉज फॉर फ्लोरिना गोगोय थैंक यू पानी Ladies and gentlemen we're ready to go into our next session that was a welcome break especially after that boring number driven cephology session i don't know i didn't find it boring but this was fun All right, let's move on to our next session this evening. New generation, new rules, leadership in a disruptive world. This session, ladies and gentlemen, is sponsored by Kirloskar. To take it from here, would like to invite on stage session's moderator Sakshi Batra, senior associate editor, anchor Business Today. Good evening, everyone. Well, after that power-packed performance, I think the energy of this space has also risen so much, and I'm very excited now to be speaking to the flag bearers of India Inc. 2.0 for this session, and uh, the next generation leaders from uh, the largest conglomerates of Indian uh, businesses, which have a legacy of so many decades and even centuries. So, um, first up, I'd like to invite on stage my first guest, Shashwat Goinka, who we all know is the vice chairperson of the RPSG Group. which has a 200 year old legacy 35 companies in all in various sectors and of course keshav reddy is going to be with us on the stage as well and he is at the forefront of the gvk group and as his insta bio really says that he's built uh, your airports before and now he's building identities with his uh, a new company which is equal which is a digital identity company and we'll find out more about it during our discussion uh, welcome to both of you and thank you thank so you. much for joining me on this discussion and the session is titled my generation my rules leadership in a disruptive world so shashwat let me begin by you you know does it really happen in uh, family businesses which have a legacy of 200 years old and successful uh, legacy at that that you know really my generation my rules or are you given a secret recipe that you know we know how we, we run businesses and this is how you should run too right so for us our business is over 220 years old right um so i think there is a huge legacy but for us um i think with legacy comes a huge sense of responsibility and and i think the whole idea for us is how do you grow that legacy and build on that legacy that you have um so i think um there's no secret success mantra or anything that you get but i think uh, this culture of growing that legacy not just maintaining but actually adding value to it is something that's ingrained in us from the very from the time when we are born i think so it's just innate in us to kind of try and do a lot better and build on what we have so you always knew that you're going to be joining the family business So, you know to be fair um when i was graduating from college i had that option uh, and to be fair mom dad my grandparents no one kind of imposed that this is what you need to do uh but i think somewhere i knew that one india is where all the action is at um the, and at that point this was in 2012 um you know i was very certain that the next century is going to be that of india's and and i think the kind of responsibility you can get 
in your own business is it takes you get you get that much faster and at a much much younger age than you would if you were working outside so okay kesha let me bring you in in that conversation so you've been a part of the core business of gvk you've been uh, building some of the exceptional airports in india and now you're venturing out to build equal and uh, many more startups you've uh, funded as well especially in the digital ecosystem in the fintech world as well tell me you know what is easier and what is more difficult uh, to grow the businesses in the scale that you're expected to or to venture out on your own and set up something of your own no thank you sakshi and thank you everyone here um, i think taking a step back you know the world when my grandfather started gvk in the 70s was very different and today is extremely different software and technology is at the core of every business today and in terms of that if you see 3 decades ago 10 of the largest companies in the world were oil and gas companies in the decade after that were all chinese banks and then this decade are all software companies and you know i think in the last 1 2 months it's actually had uh, two ai companies come into that so the world is changing and so should we so i think family businesses as we see it has also have also evolved quite uh, significantly over the years so what we have done is we moved to a family office construct wherein we build businesses with software at the core of it but at the exterior of it they're actually just old school businesses as well so i think there's a great blend that's going to happen with india and we just saw that earlier as well with uh, the new india right the energy the the excitement that's there Uh, I think we all are moving towards a new India with even family businesses progressing to being family offices and investing in you know new businesses. Absolutely, Shashwan, would you want to add to that? Because you know uh, how difficult is it to uh, have family offices also evolve in that way? Because the world is changing at a very rapid pace, and it's very difficult to stay uh, catching up with everything that's changing. So, how difficult is it, and how do you do it? You know, you mentioned we're a 200-year-old business. Uh, we are, but I think what we did 200 years ago and what we do today are very different. And I think taking a cue of what Keshav said as well is the whole idea is you have to continuously keep evolving. And I think earlier it was a generational evolvement. Each generation evolved that business, added new businesses within the fold of the family business. But I think what's changing now is is the world is changing every couple of years, and so you have to. figure out what is it that you want to be in and your business model has to be that dynamic to be able to change with the changing expectations Okay. Uh, so Shashwat also you know of course this is a very diverse group that you come in from of course it has old age businesses energy it has uh, of course and all those fmcg businesses you are now at the forefront of two yum as well uh, it is evolving with first source solutions then you have music and entertainment with sare gama as well and bell caravan has been a very big success for you so some of the innovations we are already seeing but are there uh, do you feel torn when you're pulled in so many directions uh 35 businesses in various sectors or do you keep your focus to some certain uh segments of the business where you're more passionate about and you have a great vision going forward and taking the next leg of the growth going forward so i think uh you know for us uh it's a two prong strategy so so one is uh businesses which are either legacy businesses or large businesses within the group uh they may be having um an old world uh origination but the idea is how do you get them set up for success over the next decade or two right uh, so when you really look at our um, electricity generation and distribution business which was primarily thermal the idea is how do you move into now renewable sources of energy how do you kind of move from being a, you know from a purely utility perspective to a consumer first company right and and similarly for all of the businesses the idea is really how do we convert them to become consumer first so whether it's fmcg whether it's media whether it's music entertainment whether it's retail whether it's um, first source for that matter we want to touch consumers and make consumers lives better and and you know when you really look at india and the world at large i think the consumer story is still yet to unfold and we want to be at the forefront of that Keshav, okay. you're building Equal. Tell us more about it because we do know how hugely successful Aadhaar was, and now, now you're talking about digital identity. But the moment you talk about digital identity, everybody has this fear that whether my data is, uh, you know, protected at all costs or not. We are still at the policy stage. We do not know how uh, protection policies will shape up going forward from here. But uh, and deep fakes is another problem that has now emerged in our uh, senses. How do you think you're going to be building a foolproof product right there? I think the Aadhaar and the DPI are phenomenal, and they've done, uh, they've put India on the map in all respects. Uh, what we are doing at Equal is leveraging that to build 
a nicer, a simpler experience for a consumer. And the, the, the purpose of equal is to power identity for 100 million Indians. And we use the word power because today it's in your hands. Digital has made every Indian very um, responsible and the control of that is with your hands. And I think the new DPDP Act uh, is going to be just helping that and pushing those boundaries where consumer with consent will do what he wants. And I think we're the leaders in the world in, in respect of that as well. We talk about data digitization, but we talk about data democracy where you use your data for your benefit. So I think uh, it's going to be phenomenal the next decade with data and Indians are going to be at the center of it. I mean, we just saw earlier, that's the new Bharat today. It's amazing. And uh, the kind of platforms that are there today in the next decade, it's, it's really India's time in order to do all of that. Okay. Uh, Shashwat, you're also passionate about cricket and we do know that you own uh, the Lucknow Super Giants and it was the most expensive purchase in terms of IPL. Uh, tell me, you know, how do you foresee it? Was it like just a passion, uh, uh, you know, passionate acquire acquisition when it comes to um, cricket or does it really have the thought process of a business going behind it? Will it really add value to the conglomerate going forward? So I think this was also a step to move towards becoming more consumer first, right? Entering into sports. And I think when you look at sports today, um, it is not just a passion for most people, but I think as a business, the economics make phenomenal sense, right? Um, and I think for us, the bid was not a bid which was guided by passion. I think for us um, at work, we are very... Um, dispassionate as far as our likes come. It's, it's business is business, right? And I think, so the bid was, was very much keeping in mind what we believe was the true value of, of a franchise uh, like Lucknow. And, and I think it was just the first of many for us. So we've also got, say for example, a team in the South uh, Africa Premier League as well. We've got Mohan Bagan Super Giants. And for us, sports is going to be a big thrust area, whether you look at it from a franchise, pers franchise perspective or a team perspective, or even if you kind of venture into eSports. So we will be looking at the overall gamut of sports as, as, as we move forward. Yeah, so uh, eSports is uh, interesting, you know, digital sports, the way it is shaping up, what do you foresee going forward? Is fantasy game something that's on your mind? Is digital sports, how big are you going to be thinking of capturing this market into what are you thinking? So I think, like I said, for us, it's still relatively new. We've been in the space for the last three years. Um, and I think we strongly believe in that business potential. Um, I think we are still analyzing further, but we are certain that sports is going to be one of the mainstays for the group going forward. Okay. okay. Keshav, uh, let me ask you, you know, you funded uh, so many digital uh, startups. Six of them are unicorns as well. Uh, but tell me, why is the new generation really focusing on these kind of businesses and not focusing on the old age businesses like energy, infrastructure, uh, all of those? Is, is there a sense that perhaps those were too regulated, uh, you know, sectors or perhaps too much of uh, government intervention was there? Is that somewhere on the back of the mind when you're thinking about these? You know, of the 111 unicorns in India, 65% are in the regulated space of financial services. So actually, people don't uh, realize that most of the unicorns are actually regulated directly or indirectly. What I think people do is they find a problem statement in India and they build something. And most of these companies are built by first-time entrepreneurs from a small town. They've gone into an IIT or gone somewhere and realized, okay, there's a great potential and they have nothing to lose. So if you meet any entrepreneur today, they're just phenomenal, they're limitless in their ideas, uh, anything can be disrupted and can create insane value. So I think when, when, when an entrepreneur comes in and, and the best thing that um, we can do, or as a venture capital firm that I run from the family office side, we actually just support them and we say, we will take an exit when you do. Uh, and you know, that really builds a lot of trust. So of the six unicorns, I think we've been there six to eight years at least in each of them. But we see that, you know, for the best returns for any company, it takes two decades. So if you see when SoftBank invested in, you know, uh, Alibaba or Tencent with, uh, with, with the Naspers, it took 18 to 20 years. Uh, so I think we're also looking at a longer duration where these companies become massive companies uh, over the next few decades. So when could be the next Alibaba coming in from India, you know, and uh, be that large in its extent? No, hopefully. I think... Coming uh, from you. <laughs> no, no, fabulous. I think, uh, you know... We were just talking about it earlier, but of the 10 largest companies in the world today, two of them are AI companies, uh, and then two of them are pharma companies, right? Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. That, they've been propelled due to technology. 
due to finding or drug discovery um, in, a, in a potential area which has insane potential, which is, you know, weight loss. Um, you know, we do that in our pharma service business. We see so much, uh, you know, moving towards gene therapy or CRISPR or new age technologies which are going to change the landscape of our health ecosystem. So I think it's super exciting. It's the best time to build in India. It's the best time to fund companies in India because, you know, all our stars are aligned. Uh, in all true respects. And you were talking about the L.I. Lilly's uh, weight loss drug, which has become the talk of the town right now. Is something like that coming in from you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that, that, Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk. <laughs> but those are, uh, those are phenomenal uh, success stories. You know, you could have never imagined or even had a chance to think that these would be a couple hundred billion dollar companies and, and closing, inching into a trillion dollar company. So, um, you know, the days have changed, and so, so do all of us have to, so. Okay. Tell me, Shashwat, about the challenges that were, uh, you know, faced by previous generation entrepreneurs, and how have the challenges changed in your time? Are things easier for you to do business in India now? So I think, uh, I mean, it's difficult to say the challenges that the previous generation faced, but I think they had, for a large part of their careers, a license Raj, which kind of changed at some point, and there was a a flux in terms of how business was to be done. But I think where we are today, um, I think we are in India's golden age. And, and I say that um, with all my heart. I think, um, I think in Prime Minister Modi, we've got um, one of the strongest leaders that the world has ever seen, um, a visionary, and someone with a very strong bias for action, and someone who's able to instill that bias for action in almost every Indian. It is, I think, you know, when you look at a large part of Indian heritage, it was a very pehle up kind of a heritage, right? And I think he's kind of changed that, and if I can use my uh, Lucknow uh, tagline for that, it's, you know, he's made it a ab apni bari hai. There is no reason to walk with your head, you know, kind of down. You should be proud of who you are. You should believe in yourself, and you should trust yourself, and, and have that courage of conviction to be able to do whatever you think you want to do, right? And I think that's, that's what Keshav was also saying, is out of the over 100 unicorns, and a lot of these out of India have come in the last three to four years, and, and India hasn't seen that in the past. So I think with that, I think there is no reason why anybody shouldn't be in business and shouldn't be in business in India. I think there is enough for entrepreneurs to do in India. Uh, we have a superbly young demographic, um, and we have to reap that dividend, essentially. Um, and I think um, India is yet, the world is yet to see, I think, the India story. So. Okay, the world is yet to see the India story, but ab apni bari has, like you said. Uh, what about you, uh, Keshav? Do you also feel that uh, the economic landscape, the way it has changed over the last few years for India, is it become, um, has it become more conducive for new age entrepreneurs, or is it more challenging? I think it's become extremely conducive. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. Because what has happened is we are at a, at a golden era between geopolitically, where Prime Minister Modi has placed us in the right position, in terms of demographically, that everybody knows, and then economically as well, right? The, the pace at which we're growing. And also, counterintuitively, it's a zero-sum game globally. You know, China's loss is India's gain. It's so evident, right? The China plus one strategy, so many aspects of companies coming to India, not finding aspects of investing globally. So I think that is going to be the era. So we need to ensure there's good policy, which is being done. There needs to be like capital coming in. There needs to be opportunities. And there needs to be transparency of those policies and governance. And I think that will lead India to being a phenomenal uh, nation. And I think we are super excited more than ever to be part of uh, India and its growth story. Yeah, you know, but uh, there's this one missing link that everybody talks about that private capex has not picked up. Uh, do you think that uh, there is a change in which uh, new age entrepreneurs are thinking of how to deploy money, how to make their money? Perhaps because we're looking at the stock markets, we're looking at the Bitcoin, we're looking at the financial world, the way they have immediate gratification coming in from you put that money there, you'll see it grow 10x. But do you think that that is the reason why private capex is suffering? No, I think private capex has nothing to do with uh, people investing personal capital. Uh, private capex will come. If you see the, the, the middle class is becoming so wealthy, uh, and you see that everywhere. Uh, you know, you go to a hotel, you take a flight, you go anywhere, right? It's becoming so wealthy that the whole landscape of private caps is going to change in this decade as well. And I think that's already starting to happen. If you see the investments in new energy, you see the uh, investments in other aspects of business, I think that's going to happen very quickly. On software side, of course, it's, it's a very different landscape. It's a lot of foreign capital that comes in, and I think people are investing in people. 
and I think that which is our biggest resource. Absolutely. So when you talk about people, a lot of uh, corporates are setting different guidelines, different rules for more inclusivity when it comes to women first policies, maybe transgender inclusion as well. What is your thought process? Are you doing that or such things in your companies as well? I mean, we are, I'm running a software company right now, so we don't wear jackets, suits, it's a very different landscape. And we're extru ex exclusively, like, uh, inclusivity is really important for us. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, uh, you know, if you're, the, the best leaders that I know are actually ladies. Yeah. You know, they, they are great managers of people, of capital, of resources. And I've seen so many boards that I'm part of that, you know, the people I admire. So I think that's going to change and you're going to see a lot of inclusion. You're already seeing that at the helm of all uh, large companies as well. So super excited. We, we always support and we try to actually hire if there are two people and if there's a female who's leading it, we will always hire the person there. Okay. Shashwat, do you want to add to that? Completely echo his sentiments. And I think uh, for us, um, you know, um, we have over 55,000 employees and, and today we're at about 45% of them are women. Um, and this story was very different as recently as seven years ago, right? And I think uh, one thing that I completely echo that Keshav said is, um, you know, women are by far, I think, better multitaskers, better leaders, they are able to think better, to act better, to do better, right? Um, so I think what's changed is, is the role of male and female in society. And I think as that's changing and more women are coming into the workforce, you are seeing them taking on more leadership roles. Mm. And I think that is going to be a large part of India's success story as well. Okay, that's a wonderful point. But tell me, you know, from previous generation to now, how has the way you do business changed or is changing? Or you're bringing in change in your companies the way, and you say to your father that, you know, you don't know this, I know this better, I'm going to be doing this this way. If I told my father that, I'm not sure how, how well that would go <laughs> on a lighter note. But, but I think the way we do business is significantly different, right? I think, I think the ways and means of doing business um, three decades ago versus doing business today yeah. is very different. Dealings are a lot more transparent. Mm -hmm. Corporate governance is of paramount importance. Transparency is important. Um, and I think what's also changed is the kind of workforce that you're able to get where uh, they want to be partners with you in that journey of creating wealth, in that journey of creating equity for themselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the sense of accountability, the sense of responsibility is much higher in them. And I think, um, so I think a large part of the success that all of us see is because of the people who work with us. Um, and, and so therefore, it's changed from being, I think, leadership back in the day may have been more top-down, more authoritarian. I think today, it's really more about more participative, more collective, mm -hmm. and that's what's leading you to do better things and have Wonderful. better outcomes. Uh, Keshav, uh, is there anything that you want to really imbibe from your dad and from your previous generation while you're doing business? Or is there something that you want to really change and you want to usher in? No, I've been uh, very blessed and grateful uh, from my grandfather's side on both sides, GBK yeah. Reddy and TSR Reddy, and my parents, uh, Pinky and Sanjay. I think I've been very lucky and fortunate. There's nothing I would ever change. So <laughs> in that sense, I think, uh, you know, we have to take on the responsibility and, and be very grateful and build, you know, opportunities for us, for the country, for everyone around. So I think that's the only I thing. I think I you say. want to take the fitness lessons from your dad more. <laughs> <laughs> My dad is extremely fit. He, he's doing a triathlon at 60, so. Yeah. And are you also as into fitness? No, not as much as him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you like to like at least aspire to be that? I think he's already, uh, you know, tried two Iron Man challenges, right? That's right. He's already done them. So. And at this age, at, at 60. this age, that's correct. And does that make life more uh, difficult for you? And no, not a, actually, it's really exciting because I do uh, long distance cycling with him. So okay. we go for like 50 to 100 kilometer cycling, you know, at 4:35 in the morning. So it's it's really enjoyable because we have similar passions. So uh, a okay. lot of fun. Right, Shashwat, what's your passion? You're not into fitness at all. You told me. I mean, well, not into it at all in the sense it's not a passion. I do it because I think I should. Um, and I think, um, like in this case as well, I think dad is definitely very into fitness as well. Um, he does a one and a half hour walk every day, um, one hour workout every day. So that's, that's a lot of 
uh, time that goes into being fit. Uh, so definitely something that I do, but it's not my passion. Um, I think for me, surprisingly, one of the things um, that I love to do is actually cook. And for me, uh, that's, that's a big stress buster. Mm. Uh, and for us, it's now become a family, family activity where both Shivika and I do it. And now my daughter is almost three. And we're starting to get her into it. So it's a fun Sunday activity What's that all three of us. What's the best meal that you've cooked for your family till date? You'll have to ask them, uh, <laughs> but I'd like to think I cook most things well. So is, is Sunday lunch on you, like always? Absolutely. Oh, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Well, great to speak to both of you. Many thanks, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, audiences, for being so patient and listening. And looks like, you know, our future is going to be very, very bright. We saw Florina, but uh, flag bearers are definitely taking it way forward. Many, many thanks for being with us for this very Thank special you, conversation. Thank you, Sachi. All the very best to both Thank of you. you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause as I call on stage Alika Kirloskar, Vice President, Kirloskar Group, to come up and present a small token of our appreciation to our panelists. Once again, do raise a warm applause for the two gentlemen. This session was sponsored by Kirloskar. A warm applause for Mr. Goenka, Mr. Reddy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to get into the next session, a Pacific Convergence of Interests with India, sponsored by RP Sanjeev Goenka Group. Just give us 30 seconds and we are ready to power in to our next session this evening. To take it from here, would like to call on stage Geeta Mohan, Executive Editor, India Today Television. I hope so. Good evening. Uh, we are here, joined today by the stars of uh, the diplomatic circuit here in India. And we will be discussing the Pacific convergences of interests with India. How can the world, these major powers come together, striving for peace, conciliation, and unity in a distorted, disjointed, and completely divided world? This is a moment where Quad meets AUKUS, and so we will have the entire Indo-Pacific conversation, but looking at how India really uh, plays, in, plays a role in this entire region. Um, no opening remarks for everyone, because we have a timer that's set, and we are very short of time, so a lot of questions. Let's begin with the Q&A. Ambassador Garcetti, to you first. Now, we know we've heard a lot about uh, the importance of Quad uh, and the role India has to play, but explain to me how India is important in this Quad architecture, given the fact that uh, India does not patrol the waters with Quad partners. India is not part of the IPEF trade pillar. 
So while India says, and the Quad partners say, that it's an economic structure, we are not part of the trade pillar. We say it's not a military structure, we are not part of patrolling, and most of the work that uh, India and all these Quad partners do in developing countries are bilateral in nature. So how is this important? So thank you, Geeta, and thank you to all of you and India today for having us here. It's an honor to be on the stage with my colleagues here in, I guess, what would be called the Quakus, if it's the Quad and the Aukus together. Okay, Quakus. You heard it here first. <laughs> Welcome to the Quakus. Um, and the Quad is really, I think, we've always said it's, it isn't a military alliance, all four of us. We have strong um, bilateral relations, each aspect of the Quad, each country. Those do work in strategic and military spaces. Those do work in economic spaces. Those do work in people-to-people -people and cultural, educational spaces. But the Quad really is, I think, a reflection of values and of geography and the shared interest that we have to have a peaceful, democratic, just, open, accountable Indo-Pacific. And that happens, I think, in so many rich ways through the Quad, whether it is um, looking at uh, ecological and climate issues, whether it's in emergencies like we saw during the pandemic, when the Quad really became a force for assisting each other. And I think, you know, that's a better question for each country to answer, not for one country to reply to. But India is in many ways in the driver's seat of the Quad. And that's, I think, exciting for India. I've described that India loves geometric diplomacy, triangles, squares, quadrilaterals. You know, the multilateral you can get lost in places like the UN right now, which are important convening spaces, but with a divided world, they're just as divided as the world. Bilateral is really helpful, but there's a limit to bilateralism sometimes. And so I think there's a real shared set of principles that in a discussion I had with National Security Advisor Doval, he said it's not just strategy, it's not just affinity. We do think alike, our hearts do feel alike, but it's really about ideology. In this moment when there's extremism, whether it's religious extremism, whether it's dictatorship versus democracies. And we can get hung up on the idea that the narcissism of small differences, the few areas where we are looking maybe at democratic values sometimes differently, divide us when the reality is we are very deeply united. And also I would include, of course, the UK in that, even though UK isn't part of the Quad, we share, I think, these moments, these intersections that will define not just forms of governance, but what happens with technology, what happens with trade, what happens with economic prosperity, or the four P's, as I call them, peace, prosperity, planet, and people. All right, Australian High Commissioner to India, High Commissioner Green. Um, Australia is a part of the AUKUS and Quad. What is your reading on why is India hesitant to join a military bloc? Is China a factor? Is it because uh, India is an immediate neighbor, unlike all the other countries in the AUKUS and Quad, and has to bear the brunt of uh, Beijing's aggression, should it be part of any military bloc? Well, India has a very long history of finding its own way in global affairs. For a country like Australia, close partnerships with our neighbours and our friends from far away have been part of what we've always been. India's finding new ways of making its way in the world with strategic autonomy and multi-dimensional partnerships. So it's really for India to decide where it fits into these partnerships. For us, um, the Quad tries to deal with a region which is increasingly contested, where democracy is under threat, where countries are increasingly unable to pursue their sovereignty in the ways that they want, that they get forced into choices that they wouldn't prefer and that economic coercion is a feature. That's what we're standing against. We're standing up for, as Eric said, a number of values which are important, and we're backing that by demonstrating that we support things which will make our region better health security through vaccines, maritime do domain awareness so that countries can understand what's going on, on in their near abroad, infrastructure which gives them options for uh, things which are built in public goods which uh, will be sustainable and done according to the best principles. AUKUS is entirely different. It helps develop a world 
which can better avoid conflict and deter military action, but it's essentially designed to create military capability between our three countries. In the first instance, submarines, which are going to be crucial for avoiding a major conflict, but in the next instance, a whole range of new technologies which will help all of our nations better defend ourselves and make our, make our reason, regions more secure. So the two are very different. Uh, the two are complementary and help us build a region and a world where peace is more likely. Well, um, High Commissioner Ellis, uh, uh, UK High Commissioner to India, the fact that uh, there is a lot of focus, and AUKUS was born out of that need to have a military bloc in a, at a time when um, the world was faced with aggression, particularly coming in from China. Do you see a future where India could be part of a bloc such as the AUKUS, and how much of the focus is on aggression from China? I guess for the last generation, when I joined the uh, public service, the Euro-Atlantic was sort of the center of the world in 1990. At least, that's a very British thing to say. <laughs> the next generation, Indo-Pacific, is going to be the defining area of the world. You may want it, you may not want that, but that is the case. And so, there's a great deal more intense focus on what goes on here. And the center and drivers of prosperity and human talent India is definitely one of them, it's one of the three defining countries of the rest of my life. And uh, China and the United States, and they are all in, this, uh, all in this region. So it's not surprising that that's where we return. We've had a strong point of presence here for a long time. And we share the ideology. You know, you, how are you going to maintain, how are you going to allow for prosperity and prevent coercion? And you do it in a lot of different ways. You do it in some Ways like, you know, mapping the oceans, uh, how you're going to deal with climate change and resilient infrastructure, all this kind of stuff. But there's also a harder edge to it as well. We can't kid ourselves. You need that too. You need all the elements of power, not just one bit or another bit. Uh, AUKUS comes in two bits. One is about nuclear-powered submarines, but the other is about technology, exactly as, uh, as, uh, as Philip was saying. And there you would like, I suspect you're going to see a great deal more cooperation, not just at a bilateral, but between a series of countries about how you develop technology. And that will be, the United States will be at the forefront of that. It's a technological superpower, but it will include the United Kingdom, not least because our research is so strong. The COVID shield vaccine is a kind of example of basic technology combined, well, actually complex technology combined with unbelievably effective manufacturing distribution by India. So the future will be, I suspect, in these, um, maybe it's a rhomboid-shaped diplomacy, I'm not sure, uh, between not just one country and another country, but a series of countries, which essentially are driven by a shared sense of wanting freedom and to prevent coercion. And that's where I think the UK comes in. Okay. Former Foreign Secretary of India, Ms. Nirubama Rao. Ms. Rao, let's zoom in a little. Let's look at the Indian Ocean. Now, we do see a lot of divergences in the region in the recent past. How do you see India play a role to have convergences of interests? Uh, again, looking at China and China making inroads into these very important countries in the region, be it Sri Lanka, the Maldives, or for that matter, our relations with Nepal or Bangladesh. You know, geopolitics is a very uh, popular word in the Indian vocabulary today. And when you look at the geopolitics of the region, and you're talking of the Indo-Pacific, you are essentially referring to the, what Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe spoke of when he talked of the confluence of the two oceans. So I really don't want to look at the Indian Ocean as a separate entity in the context of our discussion this afternoon, because the Indo-Pacific is the arena of competition today. Uh, somebody called it, you know, a, a contest for supremacy in the region. I don't look at it as any kind of new great game, but I understand that the China factor, uh, I've mentioned the name, the China factor refers to both the oceans when we talk of the Indo-Pacific. Right? And for China, and when it comes to India, we are neighbors. We have the 3,488 kilometer long border. And India looks at the maritime dimension of the Indian Ocean 
but there is also a continental dimension to our geopolitical concerns in the region because of the land border that we share with China and the fact that we are oriented towards both land and sea. We are, in that sense, a unique country. And uh, our peninsula juts out into the heart of the Indian Ocean. And therefore, the role that India can play with its navy and our growing naval interests and the whole context of maritime domain awareness, uh, which my colleagues on this panel referred to, in all these senses, I think what happens in the Indian Ocean doesn't stay in the Indian Ocean today. It, re it concerns the whole region. The, con the question of global trade, the question of the numbers of people who live in this region. I was just looking at the head count of countries from the global south who are in the Indo-Pacific. And my math may not be exactly accurate, but I counted 49 countries from the global south who live in this region. So uh, when you speak of organizations, bodies like the Quad, and we're all in this together as sister democracies, you know, we are talking of an agenda for human development, human security. And I don't really know if China has got that entirely right. So when you look at the Maldives and when you look at Sri Lanka, you look at the crisis that Sri Lanka faced in the last two years. I mean, it was a life-threatening crisis for that nation. And ultimately, you know, this whole pull of gravity that keeps India and our South Asian neighbors together was very manifest at that time. Because we, we were there to help Sri Lanka. And, uh, and of course, assistance from the international bodies followed. But I think that demonstrated to the world the role, the crucial role that India can play in this region. Never mind the differences that we may have with the Maldives today. But ultimately, I think, South Asia, the region, the Indian Ocean region is meant to be an integer. We are all in this together. Right. Um, let's talk about the Russia-Ukraine war, which primarily is known as a European war. So, Hi Commissioner Ellis, um, the fact that this is a war that has gone on for way too long, how do you see it pan out in the near future at a time when we are looking at, and there's a China angle to this as well, uh, we, we, where we are looking at China really coming out and supporting Russia, the reason why maybe Russian economy sustained itself for this long. Uh, it's a war that should never have started. Um, for an autocracy to just walk into its neighbor and take over its land and say that you are part of us and you don't get a choice about your future. I mean, life is complicated. This is one of the simpler things to observe. Um, it's appalling that it's happened, and it's appalling that it's going on in the way it has, with terrible human cost. One of the things I think we learned, going back to your question, is about what has happened there affects the whole world. It affects fertilizer prices in the Punjab. Um, uh, the fact that the disruption, uh, the destruction of grain supplies by the Russian ships of grain coming out of Ukraine, that has a direct effect on the poorest people in Africa. So. The world in which you could keep these different theaters apart, that world is over. Um, uh, and so what happens there has effects here. And one of the risks, I think, is it, uh, that Russia drives focus more and more on the land of the Euro-Atlantic. And that is not good news for those of us who are trying to, at the same time, ensure open and free Indo-Pacific. Now, we're managing to do that, but that is, that is a big problem, I think, for the future. But for if Autocratic coercion succeeds in taking other people's countries. That is not a good future for all of us. Okay. There are reports that uh, the United States of America had asked Prime Minister Modi to intervene. So Ambassador Garcetti did Prime Minister Modi, along with uh, President Xi Jinping, avert a nuclear attack by Russia? During the Ukraine conflict? Yes. I don't know that I can speak to whether that happened. It hasn't happened yet, so I would assume everybody. Uh, victory has many fathers and, and defeat has few. So we can all claim some credit for that unspeakable and unthinkable use of nuclear weaponry again in our lifetimes. Um, but we do see an amazing partnership. I've said, I think, a number of times that between the United States and India that we don't have an additive relationship. We have a multiplicative one. In other words, when the US and India get together, there are certain doors we open up better and there are certain doors that India opens up better. 
And when we really like each other and decide to have a deep friendship, look at the G20, a unanimous communique that I would argue was stronger on the war in Ukraine, certainly, than Bali. And India used its influence with its relationships to make sure that there was not dissent. And in doing that, made sure that another neighbor to the north couldn't create any chaos because a neighbor to the north of them was locked in. But we also do this in very positive ways, too. I think about the trilateral development initiative that we have together with the US and India. We're not just looking to stop war. We're looking to, quote the foreign secretary, to look at the human development. So TRIDEP, as we call it, recently invited a group of Fijian health officials here to Delhi, where Indian uh, experts in telemedicine trained them to get to the most remote parts of Fiji with medical care, sponsored by America's USAID. Um, and we were now so successful that we're thinking, where can we go in Africa, Southeast Asia, other Pacific Island countries together? How can we take things like digital public infrastructure that India is so advanced with and give people options that are not led by autocracies or dictatorships or people who want to spy on you? The way we took a Google cable through the Pacific that wasn't going to go to the Pacific Islands because they're too small in the market, but with Australia figured out ways to get telecommunication to these Pacific Island countries without it being a state-owned enterprise from a non-democratic country. These are great ways with which we don't just promote peace and avoid war, but we really look at human development in a way that is free and fair for everyone. On the security aspect for India, a big concern has been, with all the three countries, has been the issue of Khalistan. Uh, we've heard murder for hire charges, we've heard uh, threats to Indian diplomats, and we've also seen the kind of actions that are in action on uh, the country's part in question. Uh, High Commissioner Green, as part of the Five Eyes, as part of a country where uh, Indian diplomats have uh, come under threat or have been threatened, how, what is the reaction of a country, and should uh, the reaction of a country be? And how are you looking at the trial that is underway or the case that's underway in America? Well, first of all, we don't look at this through the prism of five eyes. We look at this through the prism of Australian sovereign interests and values. And for us, you talked about the... Sikh community in Australia and some who occasionally like to protest outside Indian missions. Peaceful protest and demonstration is a core part of our democracy and we'll stand up for it. But violence and particularly acts that might put Indian diplomats at risk are completely out of question for us. And so a huge amount of our governmental effort, much more than I think many of your audience would understand, between our multicultural, between our foreign policy, between our police, between our uh, intelligence and security agencies, a huge amount of effort goes into making sure that when there are differences between communities, they are managed in a way that doesn't cause violence or harm. And let me say this. The Indian community is the fastest growing community in Australia, and it's now big. It's nearly 4% of our, of our population. But this is not the first time that we have dealt with communities who've made their homes in Australia, and there are different parts of them. We are gripped up to do, to do this, and we take it really seriously, and a key part of that is making sure that Indian diplomats in their premises are safe. Ambassador Garcetti, will there be a trial uh, and should there be a trial, will there be naming of officers that have been kept uh, unnamed for now? And have these incidents, the murder for hire charges against Indian nationals, impacted relations between India and the U.S.? Let me work backwards. In the first, a lot of people always ask me this, has it been a setback, has it been a roadblock, has it been a bump? It's serious, and like good friends, we dealt with it in a serious way. But the pace of our relationship has only continued to accelerate even in the midst of it. In some ways, it's the first stress test of our new relationship, which has deepened. And so far, I think both countries are passing it, but there's many miles to go. I'm the son of a prosecutor, so I know better than to discuss an active case, criminal case here. <laughs> um, nor should you assume that I'm read into, because I think good prosecutors also keep their evidence where they are in order to bring to justice. And nobody should pre suppose outcomes. 
And oftentimes these are politicized in a way that none of us have actually looked at evidence or very few people have. But it is clear that we have articulated the highest levels. There are red lines when it comes to our citizens, the rights of our citizens. There's no conspiracy behind them. Life would be much easier for us not to have contested democracies where people disagree. But that is the point of a democracy and it's something that we have to defend. Similar to Australia though, we take acts of violence very seriously and we've had great coordination between our law enforcement to ensure that whether it's diplomats' lives or just drug runners, gun runners and others do face justice across borders and can't hide from one place to the next. So those can coexist. The relationship continues, I think, with more strength than we've ever witnessed before but we won't back away from the principles that are important to this relationship and to be able to respect one another. All right. It's an election year. We have more than 60 elections across the world, and we have a few very important elections coming up, not just here in India, but also the United States of America, the United Kingdom. Hi, Commissioner Ellis, to you first. Uh, Rishi Sunak and Prime Minister Modi have, uh, have had a great, great inning, so to say. Uh, should the labor come to power, will there be more questions on India's human rights records? Should India really be uh, worried and concerned? And uh, will we see the FTA that you've been so, uh, you've been working so hard on really come through? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's a career-ending moment for every diplomat when a journalist asks you the, about the future of your domestic politics, at which point you just let it go straight past your nose, walk down the pitch, pat the pitch, walk back, and take guard again. <laughs> I'm so happy to live in a country which understands that metaphor. <laughs> Ambassador Garcetti is yet to learn, you know, so, and, and Ms. Uh, he, Rao he's, and I. He's, he's taking <laughs> cricket, to, he's taking cricket to LA, it's fantastic. Um, uh, the free trade agreement uh, is uh, tough not to crack. I noticed EFTA took 16 years, so uh, are we just in the foothills after two? I don't know. Uh, although we're, we're in a pretty steep ascent at the moment, I think, to try and get to the top. Uh, that's not for me ultimately to, to determine. They do going on very well, two prime ministers. I think I see, what I see in the UK is a kind of cross-party support, certainly from the two main principal parties in my country, for a deeper economic relationship. Remember, the UK benefits enormously from its diversity, yeah? That's a great thing. That's a great thing across the country. You know, when you have a prime minister called Rishi Sunak, whose wife is called Akshita Murthy, those of you who went to my country 30, 40 years ago, can you believe that that would happen? No. Yes. It's an incredible thing. So that diversity expresses itself in lots of different ways, including in politics, range of different politicians from different places, and I think we're the stronger for it. Okay. Um, the other important election is the U.S. elections. Um, India is one of those rare countries, and Prime Minister Modi, one of those rare leaders who really had a good relationship with former President Trump. Now, it's Trump versus Biden. Both are good for India, but how, what's your reading on what either would have to offer to India? You know, it's nice when countries that don't need to get along or don't get along have leaders that do get along. But the U.S.-India relationship isn't about who's at the top. It really is nice to see that. It's, it was one of the great joys of my life to watch the Prime Minister and President Biden together at the White House. It was emotionally deep for both of them. What they said privately, showed me that the public words, they really meant them deep down. But no matter who the leaders are in our two countries, I think this is a relationship held together by all of us, by the fact that more students to the United States came from here than any other country in the world for the first time last year, that our visas went up by 60% in a single year, uh, even with basically the same staff, and I'm sure 40 of you will come up asking for help for your cousin after this, getting their visa appointment, but we brought the time down by 80% from the worst moment that it's been, that we can go straight through metric after metric after metric, and this relationship doesn't depend on elections. It depends on values. We think the same way, our heads are aligned. We feel the same way, our hearts are aligned. Now our challenge is, can our feet move together, and how quickly? But do we? Um, the United States of America just reacted to the C implementation of CAA in India, and India's response is that do not interfere in India's internal affairs. Look, with the time up, uh, I'm sorry I can't answer that question, but no, it's, all kidding aside, it's, um, 
In America, we feel very strongly about the sense that borders need to be secure, but that also we're a nation of immigrants that have been enriched by our diversity. Secondly, we understand India's security needs as well. But we are well aware of this, monitoring it very closely, and I would just say broadly that the principle of religious freedom and of equality under the law is a cornerstone of democracy. And that's why we look at these things. It would be easier not to look in our friends uh, or have friends, but we invite you to do the same with our imperfect democracy. It's not a one-way street. But I do think that you can't give up on principles, no matter how close you are with friends or if it comes from your worst enemy, when those are principles that you stand for. All right. Uh, time's up. But because this is UK High Commissioner to India's farewell conclave, uh, he's leaving after, in, a, in a week's time, going back to headquarters and then uh, to a next ambassadorial posting. Uh, we decided to do a short rapid fire. If you agree, Preeti, can we just do a short rapid fire? Not too long, and he'll do it in Hindi. And then he'll sing a bit for us in Hindi. You have to do that. For all Give the Hindi that we endured, for all the Hindi that we endured, all those Hindi videos <laughs> that Alex put out, you'll have to sing for us. Okay, a quick question, rapid fire. Yeah, yeah. And my Hindi is also okay. As good as yours. <laughs> as good as yours. <laughs> Hindi mein poochte hain, and then baakiyo se poochenge, thik hai? आपका सबसे बड़ा मोमेंट भारत में क्या था? सबसे बड़ा मोमेंट्स भारत में ईडन गार्डन्स में क्रिकेट खेला। ओह ईडन गार्डन्स। हाँ। बैटिंग किया। 25 नॉट आउट। अच्छा और सबसे अच्छा खाना क्या लगा आपको? ओ मुश्किल है। दक्षिण दक्षिण भारत में हमेशा दोसा। दोसा। ओके। दिल्ली में Chole Batura or Chola beer. Chole Batura. <laughs> okay. And see, you have it right there. Khate mein nazar aare hain aap. Yeah, that was, that um, was, that's, that's, um, that's an Enam dish. No, no, that's in, um, that's a northern, uh, northern uh, Karnataka dish. Achha. Very good. Achha, sabse behtareen uh, shahar, city koon sa tha? Uh, sabse, achha, uh, shahar. Uh, Kolkata ki Sanskriti. Ah. Um, Jaisal Mero Bikaner. Um, ke, um, Rajasthan? No, what do you, how do you say it? The uh, deserts of, uh, of Rajasthan. Rajasthan. Rajasthan, exactly. That was fantastic. <laughs> or uh, Madura, Madurai ki Mantri. Be. Acha. Or cricket moment? <sighs> there aren't a lot. <laughs> uh, Hyderabad me uh, England, uh, England ki Jeet. Acha. Yeah, teen. <laughs> Teen Salome, ek bar hi. I would have helped you, but I really don't know what you're talking about. Huh? Uh, favorite I. personality? Cricket personality. Favorite personality? Mere classmate, um, uh, Saif Ali Khan. Saif Ali Khan. Or, uh, he was a very naughty boy at school. Achha, aapke classmate the isliye favorite hain. Yeah. Or favorite politician? Controversial, but you have to tell us where you are going. Oh, I'm a civil servant too. That's why all of the mantras are very good. Okay. Can I do a quick one with Ambassador Garcetti? Ambassador Garcetti, quick one. Your big moment in India up until now. My big moment? Putting cricket in the Olympics. It took an American to put the cricket into the Olympics. Come to Los Angeles in 2028. Big round of applause to that. Favorite food? Uh, Chole Bhature in the morning, for sure. Favorite city? Uh, favorite city, it's not really a city, but Kani Kumari at sunrise. Cricket moment? Cricket moment was being in Modi sta uh, uh, Stadium, uh, probably for the IPL final, which was rained out. It was so beautiful, actually, that night, and the rain was coming down, but I didn't get to see the match, but I loved it. Okay. Favorite personality? Favorite personality besides Gita? I mean, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, my favorite personality so far was probably hanging out with Shah Rukh Khan. Ah, favorite politician. Who owns the cricket team in Los Angeles, by the way. Favorite politician or leader? My favorite politician is always the one I'm talking to. <laughs> On that note, uh, I'll just do High Commissioner Green before I let them go. High Commissioner Green, your big moment in India? 
It's very difficult, Gita, to go past the World Cup final. Oh, last. I, I know, I know, it, I know, I know it's, it's difficult in all sorts of ways. <laughs> Favourite food? Uh, anything washed down by a kingfisher. And, <laughs> and, you know, that could be a dosa or that could be a gulab jamun. Okay. Favourite uh, food? Food. Oh, yeah. You just said that, right? Favourite yeah, city. I think I did. Favourite city? Um... Kolkata is my favourite city, city of learning and literature and discussion and debate. I love it. Cricket moment? Same, cr same cricket moment. <laughs> <laughs> favourite personality? I, so my favourite personality is definitely Sachin Tendulkar. I mean, he's a, he's a hero of India. He's, he's, he's a hero of, of Australia-India relations. And when you meet him, he is such a humble, decent, down-to-earth guy. There couldn't be an Australian who, who, Australian who wouldn't like him. And favourite politician? Or a leader? I, I think that's for all of the Indians to decide very soon. Ah. On that note, thank you so much for joining us here all right, on the Day Today Conference. We're running out of stage. time, I have to end it as diplomatically as I can. Let's quickly move on while I call upon Mukesh Arora, Senior Vice President, Radhiko Khetan, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to our panelists. Please do put your hands together, raise a warm applause. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Give us 20 minutes. We're going to turn around the stage. We're going to quickly get into our next session. We are running a tad bit late, but we're trying very hard to make up. I'm going to quickly take you through on our next session. Well, she's someone I'm actually quite followed of late. Um, splendid Miss Samantha from Pushpa to the family man, carving her own niche. This session is sponsored by Masha Arts. To take it from here, allow me to call upon My colleague Akshita Nangopal, Deputy Editor, India Today Television, to introduce you to our next guest, Splendid Miss Samantha. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Please put your hands together and please give a warm welcome to Samantha Ruth Prabhu. Now in the film industry, Samantha. It's taken you 14 years to come here to the India Today Conclave. I was just going to say that um, it took me 14 years to be on this stage. Wow. <laughs> 
Did it have to take that long? <laughs> yeah, I agree. We should have had you much earlier, but it's amazing that you're here now. Thank you for and having me. And I think you're here, here when you're at your highest, so that's great to see. Uh, let's talk about your journey first of 14 years, and I'm sure you reminisce it a lot because you were a girl from Chennai. You dreamed big. You hoped to achieve a lot. You didn't have any big name, no godfather in the industry. Your family wasn't into the film industry either. How did you really kick off your career with a bang, with a Gautam Vasudev men in film? 14 years, sometimes 14 years feels like a very long time. But sometimes 14 years when you're doing something you love can just fly by. Wow. These are from your first film. I don't remember that girl though. <laughs> that girl... Um, was a scared little puppy, very eager to please, and just quite desperate to fit in, actually. I think for the longest time, I just wanted to fit in. It was, um, there was a fear of, I operated for the longest time from a space of fear. I think when your resources are limited and mine were extremely limited growing up, and coming from very, having humble beginnings, my resources were limited. So the fail, fear of failure was, fear of failure drove me for the longest time. And it pushed me. I don't even know if I operated from a space of love and kindness. I don't know if I would have been able to achieve what I have achieved in the last 14 years. I think that fear was an incredible driving force for me. When did that change? When that did you decide that, look, I'm not going to work and you know, act out of fear, but I'm going to do this to succeed. I'm going to do this because I love doing it. You know, in fact, very recently, very recently when I got sick is when I realized that the fear was motivating me, but it was also kind of destroying me. Um, and I think that although being with life throwing this curveball at me with my health and uh, with the autoimmune condition that I was diagnosed with, I think it, in many ways, I, th I thought, why me? But after having gone through this ordeal of one and a half, almost two years now, I wouldn't have it any other way. That's so amazing to hear. You see some of these pictures, um, I'm sure it doesn't sum up even an inch of the struggle that you faced uh, battling this autoimmune disorder. But look, there were many people who didn't know what it was. Did you? What happened? When did you realize something wasn't right? You know, we always, while we are like, you know, I was probably part of the hustle culture. You can't, you can't ever tell me that, take a break. I feel like we're taking a break is for the week. I'm about the hustle culture. I am about doing 10 things at a time. And uh, you know, I get only five hours of sleep and I am so productive and, uh, I get, you know, you sleep for seven hours? Are you, what, how lazy are you? This, this was my attitude. <laughs> and now, I think the greatest thing that I've learned is when I read this quote was, what the hustle culture doesn't realize is that rest is not taking your foot off the gas, it's putting fuel in the tank, which I wasn't doing. I was just taking, taking, taking and never giving my body a break, never giving my mind a break. So, I think that this feeling that you ask, like, you know, 14 years, but 14 years, to be honest, none of the blockbusters, and I had blockbuster after another, you know, I was called this weird golden leg in the industry yes. because I didn't have too many flops for the longest time. But. It, I can't tell you that those were the most unhappy years of my life because I suffered from something called the imposter syndrome where I woke up, where I always had this feeling that I wasn't good enough. I always 
was scared that I would wake up and it would all go away. I was scared that people would see me for who I truly was, which, who I thought my, I, myself to be, which is not really that great. So I suffered with this imposter syndrome for the longest time during the biggest highs of my career. So you didn't enjoy any of the successes that you got? I wish I could say yes, but I didn't. I never attributed my victories to me. To I never, I, my success to me, and, and never owned it as my wins. I always, if you, not, if you ever looked, watched any of my previous interviews, it would always be, yeah, the film is a success because maybe the stars, destiny, the hero, the... Uh, the production, the director, I always attributed my successes to someone else. I hope today you say it was because of me. Today, I feel that I... You know this feeling of having arrived? The feeling of having arrived is subjective for different people. For some people, it's their successes. But for me, the feeling of arriving is to arrive to a place where I have, fi I have finally given myself the permission to be my authentic self. All of the imperfections, all of the lows, all of the hardships, this is me. And I think this is when I, have, when I truly feel that I have arrived. I'm so happy for you that you've reached this point also of comfort, of happiness and joy in your life. Uh, when you were diagnosed with your autoimmune disorder, did you take a conscious call of coming out and going public with it because you believed there would be awareness? Um, if I'm being honest, I was forced to because at that point of time I had um, a film that was led by me. It was a female-centric film and it was coming out for, uh, for release. It was due for, due for release and uh, I, I was very sick at that point of time and I was... I couldn't... I, it was hard. <laughs> so um, I wasn't ready to come out but there was all sorts of speculations going around. Uh, there was all sorts of uh, misinformation being spread. And my um, producers really needed me to promote this film. It would die otherwise if, I, if it had absolutely no publicity. And there's no hero. There are no other artists in the film. It's, it was just solely led by me. So I agreed to do one interview. Uh, and obviously I didn't look the same I was very weak I was uh, under a lot of medication high dose medication just to to keep me stable so I think I was forced up maybe if if I was given the choice I wouldn't wouldn't have come out about my condition in such a vulnerable state but maybe more in the state that I am in now uh, from a place of strength rather than such weakness. So if I was given the choice, I wouldn't have um, announced it and come out with it so soon. Why is that? Do you believe? Because when you did speak out about it, there was a lot of scrutiny. A lot of people, unfortunately, online said, you know, this is a made up condition. She's victimizing herself. Right. How did you deal with that? because you were already in a place where you know, you're going through so much. How did you deal with that kind of criticism online? Did you see it? Did you see the kind of hateful comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was called sympathy queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. But, you know, for me, my journey as an actor, as a human being, I have evolved so much from being in this business. Early on in my career, I was, I would wake up anxious and immediately go to social media. Who's saying something bad about me? Who's written a nasty article about me? It just occupied so much space in my mind. But now I feel that the more people accuse me of things, I, I have started to almost 
question every action of mine, every thought of mine, they have actually forced me <laughs> to become the person that I can be proud of. And if I'm proud of myself, it's okay if you think something that's not true, I think, or if you think that I am something, if it's okay, maybe, you know, sometimes I also feel that when people are going through a lot of pain, they need a portal, they need somewhere to project that pain. And I feel one little nasty comment on social media kind of eases their pain a little bit. I do sincerely believe that. You're being extremely soft on them. <laughs> but you face this a lot, right? Yeah. Whether it was your health, your personal life. Not many actresses come out and speak about that, you know, their personal life, what they've gone through. And even then, very often it was the woman to blame. The actress who did this and that, that led to all sorts of personal life choices and decisions. It is. You know, it is, it is tough. But I wouldn't have it any other way. And I've always believed that Yes, there's a mountain to climb. I will climb that mountain. I will reach the top and I will reach the top knowing that there's another mountain to climb and this is how I function. Greater the pain, greater the effort, greater the reward and I'm ready for it. Amazing. You've seen so many highs. So let's talk about that as well. Uh, about all of the Otherwise, highs again, it'll seen. be hashtag sympathy queen. Do you want that? Oh my God. No. <laughs> I think you've conquered it, you owned it. You know, you've you ensured that you sent across a fitting message to everyone who kind of tried to get attention and publicity from what you were going through. But let's talk about, you know, what everyone here, even to this date, speaks of. Your performance in the family. Don't band say Uantawa. Well. <laughs> that also, Uantawa as well. And it takes guts, you know, to do an Uantawa because were you scared you'd be stereotyped then and kind of put in a box? Because you did. Ooh, and Tava, an item girl, then you did Raji in The Family Man. I think um, the decision to do Ooh, and Tava it was similar to the de decision to do Raji. I, I, you know, in the good side of not having too many people around you, like you said, you know, no godfathers, no people in your ear, no opinions that I need to cater to to make my final decision. That is the, f the good side of not having too many people around you. The flip side is, however, that I had to really make mistakes and learn from them and really hone my gut instincts. Um, the decision, I've always... The decision to do Uantawa honestly came from a place of I need to explore a new facet of being an actor. I have always been very uncomfortable, well, I know you have these pictures on, but I've been uncomfortable with my sexuality. I haven't, I, I'm not very uh, comfortable, confident, like I said, I've always operated from a space of I'm not good enough, uh, I don't feel pretty, I don't look like the other girls. So for me, it was a huge challenge. It was actually, yeah, I was the first shot of Uantawa, I was shaking from fear because sexy is not my thing. <laughs> it's not my thing, but how I've grown both as an actor as a, and as a person is I've always made sure that I put myself in the most uncomfortable, unforgiving, un, uh, very, very difficult circumstances. I like to put myself there and fight to overcome that. It's like almost like I'm kind of slaying these demons, these inner demons, you know, and I, you know, they said, you're so small, how can you fight? How can you land a punch? It's like, let me do it. <laughs> you're doing a lot of it, I hear, in Citadel as well, yeah. in your upcoming film. Yes, a lot of action, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you show us a bit of what you've learned? I'll move away so that I don't get kicked in the face. No, I'll move away. You, ha you have to block. I'll t <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> I don't want to be punched in the face either. <laughs> can you show us something of what you've learned? Show you, like, um, thank God you didn't ask me to do a step in Uantawa. I appreciate that. That's coming, you know it. Let's is. do some action, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You also have to do it. I have to do it? Yeah. Okay, can we have some music, please?
action film. I've been trained by Samantha. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so you've learned a whole lot of action also for your uh, next project. Yeah, uh, it was actually the hardest role of my life simply because I was, I had to do it when I was really weak. So it, for me, Citadel is already a success because I uh, shot for Citadel under the most grueling circumstances. I, I didn't think that I could do it, but I'm really, really, you know, when you asked again, I, 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 like now I can say I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, the mind space that you were in earlier versus now, do you think you'd still do an item song even today if it came to you? Uh, again or for the first time? Again? Again, mm, no, I don't see the challenge in it anymore. <laughs> Because, you know, there's also a lot of questions. You're someone who's faced this. We spoke about it as a woman, how you've been targeted. And very often there's this narrative about how item songs also sexualize a woman uh, and creates a wrong narrative around her. Did you sense that? Did you kind of hesitate because you were like, this will send out a wrong message? The lyrics of Uantawa, however, very interesting. Yeah, that I made sure of. <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? Uh, I think that for me it was the lyrics. It was the lyrics, it was the challenge, and uh, I think we can move past judging women for, you know, I don't know. For wanting to look good? Yeah, for wanting to look good. We can do everything, no? If we can you, look if, good, we can, we can do everything. If you had to choose between Uwan Tava and Raji, from the family man, which would you do? Oh no, of course, Raji. <laughs> Raji? Of course. Of that was course. a very special project, I'm sure, for you. That as was well. very special, yes, yes. And what was that like? Because do you feel that that ensured that you weren't boxed in as an actor? It showed that you know you're diverse. It's introduced you also to a whole new audience. Yeah, I I didn't really think that it would explore the way it did. I, I really didn't think, I just, I was very, I felt very responsible to play Raji because it, it was loosely based on real incidents and I did not want to disappoint people and I'm really sorry if I did disappoint someone but it was very special to me and uh, there were many instances while playing Raji where it really hit home and it got a bit too real. But it also took me at, uh, to a place of realization that this is what I'm meant to do. If I'm going to do another project or more, or if I'm going to accept a role, it should give me this kind of fulfillment. You know, you said in the beginning about how you never gave yourself time. You were all about hustling. Today you're an actor, you're a producer, you're an entrepreneur, you host your own uh, podcast. How are you not hustling now? This is hustling. Is it? <laughs> no. Just about five things. So. I mean, but I was, I was, um, this is something more than just doing a job. This is part of who I am suddenly. I was, I was doing, I was accepting films and doing many roles, vapid some of them just so that, you know, I'm there. I'm there on every poster. I'm there every one month I have a film release. I'm, you, c you can't ignore me. So I, actresses are drilled. This is drilled into you that you have a short shelf life and you can't afford to take breaks and uh, out, of, out of sight, out of mind. And even here, while I sit down today and say, no, I will hold my ground until I get a fantastic project. One year I've taken a break. While I sit here, there is this fear and challenge that maybe I'm out of sight, out of mind. Maybe I'm irrelevant now. So I have to beat this and I have to beat this fear of being old news and just hold and wait for that miraculous role, that, that role that's going to be worth it all to come my way and I will wait. Amazing. Um, 
it would be criminal of me and I know you didn't want to initially with the action but you have to have to what one step Prabhu one time I don't remember wrap this up let's end it can on you, a high ladies can and you gentlemen. believe I don't remember any of this yet. who's gonna who's someone nobody believes you <laughs> nobody <laughs> believes you do you want to see her dance to one tower I think we'll have to push her to do this Let's go for you it. Have to, uh, you have to teach me the steps I, I, because I, don't I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quietly on this side. <laughs>
One of those things is the nuclear launch protocol, as in what the president needs to do in order to launch nuclear weapons. In the US, the president is the only authority for that. There's no checks and balances. He alone gets to decide it. So a colleague of mine was the person whose job was to train him. And because I knew her and I knew how it works, I spoke to her about the process. And she got my kind of intuitions and thought on how to train a person uh, to make decisions of that level. Then January 6, as most of you probably know, was the famous insurrection where people raid the Capitol. And one of the things that Biden was asking, how do I know that my predecessor, President Trump at the time, doesn't start a nuclear war against who knows where, Venezuela, and just stays in power because he's now the person who does it and there's no way to stop him. And as it turns out, there is no way to stop that because it's a one-man show on this particular decision. So Biden said that in a way, once he takes office, one of the things he wants to do is create a new protocol, something that will create more checks and balances. It happens to be the case that my colleague and my friend, the woman who I spoke to, became quickly the undersecretary under Biden for nuclear weapons. And that's when her team and others reached out to me and said, okay, we want to change the protocol, but now the question is, how do we create a new one? And because we, and they said, knew that the current protocol, as in the one that exists right now, was invented many years ago by scientists, Oppenheimer, Fermi, Einstein, and the likes, they wanted to bring a scientist and have him advise on how to make the new one. That's the project we're working on for the last couple of years. It's very interesting because the other thing that I missed out in that introduction, so we have furniture designer, filmmaker, storyteller, hacker, as a tech geek, professor, security specialist in Israel as well, and of course a professor at the Columbia School of Business. Now just to you know, paint that picture for the audience, what is it like and, and what exactly does your daily job entail as a professor of neuroscience at a leading business school in the US? So it probably won't be surprising to the people here that lately neuroscience isn't just about studying the brain, it's about how to turn our understanding of thinking into other things like businesses, like decisions, like understanding our emotions, many things in this realm. So more and more companies are now looking to neuroscientists to help them make better decisions or even understand their clients in a different way. Many of the companies that are in Silicon Valley are now trying to understand how customers think, what would make them engaged, what would make them care about something, how to get them more addicted to stuff, and their neuroscientists are instrumental in helping them. This is why a business school said we need a neuroscientist in the faculty who can help both kind of interact with those companies, but also help do research on not only how we can use that, but also what are the ways to make sure it's not doing anything bad. So when we're talking about neuroscience, it's a very interesting space that's hotting up because there's a gentleman named Elon Musk. And he's working on Neuralink. Human trials have begun. He's been marketing it across the world. And then I've seen a lot of startups like Synchron who are also working in the same space. If you could tell us how this can actually transform the way we lead our lives and what this means, not just for, well, the medical field, healthcare, but also for our daily lives, Moran. Is this going to be the game changer? Everyone's talking about AI, which we'll get to in a bit. Everyone's talking about machine learning, edge computing. This might be the game changing moment. Yeah, so a lot of people are gambling on that being really a change in how a lot of things that the human race has not been able to do will be solved. The essence of it is that our brain is the same brain for many, many uh, millennia and there are some limitations to what this brain can do. We have a harder and harder time dealing with the world around us. And the question is, can we enhance the brain by essentially creating a digital component that will interface with that? That's the neural implant. And the idea here is that you can take a human brain, you can put a device inside the head, and this device interfaces with the brain from within, but also with the cloud outside, and gives us the power of the internet, of all of the uh, information that's out there as a way to think better and become smarter brain. There are people like Elon Musk and similar kind of entrepreneurs that gamble a lot on that. They gamble on that both both in the sense that it will change the human race, save us, allow us to solve problems like find cures for disease that we, with our biological brain, couldn't solve. At the same time, there's another view to that, that 
it could be the end of human race because A, it will connect us to the world in such a way that we will lose ourselves and expose us to hacking into our thoughts and something like this, but also will create different casts of reality where those who have that could do remarkable thinking and those who don't have that are just the regular humans that we all are right now and are limited by this flawed brain. You mentioned Elon Musk a couple of times and Neuralink is a startup that grabs the headlines and we cover it all the time. But a fun fact that a lot of you all didn't know, the founding team at Neuralink, some of the top scientists that were actually hired at the start by Elon Musk, were actually hired from the research labs of Professor Surf. So that is, that's no mean feat, the future of this particular industry. And like you're saying, all of our futures collectively lie in some of your former students' hands and largely in terms of what you guys are doing, even now at the research lab, there is an Elon Musk connection, even now. It is a project that you get to work on, and that's why I said that in the introduction. Could you tell us a little bit more about the mind, since you have hacked my mind already, but can you tell us more about the mind of Elon Musk? Because this is a gentleman who's already thinking about conquering Mars, he's already talking about what is what's happening on planet Earth, and then this as well. What is it like dealing with Elon Musk on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? So, so there's a lot of gossip here, so I'm going to try to navigate that. Generally, we've been doing neural implants for research for the last, I would say, 20 years. I've been involved for the last 15. And this is research-wise a classical way to study the brain in animals in an unorthodox way, but still viable to study humans. So we've been working with patients whose brains a neurosurgeon opens on day one. We put the neural implant inside their head, study them, and then kind of understand how the brain works for a while. About five years ago, Neuralink was established when Elon Musk basically saw the opportunity of that becoming both a product, but also something that could be used by everyone to help a lot of uh, people who have problems of various nature in the brain. And when he did that, he of course collectively uh, took many of the students to work in our team with offering a lot more zeros in their salaries than they get in academia and making them work on this project, but also took a different approach that sped up things. When I was asked to gamble five years ago, how soon will they have neural implants? I said, it's gonna be decades. In less than five years, they already finished a lot of the clinical trials. They're now doing clinical trials with humans and got FDA approval for various stages. So they're moving in super fast pace, in that sense, beating academics in many ways. At the same time, our connection there is that our job as academics is to keep pushing the envelope on what we can do. So while Elon Musk's team is now looking at ways to solve mostly uh, motor problems, so people who are sitting in a wheelchair would be able to not be in a wheelchair because their brain and the limbs are going to be reconnected using those neural implants. We're now looking at the future, which is uh, how we can actually read your thoughts when you are unable to communicate them and give them to other people, how we can actually pass your dreams. And those are the things that presumably Elon Musk and his team will take as a next step after they finish what we did a few years ago. Interesting. So we've already touched upon your Elon Musk connection. But now what happened on Jan 6th? You told us a little bit about it, but let's pick your brain a little bit more, Professor. Sure. The President of the United States, if he's in a room where nuclear codes have to be used, what is the advice that you've given him and his team? Because this is something that impacts all of us and the top leaders attending the India Today conclave as well. So th th I think this is, in my mind, one of the most important projects. And in a way, it's not just an US president project, it's first of all the other eight countries that have nuclear weapons, including India, that need to think of how your leaders are approaching decisions of that magnitude. And at the same time, it's true for a lot of leaders in this room. So most of us are going to find ourselves at some point in our life making big decisions that shape everything. I, I can name a few just to give you intuition. Having a child is one, getting married is one, maybe buying something very expensive is one. So those decisions are not like others. What you chose to have for lunch or what you're going to choose to have for dinner are small decisions that are insignificant, but all of you are going to make a few of those critical choices that shape everything. And the question is, how do you make them? How do you approach them? How do you think about proposing to your husband or your wife? And in that sense, what we spent the last three years doing is finding all kinds of key things that are important in how to make decisions, and we broke them down to a few advice that the president and his team can implement, but also everyone else. And I'll give you a concrete one to give you intuition. There's something 
that we spend a lot of time doing with the current team, but also with a lot of leaders who come to us and say, I want to get the same training that Mr. Biden is getting. And that is, as a step one, just figuring out your decision profile. So in this room, there are a couple of hundreds of people, let's say. Presumably, there are different ways to make decisions. Some of you make decisions better in the morning, some in the evening, some when you're hungry, some when you're full, some when you're alone, some with other people, some before the deadline, some earlier. There are many profiles of decision, and step one is just figure out what your brain state is in an optimal condition and align the decision with that. So we, maybe if you're a decision maker whose job is to make critical choices and it turns out you do better in the morning, we can align the board meeting with your optimal state. Some of you are going to have the opposite. That's one thing that we try to do with a lot of leaders, kind of find out what's their optimal state and help them align the reality. Other things we do are trainings that are uh, in a way intuitive but aren't done as often like something we call pre-mortem. You probably all heard of post-mortem, which is what you do after things ended up badly and how you analyze how it worked out negatively. Pre-mortem is a game that you play in your mind where you basically sit and you say, let's imagine right now that the worst case scenario has happened, that things failed. And we're now 10 weeks in the future after things failed, and we try to analyze backwards what led to this failure. So we basically play this mental game. We say, imagine that the war started, and we lost everything, and we weren't prepared for that. And now we try to see what could have done, uh, what could have led to this thing, what could have done to prevent it. What are the signposts that were there that we missed? How could we actually uh, identify them earlier? Those are the things that we do with the president. I'll give you maybe one more, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of promise you that there are many, many more that are more complex and kind of are not for like a 30 second answer, but we asked the question, uh, who gets to speak in what order when it comes to making a decision? Turns out that if a leader of a company or a leader of a country says, I think we should go left, what do you guys think? People tend to echo what they said. It's very hard to uh, oppo oppose your boss. So we kind of talk about who gets to speak in what order, how do you phrase the question so you get, as a leader, the best advice? You actually get people's intuition. Sometimes we ask them to vote anonymously so the surfacing of the reality comes first and then we can discuss that. All of those things, they're, they're kind of trivial notes on how to make decisions, but when it comes to actually making big decisions, you realize that they're instrumental. And all of you can ask yourself right now, how would I approach a big decision tomorrow? And what are the conditions that I would want to set up? And you realize that it's not trivial. Who gets to vote? How many times do you vote? What happens if there's a 60-40 vote versus 90-10? What happens if someone that you trust says the opposite of you? What happens if you feel that they don't have all the information? All of those things are things that leaders have to deal with a lot, and we have the president and his team basically tackle one after the other of those things, so when they come to make the critical choices, they have spent time processing all of those nuances of a choice and are doing the best they can. I'd love to be in your email inbox because just like the president reached out and Elon poached a lot of those young, talented scientists, another really interesting thing that happened a few months ago, and you can confirm, corroborate if it's true, is that the Pope himself <laughs> from the Vatican reaches out to you to actually figure out how to formulate a policy on existential threats. Sounds now, like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> a very by a pope and a... Your short wasn't on April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it, it's a, it's, there's, I think once you start working on nuclear decision making with leaders of the world, I think you become, and, and you speak about it publicly because you're an academic, you become also a visible character and in that sense a lot of people want to kind of get the same advice to get, so, so it's not surprising. In the particular case with the Pope, this is a story that I think is less known, so it might be uh, interesting as an anecdote also. Uh, the Pope of 2024 is aware of the fact that we're dealing with a world that is full of existential threats. There are many things that could harm humanity, climate change, AI, neural implants and what will do to their brain, and uh, of course nuclear war. The Pope of 1963, uh, gave a famous speech uh, titled Pacem in Terris, which is Peace on Earth, uh, where he spoke about nuclear weapons as a huge threat to humanity and the Vatican's opinion on how the world should deal with that. This speech by the Pope ended up becoming a landmark speech. It was uh, the day after on the cover of New York Times as the article on the headline. And a lot of people used that as a way to have a compass and a guideline to how the world should approach nuclear weapons. But this was over 60 years ago. This is 60 years ago. And it was centered on one threat that that Pope thought would be the end of all things, which is nuclear weapons. The Pope of 2024 realized that 
there are more threats right now, and it's maybe a time to update this, this speech. And he brought me and other uh, colleagues of mine from different disciplines, neuroscience, climate science, nuclear decision making, and so on, and basically gave us the instruction to help him kind of frame somehow the Vatican's approach to those threats and what would his speech be 60 years later, which he gave recently in September, I believe. And the point is that the Vatican commands a lot of uh, moral compasses of a lot of people, whether you're Christian or not. The Pope's send, sending a message on there's a problem with neural implants maybe changing how we think, and I should address them before, help kind of navigate a lot of leaders and a lot of people's views, which is what the speech was about. So that was the, the behind the scenes of what the Pope wanted to talk about. Fair enough. We're glad that we're getting that behind the scenes access here at the India Today Conclave. The biggest stage of them all. Professor, you said AI, and that really piqued my interest, because if you're talking about AI as an existential threat, I want to look at it as a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. As a technology enthusiast, I think maybe it could be a force for good, right? Great. So it's kind of, I'm just putting two things together. You talk about critical decision making, what my brain is going to do in the next few minutes and how that could benefit me or, or it could be for better or worse, obviously. But if we talk about AI, let's, how many of you in the audience have used chat GPT? A quick show of hands. Great. That's more than 90%. How many of you guys are usually satisfied with your responses on ChatGPT? Yes. Okay, that's less than half the audience. Now, that's a great yardstick for us to go by. The biggest concern with AI is ethical considerations. If it's telling you things, it's becoming sentient, conscientious things, where can it go completely wrong or awry? If you had to advise the, the makers at OpenAI, and you can tell us a little bit about uh, OpenAI and Neuralink as well, but if you had to advise Elon and, and Sam Altman and all of the powers that be in terms of getting the right safeguards in place and the governments that you meet around the world, with your critical uh, decision-making skills, where can we really enforce those guardrails, Professor? So, so, here, so here are kind of notes on that. Um, there's tension between capitalism and desire to see technology maturing and guardrails. It's not the first time it happened. Nuclear weapons another example. We harnessed the power of the sun to build weapons during World War II, thinking they're going to be used for one thing, and then they ended up being used for war, but also to power cities as nuclear energy is also useful for electricity. Um, trains uh, were invented as a methodology to move freight from Los Angeles to New York in 48 hours compared to the many, many days it would take when you had a camel, but they also moved Jews to camps in Auschwitz. The trains, the nuclear energy, the AI, they don't tell you whether they're used for good or bad. It's how humans use them. So what we spend time now is saying, on the one hand, let's develop technologies that are remarkable, but let's also train people on how to use those technologies for good. Neural implants, like the other technologies, they can be used to give us the power of a 250 IQ points human who maybe will solve cancer researchers' flaws over the last 100 years in a moment. We'll just see the answer. Maybe we're going to be able to recover all kinds of uh, questions in physics and math that we've been struggling with with this ideal brain. But at the same time, those 250 IQ people with neural implants might, first of all, uh, not want to interact with us mortals with only 100 IQ points, it's different species. Maybe they will also find us the way we find, I don't know, uh, ants on the floor is like useless and irrelevant and create their own world where we are just kind of slaves that they you know, give bananas to. In that sense, we don't know how it works out. And the reason it's important to think about it right now is because this decision is in everyone's hand. The scientists are going to push the envelope on creating neural implants or building nuclear energy or creating trains or many, many other things, because that's our job and that's what it is. But I think that the point of this talk and the reason I think I'm here and the reason it's important that you take this message and think about it afterwards is because at the end of the day, you have an election in a few months, the US has one. I would like to see people asking their leaders, what's their view on AI? What's your view on neural implants? What's your view on nuclear weapons? Because when this is out, it's too late. That's when it, the race has begun and the race to the bottom sometimes has begun. Right now, we still haven't kind of figured it out, so we can stop that. And it's true for AI, for neural implants, for nuclear energy, for many other things. 
AI I'm a fan of as a user, as a creator, as a researcher, but also as a citizen, alarmed by and try to think of ways that I can stop my leaders from using it for bad. But do you think these conversations are happening in the, the corridors of power or these conversations about the future when you go to Davos and, and, <laughs> and platforms like that, shouldn't they be happening now because the genie is out of the bottle, Professor? Yes. So I, I think that. Uh, yeah, is another anecdote behind the scene. When this project of decision making started in 2021, one of the first things that we went to the people who asked us for advice was a, with the idea of maybe we can use AI in the decision making behind the president. And back in 2021, we were dismissed right away. People said, like, it's never going to happen. Like, no one's going to put a machine in the situation room. Forget about it. Three years after, it's now on the menu, which means the world has warmed up for having AI in critical decisions as an advisor, as a tool, not as the decider itself, but it's already a step towards. Um, with neural implants, when I did the research that kind of maybe paved the road to what you see in a lot of companies right now, it was clear that it's used with patients, and it's used with patients for situations that are kind of critical. They can't do it without this device or put it in their brain. Now, when Elon Musk speaks about neural implants, he uses the idea of a LASIK surgery. He keeps using the word LASIK surgery, as in putting the neural implant in your brain is nothing. It's like going to LASIK surgery is the one that uh, ophthalmologists use to basically uh, fix your eyes. It's done in a five minutes kind of procedure, not even in hospital in the US. He keeps using this term to refer to the brain surgery that's required to put the implants as a way to normalize that neural implant is not a big thing. And I think that that is the tension we live in. It's true that they're amazing. It's true that they're risky. It's true that uh, and kind of, we live in a world where it's already, as you said, out of the box. It's going to be in our life, but it's not clear how it will be used and by whom and, and in what levels. And this is up to all of us to decide. I have a view. It doesn't really matter what my view is. You have to form your own, but argue for it because I think the world would have to respond to it faster than we did with other things that took years. This one is going to take days or months from the day it's out to the day it's going to have a view. But Professor, that's good marketing by Elon Musk, but it's a slippery slope to go down. I mean, to dismiss it or to make it sound trivial, trivial, right? Yeah. I mean, there are perils to it as well. Mm -hmm. And there could be side effects. Yeah. There, there, there could be negative things, first of all, to put that. So, so to be clear, neural implant means someone drills a hole in your head and puts a chip inside your brain, and it sits there, and it interacts on the one hand with neurons inside your head, and on the other side with a cloud. So your brain is exposed to a cloud. Hackers can now hack not just into your computer, but into your thought, and you would want things that you didn't really want, because someone made you want that. You can imagine a world where companies start bidding on your thoughts. Like you say, oh, I really want to go and buy this toothpaste from Crest, and you wouldn't be sure that it was, it was a Procter & Gamble that bid on your thought choosing this thing rather than Colgate getting you to choose the other one. Those, those ideas are really kind of un imaginable right now, but the jump from this is like a science fiction idea to its reality is now getting very, very short because people are already working on it. There's a saying that's kind of written in my lab's door that says the difference between science fiction and science is timing. And in that sense, I feel that these ideas are, are no longer kind of a Star Trek and Star Wars movies ideas. They're already being developed in the labs. And this means that time to come up an opinion on that is before they are out. He sort of rubbed off on me as well as we end this conversation. I've saved the best for last. Well, I've hacked into the mind of our esteemed guests. It's a very special day for the professor. It turns out it's his birthday today, and he's here with us at the India Today Conclave. So a mighty round of applause. Happy birthday, professor. Keep doing the great work that you do and power on. I think your dad's in the audience as well. What a proud moment. Um, yes. And once again, Thank you so much for sharing all those pearls of wisdom and we're wiser at the end of it. A huge round of applause. Pleasure. For Thank Professor you very Sir. much. Ladies and gentlemen, raise a warm applause as I call upon Asha Jadeja, venture capitalist, Silicon Valley founder, Motwani Jadeja Foundation. Uh, Ayush, just, would you call the guests up? One second. Sir, just to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to our esteemed guests. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm applause, please. Thank you. Let's quickly move on to our next session. A squash buckling journey to the top. Uh, I want to call upon stage my colleague Nikhil Nas, consulting editor, Sports, to take it from here.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, next to me is Anahat Singh. And uh, before I even get down to asking her a question, I just had a thought while we were walking up. Uh, it's 6 p.m. on a weekday. Uh, are you even allowed to be here? Uh, my mom's sitting right here, so I can be here for as long as I want to be. Ah, okay. It's one of those exceptions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, she is the national squash champion at the moment, just turned 16. <laughs> and might I add, the youngest national champion in the history of our country, just turned 16 yesterday. Uh, and, and before I ask you the next question, what I want all of you to do is think about what you were doing when you were 14 years of age, you know. Uh, I mean, I know for a fact that I couldn't tie my shoelaces when I was 14. My favorite pastime was probably uh, looking at a fan and then trying to speak to get a robotic voice out of that. Those are the things that I did when I was 14. This girl was playing the Asian Games. She represented India at the age of 14, playing against the best players in the world at the Commonwealth Games when she was just 14. And just this, the year that's just gone by saw her participate for India at the Asian Games and might I add, she won a couple of medals as well. So congratulations for that, Anahat. Thank you. Uh, next up, I know you went to school. How was school today? She's, she went to school in the morning, guys. Uh, most of us must have gone to work, did various other things, household chores. She did her school and has come for the conclave now. How was your day of school? Uh, just a normal day. Um, I've not been going to school as much right now because um, I am going, actually, I'm going extra than how much I used to go, and my friends are really shocked to see me around. They just come up and stare at my face, and like, I can't believe you're here, because they don't see me for months in a row, and um, yeah, it's great going to school constantly for so many days, and yeah, it's great to be around them. I, I'm sure the school really helps you out in terms of arranging the classes so that you can participate in the tournament uh, as well. I, I just want to know what's a typical day in your life? Um, if I'm not going to school, then it's just mainly training throughout the day and as of right now studying because I have boards coming up in a month. But if I do go to school, then um, training in the morning and uh, I go to school for six hours and then tra again training when I'm back and um, s studying and finishing my homework. How's the uh, preparation for the board exams? I don't think I want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to talk about it. Well, that's okay. You have an alternate career as well already. Flourishing career uh, at that. I want to know, you know, I, I'm a father to a 10-year-old and she knows every Taylor Swift song that there is, every Ariana Grande song that there is. I want to know, are you a regular 14, 16-year-old who knows every Taylor Swift song? Are, are, are you always standing in front of the mirror mouthing those lyrics? I definitely don't do that, but all my friends are obsessed with Taylor Swift, so I do hear her everywhere if I'm with them, but I'm more into Coldplay. Coldplay? Wow. Have you, have you, have you seen them perform live? No. Uh, I really want to, but my mom is not allowing me. <laughs> mom, mom's right there. You know, if she wins the medal at the Olympic Games, Get her a live Coldplay concert. I've attended one, I must tell you, incredible. Chris Martin, if you're listening, you have a big fan in Anahat, you know, maybe someday uh, she will be there uh, attending that live concert. Uh, in terms of your childhood, you know, you, you're a sports player uh, and when you're playing, you may not have that kind of luxury as to do what girls your age do, as I mentioned, you know, you, you like music, I'm sure you like going out. Uh, do you ever get that I'm going to use a term that's used by your generation, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Do you get that? Always, almost every day. Like, if I'm scrolling through Instagram and seeing my friends' stories, I'm always seeing um, that they're going out for lunch or dinner, or they're always together. But I do miss out on a lot of that, and I do get very jealous. But um, it's also that I get to travel so much because of tournaments, and then they come up to me and are like, you're so lucky that you get to travel the world. So. Um, they're getting just as much FOMO from me as well. <laughs> yeah, I think even now. But uh, is there any point in your life you feel, no, I, I should have been, you know, the regular life is better. I took sport, but regrets at all? 
I wouldn't say that I regret it. Like you said, I do have a lot of FOMO, but I love traveling and I love playing. And um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy doing it. So it's not that I regret playing. Okay, tell us how it all started. How, how did you take up squash, uh, your love for the sport? Uh, I used to play badminton uh, when I was six and I played um, till I was eight or nine and then for a few years I was juggling between squash and badminton and um, my elder sister Mira, she used to play squash and just going with her for a few tournaments and traveling and um, going with my parents and just watching her play for training sessions, I really enjoyed the sport. I was always into playing different sports even in school. and. Yeah, I just really enjoyed how squash was and I tried going for a few tournaments and trying out the sport and I really loved it. So for a few years I was juggling between both of them, but if I wanted to play professionally, I understood that I had to pick one of them and I went with squash. Okay, as the cliche goes, maybe badminton's loss is squash's gain because we've got a, a champion like you. You just mentioned that you play other sport as well. Do you still play other sport? Uh, I don't get to as much anymore because just in case I get injured or I don't even get that much time to do it anymore. Uh, but do you, like, let's say there's a sports day at school, do you participate? I do participate. Like last month, um, I was running an 800 meter and I pulled my, a muscle in my stomach and I wasn't able to play properly for four days. So I don't think I'm going to be doing sports day again after that. Oh, okay, so why did you then, I'm sure your trainer, everyone else must be upset that why did you run 800 meters, right? Concentrate on your squash because that's what they want you to do. Was there a, tr a lot of trouble because of that? Um, not really because I've not gotten the chance to do sports here or interact in many of the school activities because I'm never in town. But this is the first time I've been in Delhi after really, really long. And um, yeah, I was happy and I won, so I'm not going to regret that. The 800 meters is yeah. right. Wow, true athletes, that anahat is. Okay, tell us about your older sibling. I, I, I often wonder, why is it because it's your older sibling, your sister, because of which you started playing uh, squash, because she used to play squash. What is it about the younger siblings being the better sportsman? I mean, you can take, I can think of a hundred examples. It's mostly the younger siblings that become better at sports than the older one. Is there, is there some science behind that? I don't really think so. It's just that in my case, my parents, like we both played squash, so my parents just understood bit, a bit more about the sport and what we had to do just for me to get into a higher level and the right um, the way I had to train, how many hours I had to put in. I think that experience was just a lot more with me than with my sister because like squash is not a very popular sport, so when like, she played a lot earlier than I did and that time no one really knew about it and I think now over the years when I started playing it, it became a bit more popular and people started to understand a bit more about it so I think that's a huge thing in, like for me personally though. Okay, do the siblings still play squash, you and your sister? Is it competitive? Uh, yeah, um, she still does and she's in Harvard in the US and she's a part of the squash team. But, um, I don't think there's like a rivalry like that because she's five years older than me and her game is a lot more different than how mine is. Like she's more about hitting the ball hard and I'm more about just running around and hitting it like really gently and like um, yeah, I don't think there's a rivalry like that, but we're siblings on and off court, we always do fight, but she's always been really supportive in any case, like especially during COVID as well, that um, we didn't really have anyone to train with, we would practice together and train together, and that's one of the main reasons why my gaming like, went up so much. Okay, uh, you know, I've been listening to you for the last 10 odd minutes and the first thing that really strikes me about your personality is that you're a shy, soft-spoken girl and sports is anything but that, right? You need to be aggressive, you need to be a go-getter when you're on the, on the pitch. I mean, is there that side to your personality? Uh, outside court, yeah, a little bit, but when I'm inside court, I do anything I can to it. Anything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there is an aggressive side to her. In fact, if you do check out some of her videos, you'll realize then a lot of times she's playing against girls, uh, you know, double her age, much bigger in size, looking very athletic, but when she really hits a squash ball, it stays hit. So uh, that is something that you need to check out when you see her videos as well. Uh, the, the other thing that, you know, squash is all about, one is stamina, as you said, the movement, the other is the power, it, it's a power game, you really need to have those hard-hitting forehands. Uh, looking at you, a petite, 
you know, young girl, where does all that power come from? Uh, I don't think the strength in squash especially, it, don't, it doesn't really matter on your body type. It's more about the way you hit the ball. And um, a lot of my coach has taught me a way on how I can hit the ball just as hard as anyone else could because um, I'm still 16 and I can't really do that much of weight training and my muscles, I don't really have any muscles right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a certain technique to hit it and I'm working more on that right now. Okay. Uh, tell us, I mean, one is of course the power, the, the other is the agility uh, on that. Uh, I, I speak to a lot of other players that play squash and the one complaint that they have about you is that Anahat never warms up. You're blessed with good genes, not warming up and yet, you know, playing that well as you do? Uh, I never used to warm up, never, not even once. Even if it's the most important match of my life, I never would. But um, I have started warming up now, I'm forced into it. Even, no matter how much I complain, my coach just makes sure I'm doing it, no matter what, because, I mean, in the long term, it's really, really important. Like I said, I have no muscles right now, so I'm not going to get injured, but in the long term, once it does start to develop, I might. It won't be good. Okay, we're running out of time, but I have uh, one final question. And for all you 30, 40 year olds, don't take her advice. Warm up every time you play any sport. She's 16, she can afford to do that. Uh, squash is at the Olympic Games. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, it's going to be not now, but the, but the games that happen in 2028. Squash is going to be there and, and Anahat will be 20 by then. Your first reaction when you got to know Squash is going to be at the Olympic Games and are you primed to uh, be playing there, Los Angeles? I think my reaction would have been like any other athlete. Um, squash hadn't been in the Olympics. Like, this is the first time it's been in the Olympics. And um, we were all together. It was announced the day after Asian Games. And it was the highest medal tally India has ever got for squash. And I think the timing it was announced was just perfect. Like, everyone was waiting for it to happen. We knew a bit about it. But I mean, it's still just as exciting to hear about it. And, the fact that I'm going to be at my peak physically and mentally, I think that's a really big advantage and I'm really grateful that it was perfectly timed and hopefully get a medal as well. All right. Uh, wish you all the very best for that. That's all the time that we have uh, with Anahat Singh. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And, and Anahat is going to be there. Get your selfies if you want because once she gets that medal at the Olympics, she's going to be very tough to catch. Thank you so much, Anahat. Ladies and gentlemen, raise a warm applause for the young champion as I call upon Vartika Shukla, chairperson and managing director, Engineers India Limited, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to young Anahat. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Onwards and forward. Good luck, Anahat. If you're wondering why you're getting served uh, popcorn on your table, you'd know in just exactly two minutes from now why. We have two big Bollywood stars who are going to be up on stage next. And that's why the pop popcorn. Sit back, enjoy. We'll soon have them both on stage.
to the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. This time around, our theme, Brand Bharat, an assertive nation in an uncertain world. Those of you at the back request you all to settle down. There's a request from security, do not crowd the exits, please. Our guests at the back on my right hand side, there's a request from the security, do not crowd the exits. Another couple of minutes, we'll start. We understand the anticipation and the excitement coming in from our right, but just hold on a couple of minutes and uh, we'll be into our keynote session.
ready? All right, ladies and gentlemen, the wait is over. Our keynote session on day one, why the 2024 elections will be a watershed in the history of India. To take it from her, to, I'd like to invite on stage Rahul Kaval, News Director, TVTN, Managing Editor, Special Online Projects, Executive Director, Business Today, to introduce to you our esteemed guest. इंडिया टुडे कॉन्क्लेव के इस गाला कीनोट सेशन में आप सभी का तहे दिल से स्वागत है भारतीय जनता पार्टी का दावा है अब की बार 370 पार और एन के लिए 400 पार अब इसमें दो थ्योरी हैं थ्योरी नंबर एक कि वाकई में 10 साल काम करने के बाद और ऑपोजिशन की स्थिति को देखते हुए बीजेपी के जो सीनियर लीडर्स हैं उनको लग रहा है कि 370 पार हो सकते हैं दूसरी थ्योरी ये है कि बीजेपी को अंदर ही खेमे में ये पता है कि 10 साल की एंटी इनकम्बेंसी है वो चाहते हैं कि ऑपोजिशन को इतना डरा दो इतना दबा दो कि उनमें हिम्मत ही ना बचे लड़ने की इसलिए बोलो 370 पार कि कम से कम तीन तो पार हो ही जाए इन दोनों थ्योरियों में से क्या सही है अगला चुनाव हमारे सर पर है और इस चुनाव की रणनीति बनाने में अहम योगदान करने वाले देश के गृह मंत्री श्री अमित शाह इस वक्त इंडिया टुडे कॉन्क्लेव में हमारे साथ हैं जोरदार तालियों से उनका स्वागत कीजिए अमित शाह साहब स्वागत है आपका थ्योरी एक की थ्योरी टू थ्योरी वन की वाकई में 370 सौ पार का है कोई इतना लंबा कहते हो वो थ्योरी कांग्रेस को सिखा दो वो साढ़े चार बोले चलो <laughs> ना, ना तुम मानोगे ना जनता मानेगी ना कांग्रेस ही मानेंगे बोलने से कुछ नहीं होता है राहुल जी बैकग्राउंड होता है हमारे पास 10 साल का ट्रैक रिकॉर्ड है और अगले 25 साल का एजेंडा है महान भारत की रचना का एजेंडा है इसलिए जनता हमारा विश्वास कर रही है बोलने से सीटें नहीं आती पिछली बार जो आपकी सीटें आई थी उससे अगर आगे बढ़ना है क्योंकि उत्तर में और पश्चिम में आपका एक क्लीन स्वीप था ईस्ट में भी आपने अच्छा किया था दक्षिण अभी भी काफ़ी मुश्किल है आपके हिसाब से एक्स्ट्रा सीट्स की उम्मीद आप किस किस स्टेट में कर रहे हैं और कैसे ऐसा है राहुल जी ये सवाल आपने मुझे कहा था लास्ट टाइम भी पूछा था आप तो भूल जाते हो मैं नहीं भूलता कभी <laughs> आपने कहा था दो आ गए पूर्ण बहुमत आ गए कहाँ से बढ़ाओगे उस वक्त हमने तीन सौ का लक्ष्य रखा था तीन आई थी मैंने उस वक्त जवाब दिया था आप काउंटिंग के दिन देख लेना तीन आएगी आज भी मैं कहता हूं काउंटिंग के दिन देख लेना हम 300 पार कर जाएंगे एन 400 पार कर अब हाल में हमने ये देखा है कि बीजेपी अलग अलग अलायंसेस कर रही है ऐसे दोस्त जो बिछड़ गए थे वो वापस आ रहे हैं उस पर मैं थोड़ा वक्त बिताना चाहता हूं शुरुआत करते हैं हम हाल ही में आपने टीडीपी और जनसेना से आंध्र प्रदेश में चुनाव किया वो आपके लिए एक टेरिटरी है जहाँ पे आप नई सीटें पा सकते हैं लेकिन चंद्रबाबू नायडू ने तो प्रधानमंत्री को हार्डकोर टेररिस्ट कहा था अब उसके बाद आपने अलायंस कर लिया इसको थोड़ा एक्सप्लेन कीजिए देखिए चंद्रबाबू जी को अलायंस से हमने नहीं निकाला था उन्होंने तय किया था कि हम एन के साथ नहीं रहेंगे वो उनका फैसला था हार्डको टेररिस्ट कहा नहीं कहा मुझे मालूम नहीं है अगर कहा होगा फिर जनता के पास गए चुनाव हारे अब समझ आ गई अब हमारे साथ आए हैं स्वागत है वही सबका पर जगन रेड्डी ने तो राज्यसभा में इतनी सारी बिल्स पे इतने सारे अलग अलग मुद्दों पे आपका समर्थन दिया टाया आप आपने चंद्रबाबू नायडू से कर लिया देखिए राज्यसभा में जो वोटिंग होता है आप इसको बहुत सिंप्लीफाई कर देते हो कि पॉलिटिकल टाइप के आधार पर वोटिंग होता है इश्यू बेस्ड वोटिंग होता है तीन मुद्दों पर उन्होंने हमारा विरोध भी किया था ऐसा नहीं है बारीकी में जाए बगैर 
एक परसेप्शन बना लेना और किसी इश्यू पर समर्थन को आप राजनीतिक टाइप मत मानिए कोई भी पार्टी का अधिकार है कि इश्यू को समझकर इश्यू नेशनल इंटरेस्ट में है या नहीं है इसका सोच विचार कर कर इश्यू पर समर्थन दे या इसके खिलाफ के उनको अपनी आइडियोलॉजी देखनी पड़ती है इश्यू का बेस देखना पड़ता है और इश्यू के उद्देश्य देखने पड़ते हैं ये देख निर्णय होते हैं मैं नहीं मानता किसी के समर्थन करने से टाइप हो जाता है वरना तो हम उनके साथ ही जाते जगन के साथ नहीं ऐसा होता तो आपकी तरह होता तो आप कह रहे हो ऐसा होता साधारण तौर पे राजनीति में यह माना जाता है कि नंबर वन और नंबर टू पार्टी का टाइप नहीं हो सकता क्योंकि इनकी आपस की लड़ाई है वन और टू में कैसे टाइप हो सकता है लेकिन चर्चा खूब चल रही है कि उड़ीसा में भारतीय जनता पार्टी और बीजेडी का अलायंस ऑलमोस्ट हो चुका है और किसी भी दिन घोषित हो जाएगा मैं नहीं कह रहा कि आप कन्फर्म कीजिए कि होगा क्योंकि वो तो आप करेंगे नहीं लेकिन अगर ऐसा हुआ तो फिलोसॉफिकली इसको आप कैसे एक्सप्लेन करते हैं नंबर वन और उसके प्रिंसिपल चैलेंजर के बीच में अलायंस की बातचीत भी कैसे हो सकती है देखिए मैं इस पर इस इसलिए ज़्यादा प्रकाश नहीं डाल सकता क्योंकि हमारे राष्ट्रीय अध्यक्ष जी ने हमारे प्रधानमंत्री जी ने अभी तय नहीं किया है कि उड़ीसा में हम कैसे आगे बढ़ेंगे परंतु मैं इतना कह सकता हूँ जैसे भी आगे बढ़ेंगे भारतीय जनता पार्टी बहुत अच्छी बढ़ोतरी लोकसभा और विधानसभा में करेगी और हमारी स्थिति में बहुत बड़ा सुधार होगा पर आपने दिया नहीं जवाब वन और टू का टाइप फिलोसॉफिकली पॉसिबल है क्या नहीं देखिए हम हार्ड को राजनीति में है फिलोसॉफी नहीं होती है इसमें <laughs> इसमें हार जीत का गणित होता है और पार्टी की आइडियोलॉजी के साथ मन मेल की बात होती है तो क्या विनेबिलिटी ही एक फैक्टर है आप जितने फैक्टर्स रखते हैं मैंने दो कहा उसमें से आप सिर्फ विनेबिलिटी चूज आपके लिए विनेबिलिटी की पार्टी की आइडियोलॉजी और हार जीत का गणित दोनों को ध्यान में रख रखते हुए दोनों के बीच में बैलेंस बनाते हुए साथी को चुना जाता है सर मैं आपसे पूछना चाहता हूँ तेलंगाना के बारे में भी क्योंकि आपने जे से टाइप किया कर्नाटक में बीजेपी और जे का तो वैसे तो बी और बीजेपी का भी टाइप उसी तरीके से संभव तो हो सकता था आपने क्यों नहीं किया रा, तुम राहुल जी आप पॉलिटिकल एडवाइजर जो अभी क्या कहते हैं उसको मैनेजमेंट कराते हैं सब नहीं नहीं ऐसा क्यों नहीं बन जाते मैं तो सवाल पूछ रहा हूँ <laughs> तो मुझे लगता है दुकान चल पड़ेगी आपकी <laughs> सर मेरा सिर्फ और सिर्फ इंटरेस्ट जर्नलिज्म में ही है ये पॉलिटिकल और अच्छा और आपसे पंगा लेना मतलब दूसरी साइड पे बैठ के वो तो बड़ा ही खतरनाक मैं मैं मैं, मैं प्रोफेशनल पॉलिटिकल मैनेजमेंट करने वाला आदमी नहीं हूँ मेरा राजनीतिक जन्म भी भारतीय जनता पार्टी में हुआ है और मेरा शरीर का मृत्यु भी भारतीय जनता पार्टी में होगा इसमें कोई बदल नहीं सर हम कुछ और स्टेट्स की बात करते हैं जैसे अभी हरियाणा में आपने जे जे पी का साथ छोड़ दिया वहाँ पे क्या हुआ क्योंकि ये एक्सप्लेन नहीं हुआ ठीक से क्योंकि प्रधानमंत्री थे खट्टर साहब के साथ सभा में उन्होंने खट्टर साहब की इतनी तारीफ की लोगों को लगा कि भाई इनका तो पक्का हो गया इतना ज़्यादा वो अगले दिन जाके आपने उनको चेंज कर दिया बेचारे खट्टर साहब भी सोच रहे थे मैं मानता हूँ कि दो इश्यू अलग है खट्टर साहब का हरियाणा में उपयोग करना या केंद्र में उपयोग करना और खट्टर साहब कैसे व्यक्ति है मोदी जी ने कहा खट्टर साहब बहुत पुराने कार्यकर्ता है हमारे अच्छे नेता है तो उनका उपयोग तो कहीं पर भी हो सकता है यहाँ पर भी हो सकता है हरियाणा में भी हो सकता है अब आप, आप इसका छोटा सा निकाल देते हो कि ये तय होगा कि इनके नेतृत्व में लड़ेंगे या वो ही मुख्यमंत्री रहेंगे तो आपका दोष है मैं मानता हूँ हमारा दोष है सर देखिए पत्रकारों को किनारे कीजिए आपकी पार्टी के भी कुछ लोग यहाँ सभा में सब सुनते हैं कि अमित शाह ने क्या बोला मेरी तरफ से ठीक से देखा कैसे किया वो सब उसी के लिए इंडिकेट करते हैं आपकी एक आंख से आंख मिल जाए उसी के लिए कई लोग यहाँ पे आए उसमें इतना कुछ बोल दिया और अगले दिन जाके उन्हीं मतलब कैसे बोलूं कि चेंज ही कर दिया उसी को तो नरेंद्र मोदी कहते हैं <laughs> तो आप जब इतना एडजस्ट कर रहे थे सब जगह तो दुष्यंत चौटाला को भी एडजस्ट कर लेते एडजस्ट क्यों नहीं किया उनको क्या? जो जेजेपी पार्टी थी उससे क्यों नहीं एडजस्टमेंट कर पा देखिए हमारा जेजेपी पार्टी से कोई खराब रिश्ता नहीं है हम झगड़ा कर कर अलग नहीं हुए उनकी कुछ डिमांड थी नंबर ऑफ सीट्स के लिए जो हम पूरी नहीं कर सकते थे हमारी पार्टी की स्ट्रेंथ और व्याप देखते हुए
तो अलग हो गए इसमें क्या आपत्ति है भाई वो ऐसा सोते थे कि हमें ज्यादा सीटें मिलनी चाहिए हमारा मानना था हम इतनी दे नहीं सकते तो एक पॉइंट पर डिफरेंस ऑफ ओपिनियन हुआ तो अच्छे मूड में दोनों अलग हुए कोई गाली गलौत नहीं हुई कोई झगड़ा नहीं हुआ अलग हो गए इसमें क्या है और चुनाव से पहले हुए हैं चुनाव के बाद नहीं हुए हैं सर हरियाणा से निकल के बिहार चलते हैं वहाँ तो आपने इतने सारे पार्टीज को भर दिया है एन में कि अब आपके लिए मुश्किल हो पा रहा है बैलेंस करना क्योंकि बीजेपी है जे है चिराग पासवान है वो पशुपति पारस परेशान है कि भाई मेरा क्या वो तो कह रहे हैं मैं हाजीपुर में भी लड़ूंगा मेरे सारे एम लड़ेंगे अब समझ ही में नहीं आ रहा कि वो इस साइड पर हैं या उस साइड पर अब तो आज तो अलग ही हो गए तो बहुत ज़्यादा वहाँ पर पंगा हो रहा है ऐसा है कि सरफेस पर ऐसा दिखता है आप थोड़ा धैर्य रखो एक सप्ताह सब ठीक हो जाएगा और सब उचित जगह पे ही बैठे हुए मिलेंगे आप कह रहे हैं कि पशुपति पारस वापस उनको सुनो मतलब जो कह रहे हैं उसको इग्नोर कर दो मैंने कहा ना एक सप्ताह राह देखो राजनीति में सभी का अपनी बात रखने का अधिकार होता है सभी का जनता के सामने अपनी स्ट्रेंथ रखने का स्ट्रेंथ के आधार पर डिमांड रखने का अधिकार होता है जब मिल बैठते हैं और एक दूसरे के विचारों को सुनते हैं और डिस्कस करते हैं तो कोई ना कोई कॉम्प्रोमाइज़ करता है और एक एमिकेबल सॉल्यूशन निकल कर आता है मुझे पूरा भरोसा है बिहार में एनडीए में कोई भी खराब नहीं होगा और बिहार की इस बार सभी की सभी सीटें भारतीय जनता पार्टी के नेतृत्व में एनडीए डी सर हम महाराष्ट्र आते हैं वहाँ पे आपने बहुत पार्टियों को तोड़ा अपने पास लेके आए और अपना अलायंस मजबूत किया फिर भी जो वहाँ के लोकल एनलिस्ट हैं उनको लग रहा है कि सिंपति शायद शरद पवार जी के साथ और उद्धव ठाकरे आप कितने कॉन्फिडेंट हैं कि महाराष्ट्र में जो इस वक्त का आपका अलायंस है वो अच्छा करेगा परफॉर्म पहले मैं आपके स्टेटमेंट से डिफर करता हूँ कि हमने बहुत सारी पार्टियों को तोड़ा हमने कोई पार्टी को नहीं तोड़ा है बहुत सारी पार्टी पुत्र पुत्री मोह में टूट गई है उद्धव जी चाहते थे आदित्य ठाकरे सीएम बने तो उनके यहाँ से एक बहुत बड़ा कुंबा निकल गया उनके कुंबे में से बहुत सारे लोग निकले क्योंकि आदित्य ठाकरे को वो नेता स्वीकार करने के लिए तैयार नहीं थे बाला साहब के समय से शिवसेना में काम करने वाले लोगों ने उद्धव जी को ठीक है स्वीकार कर लिया अब आदित्य को स्वीकार करें तो वो उनको मान्य नहीं था पवार साहब भी अपनी बेटी को नेता बनाना चाहते थे बहुत सारे लोग इससे सहमत नहीं थे वो निकले आप हमने तोड़ा ऐसा मत करो पुत्र पुत्री मोह ने एन और शिवसेना को तोड़ा है ये वास्तविकता है और जहाँ तक एन का सवाल है तीनों पार्टी के बीच में ज़्यादातर सीटों का बंटवारा नाम के साथ हो चुका है कोई डिस्प्यूट नहीं होने वाला है और डिस्प्यूट होगा ये मानकर अगर इंडी अलायंस अपना सीट घोषित नहीं करता है तो जल्दी को कर दे यहाँ से कुछ मिलने वाला नहीं है सर जहाँ जहाँ पे इंडी अलायंस इंडिया अलायंस बना जैसे दिल्ली में उन्होंने बोला कि आप और कांग्रेस लड़ेंगे आपको लगता है वहाँ पिछले चुनाव के मुकाबले इस बार ज़्यादा अच्छी टक्कर होगी दो पार्टियाँ मिल आपसे लड़ेंगी वो ज़्यादा एक्साइट आपके लिए ज़्यादा शिरदत बन जाता है नहीं कौन से राज्य में ऐसा दिखता है आपको दिल्ली दिल्ली यूपी दिल्ली में हर सीट पर हमारा 50 प्रतिशत से ज्यादा वोट है अब बचे हुए उनचास में कितना भी मिल जाओ क्या फर्क पड़ता है बताओ यूपी दिल्ली की सातों सात सीटों पर हमारा 50 प्रतिशत से ज्यादा जन समर्थन है इस बार बढ़ने वाला है अब एक बार आप 50 क्रॉस कर लेते हो बाकी के उनचास में कितने है कितने नहीं है इसकी कोई रिलेवेंस नहीं रहती है यूपी में यूपी में भी कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ेगा लास्ट टाइम तो तीनों थे तीन में से एक अलग हुआ है हमारी पोजीशन उल्टी बेटर हुए आपको गणित को माने तो लास्ट टाइम बसपा सपा चौधरी चरण सिंह की पार्टी ये सब इकट्ठा थे ये तो बड़ा स्ट्रॉन्गेस्ट अलायंस था अभी भी मैं हजारों बार कह चुका हूँ फिर से कहता हूँ पोलिटिक्स फिजिक्स नहीं है केमिस्ट्री है हमेशा वन प्लस वन टू नहीं होता है कई बार ग्यारह होता है कई बार वन प्लस वन जीरो भी हो जाता है अगर पॉलिटिक्स अरिथमेटिक नहीं है केमिस्ट्री है तो जयंत चौधरी को लेने की जरूरत क्या पड़ी आप तो वेस्टर्न यूपी में वैसे ही जीत रहे थे वहाँ पे थे भी उन कुछ जीत नहीं पाए तो आपने इनको क्यों लिया फिर जाट वोट वैसे ही ज़्यादा था फिफ्टी परसेंट ज़्यादा तो आप उस सीट में वैसे ही वोट ले रहे थे देखिए एरेट गणित के कारण हमने किया है ऐसा मैं नहीं मानता हूँ 
हमने हमारी पार्टी के एक्सपांसन को तय करने के लिए और हमारी पार्टी को और एरिया में ज़्यादा अच्छे से हम कंसंट्रेट कर पाए इसलिए हमारे अच्छे एरिया थे वहाँ हमारा संघर्ष कम किया है नहीं पर वो तो वैसे ही जीत रहे थे जैसे अगर आपको वाकई में मैक्स आउट करना था बीजेपी को जितना ज्यादा आप ले आ सकते हो तो आपने जो जैसे भी जेडीयू को भी लिया आ, ऐसा है राहुल बड़ा तो, कॉम्प्लेक्स सब्जेक्ट है नहीं समझ पाओगे ऐसे नहीं नहीं छोड़ दो ट्राई तो कीजिए कि अगर कॉम्प्लेक्स सब्जेक्ट है मेरी बात मानो यार अगर अगर बीजेपी वाकई में उतनी मजबूत होती आपके विरोधियों की नज़र में तो आपको ये अलायंस करने की जरूरत नहीं पड़ती वो कहते हैं कि चूंकि अंदर आपको कुछ ऐसा पता है जो बाहर लोगों को नहीं पता इसलिए आप ये अलायंस करो वरना तो आप खुद ही ले जाते हैं सीटें ऐसे नहीं होता है राहुल छोड़ दो आप नहीं समझ पाओगे भाई बीजेपी दो बार सभी की सभी सीटें वहाँ से जीत कर निकली हैं तो फिर हमारे मजबूत नहीं होने का सवाल ही नहीं है मैंने कहा ना अलायंस के कई सारे कारण होते हैं कई डायमेंशन होते हैं तो समझाइए ना कि क्या ऐसा डायमेंशन होता है जो स, जो समय पे नहीं आपको पूछता हूँ आपकी टीआरपी क्यों बढ़ रही है कम हो रही है सब बहुत मेहनत करते हैं इसलिए बढ़ रही है।, है अरे इसमें भी हमारा विषय है हम लोग बहुत मेहनत करते हैं इसलिए बढ़ती है हमारी टीआरपी बहुत एफर्ट करते हैं सर हम लोग बाकियों की तुलना में आप तो देखते हैं बाकियों को भी देखते हैं हमें भी देखते हैं तो हम ज़्यादा एफर्ट करते हैं इसलिए टी बढ़ती है मैं सर अगले विषय पर आना चाहता हूँ वो है इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स की सूची पब्लिक हुई उसके बाद सब जगह अब चर्चा चल रही है सब अपनी गणित अरिथमेटिक मिनिस्ट्री सब लगा रहे हैं दो तीन चीज़ें निकल के आ रही हैं पहली बात तो ये कि जो टॉप तीस डोनर हैं उनमें से कम से कम आधे पे कुछ ना कुछ किस्म का सी बी आई या ई का कोई केस चल रहा है तो राहुल गांधी पीसी कर रहे हैं विपक्ष के नेता बोल रहे हैं वो कह रहे हैं कि ये उगाही का मेकेनिज्म हो गया कि एक तरफ से एजेंसी भेजते हैं दूसरी तरफ से बोलते हैं इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड ले लो तो फिर हम नहीं करेंगे ये जो पूरा पोलिटिकल विवाद बन रहा है इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स को लेकर उस पर गृहमंत्री जी आपका क्या कहना है इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड भारतीय राजनीति में से काले धन का वर्चस्व समाप्त करने के लिए लाया गया था सुप्रीम कोर्ट जो फैसला देती है वो सबको मानना होता है मैं इस पर कोई टिप्पणी करना नहीं चाहता अभी भी सुप्रीम कोर्ट में सोमवार को सुनवाई होनी मैं सुप्रीम कोर्ट के फैसले पर कोई टिप्पणी नहीं करता मैं किसी भी मंच पर किसी भी व्यक्ति से चर्चा करने के लिए तैयार हूँ इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड ये भारतीय राजनीति में से काला धन समाप्त करने के लिए लाया गया कोई मुझे ये समझा दे कि इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड आने के पहले किस तरह से चंदा आता था तो कैश से आता था बॉन्ड में किस तरह से आता है तो अपनी कंपनी के चेक आरबीआई को देकर एक बॉन्ड परचेज करते हैं और देते हैं इसमें गोपनीयता का सवाल आ गया जो कैश में चंदा आता था इसका क्या हुआ किस का नाम जाहिर हुआ है मुझे बताइए तो आज तक किसी का हुआ है क्या किसी का नहीं हुआ परंतु मैं राजनीतिक चीज़ों को ज़्यादा डिटेल में जवाब देना चाहता हूँ एक परसेप्शन चलाया जा रहा है कि इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड से भारतीय जनता पार्टी को बड़ा फायदा हुआ है क्योंकि भारतीय जनता पार्टी पावर में ब्ला 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 और अभी राहुल गांधी ने तो स्टेटमेंट कर दिया कि दुनिया की सबसे बड़ी उगाही का अगर कोई जरिया है तो इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड है मालूम नहीं इनको कौन ये सब लिख कर देता है मैं पोजीशन आज देश की जनता के सामने स्पष्ट कर देना चाहता हूँ भारतीय जनता पार्टी को अप्रोक्सीमेटली 6000 करोड़ के बॉन्ड मिले हैं टोटल बॉन्ड 20000 करोड़ के हैं तो 14000 करोड़ के बॉन्ड कहाँ गए हैं मैं बताता हूँ टीएमसी को 1600 करोड़ के मिले कांग्रेस को 1400 करोड़ के मिले बीआरएस को 1200 करोड़ के मिले बीजेडी को सात करोड़ के मिले और डीएमके को छः करोड़ के मिले अब अगर तेर राज्यों में और 303 सांसद 11 करोड़ मेंबरशिप वाली पार्टी और देश के सभी यूनिट में पार्टी का योग मिला लें इन लोगों का इतना करें मानो कांग्रेस में अभी 35 सांसद है उनके 300 हो तो क्या हो एक लगाते हैं तो टीएमसी को 20000 करोड़ के बॉन्ड होते हैं बीआरएस को 40000 करोड़ के होते हैं 
और कांग्रेस पार्टी को 9000 करोड़ की होती मैं प्रोरेटा की बात कर रहा हूं देश में हमारे 303 सांसद है हमें 6000 करोड़ के बॉन्ड मिले हैं और 242 सांसद जिन पार्टियों का है इसको 14000 करोड़ के बॉन्ड निकले क्या शोर शराबा कर रहे हो भाई इस मैं दावे से कहता हूं जब हिसाब खुलेगा ये लोग आपके आपको फेस नहीं कर पाएंगे आज तक परेश छो रख देना बॉन्ड के विरोध रखने वालों का कोई नहीं आएगा मेरे अलावे सर जो इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स में जिन कंपनियों के नाम आए हैं उनमें से कई ऐसी हैं जिन पे कोई ईडी सीबीआई का केस चल रहा है और दूसरा जो देश के सबसे बड़े औद्योगिक घराने हैं जिनको लेके इतनी पॉलिटिक्स होती रहती है उन्होंने क्या डोनेट नहीं किया किसी को उनका नाम तो कहीं है ही तो आप क्या कहते हो कि आज़ादी से अब तक वो औद्योगिक घराने ने डोनेट डोनेट ही नहीं किया है नहीं किया ही है करते तो इसका हिसाब कहाँ है मैं पूछना चाहता हूँ नाम भी नहीं आए हैं बॉन्ड के कारण आज तो नाम तो आए हैं क्या गोपनीयता की बात कर रहे हैं लोग करोड़ों रुपयों का चंदा लिया कैश में बारह लाख करोड़ के घपले घोटाले भ्रष्टाचार किए जेल में जा रहे हैं और हमसे ही सब मांग रहे हैं हमने तो काला धन को समाप्त करने के लिए बॉन्ड लाए थे मैं आज देश की जनता के सामने आपको सवाल पूछना चाहता हूं बॉन्ड आने से पहले चुनाव का खर्चा कहां से आता था वो काला धन था या हिसाब किताब का धन था ये बॉन्ड का धन काला धन नहीं है उनकी बैलेंस शीट में रिफ्लेक्ट करता है कि हमने चुनाव के लिए बॉन्ड दिया है सिर्फ गोपनीयता इसलिए रखी गई थी वो कांग्रेस पार्टी को देंगे तो हम परेशान करेंगे ऐसा उनको डर था हमें देंगे तो जहां कांग्रेस का शासन है वो परेशान करते हैं इतना डर था बॉन्ड कितना मिला ये पार्टी के बैलेंस शीट में रिफ्लेक्ट होता है और बॉन्ड कितना दिया गया एक कंपनी के बैलेंस शीट में रिफ्लेक्ट होता है क्या गोपनीय बचा गोपनीय तो तब होता है जब अब जो व्यवस्था होगी कैश से चंदा लिया जाएगा तब सब गोपनीय होता होगा और कांग्रेस पार्टी को गोपनीयता से मतलब नहीं है जब कैश से चंदा लेते हैं तो सौ रुपया पार्टी में जमा कराते हैं और हजार रुपया अपने घर में रख लेते हैं एक कांग्रेस पार्टी ने सालों तक ये व्यवस्था चलाई है पार्टी के नाम से 1100 रुपया लेते हैं सौ रुपया पार्टी में जमा कराते हैं और हजार रुपया घर में रख लेते हैं बॉन्ड अगर 1100 को लेते हो तो 1100 रुपया बैंक अकाउंट में जमा होते हैं जरा उनको कोई पूछे तो आप हमें इतना पूछ रहे तो चप 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 कर कर उनको चार सवाल तो पूछो बिठाओ यहाँ पर आए नहीं इन्वाइट किया था आए नहीं कोई बोल नहीं बट उसमें ना सर वो इंफॉर्मेशन ए सिमिट्री इंफॉर्मेशन ए सिमिट्री यानी कि चूंकि ये सरकारी बैंक है तो आरोप ये है कि अगर जैसे कोई सीनियर मंत्री पूछे भाई बताओ एसबीआई के चेयरमैन किसको क्या मिला तो उसकी हिम्मत होगी को ना बताए कि सरकार में जो बैठा है वो तो पता करा लेगा भाई विपक्ष को किसने दिया जिस, जिसकी जैसी मती है ऐसी उनकी दृष्टि होगी हमने कभी भी एस को नहीं पूछा है नहीं पूछा कभी नहीं पूछा किसको कितना मिला क्योंकि पूछने की जरूरत ही नहीं है कांग्रेस पार्टी की बैलेंस शीट में रिफ्लेक्ट होता है कि इनका इतना बॉन्ड मिला है मेरी पार्टी के बैलेंस शीट में भी रिफ्लेक्ट होता है इतना बॉन्ड मिला है कोई पूछने की जरूरत नहीं सार्वजनिक होता है इलेक्शन कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया हमारी बैलेंस शीट पब्लिक को देखने के लिए सार्वजनिक करती है मालूम ही होता है सबको तब सोल्यूशन क्या है क्योंकि सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने तो अपना ऑर्डर दिया वो चैलेंज होगा अगर ये इलेक्शन सर पे है इसमें थोड़ी ट्रांसपेरेंसी आए पारदर्शिता आए गृह मंत्री जी कैसे हो सकता है क्या होगा अब वो तो कहीं कोई मिल जाएंगे जज ऑफ द रिकॉर्ड तो मैं पूछूंगा कि सोल्यूशन क्या है इनके मन में कोई हो तो बताए जरा मुझे मुझे तो अभी नहीं दिख रहा है फिर से काले धन की वापसी आने का मुझे डर है कम से कम आप अभी भी ये मानते हैं कि इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड सोल्यूशन था परफेक्ट सोल्यूशन नहीं लेकिन कम से कम सोल्यूशन था शुरुआत थी सोल्यूशन की और इसको स्क्रैप करने की जगह सुधारना चाहिए ऐसा मेरा व्यक्तिगत मत है जो कोई मायने नहीं रखता देश की हाईएस्ट कोर्ट ने जो फैसला दिया है इसका मैं सम्मान करता हूं सर इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड से अब हम आते हैं वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन की ओर आप कमिटी में थे तस्वीर आई कोविंद जी ने आ, अपनी रिपोर्ट तैयार की पूरी कमेटी ने वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन हमें एग्जैक्टली exactly तो पता नहीं कि क्या है लेकिन आप वो क्या सार्वजनिक हो चुका है नहीं पर एग्जैक्टली exactly आप क्या सोच रहे हैं कि कैसे करेंगे 
कैसे आप दो में आपको लगता है कि हम लोग वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन की तरफ बढ़ेंगे देखिए वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन कब होगा वो तो देश की पार्लियामेंट तय करेगी परंतु वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन के पीछे नरेंद्र मोदी जी का और भारतीय जनता पार्टी का विचार ये है कि इस देश में बार बार चुनाव होते रहे थे कभी तीन राज्यों के चुनाव होते हैं कभी किस साल में चार राज्यों के होते किस साल में छह राज्यों के होते हैं पांच साल में एक बार पार्लियामेंट का भी चुनाव हो जाता है और जनता चुनावों में बिजी रहती है इससे ज्यादा रिपीटेड खर्चा होता रहता है रिपीटेड खर्चा होता है तीसरा बार बार कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट लगने से पॉलिसी मेकिंग की सिस्टम भी प्रभावित होती है कंटिन्यूटी नहीं रहती है और इसके साथ साथ डेवलपमेंट के सारे काम कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट के कारण रुक जाते हैं मैं मानता हूं इससे देश की बहुत बड़ी हानि है और दूसरा एक साथ चुनाव होने से खर्चे का व्यय कम होगा पॉलिसी मेकिंग में सरलता हो जाएगी और जनता भी कंफ्यूजन के बगैर जिसको चाहेगी उसको पाँच साल के लिए काम सौंप कर देश के विकास के काम में लग जाएगी अपने परिवार को समृद्ध बनाने के काम में लग जाएगी तो वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन एक सॉल्यूशन है देश इसी रास्ते पर 1960 तक लगभग लगभग चला फिर इंदिरा जी ने सरकारें गिराना शुरू की सरकारें गिर गई तो जनरल इलेक्शन और स्टेट के इलेक्शनों का गणित बिगड़ गया और एक के बाद एक राज्य जनरल इलेक्शन से अलग होते रहे अगर वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन होता है तो इस देश में एक ही तिथि होगी जिस तिथि पर विधानसभा और लोकसभा की रचना हो जाएगी काम समाप्त बाकी सारा पाँच साल तक जिसको जनता बागडोर सौंपती है वो चलाते रहें मैं मानता हूँ इससे हमारी डेमोक्रेसी बड़ी श्रेणी हो सर पर यह भी तो फैक्ट है ना कि जितने लोग आपको इस वक्त देख रहे हैं आज तक पर इंडिया टुडे पे टीवी में सोशल में डिजिटल में उन सब के बीच में आपकी इमेज बनी एक चुनावी चाणक के तौर पे हम सब जानते हैं कि आपको चुनाव लड़ने लड़ाने में बड़ा मजा आता है अब पाँच साल में एक बार होगा तो बाकी टाइम आपको लगेगा कि उतना एक्साइटमेंट जो बना रहता है चुनाव को लेकर फिर तो एक ही बार होगा हमारा हमने हमें कोई तकलीफ नहीं होगी आपका बड़ा प्रॉब्लम होने वाला है पाँच साल आप क्या करोगे भैया एक ही बार हो जाएगा तो नहीं नहीं ये बात तो सही है मेरे को जितने भी लोग हमारे हम साथ तो काम करेंगे सत्ता में होंगे तो सरकार चलाएंगे ओपोजिशन में हो तो विरोध पक्ष का काम करेंगे हम तो काम करेंगे पार्टी को बढ़ाएंगे मगर आपके लिए बड़ी प्रॉब्लम होने वाली है ये बात सही है आपकी नहीं नहीं ये बात सही है क्योंकि जितना मज़ा हम लोगों को डेटा में सेफोलॉजी में इलेक्शन में घूमने फिरने में जब भी मैट में आता है और जितना नेता से भी सीखने को मिलता है बाकी टाइम पे तो नेता एकदम मंत्री होता है चुनाव के टाइम पे वो वनरेबल होता है उस टाइम पे ठहरो ठहरो इतना ग्रॉस स्टेट में ये कोई सिखाने सीखने नहीं आते हैं हमारे पास सिखाने आते हैं ये अलग है हम सीखते नहीं हैं इनसे ऐसे कभी जिंदगी में कोई गलती कर सकता है अमित शाह साहब को कुछ सिखाने ऐसी जरूरत ना ऐसी गलती नहीं सर मैं सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट पे आना चाहता हूँ ये तो आपका बहुत टाइम से तैयार था चुनाव से एन पहले लेके आ गए ये तो कभी भी आप पहले भी ले आते क्या ये चुनाव से ऐसे पहले लाएं कि थोड़ा सा एक हिंदू मुस्लिम या मेजॉरिटी माइनॉरिटी टाइप का हो जाए वो अनसेटल हो जाए आपका वोट पोलराइज हो जाए पहले ले आते आप इसको ऐसा है राहुल जी आप मुझे लगता है लेजिस्लेटिव प्रोसीजर को ढंग से स्टडी ही नहीं करते हो दो में कानून पारित हो गया है बार बार मैंने कहा है कि पार्लियामेंट ने पारित किया कानून है पत्थर पर लकील है ये होगा ही होगा अब कहाँ सस्पेंस बचा है पांच साल पहले कानून पारित हो गया था अब सिर्फ रूल्स बनाए हैं हमारी विल हमने 2019 के चुनाव के भारतीय जनता पार्टी के घोषणा पत्र में घोषित कर दी थी कि हम अगर बहुमत में आते हैं तो सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट लेकर आएंगे आते ही सरकार ने अगस्त 2019 में ये बिल पारित कर दिया राज्यसभा में भी पारित हुआ लोकसभा में भी पारित हुआ कहाँ कंफ्यूजन था कंफ्यूजन ही नहीं था टाइमिंग का क्वेश्चन डज नॉट एराइज सवाल इतना है कि इस पर मर्ड डालने के लिए टाइमिंग का क्वेश्चन खड़ा किया जा रहा है सबको मालूम था कि आने वाला है और मैंने कभी नहीं कहा कि इस मामले पर हम पीछे हटेंगे मैंने हर बार कहा ये पत्थर पर लकीर है और ये होकर रहेगा 
सर संविधान में लिखा है कि देश का कानून किसी भी एक धर्म के खिलाफ कोई डिस्क्रिमिनेशन नहीं करेगा भेदभाव नहीं करेगा सवाल ये पूछा जा रहा है कि अगर क्रिश्चन आ सकते हैं पारसी आ सकते एक हैं सेकंड, एक सेकंड, हिंदू एक आ सकते हैं राहुल सिख आ सकते हैं आपका अपना सवाल है या विपक्ष के लोगों का है स्पष्ट दोनों 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 का तो मुस्लिम पर्सनल लॉ क्या है नहीं मेरा सवाल का सुन लीजिए मेरे सवाल मैं सिटीजन मेरे, मेरे सवाल का जवाब दो ना भैया मुस्लिम पर्सनल लॉ क्या है आप नहीं समर्थन करते हो तो यूसीसी का समर्थक हूँ एकदम यूसीसी होना चाहिए तो ओवेसी को भी भी पूछो धर्म के आधार पर कानून नहीं होना चाहिए वो कहने वाले मुस्लिम पर्सनल लॉ का समर्थन करते हैं क्या समझ रखा है सबको किसी में सोच नहीं है क्या मैं बताता हूं क्यों इसमें पांच ही धर्मों को लिया गया है एक कटु वास्तविकता है होना नहीं चाहिए था हमारी पार्टी तो उस वक्त थी ही नहीं अगर होती निर्णायक स्थिति में तो हम कभी इस देश का बंटवारा नहीं करते इस देश का बंटवारा नहीं होना चाहिए परंतु दुर्भाग्य की बात है कि इस देश का बंटवारा हुआ धर्म के आधार पर हुआ और जब बंटवारा की घोषणा की गई हजारों हजारों दोनों ओर से लोग वहां से यहां यहां से वहां गए ट्रेन की ट्रेनें कटी हुई आई महिलाओं के साथ अत्याचार हुए छोटी छोटी बच्चियों के साथ अत्याचार हुए उस वक्त हमारे सारे नेता देश के महात्मा गांधी जवाहरलाल नेहरू राजेंद्र प्रसाद सरदार पटेल मौलाना आजाद सब ने कहा कि भाई जहां है वहां रह जाइए अगर आपको बाद में भारत में आना है तो आपका स्वागत है हम आपको नागरिकता देंगे वो कहने का उद्देश्य था कि उस वक्त आपादापी में आने से लोगों की जान न चली जाए थोड़ा स्थिरता आने के बाद आइए स्थिरता आने के बाद क्या हुआ मैं बताता हूं पाकिस्तान में आजादी के वक्त तेईस प्रतिशत हिंदू थे तेईस प्रतिशत आज दो पॉइंट सात प्रतिशत है कहा गए भाई धन परिवर्तन तेईस से टू पॉइंट सेवन कहा गए धर्म परिवर्तन हो गया बेसुमार अत्याचार हुए महिलाओं के साथ बलात्कार हुए बच्चियों को उठा ले गया बालिक बच्चियों के साथ निकाह पढ़ लिया गया वो कहा जाए वो भारत की शरण में आए बांग्लादेश में लगभग लगभग 23 प्रतिशत हिंदू थे आज 10 प्रतिशत से कम बचे हैं कहा गए या तो भारत की शरण में आए या तो उनका धर्म परिवर्तन हो गया अपना समान अपनी मान्यता खोकर आज जी रहे हैं और दो लाख से ज्यादा उन्नीस में सिख और हिंदू अफगानिस्तान में थे आज तीन है कहा गए और वो लोग अपना धर्म अपना सम्मान अपने परिवार की महिलाओं की इज्जत बचाने के लिए भारत की शरण में आए हैं और ये कहते हैं हम इनको नागरिकता न दे क्यों न दे इनका अधिकार है उनका अधिकार जितना मेरा और आपका है उतना ही अधिकार ये शरणार्थियों का है और वो देना चाहिए सर जब पिछली बार आपका इंटरव्यू हुआ था एजेंडा आज तक और कॉन्क्लेव के मंच पे आपने कहा था कि जो हिंदू हैं जो पीड़ित हैं बांग्लादेश में हों या पाकिस्तान में अफगान कहाँ जाएं यही देश है यहीं पे आएंगे लेकिन क्रिश्चियंस के भी तो अपने देश हैं थियोक्रेटिक देश हैं वो तो वहाँ भी जा सकते हैं उनको तो हमने नहीं रोका है वहाँ चले जाए भौगोलिक सीमा हमारे साथ सटी है इसलिए हम यहाँ बुला रहे हैं एक और आप कहते हो एक धर्म क्यों छूट गया हाँ। अब पूछते हो कि एक धर्म क्यों जोड़ा आपको छूटने से तकलीफ है या जोड़ने से तकलीफ है मेरे को प्रिंसिपल का सवाल है कि सेम प्रिंसिपल, प्रिंसिपल का सवाल नहीं है ये तीनों राष्ट्र जहां से शरणार्थियों को हमने स्वागत किया है ये तीनों राष्ट्र घोषित इस्लामिक स्टेट है इनके कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में लिखा है कि वी आर इस्लामिक स्टेट इस्लामिक स्टेट में मुस्लिम पर धार्मिक प्रताड़ना हो सकती है क्या नहीं पर सेक्टेरियन तो हो सकता है क्या सेक्टेरियन जैसे अहमदी शिया सुन्नी उस वो भी मुस्लिम है वहां की व्याख्या में नहीं पर जैसे पाकिस्तान ये तो होने को तो हर जगह भूख है दुनिया में सबको नहीं ला सकते परंतु ये तीनों देश घोषित इस्लामिक स्टेट है वहां इस्लाम के अनुयायियों पर प्रताड़ना नहीं हो सकती धर्म परिवर्तन हो ही नहीं सकता क्योंकि वो तो इस्लामिक ही है बाकी सारे धर्म जो वहां विद्यमान थे सारों को शरण देने का हमने फैसला किया है और उसमें कोई अनुचित नहीं है 1950 से भारत का जो वादा था वो वादे को कांग्रेस ने नहीं पूरा किया भारतीय जनता पार्टी ने पूरा किया ये एपीसमेंट की वोट बैंक की राजनीति के लिए इसका विरोध कर रहे हैं नहीं पर जैसे पाकिस्तान अधिकृत कश्मीर को हम लोग इंडिया मानते अखंड भारत का हिस्सा मानते वहां पर अगर किसी का उत्पीड़न हो रहा हो या फिर कोई बलोच हो जो कि वहीं की परिस्थितियों से परेशान है उसका एक्सप्लॉयटेशन हो भाई पाक 
ऑक्यूपाई कश्मीर भारत का हिस्सा है इसमें हिंदू मुसलमान का सवाल पैदा ही नहीं होता वहाँ जो मुसलमान है वो भी हमारे हैं वहाँ जो हिंदू है वो भी हमारे ये बड़ी बात बोल रहे हैं आप बड़ी अगर क्या है मैं पार्लियामेंट में बोला हूँ नहीं कि अगर पीओ शो को बड़ा मत बताओ मैं फिर से कह देता हूँ पाक ऑक्यूपाई कश्मीर भारत का हिस्सा है वहाँ का मुसलमान भी हमारा है वहाँ का हिंदू भी हमारा है लेकिन अगर कोई बलोच हो बलोच पे या फिर रोहिंग्या अगर जो फर्ज कीजिए काफ़ी सारा वहाँ पे लोकल गवर्नमेंट उनके खिलाफ कार्रवाई राहुल जी ऐसा है इतने बड़े ब्रॉड फैसले एक दो को देखकर नहीं लिए जा सकते हैं पॉलिसी जब बनती है तब मेजर प्रॉब्लम के सॉल्यूशन के लिए बनती है अगर कोई बलोच होगा कोई हमें अप्रोच करेगा तो सोचेंगे उस पर इसके कारण इतने सारे शरणार्थी जो करोड़ों लोग आए हैं इनकी जिंदगी को काहे को बर्बाद कर रहे हो भाई बलोच बलोच कर कर वो अपना वोट नहीं दे सकते वो अपना घर नहीं खरीद सकते उनको नौकरी नहीं मिलती घर खरीदना है तो बंगाली हिंदू जो बांग्लादेश से आए अपने कोई रिलेटिव के नाम पर खरीदते हैं वो रिलेटिव मर जाता है बच्चे क्लेम कर देते हैं फिर झगड़े होते इनकी प्रताड़ना कभी देखी आपने ये नेताओं के इंटरव्यू करने की जगह जो अफगानिस्तान से सीख हमारे सिरसा लेकर आया था और बाकी सारे जो शरणार्थी हैं इनका इंटरव्यू करो तो मालूम पड़ेगा इनका दर्द क्या वो दिल्ली के मुख्यमंत्री ने पीसी की वो तो कह रहे हैं कि जेब कतरे चोरी ये वो सब बढ़ जाएगा अगर आप सी ए लेके आए ऐसा है आप केजरीवाल जी कुछ पढ़े बगैर बोलने के लिए माहिर व्यक्ति है इन्होंने कानून ही नहीं पढ़ा है हमने कानून में 31 मा इकतीस दिसंबर 2014 तक जो शरणार्थी आए हैं इसके लिए ये कानून है तो 31 दिसंबर 2014 में यहाँ गए वो तो ऑलरेडी यहाँ है और ये शरणार्थियों को जेब कचरे जेब कतरे रैपिस्ट ये कहना ठीक नहीं है मैं केजरीवाल को इतना ही कहता हूँ कि इतने बांग्लादेश और रोहिंग्या से घुसपिटिया आए हैं इनके लिए एक लफ्ज बोले होते तो थोड़े न्यूट्रल दे सर घुसपेटिए और शरणार्थी में बड़ा अंतर है जो यहाँ पर घुस कर आता है गैरकानून तरीके से आता है जिस पर कोई प्रताड़ना होने के बावजूद भी आता है वो घुसपेटिया है देश इसको स्वीकार नहीं कर सकता और जो शरण में आता है धार्मिक प्रताड़ना के कारण आता है अपने परिवार की बच्चियों की आबरू की रक्षा के लिए आता है अपने धर्म की रक्षा के लिए आता है इसको घुसपेटियों के साथ कभी भी इसका कंपेरिजन नहीं कर सकते अभी अभी अफगानिस्तान में जब निजाम बदला सैकड़ों सिख भाई सर पर गुरुद्वारा रख कर आए थे मैंने उनकी आंखों का दर्द देखा है मेरे घर पर आकर मुझे मिले थे किसी को पसंद नहीं है अपना देश छोड़कर अपनी संपत्ति छोड़कर अपना गांव छोड़कर आना परंतु मजबूर हो जाते हैं जब इनके लिए भी हम नहीं सोचेंगे इतनी संवेदना नहीं रखेंगे तो मैं नहीं हम तो ऐसी राजनीति नहीं करते हैं ये हमारे देश का वादा था जो नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने पूरा किया है और इसमें कोई बदलाव नहीं सर सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट के रूल्स तो नोटिफाई हो गए अब एनआरसी को लेके आपकी क्या सोच है क्योंकि आ, वो आपका जो एक पुराना बयान है ना कि सीक्वेंस समझिए क्रोनोलॉजी समझिए वो बड़ा वायरल करवा रहे हैं विपक्ष वाले चुनाव के बाद समझाऊँगा मैं स्पष्ट कर देना चाहता हूँ कि सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट में एन का कोई जींस या वायरस अवेलेबल नहीं है ऑल टुगेदर ए अलग कानून है इसमें नागरिकता छीनने का कोई प्रावधान नहीं है नागरिकता देने का प्रावधान है इस देश की माइनॉरिटी को ऑपोजिशन भड़का रहा है मैं मुस्लिम भाइयों बहनों को करबद्ध विनती करता हूं इनका मत मानिएगा ये फिर से एक बार आपसे पॉलिटिक्स कर रहे हैं सी से किसी भी व्यक्ति की नागरिकता जा नहीं सकती जो शरणार्थी आए हैं इनको नागरिकता मिल सकती है और ये बहुत थम है मैं कहता हूं कानून को डाउनलोड करिए सभी भाषा में उपलब्ध है आप भी पढ़ पाएंगे और इसको समझिए सर सी से तो किसी का जो सिटीजनशिप है वो नहीं जाएगा ये सही बात है कभी ना कभी चुनाव के बाद आपने कहा कि एन आएगी जिसमें रजिस्ट्रेशन नहीं ऐसा नहीं कहा है एन आएगा इसका जवाब मैं बाद में दूंगा एक अभी नहीं देना मैंने कहा कहा नहीं मेरे को सवाल मैं राहुल भाई बहुत सोच समझ कर बोलने वाला व्यक्ति हूँ मैं आपके सवाल को भी समझता हूँ मेरे जवाब को भी समझता हूँ मैंने ऐसा कभी नहीं कहा मैंने ऐसा कहा ये सवाल का जवाब मैं चुनाव के बाद 
इस वक्त का एक बड़ा सवाल सभी के जहन में यह है कि अगर प्रधानमंत्री मोदी और भारतीय जनता पार्टी की तीसरी सरकार बनती है तो सरकार के एजेंडे में क्या रहेगा क्योंकि प्रधानमंत्री ने बोला कि तैयार हो जाइए बड़े ऐलान होने वाले हैं और सौ दिन का एजेंडा तैयार है हम बड़े फैसले लेने वाले हैं सर थोड़ा सा इंडिकेट कर दीजिए कि क्या तैयारी करनी है भाई हम लोगों को देखिए फैसले होंगे भाजपा का चुनाव घोषणा पत्र में हमारे सारे एजेंडे को हम क्लियर करेंगे हम उन्नीस से चुनाव घोषणा पत्र घोषित करते हैं इसकी क्रेडिबिलिटी बनी है हमारे घोषणा पत्र में था कि हम धारा तीन हटाएंगे देश की जनता ने जब हमें पूर्ण बहुमत दिया हमने धारा 370 को देश के संविधान से हटा कर हमारे घोषणा पत्र में था कि हम राम मंदिर बनाएंगे अयोध्या में कोई सहमत नहीं था हमने बनाया प्राण प्रतिष्ठा भी हमारे घोषणा पत्र में था हम ट्रिपल तलाक समाप्त कर देंगे हमने ट्रिपल तलाक को समाप्त कर दिया हमारे घोषणा पत्र में था हम यूसीसी लाने का प्रयास करेंगे आर्टिकल 44 को इंप्लीमेंट करेंगे हमने हमारी उत्तराखंड सरकार ने एक शुरुआत की है और वो हमने पूरा किया है हमारे घोषणा पत्र में था कि हम सी लाएंगे हमने फिर से सी को इंट्रोड्यूस रूल्स बनाकर चुनाव के पहले हमारा वादा समाप्त कर दिया है भारतीय जनता पार्टी के वादे क्या है वो हमारे घोषणा पत्र में आएंगे परंतु एक बात बहुत स्पष्ट बना बता देता हूँ ये दस साल में मोदी जी ने देश के साठ करोड़ लोगों के जीवन को स्थायित्व दिया है सुखी बनाया है और सभी प्राथमिक सुविधाओं से युक्त किया है आज देश के साठ करोड़ लोगों को फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट अनाज मिला है घर में टॉयलेट मिला है घर में ही नल से जल मिल गया है गैस का सिलेंडर मिला है पाँच लाख तक का सारा इनका अनाज और इलाज स्वास्थ्य का फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट हो रहा है और हर किसान के बैंक अकाउंट में बेसिक इनपुट के लिए छः हज़ार रुपया हर साल जमा हो रहा है ये बड़ा काम भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार ने किया है भारतीय जनता पार्टी की मोदी सरकार ने इस देश को मैन्युफैक्चरिंग का हब बनाया है ढेर सारी सीरीज ऑफ पॉलिसी लाकर जिससे मैन्युफैक्चरिंग के लिए आज फेवरेट डेस्टिनेशन पूरी दुनिया में भारत बना है भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार ने नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने देश को ग्यारहवें नंबर के अर्थतंत्र से पाँचवें नंबर के अर्थतंत्र पर ले जाकर देश को समृद्ध किया है और मैं देश की जनता को कहना चाहता हूँ ये मोदी गारंटी है तीसरी टर्म दे दीजिए आप समर्थन कर दीजिए देश तीसरे नंबर की आर्थिक ताकत बनेगा इसमें कोई संशय रखने की जरूरत नहीं है भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार ने देश को सुरक्षित किया है आतंकवाद पर नकेल कसी है सर्जिकल स्ट्राइक और एयर स्ट्राइक कर कर हमने पड़ोसियों को कठोर जवाब दिया है नक्सलवाद को समाप्त करने की दिशा में गए हैं नारकोटिक्स को समाप्त किया है और देश को सुरक्षित किया है और अब मोदी जी ने कहा है कि अगले 25 साल तक देश की 130 करोड़ की जनता अपने आप को तैयार कर ले 15 अगस्त दो को ये देश आत्मनिर्भर होगा ये देश विकसित भारत होगा और ये देश दुनिया में नंबर एक पर होगा इसके लिए हमें अपने आप को तैयार करना इससे बड़ी कोई घोषणा ही नहीं हो सकती सर बीजेपी की विचारधारा के तीन अहम पहलू थे आर्टिकल 370 वो आपने कर दिया राम मंदिर वो आपने कर दिया यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड जो कि उत्तराखंड में हो गया आपने एक टेम्पलेट बना दिया आप आहिस्ता आहिस्ता बाकी स्टेट्स में करेंगे आपके लिए सबसे बड़ा अनफिनिश्ड एजेंडा क्या है क्या काशी विश्वनाथ में या मथुरा में मंदिर बनाना उसका हिस्सा है आपके लिए अनफिश अनफिनिश्ड एजेंडा आप किसको मानते हैं देखो राहुल भाई आप लोगों का एक प्रॉब्लम है जब तक धारा तीन हटी नहीं थी राम मंदिर बना नहीं था काशी विश्वनाथ कॉरिडोर नहीं बना था सी ए आया नहीं था ट्रिपल तलाक समाप्त नहीं हुआ था यू आया नहीं था आप हमेशा कहते कि भारतीय जनता पार्टी के साथ डेवलपमेंट का कोई एजेंडा ही नहीं है भारतीय जनता पार्टी ये डिवीजन करने वाले एजेंडा के आधार पर आगे बढ़ती है मैं देश की जनता को बताना चाहता हूँ ये डिवीजन करने वाले एजेंडा नहीं है ये सारे एजेंडा देश की सुरक्षा के साथ जुड़े हुए हैं देश के सम्मान के साथ जुड़े हुए और देश की संस्कृति को नई चमक और पहल देने वाले एजेंडा है वो हमारे एजेंडा थे हमने समाप्त कर दिया अगर आपकी वो बात को याद रखें कि हमेशा हम इसके आधार पर जीते हैं जीत जीतते थे तो अब तो हमारे पास से तो जीतने का मंत्र ही समाप्त हो गया अब तो हम चुनाव हार जाने चाहिए 
वास्तविकता ये है कि हम इसके आधार पर चुनाव जीतते ही नहीं थे हम बार बार चुनाव हमारे परफॉर्मेंस के आधार पर जीतते थे हमारे चुनाव जीतने का आधार ना ही हमारे एजेंडे के हिस्से थे ना जातिवाद था ना परिवारवाद था ना तुष्टिकरण था हम हमारे परफॉर्मेंस से चुनाव जीतते थे मोदी जी ने इस देश की राजनीति से जातिवाद परिवारवाद तुष्टिकरण और भ्रष्टाचार को समाप्त कर कर पोलिटिक्स ऑफ परफॉर्मेंस को एस्टाब्लिश किया है और यही सही डेमोक्रेसी है सर एक जो आरोप लगता था भारतीय जनता पार्टी पे पहले कि इस तरह के जो बयान आते हैं अलग अलग कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बदल देंगे या फिर नथुराम गोडसे को लेके अब जवाब दिए बगैर बात नहीं जा सकती एक सांसद ने बयान दिया हमने तुरंत अपने आप को बयान से अलग कर दिया भारतीय जनता पार्टी ने और उसको नोटिस भेज दी राहुल गांधी के सांसद ने बयान दिया इस देश के दो टुकड़े करो नॉर्थ इंडिया साउथ इंडिया आप उनके लिए एक शब्द नहीं बोलते हो इससे ज्यादा बायस जर्नलिज्म हो ही नहीं सकता दो दिन आपने एजेंडा चलाया कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बदल देंगे और भारत के डिविजन पर दो शो नहीं किए क्या बात कर रहे हो हम देखते नहीं है आंख मूंद कर रहते हैं जवाब देना पड़ेगा आपको भी देश की जनता को कि आपका एजेंडा क्या है ऐसे नहीं चलता है राहुल भाई मे, मेरा सवाल यह था कि जिन जिन लोगों ने इस तरह के बयान दिया आपने तो उनका टिकट काट दिया मतलब आप जो यहाँ बैठे हैं सारे के सारे कुछ को टिकट मिल गई कुछ टिकट की उम्मीद में है उनको आप बड़ा क्लियर मैसेज दे रहे हैं कि भाई एकदम लाइन टू लाइन बैटिंग करो थोड़ा सा आपने दाएं बाएं बोला तो टिकट भी कट सकती है जितने भी मोटर माउथ एम पी इसते सबकी टिकट काट दिया देखिए पार्टी की डिसिप्लिन में मुझे भी रहना पड़ेगा सबको रहना पड़ेगा भाई पार्टी की डिसिप्लिन एक होती है पार्टी की पॉलिसी के बाहर कोई ग्रॉस ट्रीटमेंट नहीं कर सकती सर हम लोग पश्चिम बंगाल की तरफ आते हैं क्योंकि चुनाव बाकी जगहों पे तो मतलब कुछ कुछ स्टेट्स में तो लग रहा है कि चुनाव हो भी रहा है नहीं भी हो रहा मतलब आप ही लड़ रहे हैं विपक्ष तो कुछ कर नहीं रहा लेकिन पश्चिम बंगाल में लड़ाई चल रही है मतलब आप पूरी ताकत लगाए हुए हैं ममता बनर्जी भी मतलब जितना कर सकती हैं आपको लगता है कि सबसे रोचक सबसे एक्साइटिंग इलेक्शन अगर कहीं पर है इस बार पश्चिम बंगाल में मैं बता देता हूँ राहुल जी एक्साइटेड है कोई एक्साइटेड हो जाए नहीं पश्चिम बंगाल में हम पच्चीस से ज़्यादा सीटें जीतेंगे वास्तविकता है और ये हो के रहे आपको लगता है कि संदेश खली से एक माहौल बना जैसे नंदीग्राम सिंगूर के टाइम पे हुआ आपने उसको यूज किया ममता जी के खिलाफ संदेश खाली तो एक शरीर में जब रोग होता है जब कैंसर होता है तो कैंसर की गांठ बड़ी हो जाती है तब बाहर दिखती है संदेश खाली तो एक बाहर आया हुआ परपोटा है वहाँ पूरी व्यवस्था एक खोखली हो गई है स्टेट जब तुष्टिकरण के आधार पर चले स्टेट जब वोट बैंक की राजनीति के आधार पर चले ना लॉ एंड ऑर्डर ठीक हो सकता है ना डेवलपमेंट सिमेट्रिक हो सकता है ना स्टेट का भविष्य उज्जवल हो सकता है वहां पर घुसपैठ भी करा रहे हैं स्टेट स्पॉन्सर घुसपैठ पश्चिम बंगाल में हो रही है वोट बैंक बढ़ाने के लिए वोट बैंक बढ़ाने के लिए अपनी वोट बैंक के सारे गुनाहों को दबाया जा रहा है लाखों करोड़ों रुपये के भ्रष्टाचार हो रहे हैं किसी मंत्री के घर से इक्यावन करोड़ रुपए आने के बाद राज्य की मुख्यमंत्री ईडी पर सवाल उठाती है अपने मंत्री पर सवाल नहीं उठाती है इक्यावन करोड़ कहां से आया इसका तो जवाब पूछो इक्यावन करोड़ रुपया कांग्रेस पार्टी के सांसद के घर से साढ़े तीन सौ करोड़ रुपया मिलते हैं और दूसरे दिन प्रेस होती है कि हम पर प्रताड़ना होती है अब साढ़े तीन सौ करोड़ जिसके घर से कैश मिले वो बेचारे सांसद पर ईडी ने रेड किया इसको एक क्वेश्चन कर रहे हैं भैया ये बात कभी ना कभी जनता जानती है समझती है सर ईडी और सीबीआई का चूंकि आपने जिक्र किया उसमें एक फैक्ट ये है कि कुछ तो जैसे बहुत सारा पैसा निकल आया एम साहब के पास वो बेचारे सांसद पकड़े गए उनको जवाब देना है पर यह भी हकीकत है कि कुछ ऐसे पॉलिटिशियंस हैं अलग अलग स्टेट्स में जिनके खिलाफ काफी जोर शोर से इन्वेस्टिगेशन चल रही थी फिर बीजेपी में आए फिर उतने जोर शोर से इन्वेस्टिगेशन नहीं चलती ऐसा है। नहीं होता है मैं स्पष्ट कर देता हूँ देश, देश की जनता के सामने एक भी भारतीय जनता पार्टी ज्वाइन करने वाले राजनेता का ईडी या सीबीआई ने केस क्लोज नहीं किया है जो आए हैं वो सारे चार्जशीट होने के बाद आए हैं इनका प्रोसीडिंग चल रहा है कहीं पर भी केस विड्रॉल नहीं हुआ है एक भी उदाहरण हो तो राहुल भाई आप खोज कर मुझे ट्वीट करना मैं ट्वीट पर जवाब दूंगा जिससे सार्वजनिक को सवाल और जवाब दूंगा सर वो केस क्लोज करना एक चीज है वो केस को आप ऐसी खुला ही छोड़ दो तो वो भी तो एक तलवार की तरह है ना सब केस लो है चिदम्बरम साहब को पांच साल हो गए क्या हो रहा है 
ये हमारे जुडिशियल प्रोसीजर की थोड़ी गड़बड़ है जिसको सुधारने के लिए हम तीन कानून लेकर आए हैं जिसमें तीन साल के बाद सभी को सजा मिलने वाली है ये कानून के इम्प्लीमेंटेशन के बाद तीन साल में सभी को सजा ये तो हमारी कोर्ट प्रोसीजर का मामला है इसमें पॉलिटिकल विल का मामला नहीं है चार्जशीट होने के बाद काम कोर्ट का है वो के कविता जो कि के सी की बेटी हैं उनका अरेस्ट हुआ विपक्षी आरोप लगा रहा है कि ये मिस यूज ऑफ एजेंसीज है इसको आप कैसे रिस्पॉन्ड करते हो काफी देर से अरेस्ट पड़ा था अब इलेक्शन तो कब का चल रहा था केस भाई मिस यूज ऑफ एजेंसी का सवाल नहीं है टाइमिंग क्रिमिनल इन्वेस्टिगेशन का टाइमिंग इलेक्शन के टाइम टेबल को देखकर नहीं चलता है कब का चल रहा था वो यहाँ पर तीन चार बार धरने भी कर चुकी है महिला शक्ति की जागृति के लिए सर so, वो दिल्ली के मुख्यमंत्री बार बार बोल रहे हैं कि गृह मंत्री मेरे को अरेस्ट करा देंगे अरेस्ट करा देंगे अरेस्ट कर मैं अभी अरेस्ट होने वाला हूँ कल अरेस्ट होने वाला हूँ उनको मालूम है कोई देश का गृह मंत्री अरेस्ट नहीं करता है एक पी या पी अरेस्ट करता है इतना भी उनको मालूम नहीं है कभी मैं नहीं कर सकता है यार कोर्ट का ऑर्डर होगा और पी और पी करेंगे अरेस्ट पर होंगे केजरीवाल अरेस्ट पर होंगे केजरीवाल अरेस्ट देखिए आप ई का सवाल मुझे पूछ रहे हो मैं कैसे जवाब दे दूँ भाई ये सवाल ई को पूछना है वो जाएंगे तो अभी तो जाते नहीं है कॉपरेट नहीं करते ऐसा मैंने अखबारों में पढ़ा है आपकी चैनल पर भी देखा है अब वो जाएंगे तो क्या करेंगे वो तो ईडी वालों को मालूम होगा सर चुनाव हमारे सर पे हैं इलेक्शन कमीशन कैसे इलेक्शन कमिश्नर कैसे अपॉइंट होंगे इस पर सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने रूलिंग दी जिसमें उन्होंने कहा कि आ, एक मिनट एक मिनट हाँ रूलिंग इलेक्शन कमीशन ने ऐसे नहीं दी है रूलिंग ऐसे दी थी कि सरकार इस पर एक कानून लेकर आए जिससे एक व्यक्ति के आधार पर मतलब देश के प्रधानमंत्री अकेले न करें कोई कमेटी हो इसकी सर्च की प्रक्रिया हो और बाद में इलेक्शन कमीशन का अपॉइंटमेंट हो मीन नहीं होता है तब तक चीफ जस्टिस लीडर ऑपोजिशन और प्रधानमंत्री तय करें मीन गैप भरने की बात थी कानून हम लेकर आए संसद ने पारित कर दिया गैप भर गया कमेटी की मीटिंग हो गई और इलेक्शन कमीशन अपॉइंट हुई अब बताइए क्या पूछना है सर मेरा सवाल ये है कि देश का चुनाव ये देश दुनिया की सबसे बड़ी आ, हमारा लोकतंत्र है और ये देश का चुनाव इस तरीके से हो कि फेयर भी हो और फेयर दिखे भी बहुत ज़रूरी है अगर कमेटी ऐसी हो कि एक प्रधानमंत्री हो एक कोई जज हो एक विपक्ष का नेता हो तो वन 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 बैलेंस्ड है अगर दो सरकार के मंत्री हो एक विपक्ष का नेता हो तो टू वर्सेस वन तो ये वो पहला वाला फॉर्मूला जो सुप्रीम कोर्ट का था वो ज़्यादा फेयर नहीं था देखिए निर्णय देश की संसद ने करना है कि क्या होगा और देश की संसद ने कानून बनाया है अब उसको कानून को भी कोई ना कोई चैलेंज करेगा देखेंगे क्या होगा सर क्योंकि वक्त खत्म हो रहा है तो मैं आपसे वो पूछना चाहता हूँ राहुल गांधी की जो यात्रा निकली ईस्ट से वेस्ट तक वो बार बार सड़क चलते पूछ रहे लोगों को कि अपनी जात बताओ कास्ट क्या है तुम्हारी कास्ट क्या है क्या जात है उनका आरोप ये है कि एक तो बीजेपी ये सेंसस नहीं करा रही कास्ट का उसको वो बहुत अहम मानते हैं दूसरा उनका कहना है कि जितने भी आई अधिकारी हैं या जो सीनियर अधिकारी हैं उसमें ज़्यादा अपर कास्ट के लोग हैं जो दलित हैं पिछड़े हैं एस सी उनको इतना मौका नहीं मिलता तो उस पर आप कैसे देखते हैं देखिए राहुल गांधी को कुछ एनजीओ कुछ पकड़ा देते हैं और बेचारे बोलते रहते हैं आप इनके स्टेटमेंट का एनालिसिस करिए देश का प्रधानमंत्री ओ से इनको दिखाई नहीं पड़ता देश की कैबिनेट में 27 मंत्री ओ से उनको दिखाई नहीं पड़ता और वो जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी गिनने में लगे हैं अभी मैं आपको बताता हूँ जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी की आयु करीब करीब बावन के आसपास होती है राहुल भैया बावन साल पहले हम भर्ती नहीं करते थे आप भर्ती करते थे वो आकर अभी जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी बने उनको मालूम ही नहीं है वो क्या बोल रहे हैं ये सारा गणित जो करा रहे तेरे दादो परदादो ने किया हुआ है भैया हमने नहीं किया है अब मैं इनको सवाल पूछता हूं इनकी इतनी सरकारें बनी जरा आंकड़ा लाए कि कभी भी कांग्रेस ने ओबीसी प्रधानमंत्री बनाया है क्या कभी सताइस मंत्री रखे है क्या कभी मुख्य उप मुख्यमंत्री ओ बी बना है क्या जरा लेकर आओ राहुल बाबा <laughs> मैं तो अब एडवाइस दे नहीं सकता अलग पार्टी के नेता है उनको जो चिट्ठियां मिलती है उसको जरा क्रॉस चेक कराए इसका हिंदी अनुवाद कराए अंग्रेजी में लिखी हुई चिट्ठी हिंदी में बोलते हैं तो बड़ी तकलीफ होती है उनको तकलीफ मुझे तकलीफ नहीं होती है <laughs> अमित शाह साहब आप देश के गृह मंत्री हैं देश की सुरक्षा व्यवस्था आपकी जिम्मेदारी है 
मणिपुर के लोगों को आपका क्या मैसेज है वहाँ पर इस वक्त स्थिति पहले से बेहतर है लेकिन एक डिवाइड सा बन गया है समाज में उस गैप को पाटने के लिए वो दूरी को जोड़ने के लिए देखिए मेरा तो मैसेज बहुत स्पष्ट है दोनों कम्युनिटी को एक नस्लीय हिंसा से किसी का भला नहीं हुआ है पूरे उत्तर पूर्व में नस्ली हिंसा समाप्त हो चुकी है मणिपुर में भी छः साल शांति रही एक भी बंद नहीं था कर्फ्यू नहीं था ब्लॉकेट नहीं था अपहरण नहीं था दोनों समुदाय एक दूसरे के साथ बैठे बातचीत का प्लेटफॉर्म करें भारत सरकार मध्यस्थी बनने के लिए तैयार है हम बिल्कुल पारदर्शिता से न्यूट्रलिटी के साथ मध्यस्थी करेंगे मुद्दों का समाधान लाएंगे हिंसा से सबने हट जाना चाहिए आपका इंटरनल नंबर अभी क्या है चुनाव का 370 आपका एक्सटर्नल नंबर है इंटरनल नंबर आपका क्या है मोदी जी के कहने के बाद बीजेपी में कोई कंफ्यूजन नहीं है 370 से ज्यादा बीजेपी 400 से ज्यादा एनडीए अमित शाह साहब इस वक्त कुछ लोगों को ये लगता है कि सरकार के जो मंत्री हैं उनको मुश्किल सवाल पसंद नहीं या टेढ़े सवाल पसंद नहीं वो चाहते हैं कि एक तरीके से उन पर लॉलीपॉप फेंकी जाए उसको मारे लेकिन मैं तमाम जो लोग यहाँ बैठे हैं उन सबको बताना चाहता हूँ कि गृहमंत्री साहब ने एक दफ़ा ये नहीं कहा कि ये पूछो वो मत पूछो ऐसा करो वैसा करो उन्होंने बोला कि जो पूछना है पूछो और हमने भी अपनी तरफ से जितना हो सका आ, सवाल सारे पूछे और इन्होंने भी जवाब दिए मैं भी कहना चाहता हूँ जैसे वो बोल्डली पूछते हैं मैं भी ब्लंटली जवाब देता हूँ आपकी चैनल या आपके लिए कुछ कहा हो तो मन पर न लेना भैया ये जो मुझे लगता है वो मैंने कह दिया ये बार बार मुझे बोलते तुम इलेक्शन मैनेजमेंट चले जाओ ऐसा सर हमें कुछ नहीं करना हमें जर्नलिज्म में बड़ा मज़ा आता है अगर सारे इलेक्शन ही एक हो गए तब तो फिर देखना पड़ेगा लेकिन अभी तो बहुत मज़ा आता है गृहमंत्री साहब आप आए बेबाकी से आपने तमाम सवालों का जवाब दिया आपने एक दफ़ा नहीं कहा कि ये मत पूछो वो मत पूछो ऐसा करो वैसा करो तमाम सवाल हमने पूछे भी और दर्शकों ने इसको देखा आप जुड़े हमारे साथ बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका जोरदार तालियां देश बहुत के, बहुत धन्यवाद देश के गृह मंत्री श्री अमित शाह के लिए जोरदार तालियां लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ऑफ द इंडिया टुडे कॉन्क्लेव कैन वी हैव अ वेरी वार्म राउंड ऑफ अप्लॉज फॉर द कंट्रीज होम मिनिस्टर मिस्टर अमित शाह फॉर कमिंग एंड आंसरिंग सो मेनी क्वेश्चंस एंड जॉइनिंग अस हियर द कॉन्क्लेव थैंक यू सर Thank you home minister Ladies and gentlemen that's our final keynote session for day 1 of the India Today conclave